<laughs> I was out with my two brothers and my dad fishing at around 12 in the morning. Me being maybe 12 or 13 at the time, William was older and Jason was younger. We were on a bridge that stood over a large body of water, and I was honestly becoming a bit bored since we had been fishing for the past hour. The only real exciting thing that happened was when my dad hooked a skate. It was a kick watching him struggle to maintain the pole. He had let out a mean steam of curses when his line snapped, singling his loss in the battle. The area was surrounded by forest and was beautifully lit by the night sky. I would look over the bridge's wall countless times just to see the moon's light reflecting off of the dark, steady waves. The bridge wasn't made of wood, but concrete. It was strange looking. Now that I think about it, instead of being only about 3 feet off the surface of the water, it was maybe 10 or 15. I assumed that it was made for walking or riding across. It was narrow, but just wide enough to fit 3 average people side by side. Upon stating that I wasn't having much fun, William led Jason and I down to a large blackberry bush. It was set just next to the beginning of the bridge, so my dad could still see us. With our group, we had 4 dogs. It seems like a lot, I know, but we currently still have only two of our said four dogs. Tragedies happen, I suppose. Back to the story. Two of the dogs are German Shepherds, the dogs we have currently. Other than them, we had a Border Collie and a Foxhound and Muda mix, a very beautiful dog, tall and slender, but with just the right amount of muscle. He was all white with the exception of fall points and freckles. Also, very, very fast. Here's the confusing but necessary part. The female German Shepherd was Charlie, the male German Shepherd was Simon, the Foxhound mix was Buddy, and the Border Collie was Sophie. Okay, now that we've gotten that down, on with the occurrence. We weren't really collecting the berries. It was more of a pick and eat thing. Every now and then, one of us would shout out, startled by the sudden prick of their finger from a thorn. Charlie and Buddy were my personal dogs, leaving Jason with Sophie and my dad with Simon. As I was feeling around for berries with Charlie sitting at my side, Jason left to give my dad some. I turned around to watch him go, Sophie at his heels. Before I could turn back around to face the bush, something caught my eye. Something big. My first thought was that it was a tree, that is, until it turns its head towards me. It locked eyes with me. I felt paralyzed by fear. I barely managed to wave my arm around in William's general direction, trying to catch his attention. He must have noticed as he responded with a quiet yeah. Turning to see what I was looking at, he began to say something, but immediately stopped. All emotion drained from his now pale face. Who is that? He would ask me. I could only mumble what? Not that I didn't hear him, no. I was correcting him. This thing was massive. Really, the only color you could see on the creature came from its eyes. They were wide, human-like. From where I stood, they almost looked orange. The rest was basically a silhouette. I could feel the presence of the dog next to us. Charlie snarled, stalking closer bit by bit. I wanted to jump at her, do anything to keep her away from it. Simon was staring intently, as was Buddy, but kept his position in front of William and me. The thing was standing on its hind legs, but looked like a big, hairy dog, at least something with long, pointed ears. It had lengthy fingers, or more than likely, claws. It leaned forward a bit, but not much, almost as if it wanted to intensify its glare, or maybe just to get a better look at us. I jumped at the sound of Charlie snapping her jaws at the thing before bounding towards it. I nearly choked on my breath as Buddy followed her. I frantically looked around for Simon, who was cowering behind William with his head bowed down growling. William started to run faster after them, and I started to cry, from both fear and slight anger. I heaved a breath and willed my lungs to run as fast as I could. William was on the track team and played baseball, but he was the least of my worries, because I was too. It was the fact that we were chasing two dogs, and a terrifying animal-like creature. Now that I think back on what I did, I must have been insane. Nevertheless, I chased them in the woods. We eventually slowed to a stop as we saw the dogs ahead of us. They were standing defensively, barking and snarling the cryptid. I couldn't see exactly, but it looked as though the creature was now on four legs and smaller. 
The dogs fell back, as though they had been pushed and scurried away from it, as an ear-piercing scream sounded. Buddy took off back to the bridge, where we later found him, and Charlie crouched in front of William and I. The scream sounded strangled, unlike anything I'd ever heard. I had let out a fearful shout before I felt something grab hold of my wrist, which, believe me, did not help my situation. William was trying to pull me along, trying to get us the hell out of there. All three of us ran towards the bridge. The whole way there, it felt as though the creature was on my heels, me being in the back by maybe a foot. Once we were free from the trees, we didn't stop. We bolted into the water, William and I. Charlie merely followed, not knowing what to do. I whipped my head around as we stopped and saw nothing but pine. I choked on my tears, feeling both relieved and terrified of what had just gone down. Back on the bridge, we told our dad. He called bullshit, that we were just playing a prank. But you heard the scream, right? We would ask him. He would blow us off completely and continue fishing. He was, and still is, a skeptic. Gotta see it to believe it, is his paranormal motto. I honestly don't know what that thing was, and I don't think I want to. Part of me is curious, but all of me wants to know what I'm dealing with, so I have more information on the subject. I can't be the only one who's seen it. Today, I'm going to tell you a story I haven't told anyone before, simply because they will think I'm crazy. I don't know why all this even began, but what I do remember is when. It was 7 a.m. in the morning. I was all alone in my house, which I share with my family. I was sitting in the dining room while reading a book. I knew that I was alone. I heard someone. I heard my brother's voice. He was calling my name and asking me where I am. I was extremely confused because I checked his bedroom and saw that it was empty. I stood up and walked towards the voice. It was in the hallway. There was nobody there. I suddenly saw someone's shadow. I was so scared I ran out and waited for my bus outside. For the next two years, things moved in our house. My bed moved. My bedroom was also colder than everybody else's. I always had a feeling somebody was watching me as I fell asleep, but yesterday, there was something far worse. I fell asleep with a huge feeling of being watched, but I also smelled some kind of cologne, a man's cologne that I have never smelled before. I shook it off and soon fell asleep. Around 3 a.m. in the morning, I woke up gasping for air. I couldn't move, breathe, or even scream. I felt my arms touching my head, neck, my belly, and legs. I heard some kind of language being spoken in my ear. I tried so hard to scream, but I wasn't able to. That went on until the morning. They would let me go for five minutes and then continue their torture. After they finally let me go, I had a huge panic attack. I didn't sleep. Today I'm scared. I don't want to eat. I see them. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid to sleep and I'm afraid of the dark. My husband and I moved into a house built on an old battlefield ground. This field goes on for miles and miles, then there's nothing but graves. Such a bloody massacre happened a long time ago during the Civil War in Nancy, Kentucky. When we first moved there, strange activity immediately started happening. We began hearing voices outside mumbling to each other. Note that we have no one that lives close to us for miles. We go outside to investigate and find nothing. We go back inside. It starts up again. We try to fall asleep and hear old music kind of like an old music box. This keeps us awake for some time. We were never able to pinpoint the location of the music. Every there on out, activities increase. We go on outside on our porch and sit. At night, we see shadow figures moving along the trees within the woods. We'd also be in the living room and hear something walking on our front porch often. We run outside to investigate, nothing there. My body was numb from fear. My husband, trying to act calm, was looking at me. I could tell he was in shock like I was. We knew this was something paranormal, and we are very skeptical people about paranormal stuff too, until this happened to us. It changed everything. A whole new door opened up that we were not familiar with. We thought maybe if we don't think about it much, maybe it would just stop. So living there for a week now, we decided to make a flower garden together and enjoy the beautiful weather. I put some little bunny figurines in the garden and also little chickens and turtles. 
That night we started hearing footsteps again on our front porch. This time I told my husband let's not go out. I was hoping maybe it'd just stop if we just ignored it. It kept going on for a good while. We also noticed it's now pounding loudly on our windows. Okay, we had a candle on the window seal outside. We lit it nightly to keep mosquitoes away, but we hadn't lit it for days. The pounding was getting aggressive after a few days. I look out the window and the candle was lit. My husband and I were surprised to say the least. So we went outside to investigate and look at the candle. I noticed that my little chicken fingerines in the flower garden were turned upside down. The next night, I put an app on my phone that allows me to capture EVPs and video in low light situations. My husband thought I was crazy and was skeptical about capturing anything, but I started talking and asking what do you want and who are you? My EVP app was going off in the direction where my husband was standing. I snapped a picture outside in the dark with my husband posing against the wall. We went inside and reviewed the photo. Amazingly, we saw a dark shadow figure of a man floating behind my husband in old clothes. Now we got proof. We showed it to family and friends, and they agreed something is going on here. The place crept me out so much, we decided to move. I found out later that someone died on that property in a garage fire a long time ago. I don't know if that death is related to the Civil War, or is the cause of our hauntings, or it's the old soldiers still there, or maybe both. What I do know is that strange things happen there. This whole ordeal happened when I was around 10 years old to 13 years old when I lived in a particular house. The house was quite old. It first belonged to my grandmother when she was younger and at the time we were renting from her. Many of my grandmother's antique personal items still occupied the house that had belonged to much older relatives that had passed. The importance of these objects was that objects of those who passed away could channel their energy and this shadow man I had seen could have possibly been an old relative. He could have even been one that had passed away in my lifetime since there was actually quite a few deaths of older male relatives whom I still quite miss a lot. The first I was aware of this man, I was around 10 years old. The memory is faint but I am positive what I felt and saw at the time. I was in my room with a friend and we were chatting away when we heard sort of a distinct creaking sound. When we turned our heads, we noticed a shade on a lamp that was on my dresser had somehow flown off of the lamp to a nearby spot on the dresser. Being the young child I was, I was freaked out and we stayed in the living room the rest of the night. I was about 12 years old I believe when I first actually saw the figure who had done plenty of subtle disturbances throughout the years since my first encounter with it. I had stayed home from school since I was pretty sick and was watching Drake and Josh on television to pass the time. I heard the front door open and then saw as well as felt a tall man out of the corner of my eye passing by the entryway to the TV room which I was in. Automatically I called out hey dad thinking he had returned from work early. There was no response. I paused the show and the house was dead silent. The feeling of the man's presences was gone too. I knew, I knew that I had seen something tall and shadow like walk somewhat quickly past the entryway. I got up to investigate and found that the house was indeed empty. My whole body was shaking so I did what came to mind. I cuddled up in my blankets on the couch and turned the volume up to try and erase the so prominent fear that had filled me and waited for my parents to come home. I had seen the shadow man a couple of times after that, each time thinking it was my father and each time finding out it was not. Those memories are far less prominent in my mind but are still there. We moved from the house later the next year and since then I have not seen nor felt the shadow man. Have you ever seen a shadow figure like this? This is my story of what happened to me at work. I don't know if it's a ghost or anything, but I hope that someone may have opinions. Okay, so I was walking back from giving someone their food to go back to the kitchen. Then I saw a little boy outside of the door. He looked like a normal little kid, so I smiled and walked on. I didn't think anything of it. But then, he was at the drive through window. Then again, was back at the door. And so on, until the last part, I saw his head at the same time in the door and the window with a little smile. Then it, 
Well, he went back to one, and I saw him running. Then he disappeared into the parking lot. The weird thing about it was, it was 9 p.m., and it looked to be about five years old. No adults around. It's not the first time I've seen a little boy appear before. One time I was at home, and I'd seen a little shadow boy. I went to tap him on the head because I thought it was my brother. My hand went through his head. Description, around five. Not pale skin, but not tan either. Bluish gray eyes, sandy brown hair. Wore a striped shirt with gray pants. Cute little smile with a few crooked teeth. Was he a ghost too? Thank you. New Orleans, the Bayou, Cemetery Tours, witnessed the devastating effects of Katrina and right on time to watch my son play college baseball. Then my guests entered into my experience. My first experience started when I captured the most beautiful sunset from home plate facing the swampy area where we were playing. As I looked at the picture, I noticed two orbs. One was quite noticeable as it was a small ball of light in the bottom of the photo. The second was a strobe of light coming from the sun behind the clouds. Okay, okay, I'll get to the best part. So I checked into the Whitney Hotel, located in Midtown New Orleans, rich in history. An old bank that is still in use, but is also the hotel that has been renovated with nine floors of winding halls, leading one to get very confused and turn around, so to speak. Let me mention, the entire time I stayed at this hotel, there was not one other guest ever spotted by myself or my parents. In fact, the only people you saw were the same five employees that all seemed to be interacting amongst themselves in an odd sort of way. They were always there. One was the chef, yet never saw one person sitting, eating, or drinking in the restaurant and bar. These same characters were always around, out of nowhere. They were eager to share stories of the hurricane, history of the hotel, and the architecture and other tidbits of the city. What I thought so peculiar was there was nothing ever mentioned of ghosts or hauntings. I will preface this by saying there was a strong sense of something, but I could not quite place my finger on what it was exactly. I finally put it out there and asked, what about ghosts? The two staff members shared a look and stated, oh, you can say that. They shared hearing silverware falling in the middle of the night, sounds from the hundred year old basement and the bank vault closing and locking when no one was around. I retired to my room, 611, at around 8 p.m. I noticed the complete quietness of the floor. Again, not one other room guest was around. I laid down and fell asleep. Approximately 2.13 p.m., I became aware of a feeling between my legs, as if I had been punched. I was in somewhere between sleep and wake, and had remembered the feeling in the pit of my stomach that told me, someone is in this room. I laid there paralyzed, as I tried to rationalize what was happening. Was there someone in my room? Why is in the spot where it was hit, not as as excruciating as it should be? There was still the feeling, but no pain, rather a strong pressure feeling. Then I felt the most gut-wrenching, gut-feeling, sick-to-your-stomach feeling began to rise in me. The feeling that someone was there, and this was not going to be good. My heart was racing. I was frozen, unable to roll over to look in the direction where I felt the person was standing. 30 seconds in, I am now fully aware and awake and scared to death. I thought, I need to get control. I can either lay here or take action. At this point, I leaped out of the bed and walked three feet to where I felt the person standing as it was in the direction of the restroom. It was at this point that I swear there was a figure, see-through, dressed in black and white, streaks in the face area. It wasn't a pleasant presence. This feeling I had was of sheer terror. Then it was gone. As I gathered my bearings, slowed my heart, and tried to rationalize what I just experienced, I felt a sort of calm presence come over me. I laid back down, and I instantly fell right back to sleep. I awoke refreshed and wondered why it was so easy for me to fall back to sleep. In the past, with nightmares, it's always been difficult, not this time. I didn't mention this to anyone for a few days, but that feeling of complete terror, dread stayed with me. I returned to work and shared the experience with a coworker. The fact that it was so real and the feelings it caused me is what prompted me to share my experience and hopefully can find others with similar stories so I don't feel like I am crazy. Thanks for reading. 
I've been tempted to write what happened to my family many times, but it seems far too unreal. We were not allowed to talk about this out of the house when I was a child, and my mother only told our house guests about our visitors when they experienced something in our house. Our childhood home was built in 1898. My parents bought the house in 1974 when I was only six months old. The house was very large and had been converted into a double. My grandmother moved into the upper level. Strange things began to happen shortly after my family moved in. My mother had her first experience one night after she sent my older sisters to bed. From her bedroom door, she could look out and see into the kitchen's hallway and into the bathroom. My family had only lived in the house less than a month when my mom saw a little blonde-haired girl walk into the bathroom. All of my sisters have very dark brown hair, and this was clearly a blonde-haired child. My mother panicked and yelled to the little girl, but the door shut. My mom jumped out of bed. In her mind, she was thinking that this little girl was a neighbor's child that my sisters must have snuck in the house. When she opened the door, there was nobody inside the room. My mother nicknamed the little girl Jessie and I have no idea why. My mother had many experiences in the house and with the younger children, myself, my younger sister, and younger brother. When we were very small, it was as if we were playing with someone else. I don't remember this particular incident, but my mom did. But I do remember that in my oldest sister's bedroom in her closet, there was a paneled off section that led under a hallway steps to the second floor. I remember talking to someone that we called the lady under the stairs. I always thought that it was my mom or grandmother, but I later learned that that was not the case. When we told my mom about this, she would not let us play this game anymore. I do not remember being scared at all though. My younger sister and I would always go into our hallway and play with the lady on the stairs. I have very little recollection of this, and at the time, I would have been about four years old, and my sister would have been about three. When we described the woman to my mother, she forbade us from being in the hallway alone. I never took the ghost stories to heart, and was very carefree as a child. I always felt safe, however, I did finally have a bizarre experience that I could not explain or rationalize away. My grandmother had a stroke when I was 15, and my mother gave my older sister's bedroom to my grandmother since it was on the first level and safer for her. She had no control over what she was saying and was rapidly deteriorating. My parents did not lay any ground rules for us kids that summer, as things were in havoc, and my brother and I had stayed up all night watching Nick at night in the living room. I could see into my grandmother's room, and we also kept an eye out for her should she use the bathroom or want something to drink. I was just starting to doze off when I thought I saw someone in my grandmother's room. It was a blonde haired girl who might have been 10 to 12. I have no idea the age. I thought I was just seeing things or that I was really wiped out and my mom's stories were starting to get to me. I walked out into our kitchen and my oldest sister was eating a sandwich and I told her what I saw. She laughed at me and told me I must have been dreaming. I thought maybe she was right because I just never believed what my mom had been saying about the girl she had claimed seeing on several occasions. Now here's where I realized I was not a complete nutcase. I said before that the house was very big. Well, my grandmother started screaming, and my sister and I ran into the room. My grandmother was up and headed for the front door. She was screaming about fire and the little girl. We could barely make out what she was talking about. But she kept repeating the little girl said I was going to hurt the baby and I have to go before I cause a fire. That was the most intelligible sentence that my grandma had said in over a month. My sister kept saying what little girl? And my grandmother said clear as day, the little blonde haired girl. My grandmother was 72 years old and short of hearing. She was also three rooms away when I literally whispered this to my sister. We woke up my mom because we did not know what to do. My grandmother ran out of the house and refused to come back in. She stood on her porch. My parents took her to the hospital and she was placed in a nursing home because even the mention of our house sent her into hysterics. The baby she was talking about is my younger brother who is the baby in the family. My mom decided to turn the house into a one family home again and had us kids, there were six of us, do the work. We did not mind as we wanted the help and it was a good way for us not to think about my grandmother all the time. My younger sister and I would be the only two sharing a room, but that was fine with me 
as we were very close and we were excited. Again I was up and could not sleep, so I went up to the room that would be ours. It had been my grandmother's and I was scraping wallpaper off the walls with a putty knife. We had started this project the night before and I was bored so I went up to get some work done. I was scraping the walls and had been doing so for about a half an hour when I heard a funny noise sounding like the scraping noise I was making with the knife, but different. It's hard to explain. I thought someone was playing a trick on me, so I began to scrape the wall and very quickly I stopped. However, the sound that I heard continued and it was the sound of scraping, but it was coming from across the room. I don't know if whatever was in the room was mocking me or playing a game, but the scraping kept going on. Whoever or whatever did not care that I heard them. I screamed. I thought it was one of my older sisters. I ran down the front stairs and opened the door and the house was completely quiet. Everyone was sound asleep, snoring. I woke up everyone in the house. I was terrified and I never slept in that room. I would hear things in the house until I was 18 and moved out. As for our house restorations, my mother began working on the kitchen and back hallway that led to our attic. While doing so, she found where the house had burn marks and was scorched. My mother mentioned this to one of our neighbors, a woman who had lived on our street from the day she was born. In the early 1920s, our house had burnt very badly and had been rebuilt. At that time, it had been converted into a double. A little girl and her parents lost their lives in the fire. My other sisters had things happen to them too. One of my older sisters was looking out of the living room windows. Something grabbed her shoulder and called her name. One more thing. Please don't think I am nuts, but I have not had this happen to any house or apartment I have lived in since, and one thing I did notice was that whatever was in the house was not frightening to me in my youth, but only became frightening when each of us hit a certain age. Why? I have no idea. This was also something I thought that was weird. This little girl was never visible upstairs, and the woman only was spotted downstairs once. The neighbor who was alive when the house caught on fire remembered that the little girl's name was Jessica. My mom had been calling her that for years, and had never known what the little girl's real name was, but had just called her that because it seemed right. I've been reading the stories on your site for a while now and decided to share experience of my own. I'm afraid it's not particularly exciting or dramatic, but I feel it's a good example of the attitude you need to take when dealing with spirits. I've been told on more than one occasion by people who claim psychic abilities that there are spirits present in my house. This really comes as no huge shock, as the core of the house is a farmhouse that is over 120 years old. Although I've never seen a ghost myself, I'm familiar with the sort of chilled feeling that people describe when they are in the presence of spirits. It is not truly the same feeling as normal reaction to temperature, but something that seems more internal and comes and goes independently of environmental changes. I have very commonly experienced this sensation, usually beginning before someone else remarks about their perception of something otherworldly. Several years ago, one summer morning, I'd come home in the early morning from working the night shift. I was getting undressed for bed and placed my bedroom door in a three-quarter closed position that I usually keep in to provide some cross ventilation. Let me explain that my bedroom is a rectangular room, approximately 10 foot wide by 16 feet long. There is a set of double windows on the far end of the room. My bed is crossways in front of the windows with the head on the longer wall. The door was on the other end of the room and due to irregularities from different additions to the house. There was an approximate 4 inch step down when entering the room from the hallway. At the time of this incident, there was no central air in the house, so the only cooling method was to open windows. As I was getting ready for bed, I saw the door swing shut, rather firmly from the 3 quarter position. At first, I dismissed this as just being the breeze, as I was feeling a slightly chilled feeling on what was a rather warm morning. Even though I didn't really notice much in the way of the air current, I was very tired and somewhat groggy and only wished to get to bed as soon as possible. I put my door back into the position I had it in and went back to getting ready for bed. Almost immediately, the door swung shut again very firmly. Even though I really did not notice the breeze, 
The door swung quite freely on its hinges, and I did not think much of the fact that it kept shutting. I then took one of my work boots, the common style most everyone is familiar with that laces up about 9 inches above the ankle, and placed it with the toe section underneath the door and the heel towards the doorway, and repositioned the door to the three-quarter position I wanted it to be in. Moments later, the door drug the boot across the carpeted floor and closed as far as it could with the boot in the way. Now at that point, I realized that there was certainly no breeze present that could exert that amount of force, and the chill I was experiencing was not the normal environmental kind, nor was it in any way cold enough that morning for me to be experiencing a normal chill. Now, I'm not a person who likes to have a sleep interfered with, nor do I particularly like to have my plants of any kind thwarted. Besides, all of my reading and conversations regarding the supernatural and hauntings have always indicated that you have to assert your rights to control your domain when challenged by spirits. With this in mind, I grabbed up a heavy, approximately 12 pound Thor hammer I had cast from aluminum years before in shop class and placed the head of it underneath the door, with the handle sticking up between the door and the doorway. Stepping back, I then witnessed the door drag this heavy hammer approximately 12 pounds, across the floor the same way I had my boot, until again, the door was as far shut as it could be without actually removing the hammer from underneath it. At that point, becoming somewhat angry, I took the hammer out from underneath the door, placed the door into a two-thirds closed position, slightly more open than I really wanted, and waited. Within seconds, the door started to shut again. At this point, I pointed at the door and said loudly and firmly, no. The door stopped moving and stayed perfectly still. I stood there for a few moments longer watching the door and it did not move again. I then said thank you and went on to bed. I think it's important for people to understand that in most cases of encountering a spirit in your home, you simply have to assert your right to be the master of your home. I can't promise that it will always be the complete answer in all cases, but I believe it to be the best way to begin with dealing with a disagreement with a spirit in your home. Many years ago, my family and I lived in a lovely Queen Anne style home. We lived in it for 13 years, 11 of which we experienced paranormal phenomena. Two years after we moved in, we had our first of many odd occurrences. My daughter was in the kitchen and I was upstairs when I heard her call out that the upstairs toilet must have overflowed because water was running down the outside of the staircase. I ran to the top of the stairs in bare feet only to feel water on the surface of the carpeting. I looked over the top of the railing to assure that the toilet hadn't overflowed, and that was when I felt the wetness on my feet, but there were no water pipes in that part of the house. When I got down the stairs, I found water running in rivulets down the wood and molding. My daughter reached up to turn on the light under the stairway alcove, and as soon as she did, the water stopped. We had to wipe the trom down, and we never found any reason for that activity. Months later, while preparing for bed one night, I heard footsteps running down the attic stairs. The door crashed against the opposite wall, and then nothing. I was terrified thinking that someone was there. They would have to pass my room to get downstairs, but nothing happened. When we finally went to look, the door was against the wall. We even thought that maybe a ball had bounced down the stairs, sounding like footsteps, but there was nothing. Strangely. When we started to think our house had unseen guests, we were no longer frightened. As time passed, we had many more experiences. I heard a woman crying softly but pitifully. Two of my daughters saw images of old-fashioned children dressed in long white nightgowns and mob caps. A visitor to my house saw the same thing and asked me who the little girl was. On another occasion, my nephew was spending the night and thought he saw me standing at the top of the stairs in a long white old-fashioned nightgown and then supposedly, I went down the stairs and didn't come back. My nephew was 16 at the time, and we hadn't told him about the house. My husband thought we were all crazy because he didn't believe in this sort of thing. My daughter came home late one night and was just lying in bed, going over her evening, and looked up to see a male figure suspended over the bed, and as she watched the image dissolve from the bottom up, as if it were sand falling. There were other things that happened there, although nothing dangerous, and finally, we sold the house and moved on. It was several years after we moved from the house, 
that we met a family had lived there years before we did and had very similar things happen to them. But they said their experiences were very frightening and mean-spirited. I sometimes think our guests moved in with us because from time to time, we still get very strange sensations in our present Victorian home. This is my own personal ghost story. This happened when I was about 12 years old, so keep in mind that 12 years have passed, but as long as I live, I will never forget the details. Here goes. I was spending the night with a good friend of mine, in a house that was extremely haunted. Stephanie lived in one of those houses that just seemed to be the epicenter of paranormal activity. Her aunt walked the basement steps, an unknown spirit lived in the attic, and there was a tree out back that just looking at it scared me to death. I'm really not entirely sure why the tree scared me so much, but it rocked me to the bone. It was large and had an ominous presence. Stephanie called it the witch tree, but really had no actual reason for doing so. But nevertheless, the tree is not my focus in the story. It just gives a little background information. We went to sleep that night, and about 2 a.m., I woke up with a start. I thought it was just because Steph and I had talked about ghost stories until we fell asleep, but then I had the feeling that I was being watched. I looked up and saw this large pair of blue eyes hovering over me. I know this sounds silly, but I'm dead serious. They just kept watching me. Maybe watching me is not the right word. They kept glaring at me, and all I could sense was evil. I felt so cold, and I couldn't wake Stephanie up. I thought I might have been dreaming, so I closed my eyes and laid there. But I looked up every few minutes and the eyes were still there. I had no clue what to do to make them go away, so I just started praying to God, something I saw in a movie, and never opened my eyes that night again. I woke up in the morning and told Stephanie about them. She had never seen them before, but didn't doubt me. She of all people knew the history of her house. I went on with life as normal. Forgetting about the eyes until about two months later, Stephanie came to me and said she talked with her little brother Aaron, who was eight. She said she didn't even mention the eyes to him, but one night, they were talking about the house and he asked her if he had ever seen a large pair of blue eyes. She stopped dead in her tracks. Aaron said that to him the eyes were friendly and never glared at him. We just figured out that they saw me as a stranger and focused evil on me. I will never know for certain. All I know is that I never stayed in that house again. In addition to that story, my sister and I were out driving about 9 months ago. It was about 11pm and we passed by Stephanie's old house. She no longer lived there, but I'm pretty sure that her father still did. I turned to Lauren, my sister, and said, Look, La, there's that creepy house. Now, this next part will sound so bizarre, but I swear it is true. All of a sudden, a light shot up from the house, which was completely dark, and two other lights shot up from the other side of the road. We thought they might just be electrical charges. That was, of course, until they started chasing the car. We had to get the mail down the road until they disappeared. Do you have any idea what those lights might have been? Thank you for listening to my stories. Back in 1996... My Uncle Wayne passed away in a tragic auto accident on the interstate near Nina, Wisconsin, between Appleton and Oshkosh. He had been pulling a load of sod with a small pickup truck that he borrowed from a coworker. The truck must have been too small to carry the load because the truck flip killed my uncle instantly. Needless to say, my father flew out to Wisconsin from our home in Pensacola, Florida to attend the funeral of my youngest brother. My father is the oldest of seven children. The story I'm about to tell comes from the mouth of my father. The afternoon before the day of the funeral, my father took his mother and father to the funeral parlor to finalize their arrangements. On the way back to my grandparents' home, my grandmother noticed that her family ring was missing a stone. The stone that was missing was my uncle Wayne's birthstone. They looked everywhere for the stone and could not find it. Everyone kept saying it was Wayne's way of saying a final goodbye to his mother. The next day, the day of the funeral, everyone left my grandparents' house to go to the funeral, except my uncle Stan. Stan stayed behind to wait for that cousin that was running late. A few minutes later, 
Stan heard a car pull into the driveway. At the bottom of the driveway was a car that looked exactly like Wayne's, a green Spitfire. My uncle Stan thought how strange it was that their cousin had a car exactly like Wayne's. His car was still parked outside his old apartment at the time. He looked out the window again and saw a man sitting in the driver's seat with a beard. My Uncle Wayne had a beard when he died. My Uncle Stan opened the door to walk outside, thinking it was their cousin, who also has a beard. When he opened the door, the car reversed out of the driveway and quickly drove away. A few minutes later, their cousins pulled up in a totally different car. My Uncle Stan was so shocked that he told everyone at the funeral about what happened. Since this time, no one else had been visited by my Uncle Wayne. A year ago, we bought an old Victorian house. The family matriarch had refused to let it be sold, although it was in a dismal condition. When she passed away, the family decided to sell, although it had been with them for 80 years. We began the serious process of renovation but I was disturbed by the obvious presence of an old woman, dressed in pink, always in the same place, in the same room. I naturally assumed it was the family matriarch, Sophia. She was so unhappy and seemed displeased at the disturbance we were causing, so I called in a psychic friend of mine to help her move along. The psychic rang bells, chanted, burned, and we put lit candles in all the doorways and windows the very next day. It appeared that Sophia had gracefully moved on. A year passed. We finished a renovation and were preparing to throw an open house party. The day before the party, a woman came into the house and announced that she had grown up there. She said she had been coming by to check on her progress, but had always been shy to come in. Something had drawn her courage up to come in on that day. We were very pleased and immediately invited her and her family to come to the open house the very next day. They all came. At one point, I couldn't resist, and I asked this woman if there had ever been ghosts in the house. Oh yes, she replied. My great-grandmother was so persistent, we had to call in a priest to exercise her. Feeling confident, I then told her about Sophia. The woman began to tremble and cry. She said that her mother, Sophia, had always worn pink, and the room and place I described would have been between the beds and the children's room. Rest in peace, Sophia. Years ago, before I was born, my father was sleeping at the head of the bed, I believe, and my mother was at the foot by the window as there was no air conditioning and the light was out, room dark. Well, my mother said all of a sudden, she heard what she believed to be a woman at the head of the bed, jabbering away, could not understand her at all. My mother got terrified and pulled the cover up over her head, and when she did, this thing came right by her ear and just talked. She was unable to make out what the thing was saying. She jumped up and yelled and slept for a week with the ceiling light on. She asked, and someone told her that they believed the house we used to live in had been moved from another location. Another true story. My mom used to walk me to grade school, about six blocks from the house, and she lost her house keys one day. Well, she traced her steps, even looked by the mailbox at the corner of her house, thinking that she laid them there. No keys. We lived upstairs, 16 feet up, and my dad was in front of the bedroom, and my mom was in my room, laying next to me, and the strangest thing happened. All of a sudden, I had the most peaceful feeling. This is a feeling that's kind of hard to explain, but I'll do my best. So, someone I don't know, it could have been an angel or a dead relative, who knows, but it was right next to the bed on my side and said my name. I was not scared at all, but my mom heard it too and jumped up. I had so many questions such as who are you, what are you doing, and how do you know me? But at the moment, the phone rang. And Sandy, who lived around the corner, was walking home from church on a Sunday and said, I found your keys. They were by the mailbox. I know this writing is all over the place, and I'm so sorry if this was hard to understand, but I think you guys got the gist of it. These things I can't explain are occurrences of the afterlife, in my opinion. I've had many experiences with the paranormal in my life. 
The first time that I can recall ever having a ghostly encounter was when I was living with my aunt and uncle in Warrington, North Carolina. I was home alone and doing my homework at the kitchen table when my golden retriever started to act a little funny. He kept jumping in front of me and growling at the back door. It was a glass sliding door leading outside to the deck. I got up because I thought that maybe he wanted to go outside, but instead, I saw the transparent head of an Indian just moving across the deck. We were living in a trailer about five feet off the ground, so I believe it must have been walking on the ground beneath the trailer. I screamed and jumped onto one of those freestanding freezers that we kept in the kitchen. When my mom remarried, she moved my younger brother, my younger sister and I, all the way to Cape May, New Jersey. That's when things got weird. We were living in an apartment above a hardware store while we waited for our stepfather to get us a bigger place. My sister, stepsister, and I stayed in the same room while my brother took the living room. Every night, we could hear the sounds of a person wearing heavy boots walking on the ceiling. What got us scared was that we were as high as the building went and there wasn't even an attic above us. Another time our parents were out and we were all in the living room watching TV when we heard the sounds of someone running from the front door to a computer chair in the corner. The chair spun around and it sounded like someone jumped off of it and ran into the kitchen. The kitchen light turned off, then everything was quiet. We all kind of looked at each other, then ran into our room screaming. We all slept on the same bed that night. Things got worse when we moved. We were in the same neighborhood, just a bigger house. My mom began to experience things in the new house as well. My stepsister had a history of talking on the phone in the middle of the night. And one night, my mom swore that she heard the phone being dialed. She called for my stepsister to go to sleep, but she got no answer. So she went to her bedroom and saw that she was asleep. When she went to find out where the dialing was coming from, the phone was thrown at her from the living room. I would always hear my mom calling me, and she said that she wasn't. Sometimes I like to think that I saw my brother run into another room. But he wouldn't even be there. When my baby brother was born, it was as if he could see things that nobody else could. Sometimes he would follow things with his eyes and laugh until whatever it was went towards the basement door. Then he'd cry as if someone was hurting him. Sometimes we'd see and hear people in my brother's room and then they'd look at us and vanish. My mom wanted to move. So we ended up moving a half an hour away from that house. First thing that happened to me in that house was after my baby sister was born. Now there were eight people in my family. I was babysitting her one night and was changing her diaper in our very cramped bathroom. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my brother enter the bathroom and I could feel him standing behind me. When I turned to tell him to get out, Nobody was there. I thought it was strange, but didn't really think much of it. I accidentally dropped the diaper onto the floor, and when I bent down to pick it up, I saw my brother's feet and legs. I jumped back, but nothing was there. I grabbed the naked baby and ran out. Then one day, I stayed after school for a party with my club. I was talking with my teacher. Then I wandered off with my friends. About five minutes later, she came to me and asked where I went. She said that she asked me to go and get food from the back and that I had followed her in there. But when she turned to hand me the food, I wouldn't take it. Then when she turned around again, I was gone. She didn't see me leave, even though the door was right in front of her. I thought it was probably a different girl because I had been with my friends the whole entire time. After the party, my friend had to use the bathroom, so I went with her. When she was done, we both stood and fixed ourselves in front of the mirrors. A girl walked in and went into the stall behind me. We were going to leave, 
but I had to spit my gum out. So I pushed open the stall behind me. It jumped back and said sorry because the other girl was supposed to be in there. Nobody was there. She couldn't have left because she would have to pass both me and my friend to leave. My friend looked at me and I knew that I wasn't going crazy. I realized when I was very young, I could see things that no one else could. It all started when a friend of mine was killed during a tornado. We were about five years old, and after the storm, he and his sister appeared in my bedroom. Over the years I saw them very often, and just thought it was because I saw the tornado carry them away. But later, I discovered that was not the case. When I was 12, my family moved into an apartment complex. We had a two-story apartment that at first seemed pretty normal. One night, I had a dream in which I kept being told to look in the attic. The problem was, was that the attic only had openings in the even apartments. Ours was an odd number. A short while later, I started hearing footsteps, but no one was there. One night, I followed the sound of footsteps down the stairs and into the living room. There I found an elderly lady rocking in a chair. She just walked away and disappeared. I became so used to her appearances and it never bothered me. A few years later we moved in with our great grandmother and grandmother. There was a nice area of woods behind their house where we used to hike. My great grandmother used to tell me stories of a hunter who went into these woods and ended up never coming out. As kids, we used to laugh it off as a myth. One summer's day, we went hiking with some of our friends. Once we got into the woods, I had this feeling as if something was following us. It was a scary feeling, not like any encounter I ever had. After climbing a cliff, we were walking around when something ripped my bracelet off my wrist. At this point, I convinced everyone it was time to go home. We got lost in a new trail we discovered and came across a man dressed in a white shirt and what looked to be purple pants who appeared to be building a fire. Upon later discussion, we discovered that he fit my great grandmother's description of the man who never came out of the woods. While this scared everyone else, I kind of knew he was just stranded. For many years, I experienced many strange events. Something would move items and then put them back, or appear before I was outside. I became used to it. It happened all my life, but in 1995, my husband and I moved into a house in London, Kentucky. This house seemed normal at first, but after a few months, we began hearing footsteps throughout the house. Then a shadow chased my sister up the stairs from the basement. It seemed to be just because it was an old house. Until one morning, someone said hello to me. I was the only one awake. Everyone said I was hearing things. Until one night, we left town to visit family and left our roommate home alone. As night fell, it began to storm. When the storm knocked out the power, our roommate began hearing footsteps. Then she heard someone say hello and ask where I was. At this point she left. The next morning, I called to check on her and someone or something picked up the phone and laid it down. I could hear voices talking, but when we got there, the house was empty. The phone was laying in the floor off the hook and our roommate arrived home shortly after us. Her aunt told us that she had been with her all night. A few months later we moved out and never heard anything from the new residents about hearing things. The strange thing was, a few years later, my daughter started talking to people who no one else could see. Apparently, it's a family thing. I would like to tell you some of my personal experiences with the paranormal. When I was about 10 years of age, 
were living in Trinity Springs, Indiana. I lived with three other sisters and our mother, Will, our mother, decided to go for a walk to a friend's house that was about five miles, give or take a few miles. To kids, it seemed to be a long ways from home. On the way, we had passed the cemetery. It always gave us the creeps to walk near and we would run past it. To keep the creepy feelings down, mother would always get mad at us for doing it. When we arrived home, the door was standing wide open. Mother told us to stay outside, just in case someone was in the house. We did as we were told, and I watched the doorway in case the police needed to be called. After about 10 to 15 minutes, we all went in, ate supper, and went to bed. It was about midnight when something pulled down on the edge of the bed. I thought it was our dog wanting up under the covers with us. I stuck my foot down there to help her up. When I did, a hand grabbed my left foot. I pulled my foot back quick. Before I knew it, my foot began burning like it was on fire. Then the hand rushed up my sister's leg, searching for my foot. And of course I screamed. Mother came running into the room, wondering what was wrong. I told her, and all she said was, You just had a bad dream, so go back to sleep. She went back to bed. I jumped from our bed, all the way into the hallway. I was not willing to put my foot on the floor next to the bed. When I returned to the bedroom, I looked under the bed, to see what was under there, and see nothing there. Soon as mother was asleep, we jumped up and grabbed something to try and protect ourselves somehow. Soon as we went to sleep, this person would grab, hit, or punch us. When daylight broke, it quit, and we got a little sleep before mother would wake us up for breakfast. When we walked into the kitchen, our mother asked us how Diana got the bruise on her arm. We told her, and she blamed us for fighting. My sisters and I told her neighbor about the experience. She told us about a home that stood in the same place that had burned down with three children inside, while their parents had went to town to a bar. The eldest child tried to keep the fire going because the house was getting cold. When she was putting wood into the wood stove, a piece of coal had fallen onto the floor. She hid under the bed. She thought that her parents would get mad at her for what she had done. All the children had passed away in the fire. Here's one more. When my grandmother was still around, she lived in a house that was haunted by grandfather. He had passed away in 1959, when my mother was five years of age, from black lung, because he was a coal miner. At night, you could hear him walk down to the basement and back up the steps. If he had seen that you had no covers on, he would cover you up to keep you warm and safe. My friend, his girlfriend and myself were all sitting around watching a scary movie one night in his apartment. After the movie, we discussed supernatural things we had experienced before. Both my friend and his girlfriend said that even if the ghost of a family member appeared to them and meant no harm, they would still be horrified at the sight of it. I, on the other hand, had said that I wouldn't be because I've had experiences as a child and that I wasn't afraid of them. As to whether or not there were ghosts of past family members is not known to me. I was too young to remember details. I stayed a night at his apartment a few nights later. While I was laying on the couch, my friend came out from the bathroom, walked through the hallway, which is mostly visible from where he slept on the couch and into his room. After he shut his door, it was almost completely dark. As I rolled over and faced the hallway, I saw a faint white figure of a woman from the middle of her torso on up. Her hair was short and black and she had broad shoulders. As to whether or not she was in fact a female isn't for sure. I just got the distance feeling that what I saw was female. It stayed floating in the hallway, facing me, for a few minutes, before ultimately fading. 
Now honestly, I was slightly freaked out, but I didn't feel threatened. I rolled over and tried to go to sleep. A period of time that seemed like a few hours had passed, and I'd finally gotten into the half-conscious state of sleep. Slowly, I started to develop a strange feeling on my right shoulder and back. I was facing the back of the couch with my back to the hallway. I heard a calm woman's voice say, How are you feeling? And I responded immediately, I'm very tired, please let me sleep. Movement from my mouth jolted me from my sleep, and the feeling on my shoulder and back had disappeared. The next day I told my friend about what I experienced. He bursted into tears as I finished the story. To my surprise, the night was the anniversary of his mother's death. After discussing it with my friends, I wonder if it was in fact his mother. Then why would she appear and speak to me and not him? They suggested that the fact that I was not afraid of the paranormal, and that I had admitted it a few nights ago, was why she came to me. This was about a month ago. Since then, strange sounds and odd visions are seen in his apartment occasionally. The slight sound of egg shakers are heard moving around the living room. I've heard it pass right over my head before, and circle around in the kitchen. Santa Cruz, California, the Red Room Restaurant. This is the site of the old Santa Cruz Hotel. This is an old house, now converted into a restaurant and lounge. I had the experience there back in August 2007. I went to use the women's restroom. I went into the first stall and noticed that the toilet paper cover was opened. So I went to the next stall and noticed the same thing. So when I went back to the first stall, I closed the door. I heard footsteps, as if someone had entered the bathroom. The footsteps got louder, and it almost seemed as if someone was pacing back and forth, in front of my stall. I looked under the door, and realized there was no one else in the restroom, other than myself. Being the logical person I am, I thought maybe it was someone walking upstairs, not even realizing there was no upstairs. Upstairs would be the roof. That's when I looked back down again and noticed the fog moved past. As I was ready to open the door to my stall, I could almost feel a presence, as if someone was standing right in front of me. I couldn't see anyone, but I felt someone there, very close. I left and went back to join my part for a dinner and never said anything about it. The waitress, who was very chatty, started talking about the restaurant and the history behind it. It was an old brothel house in the 1800s. She then revealed that there was a ghost there. She said it was a ghost of a young prostitute who was very unhappy and decided to hang himself in the back room, which was now the women's restroom. I almost fell out of my chair I just couldn't even believe it. The waitress claims that it's a friendly ghost and that she likes to mess around with people. She also claims that the ghost constantly opens toilet paper covers and they're always having to close them. Hence, why the covers were open when I went to the stalls. I quickly told the waitress and the rest of my party what I experienced. The waitress believed me, but the rest of my party thought I was nuts. If people want to go there and experience it themselves, they should go in alone. She won't show herself to groups. I've always had weird experiences in my life that many people have never had or do not believe. The scariest one occurred when I was 12 years old. It was the spring of 1986. We lived in an old neighborhood in some cottage type houses. One day I was home alone shortly after school, doing my homework, when suddenly I heard a man breathing very loud and deep. It sounded like he was struggling for air. I was in my room, and the restroom was across the hallway from the room, and that's where the sound was coming from. I immediately turned off the square electrical fan that I had on 
thinking maybe it was malfunctioning. As soon as I turned it off, the heavy breathing got louder. There were no open windows, so it wasn't coming from the outside. I became very scared because I knew I was the only one at home and there was certainly someone breathing very loud right outside my room. I ran out of the house as fast as I could and waited outside until my parents got home from work. My brother and sister were due to arrive as well. When my mom returned. I told her what I heard and she totally believed me. She said that when we were into the house, they were told that a man was stabbed to death in the house. Could it have been his echo of his last moments? Guess we'll never know for sure. My name is John, and I've been a Civil War reenactor for about four years now, attending living history events and reenactments throughout the mid Atlantic states. I'd like to tell you about an experience that my reenacting group had at Antietam National Battlefield, Maryland. My company, Company G, 96 Pennsylvania Volunteers, annually has a living history event of this famed Civil War battlefield. It was here that in September of 1862, one day's casualties amounted to 23,000. More killed, wounded, or missing in one day than the casualties in America's previous wars combined. At one point during the battle, one American was injured with every second tick by. I'd like to note that this was the ground upon which we were camping on. To continue my story, we traditionally take a walk into the battlefield to a small lane known as the Sunken Road. Here, Confederates hunkered down in a road that had been worn down by years of wagon travel, holding off wave after wave of heroic Union soldiers advancing upon them. Eventually, the Union forces swarmed over the Confederates' right flank and fired into the rebels from down the road, driving them off. This is where we annually took a midnight tour, hoping to catch a glimpse of energy left from 1862. Please note that even though the park closes around 10 p.m., the rangers often allow us reenactors to walk around. This is because if we found anyone defacing a monument or even shifting a pebble, that person will be praying for a ranger to come by and save him. So this night, about a dozen of us strolled down the sunken road and eventually came upon a monument located in about the center of the lane's length. We sat down along the banks of the road to relax and take in the atmosphere. About 20 minutes passed with silence and a few pictures taken here and there of us around the monument. Soon, four of us, myself included, chose to walk the remaining distance of the road to an observation tower, climb it, take a few snapshots, then head back. So we decided to walk down to the tower, ascend a few flights of stairs, and took a look around. Meanwhile back at the monument, our captain decided that everyone had better get back to camp, so he sent two men to go retrieve us from the tower. No sooner had those two began to walk down the road, when the remaining few men heard shoes and heel plates, Horseshoe-like plates were wear on our leather shoes, on the gravel, and earth down the road. First two pair, then four pair, then six, and so on. Equipment could be heard rustling around on the body. Knapsacks, canteens, cartridge boxes. If anyone knows what it sounds like to have men marching on a dirty road with full gear on, it's us. The sounds continually crescendoed until one man sat up looked down the road, and stirred the other men to listen. Just as they began to sit up and peer into the darkness down the road, the sounds faded away just as quickly as they came in. Another man jumped up, went down the road and looked over the fences and banks, only to find weeds and small shrubs. He figured that if this was some sort of ghost regiment, it may have followed those two men who had began to walk down the road to the tower to fetch us. I also had another story I experienced firsthand during a sleepless night in an old gun mill. We also used to have an annual event at Jacobsburg State Park, Pennsylvania. On the land is the Henry Homestead, including a mansion and a house whose basement was the gun mill. The house now is a museum to the Henrys, and the mill below it is open to see the machinery and processes of old time gun making. 
The history of the homestead dates back to the Flintlocks. Our event took place very near the homestead, and since it was going to be extremely chilly that night, the caretakers were kind enough to allow us to sleep in the house that night. Little did I know about the death that occurred in the house long ago. A young girl had contracted a contagious disease, one of those terrible, yet common, diseases of the old days. She had died, and since it was thought that her illness could be contracted even though she was dead, the viewing of her body was not a traditional one. Her body was placed on a large windowsill inside the house, of a window outlet that protruded onto the front porch. This way, the viewers could stay out on the front porch and peer in through the windows to see her on the windowsill. Of course, nowadays, ghost stories fill the house, so now it's time to go to bed. You could say, more like hit the hardwood floor. Of course, the lucky guy I am. I got a spot directly to the large window and the windowsill. I laid there half the night, listening to each hour tick away on the clock in the next room. Eventually, I had enough, so I moved to a spot further away from the sill. I laid there for some time and then heard something. The noise was coming from. It sounded like the downstairs. The best description I can give is that it sounded like an older lady mourning or crying, possibly over the recent death of her daughter. It was not the house settling or creaking, as it continued for what seemed like years. Okay, well maybe a few minutes. My house also creaks a lot, and it sounded like nothing I had ever heard before. Scared out of my wits, I frantically tapped on the leg of my first sergeant, laying just a few feet away from me. He awoke, and I told him to listen. He heard the sound too, but not even wanting to ponder over it, he nervously said, wonder what that was, and quickly laid back down. The sound soon died off, no pun intended. Sleep was pretty much out of the question now, so I laid there another hour or so until I heard something else. This one is easy to describe. Imagine being outside, and two other people are far away from you having a conversation. You can make out murmurs, in tones and voice, but not individual words. Almost like being underwater, and someone is talking above surface. That's what I heard. Only it seemed to be between a lady and a child. Probably a young boy. Again, the sounds came from below the floor in the basement. These didn't last as long, possibly because God answered my prayers for them to stop. That night, I heard every single hour chime by, and every minute crawl past, every second tick by on the clock. Needless to say, the next morning, I wasn't a happy camper. Hope you enjoyed my stories, and yes, they're true. I told them just as I know them. Have a good one. I was in an infantry company in Germany back in 1989 to 1991. We used what is called a Bradley fighting vehicle. It weighs about 51,000 pounds and looks like a tank. We were doing live fire exercises at night and we finished about 2 a.m. I was driving a Bradley in a convoy of about 10 other Bradleys, returning to the motor pool. The drivers used a large night vision scopes to see by. It's like watching green TV, and the Bradley commanders use that one that attaches to their helmets. While driving, a commander is to stand on his seat so that half of his body is outside of the vehicle so that he'll have a better view of the surroundings. At about 3 a.m., I saw a man standing by the dirt road we were traveling on. I figured he was one of the German range patrolmen and that he was just waiting for us to pass. Right after the Bradley in front of me passed, this man walked right out into the dust of that Bradley. I hit the brakes to avoid hitting him. At the exact moment, my commander said watch out, but it was already too late. I knew I must have hit him. I didn't even see him come out on either side. My commander then asked me if I'd seen a man walk out in front of us too. I said yes, and then he said that he had too. 
But when he turned around to check for a body, there wasn't one anywhere on the road. This dirt road was about 50 feet across. And when we returned to the motor pool, we took a flashlight and checked the whole front end and found nothing. No blood. No piece of clothing. There was nothing. My name is Heather, and I live in Omaha, Nebraska. I've only seen a few ghosts or spirits in my life. Sometimes I do get the chills though, like someone or something is nearby. The first spirit I saw was when I was younger, about 13 years. My mother told me to go into our basement to get some candles, which wasn't unusual. We spent a lot of time in the basement, playing slot cars and electric trains, and my dad has a workshop down there for models. As I fetched the candles, I felt watched. I scampered back upstairs, startled and panicked, and told myself not to be so silly. I give mom the candles. I don't remember why she needed them, and felt the nagging, watching feeling again. I opened the basement door, and a round, green-white light was bobbing slowly up the steps, I think about three to four feet off of the ground. I grabbed my jacket and ran outside to my grandma's house down the hill. I never saw it again, whatever it was, and everyone laughed at me for it, but I remember it clearly. It was green and glowing with a soft white light. Mom laughed and said it must have been a glow-in-the-dark Halloween candy bucket from the size and color, but she couldn't explain how it was floating. My house is quite old, about 80 years and nothing like this has ever happened again. We're the third family living there, and nothing violent ever goes on. I still get the odd feeling, but it's never been strong enough to make me panic again. The second spirit I saw really floored me. I was 14, and was riding my bike around town, since it was a nice summer day, and I ended up on 2nd and 22 in queue, about 3 miles from my house. There's nothing there but cheap houses, and it's not a bad neighborhood, but it's not the richest in the world, but it's not a cheap, run-down area. Just relax, second-hand. Nothing violent ever happened there before. It's become a run-down area now, and there was no graveyard, or ancient Indian burial ground, or anything that I, or anyone else knows of. I wanted to go to Dairy Queen on 24th and Q and I was behind it. As I came to 22nd, I saw a flat field where I knew there should be houses. It was filled with what I can now describe as short, rectangular tombstones. I saw a woman standing there, dressed all in browns and earth tones. I couldn't even see her face or hands. She had a headscarf on, and her hands were held in front of her, covered by her sleeves. I think she had on brown shoes but I don't really remember her having feet or not. I'm inclined to think not. I asked her what this was, but she didn't answer. I turned back to the graves, which had vanished, and replaced with the things that should have been there. Streets, houses, sidewalks, trees. I turned back to the lady, and she was gone. I had a very chilly, uneasy feeling, and a few dead leaves fluttered by. I rode away, as fast as I could. I once saw a strange figure in the mirror, a girl my age, 13, but with dark brown hair, with thin bangs, and braids past the bottom of the mirror frame. She just startled me, but caused me no harm. The last one I saw left me breathless and thrilled. I was staring out the window to our front window, when I thought I saw something in the clouds. It couldn't have been lightning, because it wasn't fast enough. It resembled very slow lightning. It was white and long, and crooked. I got up and tried to stare out by the light. It was at a bad angle, so I stood up and walked to the front door. As I peered out the glass, I saw a flash of lightning and a giant pair of silverly white eyes, rimmed with blue, which then vanished in a flush. The outside of the window was covered with condensation, like breath, which smelled really sweet, like milk. I wiped it away. I've come to the conclusion 
that the first three were just random encounters, but the last one was a kind spirit, one that was looking in on me. I haven't seen anything so clearly after age 15, but sometimes I see holes in my vision, weird things. After rubbing my eyes and refocusing, they're gone. And sometimes, I can hear odd noises and voices no one else can. I don't think I'm psychic or anything, but I do think I'm a little more sensitive than the people around me. I know, you may not believe this, but it happened. It's true. Thank you. When I was around five or six years old, I remember seeing a figure of a woman standing outside of my room. The living room was the next room from mine. I always thought it was just light coming from outside the windows in the living room, but when I went up to the light fixture and tried blocking the light with my hand, nothing would happen. The light would still be there. I wasn't scared, because I wasn't aware of ghosts when I was around that age, but as I got older, maybe around 9 or 10 years old, I sometimes would sleep in the living room, on the couch, because my room would get really hot in the summer. Well. As I would lie on the couch, getting ready to fall asleep, I would hear things in the kitchen, like the sound of someone placing a glass on the table. I would sometimes go to see if anyone was there, but nothing would be there. I still hear the sounds in the kitchen sometimes, and when I would be home alone, I would sometimes go into the basement and watch TV or exercise. As I would work out or watch TV, I would sometimes hear footsteps above me, seeing how the TV was right below my room. But what happened to me two months ago terrified me. I'm 17 years old now, and it was raining harshly in the middle of April, and I was working on an art project in the dining room, which was the room after the living room. I was home alone at that time. My mother was picking up my sister from work, and my father was working. As I was working on my art project on the table, the lights went out, and as soon as they went out, in front of me, I saw a woman sitting across from me. I couldn't see her clearly, but she seemed to be smiling. About a second later, the lights turned back on. I was so scared, I ran into the kitchen and stayed there until my mother and sister came back. When they finally returned, I told them about what I saw and my sister kind of freaked out because she hates hearing about things like ghosts and other things related to that. My mother told me it was probably just my nerves and I've been working too hard on my project. I believe what I saw was real. I don't know what this ghost lady is doing in my house, but she seems to bring attention to me only. This is just one account from over 40 experiences I've recorded in my ghost journal. It was a very unusual day in Chicago, only four days to the new year, and in the middle of winter, it was 63 degrees. Yet the skies were dark, but there were tons of fluffy clouds. My friend Christine and I decided to enjoy this rare day and go walking around the park. We watched as the clouds seemed to spread across the sky and realized the storm was near. Somehow, the conversation switched to cemeteries. She told me of an old German cemetery that was near the park that she had gone to. They have a section of infant graves from the late 1800s to early 1900s. She knows the babies died in groups around the same times. After hearing this, I wanted to go see for myself. She told me where to go. And as I drove into the cemetery, I pointed to a corner and asked her if that was where they were. She said yes. I would never been there before. I don't know how I knew. We parked on the road, got out, and looked around. Some of the graves were old and worn, the names and dates hardly visible. The baby section was so sad to see, and we figured there must have been a plague of some sort in the area. It was beginning to get dark, even though it was about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. The cemetery closed at 5, so we wanted to hurry and see everything before they closed and before the storm came. We were walking through the cemetery, 
when it felt like the temperature had dropped 20 degrees in a few minutes. I stopped in my tracks and noticed a familiar smell. The scent became stronger and I realized it was roses. I asked my friend if she smelled anything. She said yes. I asked her what she smelled and she said roses. I was bending down the smell of flowers on a grave, which were not roses. I wanted to figure out where the smell suddenly came from. Suddenly, my friend told me to look up, and in the distance was a flower girl. And you guessed it, she was holding on to roses. Both me and my friend were in disbelief. We couldn't even fathom what we were seeing, but yet here was this flower girl holding on to a rose which had a strong perfume smell. Her attire was in a Victorian style dress. She looked absolutely beautiful, but it was also really scary because it was in the middle of a cemetery and we were really spooked. Even though it felt like forever, she momentarily appeared and then she was gone, just like that. It must have been about 15 seconds, if that, but we both saw her and we're not making this up. We're totally sane individuals who actually go out and try to see these things on purpose. I know that sounds crazy to some of you, but we get such thrills about ghost hunting. Anyway, we're not even done with the story yet, because right after, we heard the most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard in my entire life. It was a scream right after she disappeared, and I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. It sounded like a human trying to imitate a wolf, as in, you know, a human howling, but in a wolf style. I know that sounds ridiculous, and maybe it could have been a real human being trying to play with us. However, we did not stick around long enough to find out, and we bolted all the way home. I guess the moral of the story is, yeah, you can be interested in ghosts and whatnot, but even if you are interested, be very wary, and just remember, ghosts can't hurt you. If that was real, I have no idea what to say, but if it was a human being, I guess you gotta stay clear of the cemeteries. I'll tell you what though, the roses, the girl, and the scream, they were all very real to us. We did not hesitate to leave, because we did not know what to expect if we stayed longer there. Just remember to be very careful. Ghosts are crazy, but humans can be just as crazy. This happened to my fiance about 37 years ago in Carn City, Texas. He was about five years old and was attending a church function with his grandparents at the St. Paul Lutheran Church there. He was running around with two of his slightly younger cousins, having a good time. This function was taking place outdoors. Now, there were actually two church buildings there. A new church had been built, and the older wooden structure was still standing close by and being used exclusively for storage. The church had been collecting clothing and had put it in the older building. Anyway, my fiancé and his cousins had been told to stay out of the churches, but being little kids and the adults having their attention taken up with visiting, the boys decided to explore the old church. They went into the older building and looked into the large room where the clothing was piled on three tables. My fiance said the first thing he noticed was the clothing on one of the tables agitating violently and he could see a lady who just happened to be transparent sorting through the clothes that were shaking. All that she remembers of her appearance is that she was a motherly or grandmotherly looking figure with a high neck dress and her hair pulled back in a bun. She did not pay any attention to the three little boys, but they ran out of the room as fast as their feet could carry them. He says that he may have been the only one to see the lady. He thinks the other two boys just saw the clothing shaking on the table. My fiance says that he believes that the only reason the clothes were shaking was because of the ghost. The windows were all closed, there were no fans, and of course, no central cooling system in this old building. And remember that the clothes on the other tables were lying still. They went to tell their grandmother about the situation. Naturally, they got chewed out for being where they weren't supposed to be. 
and we're told that no one was in that building, but they remember it well. This story is one that may or may not scare you. It's more of a mystery to me and my friends. When I was young, me and my cousin were always together in trying to scare each other. It just so happens that there was an old house which my grandfather had built in the early 1900s, which we thought may be haunted. It should be mentioned that I am from a small town in Virginia, and in the early 1900s, it was a pretty isolated town from the rest of the state. My grandfather was a pastor of the local church. Being that the church was very big, and my grandfather's house was, he would have wakes and funerals in his den. The house was very big, and there was plenty of room for people to attend these funerals. Anyway, my cousin and I used to see things through the windows which we could not explain. The house had not been lived in in many years, when we would see these unexplainable lights. They were blue in color, and they seemed to go from window to window when we were looking at them. We finally got the nerve to sneak into the house, which probably wasn't too smart. Anyway, we had to enter through the basement in order for my father not to see us trying to get inside. This was very scary because there was no electricity and we had to try and make it through the dark and up the stairs to the entry of the den. We did this several times and on some occasions we heard and seen strange things and sometimes we didn't. On one occasion we lived in the house and we heard a tapping on the ceiling upstairs as if someone was hitting it with a cane. This was very odd, because my father lived in the house as a child, and said his uncle lived with them, and he had a cane. When he needed something, he would tap on the floor for someone to come and help him. This scared the living daylights out of us, but my cousin was a little more courageous than I, and he persuaded me to go up the stairs. When we got there, he asked whatever it was that we were seeing and hearing to leave us alone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sound stopped and we left the house. My father was a little skeptical about the whole thing, but he felt that there may be some truth in it. He himself now saw a ghostly apparition which he can't explain. This is coming from a man who himself is now a preacher, and I don't think he doubts seeing this at all. I really feel that there is some connection to the noises and sightings with the funerals that were held in the house. There are other occurrences which have happened, but would take a while to tell them all. I've read in other experiences about blue lights being represented with the supernatural. The story may not be that scary to you, but to me and my cousin, we know that there is something paranormal about that house. Myself and a friend recently moved into a house in Belmont, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. The place is about 100 years old, and retains much of the original woodwork, ceramic doorknobs, etc. I even found an old ceramic liquor and med bottle in there. It's a third floor apartment, with an old aluminum speaking tube to the second floor, which leads us to believe this may have been servants' quarters at one time. We never get anything but good vibes from the place, but a few things have happened which make me wonder, and I write asking your opinion. Firstly, the former tenant was an elderly alcoholic, who, according to the landlord, used to heat only one room in the house, the dining room, with a space heater. She kept the whole place closed up, according to Miss Richardson, who also tells us the former tenants didn't die, but moved to a nursing home. We aren't sure if we believe her. Well, that room seems to have a door problem. Often when I return from work, all three doors to the room will be slammed shut, even the one which is tied open with a string. These are doors which don't close easily, being old and paint covered and wrapped a bit. While we hang out, sometimes doors slam. It happens in fits and starts. One week could happen every day, but it hasn't happened for a while. Granted there is a breeze in that room, but the manner in which it happens strikes one as odd sometimes. Also, we have both seen a white figure in a long dress, and perhaps a veil, always in the hallway into our place or in the doorway of the dining room. It is a peripheral vision thing, which leaves one looked at directly. I've seen it standing in the door several times, and I saw it seemingly walk down the hall once. 
It kind of bounced up and down like a person would were they walking. Mike tells me he usually sees it moving past the door, either coming into or exiting the apartment, and he has used the words wedding dress to describe its clothing. I didn't get that detail to look, but I've definitely seen the shape. Visitors have seen a similar shape, but hesitate to call it a ghost. Lastly, and this is not so much an experience as a creepy coincidence, when first repainting the place, we decided to do the kitchen in blue and white. I propose that we paint only the panels and the kitchen doors blue. We haven't done this yet, which both of us thought was a good idea. Later, when exploring the basement for the first time, I found an ancient door of the same style as our other doors, removed from the hinges, and brought downstairs years before. It seems to be the one door from our apartment, which has been taken off the hinges, the kitchen door, and the panels painted years ago in cracked blue paints. Yesterday, my husband and I toured the Whaley House in San Diego. I think I may have been present to a supernatural occurrence of sorts, but I wanted to ask you about it. Initially, I started out on the first floor, not part of the tour, and I felt a markedly weird sensation in front of the dining area that I can only describe as having a sinking feeling that bordered on nausea. I felt fine walking around Old Town and coming into the house. I hung out in the dining room area for like 10 minutes, thinking what I was feeling was so unusual, and it dissipated. I felt fine again, so I looked around the rest of the house and felt okay, until I came to the first upstairs bedroom, directly right of the stairs. I again felt that same feeling, and I stood there, just looking about the room, and that is when I think I saw something in one of the mirrors, the mirror closest to the hall. It looked as though thin white smoke was being reflected into the mirror, as though someone was standing next to the mirror with a lit cigarette. I can only describe what I saw as smoke, because it curled. I also smelled a very faint smell of cologne, that reminded me of violet water. I made sure it was not me, since I was the only person in that area and it wasn't. It seemed to blow in through the saddled wooden partition. I was a little weirded out, because I was in disbelief at what I thought to be witnessing, so I called to my husband downstairs to come up. I didn't want to cause a stir, because I was unsure what this was. I even saw the presence of a shadow behind my back, in the corner of my eye. I walked back to the area in front of the room, and looked back into the mirror to make sure that it wasn't a reflection of something outside, like a passing vehicle, but I no longer saw the smoke. I really didn't want to tell anyone about the incident, because I would have winded up scaring everybody, including myself. I've been thinking about it ever since, and been trying to find a logical explanation for it. I've always been very interested in the subjects of ghosts and the paranormal, but never thought I would have a direct experience with them. Although I'm currently part of a theater group that is renovating an old theater, and we definitely have some spectral energy in the place, but that's another story. This story is about the first time I had something strange happen to me. I'm originally from a small island off the coast of Italy. The community dates back to 700 BC so you can imagine they have their fair share of ghost stories. I was 15 and staying at my aunt's house with my sister. Our grandmother had died three years before, and as part of our week-long stay, we went to visit her grave. The experience was unsettling to say the least, and I think I was most affected emotionally by the visit. Trying to remember a woman who I love very much now, reduced to nothing but a picture and writing on marble mausoleum. Although it was a very hot and humid summer day, the cemetery seemed to have an unsettling chill about it, and I couldn't wait to get out of there. However, anyone who is Italian or knows of Italian cemetery visits is that they are family events that take a long time. Feeling very sentimental and depressed, and somewhat bored, I couldn't help but look around and read more gravesites. With each name and picture that I saw, I thought more about the people behind them, their lives, and who they have been. The atmosphere seemed more oppressive, 
and I started seeing flashes out of the corner of my eyes. Nothing definite, but it was almost as if something had passed in front of me very quickly, and the experience left me somewhat disturbed. We left not long after, much to my relief, but still with this heavy, depressed feeling. Later on that night, I had fallen into a deep sleep, but was awakened at 3 in the morning by a male and female voice arguing. I was very groggy, but I immediately thought the voices were strange because they didn't sound like they were coming from anywhere, in particular at least. They sounded as if they were right in my ears. The room I shared with my sister was directly over a busy main street, and being a summer resort, there is always some activity going on. However, the street this night was totally quiet, with no one in sight. The voices continued to argue in Italian, and though I spoke it, I couldn't make out what they were saying. Also, the intensity of the voices didn't change as I moved around the room. They always seemed to be in my ears, and were continuing to grow in intensity. At this point, I thought it was my cousin and her husband who were arguing from their bedroom. They shared the room with their two small children, and I thought what could be so important to be arguing at this hour of night, and why weren't their children reacting? I decided to investigate. As I slowly opened the door, the voices suddenly stopped. Not a cut-off in conversation, or a conclusion, but as if someone had switched off a radio. I walked to the room, and found the whole family sound asleep. I returned to the room dumbfounded but found the room was very cold. The day had been extremely hot, and the night had not let up, and I was just in the room a minute before. But I knew the temperature had gone down at least 10 degrees. It was then I felt the same heaviness that I had experienced at the cemetery, and a large chill moved right through me. Almost immediately, the room returned to its original temperature. During this whole experience, my sister was asleep next to me, when I asked her about hearing anything during the night, she thought it was crazy. To this day, I'm not sure what I heard and felt that night. However, I spent many nights in that room over the years and never had a similar experience. Did I touch something or someone? And did they follow me back from the cemetery? I don't know. I never shared this story before, but this seems like the right place to do it. When I was born, my parents rented a portion of a three-family house. The house was huge and previously owned by an old German woman. Apparently, the house belonged to the same family since the early 1700s when it was built. After the old German lady died there, there was no one left in the family to take on ownership of the house. Someone new took the house over and rented it out to three other families. As soon as we moved in, my parents had odd things happening on a daily basis. The TV and all of the lights in the house would constantly turn on in the middle of the night. One night, my dad had some friends over to watch a football game, and all of the power in the house kept going on and off. His friends were so freaked out that they left. What bothered my mom the most was that all the rooms in the house stayed warm, except for mine. My room was always like ice, and being a newborn, my mother was concerned. She would turn the heat way up, and still my room stayed cold. One night, she heard a woman's voice coming from my room. As she neared, she could hear an old lady singing a lullaby. When she opened the door, the rocking chair was swaying back and forth, and my room was warm. After this occurrence, my room remained warm. This became an ongoing thing in the house. The rocking chair would constantly rock, no matter where in the house my mom moved it to. And oftentimes, she would hear a soft voice coming from my room. The lights continued to go on frequently in the middle of the night. As I got a little older, into the toddler years, I can still remember certain things happening. My parents found it odd that I am able to remember things so clearly. I can describe my bedroom in distinct detail, as well as the other rooms in the house. I only lived there from newborn to two and a half years. One night, I woke up and felt absolutely terrified. 
I remember climbing out of my crib, onto the little table and chair set, and stepped onto the floor and dodged from my parents' room. As soon as I climbed into bed with my mom and dad, I heard my aunt, who was asleep on the couch, screaming. My mom woke up and ran into the living room to see what all the fuss was about. My aunt kept crying. I saw her. I saw her. Over there by the lamp. Apparently, my aunt says that she saw the old lady standing at the foot of the couch by the lamp. When my mom reached over to turn the lamp on, she disappeared. All of my parents' old friends remember the house, and everyone has a story of something that they experienced there. We know that the old lady died in the house, probably in the section where we lived. At first, I think she was angered that the house no longer belonged to anyone in her family. She was harmless and just wanted to make her presence known. We only lasted there for two and a half years. Sometimes we drive by the house and contemplate stopping in to see how the current owners are making out, but I never had the courage to go back. Here's some spooky experiences that I remember from my childhood. The first one didn't happen to me. It's something that my mother told me about. Her mother died in 1959. A few years later, she remembers waking up in the middle of the night and hearing her mother calling her name. This always gave me the chills, especially if I thought about it at night. When I was maybe six or seven, something happened that scared the living daylights out of me. I can still picture it in my mind. A short time after I went to bed, I was lying there awake, and I looked up at my bedroom door, which was closed. There was a window across the room from the door. The curtains were open, and the moonlight was shining through the window, making a square of light on the door. In the middle of the square of light, I saw the shadow of a hand slowly moving back and forth. I was so scared that all I could do was just stare at it. I was trying to scream, but no sound would come out. Finally, I managed to get my voice to work, and I yelled as loud as I could, Mom! My mother came running in, and I told her what I saw. I don't remember if she saw the shadow too. Probably not. She didn't see anything outside, and she shut the curtains. Now, there were no trees right outside my window that were close enough that they would make a shadow. Not to mention that this did not look like a tree branch. It was definitely the distinct shape of a human hand. Looking back on this as an adult, I realized that this was most likely not anything supernatural at all, but someone actually trying to break into our house, which, quite frankly, is more scarier than a mere ghost. When I started screaming, the person heard me and ran away. Shortly after the previous incident, I asked my parents if I could move into the room across from that one. Gee, I wonder why. My new room had a little trap door in the closet, leading to an attic of sorts. My parents never used it for storage, as it was too hard to go up there through the trap door, and it most likely wasn't even high enough to walk upright in. When I was about 10 or 11, my best friend and I were playing in my room and we noticed that the trap door was open about an inch or so. We slid it closed. Every once in a while, I'd look up there and find that it was open again. I'd keep sliding it closed, and then a few days later, it would be open. My friend and I naturally assumed that we had a ghost in the attic. I really don't remember if I actually heard anything up there or not. Around the same time, this same friend would occasionally spend a night with me. Several times, we'd be lying in bed and hear the sound of a newspaper or some sort of paper being crumpled up in the living room when we knew no one else was up. We called this the newspaper ghost. Another time, I think I was about seven, I was riding my bike around in circles in the street. This was in a housing development where there was very little traffic. My aunt, Uncle and cousins were visiting, and I recall looking at the bathroom window on the side of our house and seeing my aunt's face looking out the window. Later, I mentioned it to my aunt, and she said she hadn't been looking out the bathroom window, and neither had anyone else. 
Now, I realize that this could have easily been a reflection of something in the window. At the same time, it seemed pretty spooky to me. In the summer of 69, I was about 13. We had some relatives staying at our house for about a week. One evening, after everyone had gone to bed, I was still awake. As a child, it always took me a long time to get to sleep. I was always too wound up, I guess. Anyway, all of a sudden, there was this loud crash that came from my closet, like something metal or aluminum falling on the untiled floor. The thing that came to mind was a metal vacuum cleaner hose. There was no vacuum cleaner or any other large metal object in my closet that could have fallen and made such a noise, and even if there was, what would have made it fall off the shelf? I was too scared to get up and look in my closet or go and ask anyone if they'd heard it. Now, this was a small three bedroom house in Levittown, Pennsylvania. If anyone is familiar with the houses, if a loud noise occurs in any part of the house, it would be impossible not to hear it all over the house. The next morning, I asked my parents, aunt and uncle and cousins if they heard a loud crash in the night and no one else had heard it. And by the way, I looked in my closet in the morning and nothing was out of place. This has always puzzled me. Here are a few things that have happened in the last few years in the house I live in now. Nothing blatantly scary, just weird. I thought I'd share them just for the fun of it. One night, I was asleep and all of a sudden, I screamed and woke myself up. My husband came running in and I couldn't for the life of me remember what I had dreamed that had scared me. But I had a vague memory of looking beside the bed and seeing something in the form of a human being made up of little points of light. There have been a few occasions where I've woken up in the middle of the night and heard a kind of electrical humming that sounds like it's coming from our bedroom closet. My husband said he could hear it too. I could never figure out what's causing it. It sounds like it could be the refrigerator running, except that the kitchen is not right next to the bedroom. And if it was the fridge, wouldn't I hear the noise every night, since obviously the fridge runs all the time? I haven't heard it in over a year. Just as well, it gives me the willies. I want to say that I can sympathize with your situation, although other than apparitions, my experience varies greatly from yours. I do want to share what happened to me with you, but I do want to warn you ahead of time. I used to be a reporter, so I can get lengthy. My first experience happened when I was a child. I was seven years old and lived a completely normal life. My parents didn't smoke dope or dabble in the occult, so I really had no knowledge of ghosts other than the traditional Halloween experiences every child encounters. When I turned seven, my family moved from Metro Memphis, Tennessee to rural Independence, Mississippi. We moved into a house that my father renovated. Rather than trying to draw a diagram that may get scrambled and transmit, I'll try to describe the layout of the rooms involved. The way the home was originally laid out, you walked in the front door into the living room. To the left was the kitchen, open without walls to the living room. To the right was a bedroom door. Straight ahead was a hallway leading to other bedrooms, laundry room, and bathroom. After my father was finished, the front door was added onto a new wing of the house. The living room was enclosed into a bedroom. The bedroom now directly led out into the hall, which now led to the kitchen also, and had a new doorway to the bedroom that previously opened up to the living room. Is that confusing enough? We moved into the house, and I immediately was terrified of my sister's bedroom, the one that had previously opened up into the old living room. I just felt that something was there, and it was watching me. I felt like it wanted to possess me or something stronger than a mere presence. Also, I never found out why, but hers was the only room with security bars on the window. No other family member noticed anything strange in the house. I ended up in the new bedroom, and sometimes at night, I'd hear noises. Being so small, I don't remember exactly what they were, but frequently, I'd see an incandescent, glowing form in the shape of a human 
walking across my room. What made me know that it had to be a previous occupant of the home was that it would walk from the bedroom I was so scared of, through my room, into the kitchen, the way the house used to be laid out. Once when my grandmother came to visit, my parents forced me to sleep in my sister's bedroom. I was so terrified, but I finally went to sleep. When I woke up, I saw what appeared to be an ectoplasm swirling above my head. I spent most of my childhood years terrified of sleeping. Being a middle child of an older sister and a younger brother, I'd hide my prized possessions, jewelry, money, whatever I thought I didn't want them to get a hold of. Almost every time I hide something, it would disappear and reappear later in a different location. Thinking my siblings had discovered my hiding place, I'd find a new one, each time to have them disappear and reappear once again. The really strange part came later. We sold the house when I was 13 to another girl's family I went to school with. After she'd move in, I'd asked her one day if she noticed anything weird in the house, and she said no, but her sister refused to go into the bedroom that scared me. Sister's explanation was that someone was watching her, and she was a middle child also. I guess there must have been some connection to middle children. I said something years later about the house being haunted in front of my aunt. She said she'd always had a feeling that something was wrong with the house. I'd appreciate your input as to what you think my experience meant. I had a person tell me one time I was a demon that wanted me, but I'm not even sure. While I lived there, although I was the only family member that had strange experiences inside the house, I wasn't the only one who had strange experiences in the area. In the fall, between the hours of 10 p.m. and 12 a.m., my mother would see balls of light floating in the field and wooded areas across the road from my house. She would always ask me to come look, but I had enough terror inside the house, and as far as I was concerned, the woods were my only safe haven while at home. So I never looked and never witnessed the lights myself, but both my sister and my mom did. When I was 19, I started dating this guy who was friends with a neighbor from that house I'd lived in. Basically, he lived catty corner from me, with their house backing up to the woods mine faced. My new boyfriend asked me if I ever saw anything strange in the woods. I said no. He told me that his neighbor's kid, who was a friend of his, told him that he'd seen balls of lights in the woods. I then told my boyfriend about my mother and sister's experiences. So apparently, it wasn't just restricted to my family. Another experience I had was when I was in my early 20s, when my grandfather passed away. We'd always loved each other very much, but didn't have a close relationship because of my grandmother, whom I didn't get along with. I was present when he passed away and was devastated. Three months passed, enough time to allow me to grieve and get on with my life. I was asleep one night and awoke to find my grandfather sitting on the side of my bed. He told me not to be scared, that he had a message for me. He told me I needed to get my life straight, or I was headed for trouble. I remember he held my hand, and told me that he was going to tell me what heaven is like, but I'm not allowed to remember what he told me. I remember him being present for a while longer, but can't remember a word he said, now that I'm an adult and have some time and distance between me and these experience I had as a child. I'd like to try to discover what these experience meant or why I was chosen to have this one. Do you have any suggestions? Also, even now, I can drive by a place or house and tell that it's haunted. Does that mean that I'm psychic or paranormally gifted? Usually I just get kind of jumpy and frightened, but one night I was out repossessing vehicles something I did part-time for a while, and my partner pulled up to this house. I was so terrified of that house that I told him he better turn around immediately or I was getting out of the vehicle and running. Please help me to understand what is going on with me. I'm finally getting to a point I accept it and want to understand it rather than how I've been so terrified in the past that I didn't even want to talk about it. In 1983, when I was 18 years old, 
I was severely ill. I woke up one morning and my face was badly swollen. My mother took me to the emergency room. I was placed in the ICU the next day as I went unconscious. It would take a team of doctors over a week to finally diagnose me. It was a rare disease. There was only two case histories. They both died from it years before. That's why my doctors had no idea what it was. It was from a sinus infection that had backed up behind my brain. From this, I developed a brain abscess. The night before they would make the decision if I needed brain surgery to remove the abscess, I was lying in my hospital bed, praying that the abscess would have shrunk a little. I felt someone standing beside my bed. I was sure it was a nurse, as it was very late, too late for visitors. When I turned to talk, it wasn't a nurse at all. It was my grandfather, who died one year earlier. At that moment, I wasn't afraid. He said to me, you'll be fine. When I asked if you were sure, he then replied, do you doubt me? I replied no. He then said, everything will be fine. You will be alright. This part has puzzled me ever since he told me. He said, take care of your mother. This was my mother's father. Then he simply turned around and walked out of the room. The nurses came in and I was wondering what happened to my grandfather. They didn't say anybody walked into the room, and they told me to calm down. I swear I knew what I saw. I knew it was my grandfather. But the whole situation was just weird, and it gets weirder. I thought he meant that I would do fine through the surgery. My grandfather. Now here's the kicker. He had brain surgery about seven years before his own death. Even crazier. The next morning I had an x-ray and they came to tell me that my abscess was completely gone. First of all, I have no idea what happened. Even the doctors were confused. They wanted to take even more x-rays, and I obliged, and they confirmed no abscess whatsoever. As for my grandfather talking about my mother, I had no idea why he was mentioning her. She was pretty healthy at the time, but it makes sense now. Recently, she has been diagnosed with MS, diabetes, and in September, she had heart failure. In November, she almost died and had triple bypass surgery. Through the years, my family has had many encounters with the spirit world, but this was the most wonderful one. In the summer of 1994, my sister and I moved to Hawaii to live with our father. While we were gone, our mother moved into an apartment to save money. Right away, strange things started to happen. Her two cats would never enter the bedroom of the apartment, choosing instead to sleep in the living room. They would claw and bite if you tried to carry them in there and then run quickly away. Mom only spent one night in the room and then opted for the living room as well. She didn't see anything, but felt as if there was someone watching her or that someone was in the room. A few weeks later, she returned home from work to find her disposable razor disassembled on the bathroom counter. Even the twin blades were removed and the whole apparatus was laid out in a straight row. The next night, my cousin, Stacy and her husband, Mitch, went to stay over at my mom's with her. They were in from out of town, not going over to ease her fears. She wasn't scared yet. The two of them argued with mom over sleeping arrangements, and she assured them that they never slept in the bedroom anyway. That night, my mother woke to hear Stacy and Mitch screaming in terror. Mom ran into the room to find Mitch trying to pull Stacy off the bed. She was screaming to get her off the bed, so mom started pulling too. Once they got her to the floor, Stacy said that it felt like someone was sitting on top of her, and she couldn't breathe. And while it was going on, she said she could see a teenage boy in the corner, laughing uncontrollably. The three of them decided to drive to my grandma's to spend the night. Fast forward to Christmas break, when my sister and I came home to visit. Her first afternoon at the apartment, 
we heard a loud crash from the bathroom. All people and animals in the house were accounted for in the living room, so we went to check it out. Everything from the cabinet under the sink was out on the bathroom floor. It wasn't all tipped over, however. It was lined up in a straight row. After that, Mom told my sister and I about all the strange things that had occurred. My sister and I were thrilled, thought it was really cool. Mom said that we were more than welcome to sleep in the bedroom if we wanted to, so we did. Early the next morning, I woke up and thought I saw someone standing in the walk-in closet. The sun was just starting to come up, and I thought for sure it was my sister playing a trick on me. When I looked over in bed, she wasn't there. Instead, there was a guy, maybe teens or early 20s, with shaggy black hair and no face, in bed with me. He reached out for me, and I literally wet my pants, running into the living room. I woke my mom and sister, who had moved during the night, said she had the creeps, and attempted to tell them what happened. Mom told us to get our stuff, and we left. Later that afternoon, I recited the story to Stacy, and she said the guy I described was the one she saw laughing at her. Mom went to the leasing office a week later and asked to be moved to another apartment. All the leasing agent had to say was that no one had lived in that apartment longer than four months. It started some years ago, and I'm happy to say that it's been over for some time now. I'm confident that I'm no longer being followed by Mage, but I would like to share my experiences with you, and if you can provide any insight or better understanding of what happened to me, I would be most happy. Some years ago, I was sleeping over at a friend's apartment. I went to bed and lay there alone with my thoughts until I think I fell asleep. I was awoken by three sharp knocks, similar to someone knocking on a solid wooden door, and turned my head to the bedroom door, which was three yards away to my right. The door was closed, yet within the door frame was a figure. To my eyes, the figure was shimmering and vivid with colors, without any real human form, yet to my senses, I was certain that it was a woman, that she was extremely tall and that she was wearing jewelry. I perceived her with the absolute clarity that my eyes were unable to support. I opened my mouth to yell, but could not. It lasted only a few seconds when the door opened and my friend entered the room. The vision was gone. I said to my friend with a detached calmness that I had just seen a ghost, but this of course was met with indifference. I did not press the matter as I was already beginning with self-doubt. By the end of a mostly sleepless night, I would managed to convince myself that it was a dream, or at least a product of that period between sleep and wakefulness. Within days, the whole episode was forgotten. Some six months later, I was at home with my parents and decided upon an early night. I had a lot on my mind that night, and needed some space and some quiet for contemplation. I was lying on my single bed in my small bedroom, lost in thought, when I heard the three knocks again. My heart leapt. From my bed, I could see ahead of me, and to the right, the bedroom door, which was open, and the landing is accessible by three ascending steps. Through the door, I can see about three yards of the landing, until the angle of the door frame cuts off the view. There, just at that farthest point, was the same vision, the same shimmering colors. She was much clearer this time, and there was no doubt that my eyes were seeing a woman. She was so tall that she had to bend her head to her left until it was almost resting on her shoulder, like a body hanging without the noose. But she was looking at me, her eyes, Although I couldn't actually see them, were fixed upon me, and there was a malice in them, I had no doubt. Then, in an instant, she came along the landing, down the three steps, and right up to my face. So quickly and so aggressively, she brought her face to within an inch of mine. 
I could make out her eyes and nose, but to this day, I cannot be sure if I saw them or experienced them. I could not separate her emotions from her visage, which seemed to be one and the same in my mind. It is difficult to describe, but I saw her face and features, along with her hatred and despite. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came. Eventually, she disappeared. I've never been so terrified in all my life. Never has fear removed any capacity to utter or to move a single muscle, and yet this was the case. I lay rigid for some time, at least until the room was light from daybreak. I was absolutely sure that I had not fallen asleep, but yet over time, I managed to convince myself that this was indeed the case. This is how I came to terms with it. Over the next year, I saw no more of her, and she was reduced to an entertaining story for friends. Then I married and moved to set up house with my wife. The third, the last, and the unequivocal sighting was during the early days in my new home. It was a bright, warm Sunday afternoon, and I was sitting on a chair to watch a television program, an old episode of Bonanza, as it happens, when I became aware of another presence in the room, I turned to the door behind me, fully expecting my wife to be there, but she was not. As I turned my head back to the TV, to my right was a settee, and sat in the middle was the woman again. This time she was sat on the edge of the settee, with her hand forward, cupping her chin in her hands, and her knees were also together under her chin. She was leaning forward in this position, contemplating me amusingly, or mockingly, I cannot decide. There was so much clarity about her features, and the room was bright, which she seemed to reflect. There, in front of me was a woman, about 25 years old, very sharp features, very tall, and very thin. Her bright colors, her hair and her jewelry, reminded me of a punk rocker. Although this was not so, I'm sure she was from a long time ago before that era. I was not afraid, and emboldened by the daylight, I simply and calmly asked her what she wanted. There was no response, no answer. She simply faded away, and I have not seen her to this day. Compressing my research into a short paragraph, I went back to the place of the first sighting and asked my friend some questions. It transpired that she was haunted by a spirit many years previously who would disturb household objects. An expert was brought in who ascertained that they were being haunted by a malevolent spirit who was called Mage. It was not possible to get rid of her, but to hope that she leaves of her own accord. This happened in my friend's hometown, some 300 miles from where I live. My theory is that Mage came with my friend to my hometown and took a liking to me, thereby following me to both my parents' home and onward to my married home. I don't know who has provided the vehicle for her to leave my house, but I hope that she has been gone for good. When I was in my early 20s, a friend and I decided to rent a house together. We found a lovely old house near the Mississippi River, and I was immediately drawn to it. After we moved in, we both began to notice banging on the walls and lights blowing out constantly. The lights we attributed to bad wiring, and the banging, I truly believed, was my friend, and she truly believed it was me. The layout of the house was one we had never seen before. There was a hallway that led from the front living area to the back bedroom areas that was at an odd, slanting angle. I always felt uncomfortable going down this hallway and found myself going around by way of the kitchen. After months, my friend and I decided to take in a third roommate to help with expenses. During the next month or so, after this third roommate moved in, we noticed the increase in frequency to the noises, banging, and lights going out. We also began to notice that every month, and this is really weird, Right around the time that all three of us began our menstrual cycles, a very large stain began to appear in the middle of our living room floor. We tried constant shampooing, 
but it will always reappear immediately. And then after our cycles are finished, the stain would disappear on its own, only to reappear the next month. Our third roommate then became very withdrawn, after only a short time of being in the house. She began to go directly to her bedroom, and never came out, except to go to work. Her personality has also changed drastically. She went from being very funny and outgoing, to a complete loner. She would also say very inappropriate, weird things to us. We had known this girl for some time, and her behavior was quite unsettling. She finally told us that she was not comfortable in this house, and was moving out, and she did so that very day. Shortly after she moved out, the banging noise began in earnest, and we started noticing our things being rearranged. We began to laughingly and nervously admit to each other that something was not right in this house. However, neither one of us felt threatened by any kind of the weird happenings, and in fact, I personally actually felt almost protected by it. We started to call our ghost George, and would talk to him whenever the banging would begin. We were trying to watch something on TV, and George would start banging or knocking. We would say, please George, not right now, we're trying to see this. And he would actually stop, at least until the show was over. Unfortunately, no matter how much we begged him to stop putting the stain on the floor every month, that never ended. In fact, it got bigger and darker the longer we lived there. One kind of amusing episode happened to us one memorable evening. I decided to let my boyfriend at the time stay overnight with me, although I usually didn't do this. Just as we were dozing off, a very loud bang sounded, coming from the hallway. My boyfriend sat up and asked, what the heck was that? Immediately, a knocking began at the far end of the hall and rushed towards my room very fast, knocking louder and louder the closer it came. My boyfriend said, that has to be your roommate being funny. I just laughed and tried to explain about our ghost and that I thought he might be angry that I had a male friend overnight. He said that was bull and got up to investigate. Just as he came to the hallway, the knocking began again, all around him. Needless to say, my brave six foot four inch boyfriend ran straight out the front door and never came back in the house. Anyway, after a few years, my roommate and I decided we were going to move to a cheaper apartment, closer to where we worked. As soon as we started packing, the noises, and especially the lights going out, began to get really bad. I was even starting to get a little frightened. One day, as we were finishing up packing, we decided to go check in the basement and see if we had anything left down there. While we were down there, we decided to go in the old fruit cellar, since neither one of us had actually looked in it. We found some old fishing equipment. We also found an old shirt box that was sealed with tape and felt kind of heavy. So we brought it upstairs and opened it up. Inside was a bunch of old pictures. Most of the pictures were of a young man of about 25 or 30. In many of the pictures, he was in our house and standing on the porch of the house. There were also some antique glass lines with pictures of him in the military uniforms. We dated the stuff around World War II. We decided to call our landlady, an elderly woman, around 80 years old, to tell her we had found the box. When we called her and told her what we had found, she hung up on us. We called back, and her daughter answered and said that they didn't want that stuff anymore, and we could have it or throw it away. We thought it was very strange, since normally our landlady was a sweet old lady. So we decided that some of the stuff in the box might be worth more money, and we would sell some of it. Some war medals, and even an old stock certificate. That night, I put the box on the kitchen table, and we went to bed. In the morning, we were going to move the last of everything, and as we were preparing to go, I asked my roommate what she had done with a box of stuff. She said she hadn't touched it. We looked everywhere and couldn't find it. Finally, around lunch, we got hungry and decided to cook a frozen pizza. We turned on the oven and immediately began to smell something burning. When I opened the oven, there was the box. Okay, 
I swore my roommate did it, and she swore I did it. So we left the box on the table again, and left to move some things to the new place. When we got back, the box was gone again. This time, we found it immediately in the kitchen pantry. So we kind of laughed it off, and put it back on the kitchen table. About ten minutes later, I walked into the kitchen, and it was gone again. I decided the heck with it, and decided to just go finish the bedroom closet I had just minutes before been working on. When I stepped up on the chair to wipe off the upper shelves, there was the box. That did it. I said out loud, Okay, George, we promise not to take your stuff, and put the box back in the fruit cellar where we had found it. We left that day and have never been back, but I've always wondered if the next tenants ever heard from George. I've worked for a domestic violence shelter for approximately seven years. While I personally have never seen anything, there are always odd sounds and unusual occurrences. Let me start at the beginning. The house is two-story with an attic and a basement and over a hundred years old. I really don't know much else about its history. The local domestic violence center purchased the building, which had been uninhabited for a number of years, did some renovations, and began operating an anonymous shelter for battled women and their children. Over the years, there have been numerous sightings of a young couple. A woman in a long flowing dress can be seen periodically walking up the long staircase. A man in dark, old fashioned clothing has been seen in the living room and at the top of the stairs outside the attic door. It is usual for all who went into the attic or the basement to feel uneasy and not alone. Recently, the sightings seem to have increased. A church group came over to the holidays to sing Christmas carols to the residents, and a young boy pointed to the ceiling and said, Look, there's an angel. The only thing seen by the others in the room was a hazy, grayish fog that wasn't in any particular shape. A few months later, one of the employee's daughter was in the living room, alone, working on a school project, and looked up to see a gray, transparent figure looming in the doorway. She screamed, and her mother raced in to see the figure moving slowly upstairs. It was as if the ghost was checking in and didn't mean to frighten the young girl. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this haunting is that the couple together, fitting the same descriptions of the man and the woman seen in places of the house, have been seen in one bedroom upstairs. To my knowledge, at least three residents in the last year have been awakened at night to see the woman sitting on the edge of the bed with a man standing behind her. The couple has been described as comforting and reassuring to those who have seen them in this manner. And these apparitions have seemed to know when these residents were about to face a particular trying experience. One woman was going to court the next day for an order of protection. One lady was facing a decision about the custody of her new little baby. And one woman was about to embark on the dangerous underground trying to change her identity in order to hide from the husband who tried to kill her. All three of these women felt as though the ghosts were trying to tell them that everything was going to be alright and... As it turns out, the dire situations facing each of these women worked out in their favor. I personally find their presence reassuring as well. Women and children who came through the shelter are very often depressed, sometimes hopeless, scared, insecure, and anxious. I think that the fact that they are comforted by these spirits is a sign that these are good spirits who seem to approve of the work being done in their house. They've never tried to scare anyone. Sure, lights turn on and off by themselves, and the dishwasher is forever turning on by itself. Maybe they are just trying to figure out what these gadgets are. I do not know anything about the history of the house, but I assume these spirits were once residents of this house. Based on their actions, they seem to be good and well-wishing. I hope they continue to watch over the shelter and help the current residents. Hi. My name is Tariq, and this is my supernatural experience. It happened to me when I was about five or six years old. I seem to remember it was quite a sunny afternoon, nothing particularly unusual about that day. My mother asked me to go upstairs and wake my father, 
who often took afternoon naps. I remember feeling quite lazy and I could not really be bothered going all the way upstairs to attempt to wake my dad sleeping. However, my mom insisted so I did. I was about to walk up the stairs when I suddenly was overcome with fear as what I had saw made no sense to me. There, at the top of the stairs, was the biggest dog I had ever seen in my life. It appeared to fill the whole space of the landing and was near the height of the ceiling. The dog appeared to be aggressive, and was barking and growling so loud that it could have woken the dead. I was so shaken and scared that I just froze in the spot. I shouted for my mom. I said, Mom, I can't go upstairs, and she told me not to be lazy. I told her no, there was this big dog at the top of the stairs, and it would not let me pass. My mom came out to me, and she said, Tariq. We do not even have a dog. Of course, this is what I already knew. I quickly told my mom to get over here and see what I was seeing, but by the time she arrived and looked up the stairs, it was gone. This perplexed me even more, and being the age I was, I couldn't even understand it. I started to doubt myself, wondering if I ever even saw it at all, and I trusted and believed in my mother. So if she didn't really see it, maybe I was just hallucinating, and it really wasn't there. Obviously, the dog disappeared, and after a while, I forgot about it, and never resurfaced again. However, these memories came back when I was about 12 years old, and I spoke to my mom about it. Looking back on it, I do believe I saw something paranormal. But any ideas on why my mom or dad could not see it or hear it, and why was the dog being so protective, beats me. I don't know, but it was sure a scary sight. It just sucks that I feel like I was the only one who had saw it, and it makes me crazy. But what can you do? I don't know. I recently had an experience that I can't explain and decided to tell my story here. In June, my boyfriend Ian, our then 15 month old twins, of course me as well, we all went to his family reunion. While we were there, we had a wonderful time meeting his family and getting to know everyone really well. We stayed at his father and stepmother's home with the immediate family. One night, while everyone was asleep, one of the girls started crying most likely from being in a new place or losing her pacifier. I woke up and still groggy, I sat up in the bed. I looked over to the crib. Next to the crib, there was a little old woman standing there looking into the crib. When I saw her, she didn't scare me and I thought nothing of it. She looked at me, put her finger up to her mouth, kind of bent down and whispered, shh. So I laid back down and fell back to sleep. Brianna slept through the rest of the night. The next morning, I got up and remembered what I saw. Not sure if I dreamt it or not, I pulled Ian away from the family and asked him if he had a picture of his grandmother. The family had spoken a lot of her the previous day at the reunion, but I had never met her. Ian was very close to her and was very upset at the time of her death. It would have been almost nine years ago. They found one, and after I saw the picture, I felt this warmth, the only way I can describe it, and it filled my body. It was the lady I saw the night before. I wasn't sure if I should tell anyone, for fear of them thinking I was insane, but I decided to tell Ian. When I told him, He kind of gasped. Like I said, he was very close to his grandmother. I'm glad I told him. Later, as we were talking to the family, someone said, Oh, it would have been so wonderful for her to be here and see all the family together. Speaking of the grandmother, Ian looked at me and asked me to tell everyone what I saw. I'm still new to this family. It wouldn't want to be dubbed as the crazy one just yet, 
so I kept it to myself. Thanks for giving me a place to share this. In 1983, we moved into a home that had suddenly been vacated by the owners. The man had suffered a heart attack at the front door and died. His wife went into serious shock and suffered some emotional distress. After the funeral, her children decided to take her back to Missouri. I had personally known the couple in 1971 as I had lived in a house on the connecting street. Our backyards were contiguous. Mr. Williams had been the water superintendent for the city for many years. He was an upstanding citizen, a loving family man, and a friend to many people. Shortly after moving in, he got the feeling that Mr. Williams had never really left his home. At night, after everyone had turned in, footsteps could be heard throughout the home. It sounded like heavy footsteps stomping up and down the hall outside the bedrooms. I would get up and check to see if the children were awake and would find them sleeping soundly in their beds. Once in a while, doors would open up wide as if someone was entering a room and then the door would slam shut. One night, my wife at the time awoke to see the form of a man standing at the end of our bed. He woke up on her side and leaned over a little. She laid there terrifying, knowing that I was very hard to wake up and that if this were a burglar, I would not suddenly spring into action against the intruder. She maintained her position and just peered through her eyelids. Suddenly, the figure just faded away. These occurrences persisted for about a month. One morning, at around 2.30 a.m., we were suddenly awakened by the bedroom door slamming open with a violent force. We were very tired of Mr. Williams' nightly tirades, and I was running on my last nerve. I got up and decided to try to talk with this confused soul. I addressed him as Mr. Williams and told him that he had suffered a heart attack and had died. I told him that his wife had gone to Missouri to live with his children. I told him that we were paying rent to his children to live in this house, and we worked hard for our money. I started to get angry with him, and told him that if he wanted to rant and rave and stomp about the house, he needed to do it when we weren't there, as he was disturbing our sleep. If he continued, we would be forced to move, and his children would have to find other renters. I suggested he go to Missouri, because that is where he would find his wife. After that, we never heard from Mr. Williams again. In August of 1997, I was helping a friend deliver some things for a post-funeral reception that was to be held in the officer's quarters number one at Fort Concho in San Angelo, Texas. Fort Concho is the best preserved and reconstructed cavalry fort in America. This is where the Buffalo Soldiers were stationed. It was very early in the morning, and we had to get the key to the building from the curator. We drove to the other side of the parade ground and parked the van. We went inside, and I took some things up to the staircase to the second floor, while my buddy worked on the first floor. I walked into the west bedroom upstairs, and immediately felt like I had just walked between two people that were standing shoulder to shoulder. I was walking into a tremendous field of static electricity. I had a cold sensation, and the hairs on my neck and arms stood straight out. I put the vase down that I was carrying, and found myself compelled to say, excuse me. Then I proceeded to the east bedroom. When I entered the room, I saw a little girl out of the corner of my eye, playing on the floor to my left. I placed the vase, and when I turned around, she faded away. A couple of days later, I was again with my friend. We stopped by the house of the lady, who was responsible for financing the restoration of officer's quarter number one. My friend mentioned that I had felt a presence and saw a little girl. 
I told her that I had seen her in the east bedroom, and she told me that a little girl had died in that very room. Maybe it was her parents that I felt in the west bedroom, or just someone else watching over her. A few months later, I had the opportunity to stop by the officer's quarters number one when it was open to the public. I was walking around and a staff member volunteer came up and asked me what I thought of the building. I told her I thought it was haunted and repeated the story of the little girl. The lady took me into the dining room and pointed to a portrait on the wall. It was the same little girl I had seen upstairs. I would first like to say, I was not a believer in ghosts or spirits. I was in the Navy at the time, and had been just transferred to Japan. My family and I arrived there in August of 91. I felt very lucky, because the Navy had just opened Hario, a new housing complex, about 9 miles from the naval base. This meant that my family and I would not have to live off base. My wife and I were taken out to the Hario to pick out a house. Being newly opened, we basically had the pick of the litter. My wife and I chose a nice three bedroom room townhouse in the center of the housing complex. We moved in within three days and began to settle down. Nothing much happened for the first month or two. Then one night, my daughter, who was three at the time, started waking up at night crying. She would point at the wall and tell me to make the snake lady go away. This happened about once a week. Of course, I thought she was just having bad dreams. We would let her sleep in our bed when this happened. My wife became pregnant at the time, and we were allowed to move into a four-bedroom house. I was hoping this move would solve the snake lady problem. As we moved into the new house, I assured her the snake lady was gone forever. Boy, was I wrong. It was about two weeks before our encounters with the snake lady started again. This time my wife and I could actually feel some sort of electrical charge throughout the house. These encounters intensified, and my daughter started to see more and more apparitions. She would tell me that the snake lady wanted to take her away. I, being a skeptic, thought the electrical charge was sort of funny, but never gave much thought about my daughter's nightmare being real. Then one night, my wife and I were awakened by my daughter, screaming at the top of her lungs. We rushed into her room to find her pressed against the far wall, her feet approximately one foot off the ground. My wife and I both grabbed her arms, and with one of my feet pressed against the wall, I pulled with all my might. She wouldn't budge. I'm not a small man, 5 foot 10, 191 pounds, and I worked out all the time. I could not get her off the wall. All the while she was screaming that the snake lady wanted to take her away. Scared to death, I started praying in my head. My daughter started to slide down the wall, and she fell into our arms. I don't know what it was but I believe there is something out there that we don't know about. The next day I blessed every room in the house with olive oil. This seemed to do the trick because my daughter never had another experience. My wife is Japanese and she did some investigating of the area's history. Harry O was once an internment camp for the sick and dying Japanese soldiers of World War II. There is a shrine just outside the back gate for the soldiers that died there. And that's what we found out. Thanks for reading. It's funny really, cause I've been reading your site for quite some time and have marveled over the experiences people have had, but never ever thought I would be emailing you my story. This experience is mainly my two friends, but I experienced it firsthand last night. They live in Rath, Royal Air Force Quarters, in Middlesex in England, and have never really mentioned anything before. A couple of weeks ago, Susie and I were chatting about various things when the subjects of ghosts came up. 
Funny enough, the handprints have come back since Elena was born, said Susie. Handprints? What handprints? I replied. It seems that since they moved in over three years ago, they've had various things happen. So she took me upstairs, and there, clear as day, was a set of huge handprints on the wall just above their bed. Apparently, she has tried everything to get rid of them, and they disappeared when she was pregnant. As soon as the baby was born, they came back, and when I saw Susie and Jay last night, they casually informed me that the handprints had moved. By now, I was getting quite spooked out. We went outside for a cigarette, with one of the music channels on the TV playing. When we came back in, the channel had changed to some gruesome true murder documentary. The hairs on the back of my neck were standing on edge at this stage, and it took Susie a good five minutes to change the channel back. Also, they both watched a candle that stood on top of the telly, very casually move from the middle, and drop off at the end. Things have been moved around, never hidden, and the TV also turns on and off. Susie and Jay were very relaxed about this, and the ghost obviously means them no harm. Last night, it was Susie, Jay, and me, and they told me what happened last Sunday. Apparently, Susie had gone up to change Elena, and had sat out her pajamas and nappy out in the changing mat in the bedroom. She was bathing Elena, and thought that perhaps she could use one of the smaller nappies instead of the big one that she had pulled out. When she went back into the bedroom, the pajamas and the big nappy had been thrown onto the chair, and in a perfect arc were three of the smaller nappies on the changing mat. Poor Jay got it right in the neck for that, until he explained that he hadn't been upstairs at all. Again, the hairs on my neck were standing on end, and when I had to go upstairs to use their toilet, Susie had to come with me. We then went out for a cigarette. And as we were sitting there, I saw the shadow of someone walking to the kitchen, didn't think anything of it, until I realized that we were all sitting outside. I told them, and Susie said that she sees shadows out of the corner of her eye all the time. We then went back in, and I was sitting on the sofa next to Susie, talking to Jay, when I noticed that she was staring at something right behind her. I asked what she was looking at, but she said nothing at first, knowing how freaked out I was getting. She then began to tell me that she noticed a transparent man with an axe lodged into his forehead, casually move from the room we were in and into the kitchen, then disappear. She had told me that when she was alone in the living room, another time, that she also saw a man sitting down at the kitchen table as if he was writing on a piece of paper, then disappear shortly after. Apparently, they are not the only ones to experience things. It seems that quite a few people in the row of houses had strange things happen, and the couple on end have seen a shadowy figure. She asked me to babysit Elena next week. Must admit, not too keen on having the extra company though. When I was about 10 years old, my family lived with my great-grandmother and me, and my brother had to sleep in the basement. Half was for storage, half was an extra room. So one night, at like 3, I had to walk to the top floor to take a pee. On my way down, I hear the voice of a little girl say goodbye. Then I noticed that same voice, and it said die. I immediately freaked out and ran back into my room, absolutely terrified. There was another incident with my brother. He was in the basement, and he heard the same voice coming up the stairs from it. It said die as well. And he turned back, looked down the stairs, and the apparition of a girl was standing right there, and then materialized and disappeared in an instant. When I was 15, we moved out to New Jersey. When I was 16, 
I heard horribly violent screaming. It sounded like a woman, and it sounded like it was coming from behind me. Three days later, my brother, he was 19. He heard the same screaming coming from our bedroom closet. Nowadays, we don't hear any mysterious voices, but we both know they had to be ghosts. And not only that, they had to be evil. And I don't want to experience that ever again. I'm sure my brother doesn't want to either. Thanks for listening. I first became aware of a presence in our home when I was a child of four years. When I was four, my brother was born, and my parents moved him into the bedroom next to theirs. I was moved into my very own room, upstairs. My older sister occupied the room next to mine. It did not take me long to realize that there was something odd about this new room I was in. I would wake up in the night, chilled with the overwhelming feeling that someone was watching me. Sometimes, I caught fleeting glimpses of what looked like a shadow on one particular wall. When I mentioned the shadow to Ma, she attributed it to light play from the moon and other rational explanations. I tried very hard to believe her explanations and to make the shadow sightings go away, but I simply couldn't take the vision of a man in overcoat wearing a fedora. I could never actually see this man, just an outline, a shadow, but I knew he was there. I can't even say I felt threatened by this figure. I just felt watched and not alone. I suppose I should describe our family home. It is a large, Cape Cod style home built in the 1940s, just after the war. The family that built the home were obviously influenced by World War II, as was the world, I would think, and they built a secret room, which I would imagine was designed to hide the family if war ever broke out on home soil. This room was only accessible via a trap door in the kitchen floor, and it led to the secret room in the basement. My dad sealed this room off before I was born, although I know exactly where the trap door is. There is also a secret passageway that leads between the closets of the two upstairs rooms. This passageway has been sealed before my parents bought the home. This house was the second built on the foundation. The first was a farmhouse dating back to the late 1800s, which burnt when my mother was a child in the 1930s. The family that originally built the Cape Cod did not live there long, and it became a rest home for the affluent elderly in the community for many years. My parents bought the home in 1954, and I was born 11 years later. There were other strange occurrences in the house in my younger years, such as doors opening and closing by themselves, and doors locking when there were no locks, and the piano playing by itself. But I'll fast forward to 1974, when my older sister got married. I took the opportunity to move into her larger room, and that is when the strangeness went into overdrive. I hadn't actually even moved completely into the room when the weirdness began. I'd moved my record player into the room, along with a student desk. I was showing the room to a friend one afternoon when the door slammed shut behind us. When we turned to look at the door, the shade in the opposite window flew off the hinges and landed at our feet in the middle of this room. We both screamed and ran to the door, only to find it locked, and there wasn't a lock on the door. We managed to finally get it open and run down the stairs. My friend would never even go into the room again, let alone spend the night with me. I didn't let it bother me, however, and moved the bed into the room and took up residence. The room always stayed incredibly cold, even in the heat of an Ohio summer. My dad installed triple the insulation into that room to try to help with the chill, but it remained downright cold. There were countless nights when I would awaken to knocking on the walls. Sometimes I would knock back, and it would knock back at me. When I told my parents about the knocking, my dad said it was a tree limb scraping the house. 
the knocking became so intense that he ended up cutting the tree down. But the knocking continued. My parents installed an intercom system into my room next to my bed, so I could page them when the knocking started. Dad seemed convinced that it was the neighborhood boys throwing rocks at my window. It didn't sound like that, though, and the knocking was coming from an inside wall, not an outside one. One afternoon, I was lying on the bed reading, and I got the overwhelming feeling that I was being watched. I sat up on the bed and said out loud, Stop it! There's no such thing as ghosts! And no sooner had I uttered the words, a figurine on a shelf began to wobble, and then flew off the shelf and across to the bed, hitting me on the forehead. I slept on the sofa for a month after that. My family was even beginning to notice strange things happening by this time. The television would turn itself on and off, or alternatively increase the top volume without anyone being in the room. Dad said we had a bum set and bought a new one, but it did the same. We had the wiring replaced, but it still happened. My mom declared that if it was a ghost, it certainly wasn't going to run her out of the home she loved. This is true. She still lives there with the ghost. Other things that would happen in the house included radio switching on and off, lights flickering, the washing machine switching on and running a cycle, and of course the shadow wandering around upstairs. It was all beginning to frighten me quite a bit, especially the knocking noises. If the knocking started, I would buzz mom in the intercom, and she would race upstairs, but as soon as she reached the top step, the knocking would stop. I began to think perhaps I was going a bit crazy. I went away to college, and something strange happened in my old bedroom about a week after I had left. I still had the same clothes hanging in the closet, and there were a few posters still hanging on the wall, but otherwise, it was empty. My mom heard a funny noise upstairs one afternoon and went up to investigate. She checked the first bedroom and saw nothing amiss and went down the hall to my room. She opened the door and discovered that the mirror tile on one wall had exploded all over the place. There were shards of glass sticking in the opposite wall and had scraped across the ceiling like claw marks. My posters hung in shreds. She noticed my closet door hanging open and shreds of glass sticking in the clothes still hanging inside. She shut the door and waited for dad to get home from work. He decided that it must have been a freak lightning hit although the day was sunny and cloudless, and rang the insurers to come out and investigate. The investigator noted that the point of impact seemed to be the upper corner of the wall, where the mirrored tile met the adjoining wall. Oddly, he also noticed that the broken wood in the corner was pointing outward, as if the lightning had been inside the room and went out, instead of the lightning hitting outside and coming in. The insurance company still paid for the damages, although they could never find the point on the outside of the house where the lightning had come in. When I heard about it, I came home to view it and noticed that the wall in question was the one where I had always heard the knocking. As I said, my mom still lives in the house and strange things still persist. She keeps the washing machine unplugged, but unless the water is cut off, it still fills up. This is the third faulty washer we've had. The TV still plays tricks too. My dad passed away in the house two years ago, and on a night after he died, I was staying with mom, although I wasn't about to go upstairs ever again. And in the middle of the night, we both heard faint music playing upstairs, bluegrass music to be precise, which was dad's favorite and we reckoned that there must have been a party going on to welcome Dad to the other side. Mom has since sealed off the upstairs and only lives in the downstairs part of the house. My brother has had plenty of strange things happen to him in the house as well, as did my sister, and as a result, none of us want Mom to bequeath the house to us. She can't understand why.
every single night in my home. When I was four years old, my parents would come in and put me in bed, mostly my mother, because my father wasn't home much. I never liked to sleep in the dark, and there were no outlets in my room for a lamp or none that wanted to work at the time. As I laid in bed, almost every night, I'd look out into the hall, and I would be able to see the hall light on. Almost every single night as I lay in bed, a boy would walk past my door several times and then stop. It was a white glowing type thing that I remember perfectly well. It scared me a bit, but I never got an evil aura off of him. A thing about the boy is that he had died a long time ago before we had moved in. It scared me all the time to recall it though, even though he isn't bad. I've only slept with the door open once. Since then, my parents got the outlets working. I was sleeping in a different room, but it was across the room the boy had died in. I looked outwards from my slumber, my glasses still on my face because I always fall asleep watching TV. I saw the boy, and he went into my brother's room. That night, my brother got really sick. I don't know what happened, but the boy had died of a sickness. Another thing that happened. Me and my friends were sitting out on my back porch, and my one friend had brought a Ouija board with her. My other friend suggested that we play. Of course, I didn't want to because I've had past experiences that turned out bad with those things with other friends. We sat at the table and put each of our hands on it. Before we started though, we read something that had said you must finish a question. We thought we would. Beside the porch is a pool. This will fit into what happened as I go. We didn't believe that the board would actually work though, and so we tried, even with the past experiences I didn't think it would. So this is what we did. We tapped our fingers while the thing was moving, so that no one could move it themselves. We did get in contact with the spirit, and we, of course, ended up not finishing a question. Then, we noticed from the pool a mist that started to emerge. I kid you not, it was a ghostly apparition floating above the pool. It lasted for about 10 seconds, and then it faded away. I then decided to finish the question. My friend immediately stopped me and asked me what I was doing. You're conjuring up evil, she said to me. It was clear that she didn't want to do this anymore, so we stopped, and we never returned to that Ouija board again. In fact, we went out to the fireplace, and we burned the Ouija board so that we would never have any bad omens attached to us. Yet another incident occurred. About a year ago, I met up with some different kind of people, Wiccans to mostly say, and I still am Wiccan now. I took it in, because God actually hadn't helped me one slight bit with my life, so I started to believe in gods. I learned some good spells, and some bad. The ones I used most were the exorcism spells for haunted houses around here. My house I knew had quite a lot of ghosts in it, and I decided to get rid of one particular one. One that would scare the entire family as we slept. At night, if you were to turn the light off in the living room, the room would turn a deep dark blood red, and the windows to the place would disappear. When you looked to one corner of the place, you could see a black figure walking out of it. This is the ghost I decided to rid the house of. It never spoke during anything. It would only appear and nothing more. My sister and her friends hadn't believed me when I told them of what was going on in the room and they tested it for themselves. As we did it, they saw exactly what I was saying and screamed for me to turn the light on. I actually sleep in that room still. The ghost is still there, but it doesn't bother us anymore. When I had tried the exorcism, the ghost had gotten angry and thrown the lamp at me. If not for me dodging it and then grabbing it before it hit the wall, I would have been in trouble. It glared at me and disappeared. 
you're probably thinking, this is absolute bull, but I can assure you, it was not. And I tell you this, not because I really want you to believe in some fantasy story, but because this actually happened. I couldn't even believe with my own eyes what was occurring. When I returned to the room that night, and from then on, the ghost never came back, or it didn't bother us anyway. There are other ghosts in my house, ones that are in the cellar, but I've only heard them, not actually seen them. Anyway, this last event occurred outside of my house. Anyway, one night I was out with my friends, against my parents' will. We had left when they were asleep. It was around 3 a.m. in the morning and we wanted to see what was around the area. We went up to the graveyard near and sat down by some of the older graves deeper into the graveyard. As we were sitting there, I looked up to see a dark and black figure standing by one of the trees. He wasn't looking at me or my friends, but something else. I had been leaning up against the grave. I didn't have much respect for the dead at the time until after this. I turned around and looked up to see a white figure standing there, looking at the black figure. They then turned their eyes towards me. I tugged on my friend's arm, but she didn't reply. She was asleep, along with the two other people that were there with us. I backed up off the grave as the white one glared at me. When I got completely away, they had turned their eyes back to each other and had vanished. Before our marriage, my husband purchased a home built sometime previous to 1870 in the center of a small town in Michigan. It is a lovely house, we still have it, with high ceilings and wide archways between some of the rooms. When we moved in, we had very modern furniture which really didn't look right in the house, so our friends would bring us antiques whenever they could find them, very cheaply or for free. One friend bought us a very large round antique mirror that he had found in a house his company was hired to tear down. It was the kind with a gilded wood and molded frame with a medallion at the top, a glass, while it had some dark spots and shadings, was in exceptionally good condition. This was back in the mid to late 70s, and we had parties almost every weekend. In the summer when the doors were left open, no one bothered knocking. They just opened the screen and came in. Late one Friday or Saturday evening, shortly after receiving the mirror, I was sitting on a low sofa against the east wall of the living room. Also on this wall was a large archway leading into the dining room which is where the main entry door that we used was located. There was also a door leading into the living room from the front porch, but no one used this one. The mirror was hung on the north wall, right next to the couch where I was sitting. Everyone else was sitting in the middle, or at the opposite end of the room, large room. I was looking to my right, and noticed in the mirror that a young man was walking through the archway into the living room, and stopped right at the threshold. At first glance, I did not recognize him, so I turned on the couch to look at him directly, and there was no one there. I looked over at the mirror again, and there he was. He was not a big guy, about five foot eight or five foot nine, thin built, dark hair, short for the times, and wearing what looked like one of those blue gray work shirts. I looked towards the archway again. No one was there. I shot off the couch and into the dining room to see if anyone was playing a trick on me. There was no one in any part of the house other than the living room. It made me very uneasy and I could never sit in that area again. In fact, I moved that couch a week later and even though the mirror still hangs there all these years later, I tried to avoid looking at it. A couple of years after this happened, I joined the local historical society. I met a wonderful tiny old lady in her 90s. 
She told me that she had been in my home many times during her youth, and I found out from her that during Prohibition, the people who owned a house would have parties with bootleg liquor. There was an argument late one evening, and a young man was killed by a blast from the barrels of a shotgun at close range in the area of the front entrance to the dining room. I'm not sure if it was him or not, but for three or four years after that, every night at 3.10 a.m., I would hear slow but steady footsteps on the creaky wood floors, walk from the archway, through the living room, and up to the bedroom door. They always stopped right there, thank God, and I tried to make sure they would come no further by hanging a crucifix on a hook inside of the bedroom door. After a few years, it either stopped or we grew so accustomed to it that we didn't notice it anymore. So. Do you think my spirit came with the mirror, or that the mirror just enabled me to see him? I don't know. I guess we'll find out sooner or later. Early March last year, my husband and I had the most terrifying night of our lives. Avid campers, we had never been scared sleeping out in the middle of nowhere in our tents. We went to a campground called Weldon Springs in Illinois about 45 miles from our home. We stayed at the backpacking area, which at that time of year is isolated, except for a few deer and birds. I felt fear the minute we walked into our spot. We had camped in that spot several times before with no weird occurrences. I felt like we were being watched. I tried to pass it off as dead trees and grass and a lack of other people around. By evening, Sitting around the fire, I was scared. Our friend came along to stay with us, had a sleeping bag with him, ready to camp. Oddly, he decided not to stay. When we got settled in our tent, hell broke loose. We laid there a minute, and I heard an odd stomping noise in the trail leading to our site. It got louder, like it was getting closer. I asked my husband after we discussed it ourselves, and he said he felt an evil presence there. Even though we were absolutely terrified, I told him to take a peek outside the tent, just so we could ease our minds about the situation and prevent our imagination from running wild. This was a terrible mistake. He told me when he looked out that he saw the ghost of a hunter with red eyes staring right at him, and then he floated off into the woods and then disappeared. It didn't last very long, but he could still tell that the man was wearing hunting gear from a different era. It definitely didn't look like the attire you would see today, according to him. He told me that the clothes that he wore looked a lot like the people in the Wild West would wear in the 19th century. My husband even said that it looked as if he didn't want to be seen, like he had the look of pure shock on his face. In a way, I wish I had seen it myself, but I know I wouldn't have been able to handle that. We know that there was something strange out there that night, and we'll never forget it. There's this camp that I know of. It's referred to as Camp Connecticut, and it's a run-down camp. It's called the Run Camp because of its deadly history where a group of men were once gathered, said to be a cult, and eventually the town had exiled them and were forced to stay at this camp outside of town. When abandoned, the caretaker's daughter was found brutally murdered in the camp, and all members of the camp denied any knowledge or participation in the murder. Whenever I go back to the camp, I've always experienced unsettling events that could be tied to the events just described. Experiences included voices. For example, a young girl screaming, which we thought could have been the young murdered girl. We have seen figures pass among the trees while walking through the narrow paths along the woods. In pictures that I have seen, there are many orbs near the main gate and near the large sign within the camp. Examination shown not to be a photo error or bad development. There was also this insane experience that my brother's best friend and his friends had. 
he happened to take a trip here, and while walking the main entrance pathway, he came across a man standing there in all white clothing. They called to him, and there was no response, so they turned to go the other way, and when they did, this presence in the white was standing right in front of them, with eyes that were completely black. As they turned and ran, it seemed as if the presence began to run after them. Anyway, as they got close to the main gate, they turned, and there was no one behind them at the time. They stopped again for a second, and turned back to look behind them again. They recall that about five apparitions, all in white, were standing right next to each other, and then they disappeared. It was as if they were letting them know that there were more of these ghosts. They then walked back to the car, and drove away. This place is very freaky to even just look at the main gate. I get scared every time I go. I will send our photos as soon as I get my scanner up and running. Thank you. I've been tempted to write about what happened to my family many times, but it seems far too unreal. We were not allowed to talk about this outside the house when I was a child, and my mother only told guests about her visitors when they experienced something in our house. Our childhood home was built in 1898. My parents bought the home in 1974, when I was only six months old. The house was very large and had been converted into a double. My grandmother moved into the upper level. Strange things began to happen shortly after my family moved in. My mother had her first experience one night after she had sent my older sisters to bed. From her bedroom door, she could look out and see into the kitchen hallway and into the bathroom. My family had only lived in the house less than a month when my mom saw a little blonde haired girl walk into the bathroom. All of my sisters have very dark brown hair and this was clearly a blonde haired child. My mother panicked and yelled to the little girl but the door shut. My mom jumped out of bed. In her mind, she was thinking that this little girl was a neighbor's child, that my sister must have snuck in the house. When she opened the door, there was nobody inside the room. My mother nicknamed the little girl Jessie, and I have no idea why. My mother had many experiences in the house, and with the younger children, myself, my younger sister and younger brother, when we were very small, it was as if we were playing with someone else. I don't remember this, but my mom did, but I do remember that in my oldest sister's bedroom in her closet, there was a paneled off section that led under our hallway steps to the second floor. I remember talking to someone that we called the lady under the stairs. I always thought that it was my mom or grandmother, but I later learned that this was not the case. When we told my mom about this, she would not let us play this game anymore. I do not remember being scared at all. My younger sister and I would also go into our hallway and play with the lady on the stairs. I have very little recollection of this at the time. I would have been about four years old and my sister would have been about three. When we described the woman to my mother, she forbade us from being in the hallway alone. I never took the ghost stories to heart and was very carefree as a child. I always felt safe. However. I did finally have a bizarre experience that I could not explain or rationalize away. My grandmother had a stroke when I was 15, and my mother gave my older sister's bedroom to my grandmother since it was on the first level and was safer for her. She had no control over what she was saying and was rapidly deteriorating. My parents didn't lay any crown rolls down for us kids that summer as things were in havoc and my brother and I had stayed up all night, watching Nick and Knight in the living room. I could see into my grandmother's room, and we also kept an eye out for her, should she use the bathroom or want something to drink. I was just starting to doze off, when I thought I saw someone in my grandmother's room. It was a blonde haired girl, who might have been 10 to 12. I have no idea the age. I thought I was seeing things, or that I was just really wiped out and my mom's stories were starting to get to me. 
I walked out into our kitchen and my oldest sister was eating a sandwich and I told her what I saw. She laughed at me and told me I must have been dreaming. I thought maybe she was right because I just never believed what my mom had been saying about the girl she had claimed to have seen on several occasions. Now here's where I realized I wasn't a complete nutcase. I said before that the house was very big. Well, my grandmother started screaming and my sister and I ran into the room. My grandmother was up and headed for the front door. She was screaming about fire and the little girl. We could barely make out what she was talking about, but she kept repeating. The little girl said I was going to hurt the baby and I have to go before I cause a fire. That was the most intelligible sentence that my grandma had said in over a month. My sister kept saying what little girl, and my grandmother said, clear as day, the little blonde haired girl. My grandmother was 72 years old and short of hearing. She was also three rooms away when I literally whispered this to my sister. We woke my mom up because we did not know what to do. My grandma ran out of the house and refused to come back in. She stood on her porch. My parents took her to the hospital and she was placed in a nursing home because even the mention of her house sent her into hysterics. The baby she was talking about is my younger brother who is the baby in the family. My mom decided to turn the house into a one family home again and had us kids, there were six of us, do the work. We did not mind as we wanted the help and it was a good way for us not to think about my grandmother all the time. My younger sister and I would be the only two sharing a room, but that was fine as we were very close and we were excited. Again I was up and could not sleep, so I went up to the room that would be ours. It had been my grandmother's and I was scraping wallpaper off the walls with a putty knife. We had started this project the night before and I was bored so I went up to get some more done. I was scraping the walls and had been doing so for about an hour when I heard a funny noise that sounded like the scraping noise I was making with the knife, but different. It's hard to explain. I thought someone was playing a trick on me, so I began to scrape the wall and very quickly, I stopped. However, the sound that I heard continued and it was the sound of scraping but it was coming from across the room. I do not know if whatever was in the room was mocking me or playing a game, but the scraping kept going on. Whoever or whatever did not care that I heard them. I screamed. I thought it was one of my older sisters. I ran down the front steps and opened the door and the house was completely quiet. Everyone was sound asleep, snoring. I woke up everyone in the house. I was terrified and I never slept in that room. I would continue to hear things in that house until I was 18 and moved out. As for our house restorations, my mother began working on the kitchen and back hallway that led to our attic. While doing so, she found where the house had burn marks and was scorched. My mother mentioned this to one of our neighbors, a woman who had lived on our street from the day she was born in the early 1920s. Our house had been burnt very badly and had been rebuilt. At that time, it had been converted to a double. A little girl and her parents lost their lives in the fire. My other sisters had things happen to them too. One of my older sisters was looking out the living room windows. Something grabbed her shoulder and called her name. One more thing, please don't think I'm nuts, but I've not had this happen in any house or apartment I've lived in since. And one thing I did notice is that whatever was in the house is not frightening to me in my youth, but only became frightening when each of us hit a certain age. I have no idea why. This was also something I thought that was so weird. The little girl was never visible upstairs, and the woman was only spotted downstairs once. A neighbor who was alive when the house caught on fire remembered that the little girl's name was Jessica. My mom had been calling her that for years and had never known what the little girl's real name was, but I just called her that because it seemed right.
Hi, I just thought I'd write to you guys to tell you what happened to me when I was about 12 to 13. I'm from Northwest England in a county called Cheshire. I was staying with my father in a small village called Renberry. He used to live in a large country house that has been around for many years. I think, but I'm not certain, that the house is in Victoria. I was staying for the weekend. The house does look spooky, but I never felt any kind of presence there until Sunday afternoon when my father popped out to the local store. He was only gone for about 15 minutes. It was about 9.30 p.m. and I decided that I needed the toilet. There was a downstairs toilet, but that was full of boxes and tools, so I had to go upstairs. I walked upstairs and went to the toilet. After flushing the loo, as the noise from the loo had gone and I was washing my hands, I heard the sound of a baby crying and screaming. Sound was coming from a nearby bedroom. This scared me a lot because I knew there was nobody in the house and it was not coming from the outside because the house is stuck in the middle of nowhere, just miles of farm fields around. I walked out of the toilet and headed towards the direction of the crying. As I opened the bedroom door, the sound flew past me, but no one was there. It was almost like the sound traveled through me. I was rooted to the spot with complete terror. I then turned to face the sound, which was now sounding like it was coming from one of the other bedrooms across the hall. I don't know why, but I headed to the other room. The crying baby was really, really loud, and I was sure that someone was hurting a baby. Looking back, maybe that's why I went to see. As I opened the door, I saw something I will never forget. There was a baby lying on the floor, but it didn't look right. Half of its body was stuck in the floor. I could see one of its legs pointing out, and a half of a face. It was wearing old looking clothes. The sound of the baby was almost deafening and it looked like someone was hurting it, but no one was there. This was all too much for me and I ran downstairs and outside into the dark and just waited for my father to return. I never told my dad anything. This is the first time I've ever told anyone. I thought I was going crazy because I've never believed in ghosts before. My father no longer lives there now, but I did go back once when he was visiting an old friend that now lives there, but I never went up their stairs on my own again. Well, I just thought that maybe you would find that interesting. Nail me back if you wish. Hope you don't think I'm lying, because it was all very real to me. I'm 20 years old now, and I have access to the internet. I spend my time looking for other people who've had similar things happen to them. Thank you for reading. Many years ago, my family and I lived in a lovely Queen Anne style home. We lived in it for 13 years, 11 of which we experienced paranormal phenomena. Two years after we moved in, we had our first of many odd occurrences. My daughter was in the kitchen and I was upstairs when I heard her call out that the upstairs toilet must have overflowed because water was running down the outside of the staircase. I ran to the top of the stairs in bare feet only to feel water on the surface of the carpeting. I looked over the top of the railing to assure her that the toilet hadn't overflowed and that was when I felt the wetness on my feet but there were no water pipes in that part of the house. When I got down the stairs, I found the water running in rivulets down the wooden molding. My daughter reached up to turn on the light under the stairway alcove, and as soon as she did, the water stopped. We had to wipe the trom down, and we never found any reason for that activity. Months later, while preparing for bed one night, I heard footsteps running down the attic stairs. The door crashed against the opposite wall, and then nothing. I was terrified, thinking that someone was there. They would have to pass my room to get downstairs, but nothing happened. When we finally went to look, the door was against the wall. 
We even thought that maybe a ball had bounced down the stairs, sounded like footsteps, but there was nothing. Strangely, when we started to think our house had unseen guests, we were no longer frightened. As time passed, we had many more experiences. I heard a woman crying softly, but pitifully. Two of my daughters saw images of old-fashioned children dressed in long white nightgowns and mob caps. A visitor to my house saw the same thing and asked me who the little girl was. On another occasion, my nephew was spending the night and thought he saw someone standing at the top of the stairs in a long white old-fashioned nightgown. My nephew was 16 at the time and we hadn't told him about the house. My husband thought we were all crazy because he didn't believe in this sort of thing. My daughter came home late one night and was just lying in bed, going over her evening, and looked up to see a male figure suspended over the bed. She watched the image dissolve from the top as if it were sand falling. There were other things that happened there, although nothing dangerous, and finally, we sold the house and moved down. It was several years after we moved on from the house that we met a family that had lived there years before we did and had very similar things happen to them when they said their experiences were very frightening and mean-spirited. I sometimes think our guests moved with us because from time to time we still get very strange sensations in our present Victorian home. I've had quite a few ghostly experiences over my life, all of which have been rather benevolent, except for one that happened a few years back. I was 24, living with my mother, my sister, and my two-year-old niece. One night, I woke up and looked up into the darkness. This thing flew down from the ceiling, straight at me with its arms out. I can still see it. It looked like a cross between a gargoyle and an alien. It looked so evil. It sounds silly, but I was so terrified that I ran out of my room screaming into the living room to be with my mother. I was shaking uncontrollably, and I sat with her for quite a while before I could convince myself that it was just a dream, and I went back to bed with no further problems. Well, a few months down the road, my sister was at home with her friend, Kelly, who seems to have some sort of connection with the paranormal, like her mother, and she sent her down the hall to get a towel for my niece. The linen closet is down the hall in my mother's room. Kelly came back a couple minutes later, white as a sheet. Now, my sister and Kelly are always talking about stuff like this, but this is what really freaked me out. She said that there was something in my mother's room, and it was a threatening presence. She then went on to describe it. About three foot tall, gray, kind of a cross between a gargoyle and something. I would never mentioned anything to my sister, and the only thing I had told my mother is that something scared me. I would never described what I saw to anyone in another related incident prior to my sighting. My mother was trying to sleep one night in her room, and as she is about to fall asleep, something breathed near her, kind of like a sharp exhale, right into her ear. She woke up the next morning with scratches in the middle of her back, and the freaky thing is, she slept alone, and there were only three, long, about six inches thin, scratches on her back. Needless to say, I'm very happy to be out of the house. I'm not sure if this qualifies as a ghost story, but it was more than an ordinary dream. My cat Johnny, my sweet silver bad boy for 10 years, died at home of aggressive cancer in March. During the month between his diagnosis and his death, I showered him with even more attention than usual. So by the time he passed away, we were closer than ever. On several occasions, including at his grave just before burying him, I invited him to come back and let me know he was okay. A few nights after his death, 
I was aroused by a dream by the sound of Johnny's meow, coming from the direction of his special spot at the foot of my bed. Coincidentally, his grave is about 30 feet further in the same direction. I waited with a mixture of hope and anxiety to film walking up my body to my face, but it didn't happen. Instead, I became aware of something tickling my left ear and tried to reach over the pedal, only to find that I was paralyzed. That's when I panicked, remembering all the scary ghost stories involving a period of paralysis. That was the moment where I woke up, and I suddenly saw something in the corner of the room. It was a dark, small figure, but I couldn't really make it out. It was a dark shadow, even though it was a very dark outline of something. I'm assuming it was a kid or something. It was very terrifying. I couldn't even believe what I was seeing. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like two grim reapers were standing right behind him. So this humanoid ghost, this figure, this creature, this child, was hunched over and was absolutely mortified himself. And these grim reaper type ghosts came to take him away. And just like that, Within seconds, they were all gone. I guess you can say that my cat didn't return. In fact, I think a demon actually returned. But I guess that's up for debate. Thanks for listening. After you read this experience, you might think I'm crazy or something. But believe me, it was the most terrifying night in my life. It has taken me a lot of time to get over it. Before I moved out, about a year ago, I lived in a hundred year old house. It had two floors, and my family only lived on the top floor. We barely ever went into the basement, because the floors were all rock, and there were no lights down there. One day, when I was about 15, I had a friend sleep over, and we thought it would be cool if we slept in the basement and told ghost stories. We gathered up our sleeping bags and our candles and went down to the basement. As soon as I entered the room we were going to sleep in, I immediately felt as if we were being watched, and I told my friend that I thought we should maybe sleep upstairs. She just told me to quit being a wimp and to set up my sleeping bag. As soon as we stayed up and talked and laughed, we never did tell ghost stories. I felt more comfortable and fell asleep easily. In the middle of the night, I remember this so clearly because this scared the crap out of me so bad and I'm absolutely positive I wasn't dreaming. I woke up to knocking coming from one side of the house and slowly getting louder and closer. And right when it was so near that it was shaking the ground, there was a big crash and it went away. I sat up straight in my sleeping bag, and my whole body was trembling. After I calmed down a bit, a figure appeared at the foot of my sleeping bag, and I froze. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't do anything. The figure was of a man dressed in rags that were covered in coal. He stared at me as if he recognized me from somewhere, and then his eyes widened. And exclaimed with a gasp, Mary Beth, Mary Beth, help me. He then disappeared with a flash of light. Apparently, my friend had woken up right when he disappeared and saw the flash of light. The next day I told my parents, and they said that they had felt a presence down in the basement earlier. I read up on the history of our house and found out that the mistress of the house was named Mary Beth, and her picture resembled myself. One of her servants had been trapped in the basement and tried to climb out of the coal chute without succeeding, and after being trapped for about three days, he died in an unexplained fire accident while in the basement. Thank you for taking your time to read this. Hello. I have another ghost experience for you. In March of 1994, my husband, my oldest daughter and I, 
We visited Venice. We booked a room at the ancient Palacio. We were assigned a room on the second floor, overlooking a canal. The view was accessed by opening the heavy wooden shutters, which opened into the room. These had a metal rod, which fit into a U-shaped hook on the other window. Opening out were double windows, also heavy, with numerous panes of glass. This room had double beds, with a narrow walkway between them. About three times during our two days there, we would hear footsteps start from approximately the middle of the room, and march smartly over to the windows, at which point the wooden shutters would fly open. We would track this phenomenon with our eyes, but saw nothing and felt no fear. The first time we rushed over to the windows to check them, these shutters were so heavy that it felt doubtful that a gust of wind was blowing them open. What's more interesting is that the glass pane windows remained shut and seemed pretty airtight. The catch was not all that easy to work, either. My daughter, then 14, remembers having to struggle with it to open it. Even my oh-so-logical and mechanical husband looked over the shutters and could come up with no good explanation. The last night we were there, we retired for the night with my husband and I in one bed, and my daughter in the other. She and I could hold hands in the space between the beds. They were so close together. Right after lights out, we heard the footsteps, this time walking up between the beds to where our heads were. We could hear breathing. We were both too scared to do anything but we certainly compared notes the next morning. I wanted to ask as we were checking out if the place was haunted, but the only folks on duty that morning didn't speak English, and we don't speak Italian, but we'll never forget the place. About 10 years ago, when I still lived in Pennsylvania, a group of friends and I took a joyride out to the Quaker Cemetery just for a good night scare. It was a chilly, full moonlit November night, and there were six of us there, five guys, and me, the only girl. It was the perfect setting for a ghost. Now, I don't know how many of your readers have ever been to this cemetery, but describe the first time I saw the place. I screamed and just about curdled my boyfriend's blood. The crematorium scared me the most. I don't know. Something about the way it looks and what it was used for. Anyway, back to that night. Two of the guys were acting like morons and jumping all over the place and around the markers inside the cemetery. I was angry at their pure disrespect for this old place and so I tried telling them to stop. But of course, as excited as they were getting, they wouldn't listen. Me and this other guy were too chicken to go along with them, especially because of the way they were acting. They were bound to disturb and peace in the cemetery, so we stayed by the car. We kept hearing a fake bird call coming from the trees along the opposite side of the road, and then I started smelling the lily axe. The lily axe scent somehow wasn't disturbing, even though it was November and none were blooming, and also, there weren't any fresh flowers placed on any of the very old graves. The fake bird call almost scared the life out of us, because it just sounded so unnatural, and with each chirp, sounded closer and closer. We decided that we really needed to get out of there, so we both sat inside the car, waiting for the others. I got myself in such a worked up state, that when I found a quarter on the ground, I swore, in blood we trust, was written on it, rather than the usual in God we trust. My friend just laughed at me. The story that I'm about to relate to you took place when I was about 11 years old. I'm 17 now, and most people whom I've conversed with about this matter shrug it off as the hallucinations of a child. It was the fall of about 92 or 93, maybe before, maybe after, I do not honestly remember. I was living with my father here in Texas at the time, 
because my mother had hauled off to Arizona to take care of her father, who had succumbed to a stroke. My father and I had gone to my grandmother's house for dinner. My grandfather was out of town visiting relatives in another part of the state. My father, my grandmother, and myself were in the kitchen conversing about things that I can no longer recall. Because my memories of this occasion are starting to fade and jostle in my mind. My father told me to go wash my hand in the restroom, as my grandmother had just finished making dinner and we're about to sit and eat. I walked out of the kitchen and into the dining room. As I looked in the general direction of the restroom, which was about 15 feet from where I was standing, I noticed two things immediately. The toilet was making strange noises which isn't uncommon in houses, and there was what appeared to be a man in a shroud, standing in the restroom, with his hands under the faucet, staring at me. I don't remember exactly what my feeling was at the time, except for a bit of fear, and a bit of awe at the supernatural. I'm a big reader, and around that time in my life, I was getting into ghost stories, and other paranormal phenomena. I then walked back into the kitchen, and my father asked me if I'd washed my hands. Of course, being as frightened as I suppose I was, I told him that I had, and then I proceeded to eat my dinner. But the events of that night have never entirely left me. I'd seen the man in the cloak on at least two other occasions since, but those stories are for a later time. Thanks for reading, and good night. This story was told to me by an ex-boyfriend, Mike, when we first started dating. We were still getting to know each other, so when he told me he was very afraid of spirits, I believed him, because it's not the type of thing you'd say if you were trying to impress a girl. I asked him why, and this is what he told me. Mike's first encounter with ghosts was about 10 to 12 years ago, when he and his family, mom, dad, Little brother George and Mike were living in a house in the northwest side of Chicago. This particular house had an attic, which was used to store the items that came with the house when before Mike's family bought it. Nothing too unusual, mostly furniture and such. At this time, Mike was probably 15 years old, and his brother George was probably 9 years old. They were up in the attic one afternoon, goofing around pretending to be acrobats and wrestlers. Eventually, they got tired and George collapsed on the floor while Mike sat in the old recliner that came with the house. The brothers continued talking until their mother called from downstairs, announcing that dinner was ready. The boys had worked up an appetite, so they bolted out of the attic. Mike was the last one out, and as soon as he shut the door behind him, he remembered that he left the light on. Knowing his mother would be mad if he didn't turn it off, Mike opened the door to the attic, took one step in, and froze. The recliner that Mike had been sitting in was slowly turning towards him. Mike tried to command his body to run, but he was so scared he seemed rooted to the floor. The recliner turned enough so that Mike could see the form of a knee, and it was at that point that Mike got the strength to bolt out of the room and down to the kitchen. He told his parents what he saw, and of course they didn't believe him, but Mike refused to stay in the house any longer. He was so upset that his parents made arrangements for him to sleep at his aunt and uncle's house that night. Furthermore, this was the last time Mike ever stepped foot into the house. He stayed with his aunt and uncle until his family sold the house a few months later. Of course, his parents objected to his imposing on his relatives' hospitality, but they were too afraid to force him to come back, fearing he would have some sort of breakdown. The next house Mike's family moved into was still in Chicago, and not too far from the old house. Everything was going fine until one night, when Mike's family had friends over for dinner. After dinner, the adults and Mike sat around the island in the kitchen, having coffee and talking, while year-old George played outside in the backyard with the guest little boy 
Sam. At one point, George opened the kitchen door and ran through the kitchen, past all the adults, and straight into the adjoining bathroom. Nobody thought anything of this until about 10 minutes later, when Mike's dad questioned why George was taking so long in the bathroom. Mike's dad knocked on the bathroom door, asking George if everything was all right. No answer. Mike's dad tried to open the door, but it was locked from the inside. Everyone started getting concerned until the kitchen door opened again and in came George and Sam. Mike's father asked George how he snuck back out of the bathroom without anyone seeing him. You see, there is no other way out of the bathroom. If George came out or even opened the door, he would have been seen. In order to get back outside, he would have had to go through the kitchen again. George swore up and down that he had not been to the bathroom at all. He was outside playing with Sam the whole entire time. Mike's father asked him again to explain about the locked bathroom door, but when they checked it again, it was not locked. There were other strange incidents that happened in the house, mostly to Mike, more than anyone else in the family. The last incident Mike told me about was something that happened to him a few months before we met, when he was about 22 years old. One night, as Mike was laying in bed, he woke up with an uneasy feeling. He was lying on his side facing the wall, and he felt as if someone was staring at him. It was the middle of the night, and pitch black in the room. Mike turned over and opened his eyes and saw a black figure standing next to his bed, staring down at him. Mike shut his eyes and screamed for his mother repeatedly. When she came storming in the room, Mike told her what had happened. It seemed as if such occurrence happened sporadically. Strangely enough, when Mike was getting to the point of forgetting them, seems as if the spooks recognized this and remind them of their presence every now and again. I was kind of skeptical when Mike told me the story, mainly because I was just getting to know him. I couldn't tell if he was a habitual liar or something, but the way he acted and the way he told me the stories was enough to make me wonder if he was a spook magnet. We only dated a couple of months, and maybe that was for the best. It might be younger than some of you. But I've had a lot of experiences. I'm 18 years old. About a week after my 10th birthday, my uncle had taken his own life inside my grandparents' house, the one I'm currently living in now. After his death, I would refuse to go down into the basement where it happened. I would always hear unsettling noises to the point in which I would feel so uncomfortable being in that home. The odd part is, it would only happen when everyone was in bed and I was home alone. As creepy as it was, I still had somewhat of a morbid curiosity to go down there. Though, of course, I could never bring myself to do it. There would be times I would hear very faint snarling and growling sounds. Other times, I would hear weeping. It was very disturbing. Then about six months after my uncle's death, my 17-year-old cousin had died in a car wreck. One night, I was so upset over the deaths that I had stumbled down there without thinking about where I had went. I was so overcome with grief of emotions that I was bawling my eyes out. It got to the point where it was too much for me. I was sitting on the couch thinking about ending it all so I could be with them. Just when I was about to, I felt a hand on my shoulder and I knew instantly that it was my uncle. That moment made me realize that it was okay to continue on. That may have been a positive experience, but I assure you, it didn't get better in that basement, in that house moving forward. One evening, I was up in my bedroom. My parents were again fast asleep when I heard a disturbing wailing again coming from the basement. I have a vent in my room, and it connects directly down to the basement. I could hear these cries coming from the vent. 
I listened closer through the vents, and I could have sworn I heard my name being whispered. Like an idiot, I thought maybe my uncle had returned and wasn't feeling well. So I swallowed my pride and went down into the basement so I could at least tell him that everything would be okay. As I opened the basement door and looked down the steps, at the end of these steps, I saw a figure for a moment's time. It wasn't my uncle. In fact, it was a black misty shadow, and it slowly evaporated. It seemed to be there for a few seconds, then it was gone within a blink of an eye. I then turned around, heard a distinct growl, then ran back up the rest of the steps and back into my room. Sometimes when I walk around the house, I can feel something watching and even following me. It's not always my uncle, but it definitely feels like something evil. It wasn't too long ago that me and my 21 year old cousin went to go see her dad. Now, this is the cousin that was in the wreck with the one that passed away. Jean, the 21 year old cousin, had told me that she had felt her sister's spirit with her before. While we were up late at night talking about her, we suddenly felt her presence with us. It was like she was sitting there and listening to us. Then, not too long ago, I was over at a friend's and was going to stay the night. We were in her room, talking about how she thought that maybe she had a ghost living in her house. Of course, I'm sitting there nodding my head. Then I felt something grab my necklace that I was wearing. So we got freaked out and ran to the living room and checked out my neck. Whatever had touched me left a great big red check mark on my neck. Then about 5 to 10 minutes later, it felt like something was grabbing my legs. I pulled up my pant legs, and it had red marks all over my legs. So me and my friend decided to get out of the house and go bowling. Over at the bowling alley, the marks had turned white and disappeared. Well anyway, when we got back to our house, the marks returned, and I kept feeling things grabbing me and following us occasionally. But the weird thing is, nothing was happening to her, and she told me that nothing like this has ever happened to one of her friends before. I was beginning to think that this bad presence at my home was starting to attach itself to me. So we decided to go to bed. While we were laying there, it felt like someone had come up and sat down on the bed between us. So I looked over, and no one was there. I haven't been over to my friends ever since. A friend sent me this and suggested that I tell my stories. So here's one of them that I hope you enjoy. I have more if you'd like to hear. I live in Clinton, Illinois, which is a small town. We have a lake. And that's pretty much about it. One night, I was out joyriding in the cemetery with a friend, as I like to do from time to time, and I had to go to the restroom. So, I went to this access area that is out in the country. I went to the restroom and then walked through the pavilion to look at the lake. I then came back to my car and then crawled into the driver's seat. I looked up, and there was this little boy ducking behind a garbage can. He had red eyes that glowed like a demon's, and teeth that were jagged and white. A black figure that looked like a medium-sized dog was beside him, and it was black. All that you could see was its red eyes. They both stared at us in the car, and I felt fear overwhelm me. I quickly started the car and left. The next day I told my mom about it. She grew up in the area and she said that they often had Satan worshippers out there and that rumors were that a little boy was drowned and used as a sacrifice many years ago. My aunt, she says that the little boy was evil and therefore was put to death in that spot. 
I've tried to research this, but there are no records of any murder of a child taking place in this area, but I will never go there again, night or day. This is just one of the countless stories that I have. I have some photos too. I don't know if you can use this, but if you can, feel free to. You may also edit if needed. Have you ever stayed at the Holiday Inn? You should, because this story is outrageous. In early of July 1999, I spent a work week there for a regional curriculum camp. I had originally been slated to share a room with other teachers on the first floor. However, the room was a smoking room, and the odor was causing my asthma to flare up, so I was transferred to a room on the fourth floor. Buggered if I can remember the room number. When I retired on Monday night, I had not heard yet of the ghost or any legends. I was awoken three times during the night by the phone ringing. I was really ticked because no one was ever there. I vowed to speak with someone at the front desk about it. In the morning I learned about Tanya, the ghost. We all laughed at the story thinking it was something to amuse tourists. Being WNY natives, we weren't going to be suckered by any such nonsense. I forgot to talk to anyone about the phone and decided not to bother. I fell asleep very quickly that night. I was awakened that night by the sensation that someone was staring at me from the left side of the bed. I have small children. My son often wakes me using the stare method. Now, I might have thought the ghost story was crap, but I wasn't going to test the theory by looking to see what was next to me. I said go away, I'm not going to look at you, I need my sleep. The sensation immediately left me, and I slept the rest of the night, quite peacefully. I awoke and went to my morning sessions without anything remarkable happening. However, I had to return to my room mid-morning to fetch some papers I needed for the next session. The curtains were open on the doors leading out to my balcony, which was not unusual. Housekeeping always opened the doors after cleaning. What was unusual was the number of small, sticky handprints all over the outside of the doors. These were no higher than my waist. I shook my head at the poor cleaning job. I was sure that the previous guests must have children with them and that the maid had failed to clean the prints off the glass. I wonder how hard it was to open the doors and give the glass a good cleaning and then I hustled off to make my session. As the day progressed, I heard more tales of Tanya, like how she throws the poolside chairs into the pool during the night, etc. We giggled amongst ourselves, like good campers should when hearing ghost stories. None of us was going to admit we believed any of it, especially when our principals were listening. So, I was half joking while I was in my room, getting ready for bed, and said out loud, Listen Tanya, I don't know how old you are, but I think you'll enjoy the books in the falls room. If you can read, you'll really like them, even if you can't. Lots of them are full of beautiful pictures that I bet you'll like to look at. Go there instead of bugging me. I slept like a log without any interruptions that night. When I went to breakfast the next morning, I told a colleague about my chat with Tanya. I mentioned that it must have worked because I had slept so well. I stopped talking when I saw my colleague's jaw drop and her face go white. I asked her what the matter was, and she took me over to the professor who was leading the sessions in the falls room. My colleague said to the professor, tell us what you found in the room this morning. I listened in stunned silence as the professor described what a mess the room was. Books were thrown all over the place, the display table was in shambles, and her boxes of supplies had been unpacked and poorly repacked. In her own words, she said it looks like a kid went through everything and tried to put things back together 
but couldn't manage. The professor had questioned the hotel staff about who had access to the room, and all swore that no one had been in the room after we had left, and that the door had been locked until the staff left the professor in the morning. I apologized when she finished and explained that it had probably caused the mess by inviting Tanya to go there. We all laughed uneasily at that. Some of their teachers on the fourth floor admitted the strange things, like the ringing phone, no caller, and the sensation of being watched. Suddenly, we weren't so sure that the story was something just to amuse the tourists. Were the phone calls, staring sensations, sticky fingerprints, and trash conference room related? There could be logical explanations, like incorrectly routed calls, poor cleaning, and staff mischief. Maybe Tanya was drawn to all of us warm, female, motherly-like type teachers. No male teachers that I know of on that floor. And yes, all of us are moms too. One thing is for sure, I'm far less skeptical of the paranormal than I was before. And I will admit, even to my principal, that something odd happened in that hotel. If you really want to check out the paranormal, then you have to go to the Grand Island Holiday Inn. You can pretend you came here to see Niagara Falls. I've had many experiences with ghosts and hauntings, all beginning around age 3. I'm now 28, and my connection to ghosts and spirits has only grown stronger with time. I suppose I should start with my earliest haunting. I was around 10 years of age. My parents had just divorced, and I was feeling alone and angry. I don't like to sleep with my bedroom door open. When I did, I felt I was being watched. One summer night, the air was hot and humid, and I had no choice but to sleep with my door open to get a cool cross breeze. I remember waking up sometime around midnight or shortly thereafter feeling I was being watched. When I looked out my bedroom door, I saw a frightening sight. A figure with pure black skin, bright yellow eyes, and a cloak of red, white, and black hurlican-like design was staring at me, its hands on the door jamb, about to enter the threshold of my room. I screamed, saw its eyes widen in shock, possibly and flee down the hall adjacent to my room. I even saw its robes fluttering after it, as it fled. My scream woke my family, who searched the room for the thing, lack of a better word, but found nothing. All the doors were locked, no windows were broken. I shut my door, put up with the heat, and it hasn't returned since. I've been told that the creature was a demon. I also found out that I was depressed at the time, and that may have been drawing it to me. I can still feel its presence when I think about it. I feel very frightened just remembering the experience. Thank you for letting me share my experience here. I wanted to share my own personal experience with you regarding my beloved Nana. She passed away in 1984. I took her death very hard and would go to visit her grave often. After my now ex-husband and I married in 1998, I became pregnant within the year. Since I knew that my ex and I would not stay together for the long term, and since our marriage was so troubled, I found myself up at Nana's grave many times, sometimes just to talk to her and ask her to guide me and to watch over myself and the baby. The first time I went to see her grave, I hadn't been there for nearly two years at the time. I was pretty certain of what row her stone was in, but not completely sure. I asked her out loud to help me find her, and so help me God if I'm lying. I ended up parking directly in front of her row. I thanked her and walked over to her grave, placing a single rose on it and crying. I was about six months pregnant with my daughter at the time and I was very certain that her love for us would get us through the rough months ahead. Shortly after our daughter was born, 
My ex-husband and I were having major problems, major fights. It was obvious to the both of us that we would eventually split up permanently. We separated when my daughter was three months old, and I moved into an apartment with my infant. Shortly after, I could feel my Nana's presence. I never saw anything. I always asked her not to appear to me, as she knew I would be afraid. But her presence was unmistakable, especially in my daughter's nursery. It never frightened me conversely. I felt very comforted and protected. As a new mother, I took many photos of my infant those first few months. I never noticed until a friend pointed out to me that in one of them, which was a picture of the nursery, there is a vortex on the right, like a solid bar of white light, and to the left of that, an arch mist that almost looks like the shape of a rainbow, but you can see the wall right through it. Also, the picture of the room came out as if I had taken it from on the floor, or close to the floor, and pointed the camera up. I would have never taken a picture from that angle, and I know I didn't. I cried when I realized that the vortex and the light are my Nana watching over her great-great-granddaughter and me. I don't think it's a coincidence, either, that the photo is focused on the rocking chair and the mist is right across it. I should also mention that shortly after my Nana passed away in the 80s, and my brother and I still lived at the home with my parents, that one night I was up reading in bed and walked out into the kitchen. My brother was sitting at the kitchen table, shaken and white as a sheet, almost crying. A second later, my mother walked out of her bedroom and she was crying. They both professed at exactly the same moment that they had seen Nana appear to them and tell them not to worry and that she was all right. I might add that their bedroom were on opposite sides of the house. My mother also had a separate incident where she saw my Nana at the end of her bed. She wasn't at all afraid, she was comforted. I still visit my Nana just to say hello and it comforts me to know that someday I'll meet her again. Until then, I guess I'll just be comforted by her presence and know that her ghost is still looming around. And no matter what, I'm always a fan of Nana. How can he not like Nana? She's amazing. I miss you, Nana, but I'll see you again. This incident occurred about 20 years ago in Michikawa, Indiana, when I was only nine. Our house was built in 1904, so I had the huge sawed oak doors in trim. The living room was very long, with ceilings which are 12 feet high. I hope you got the idea of the architecture of this house. The basement was a full one, divided into two rooms, and this is where most of the presents seemed to be. I'll get to that later. Back to the house though. The master bedroom was downstairs with this entrance being oak sliding doors. All of the fixtures were of the early 1900s also, so the living lights were hanging chandeliers, one at each end of the living room. The upstairs had three bedrooms, with a landing at the top with a banister guarding the stairs. The stairs were enclosed and curved, and this will be important in a minute. The house upstairs wasn't insulated well, so in the winter, it was cold, and in the summer, hot. As a consequence, my two brothers and I slept on the pull-out couch downstairs. One night, my younger brother and I went upstairs to get ready for bed, and as we were going down the stairs, I looked back up due to the feeling something was there, and I saw an apparition coming towards us. I screamed and told my brother to look up. He did, and saw the same. So we flew down the rest of the stairs and yelled at our parents to go look for the man. They did, and of course, nothing was there. Now, let me describe the ghost. He was not opaque, he was complete in his form, and he was dressed in Catholic's priest clothes. I noticed this because we were not Catholic, but my friend next door was, and I visited her church just down the road. I thought this was very peculiar, 
But what I thought was even more peculiar was the fact he was holding a gun, and he pointed it directly at us, or so what I thought was a gun. Of course, my parents told us we were young and had very vivid imaginations, and it was nothing. Years later, however, my mother confessed that she knew the house was haunted, and also because when she was the only one home, she would hear something walking up the stairs and on the stairs. We always had German Shepherds, and our dog would growl at the ceiling and would never go in the basement. Now, on to the basement. I knew there was a presence here in the back room where the water heater was, because it was much colder, and felt wrong. It felt evil and bad, and didn't want anyone there, because it felt you, and you just had to leave immediately. I want to say, that the upstairs didn't have this feeling to it. Even though this is where we saw the man, I'm not sure of the history of this house. And soon after this incident, we moved to Florida on my dad's company transfer. I just want to give my opinion on this. After researching different types of hauntings, I feel that this was a replay of some kind, and I was a witness to it. I do feel that there might have been more than one presence, because the evil in the basement was different than the other, and the one in the basement didn't want anyone there. He did other things to give us this feeling. Mostly, the noises were harmless and no bother to us, but it was the basement that we avoided for whatever reason. I would love to hear what you all think of this, and the type of haunting you feel it is. I used to spend a lot of nights driving around in my youth. I was young and reckless, and had no clear direction in life, so I'd often find myself aimlessly driving, late at night. I'd spent a majority of my adolescent years dependent on drugs, and unfortunately, almost succumbed to an overdose. I was harming others, but most importantly, I was on a path to self-destruction. The night before my overdose, I had a creepy paranormal experience that, fortunately for me and those around me, changed my entire life for the better. It was another one of those late night drives. I'd gotten into a verbal altercation with my parents. Words that weren't meant to be said were exchanged, and I ended up running away from home. I took the keys and headed out driving for hours until I ended up in an unfamiliar town. I was starting to get a little exhausted was six hours away from home and was running low on gas. What happened next will always be embedded into my subconscious for the rest of my life. I pulled up to a gas station in the middle of nowhere. Now, like I said, this area was completely isolated from the rest of the world. It had a last house on the left kind of feel. Until I ended up at the gas station, I'd driven past miles and miles of just cornfields and farmland woods all around, nobody in sight. I ended up walking to the gas station and bought myself a pack of cigarettes from the station attendant. He noticed I looked a little confused and asked if I was lost. I said yeah, I was. This was before GPS and cell phones and I didn't have a map with me. He told me there was a bridge in the distance that was visible from the gas station less than a mile or so away, but said if I crossed it, I could pass another town nearby and find a highway that could take me back home. I thanked him, pulled my gas, and went driving towards the bridge. As I started to make my way through this road, and on my way through the bridge, rain started to pour down, and I could barely see through my windshield. It had rained so much that it almost obscured my vision, and there was no source of light anywhere along the dirt road I was traveling on except for my headlights. The guy at the gas station told me the bridge was very close by, and even though I could see it in the distance before it started raining hard, it felt like it had been forever before I could see it. Just then, I finally came across the bridge, despite the downpour. This is the part that really startled me. I was driving across the bridge, absolutely nobody in sight, no other cars. It was late at night, 3 a.m., and nothing but trees and bushes scattered around the bridge. 
I kept driving across this long bridge, and that's when my headlights shined onto this small child who suddenly appeared within my field of vision. All I could remember was that his eyes were glowing, almost like an animal in the night. I was unable to stop in time, and I thought I had hit him. I immediately panicked, stopped the car in the pouring rain, got out to check to see if he was okay, and the kid was nowhere to be found. It confused the hell out of me, because again, what kid would be playing around in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, and in the pouring rain? I didn't even hear a thud, or any noise besides the sound of the rain falling down on my car. At the moment of impact, I looked under the car. It was as if this child didn't even exist. I remember distinctly that the boy was wearing overalls and a hat. It looked like a completely real boy. There was no mistaking that this was a human. Now, I mentioned my recklessness and drug abuse because this incident caused me to turn my life completely around. I was so worried that I accidentally hit a child and it may have ran off into the woods that it made me swear to always be alert and never fight with my parents again. This happened when my brother was around five years old. It was around 2 a.m. and he went into my parents' room to get in bed with my mom. My mom's bed was right by one of the bathroom doors. The door on the other end of the bathroom led to where the back door was and the stairs to the basement. He got in bed and was facing the bathroom. He got scared and woke up my mom and asked who the little girl in the bathroom was. He said he had never seen her before. He told my mom that she was just standing there, staring at him. My mom said the way he was talking, like there was really someone there. It really scared her. She said she just rolled over and shut her eyes. She was too scared to even look. I don't think a five-year-old imagines things like that. While we were in the same house, my mom's cousin was hunting in the mountains and accidentally fell on his gun and killed himself. The family thinks he came back to say bye because it was such a sudden death. A few days after he died, when we were all in bed, a light in the hallway bathroom would click on and off. It was an older house, so the switch made a really loud click when he turned it on and off. My mom would be sitting on the couch late at night, with her back facing the hallway. You can sometimes feel when someone is behind you, and she said she heard me breathing hard and walking up the hallway. She called my name and turned around, and no one was there. At the same time, at her cousin's parents' and sister's house, similar things were happening. His old toys from when he was younger were stored in the basement of his parents' house. One night his electric train turned on, and was going around the track. No one knew this was happening to other family members, until my mom called his parents and told them what was happening to her. The next day they went somewhere and tried to contact them. They all said they loved him and it was time for him to move on. They think he was trying to contact the family because he died suddenly. After they talked to him, everything stopped. The following happened back in July 1995. Me and a friend traveled around the UK by train. It was about 4 p.m. Then we checked in at a bed and breakfast in Manchester. All double room was occupied, so we got the two single rooms, which was located next to each other. We were quite tired after a long day trip by train, so we rest for a moment. Later we went out to eat something, had a beer in the hotel bar, and then headed up to the rooms for sleeping. The time was about 11 p.m. I closed the Venican blind, turned off the light, and almost immediately fell asleep. The room was pitch dark. Then, after about two hours I woke up and found the room bathed in light. The light almost blinded me. I had a strong emotion to walk towards the window, just like I was enforced to do so. And then I went up, I heard voices and music, 
like old folklore or something. The voices was only like a murmur, so I actually couldn't hear what it says. It was like being in a full up restaurant or a pub or something. I was not actually scared, but it was an easy and confusing experience. Then I reached the window and opened the Venetian blind. Everything turned to normal again, quiet and pitch dark. I went back to bed again, and to my surprise, I fall asleep after only about 10 minutes. The morning after, we met up and headed down the stairs for breakfast. Afraid of being regarded as a fool or jackass, I told him it was only a dream. Then, I almost dropped my coffee pot when he told me that the exact same thing happened to him. He has always been quite skeptical to the paranormal things, but I think this experience has changed his mind a bit. I would be very glad if you could give me your opinion. I have apprehension about what really happened that night. I know I was fully awakened, and it can't be my imagination, because the same thing happened to him. As I said in a previous mail, I'm not so good with English, so I hope you understand me. You may publish my story if you want, but you better circumscribe it before. Hi there, my name's Joe. My friend Colin probably wrote you recently about some recent activity. For the past I don't know how many years, I've been able to feel and to an extent see ghosts. I can sense what they are feeling and what their intentions are. However, for about three years, my friend Colin started having sleeping problems. I already knew his house was haunted, but what was haunting it was the spirit of what I think is a five-year-old child. For Christmas the year before, a friend of ours that lived in Thailand sent us all gifts. However, Colin was the one that received a house that she would leave tokens and gifts in to help ward off evil spirits. Over time, it stopped doing that. Trapped in the house with some kind of creature, like a demon, it was huge, dark, and very menacing. I still don't know how to use all of my abilities very well, but at the time, I sure as hell didn't, but I attempted this anyway. We attempted to destroy the house and everything in it. It took 45 minutes just to get it to catch fire. During this 45 minutes, I was attempting to immobilize the creature inside the house. After 45 minutes, I was able to trap it by pure luck. After I trapped it, I was able to see what was being stored in the house. It was a large field, fire everywhere, dead bodies on fire, blood everywhere. It reminded me of what hell would look like when described to you as a child. After that I was drained. I couldn't do much of anything. I thought I lost all my abilities, but after two months they started coming back, very slowly. I knew this only because I was able to see the ghost in Colin's house again. While I was living in Korea, I encountered a few spirits, but they were by chance and left over from the war. That was when I knew my abilities were back to full, but I wanted to learn how to better use them, and I'm not having any luck. Well, to end the story on a bad note, last week my friend Jess asked about any ghost encounter any of us have had. So Colin and I talked about this one, so Jess got curious and wanted to see where it happened. Reluctantly, we took him there. Surprisingly enough, development has been going on in the area for the last five years, but at the spot where we destroyed the house, nothing is built. We went to the spot, and I was able to feel it out from residue from when we first destroyed it, but after a few minutes, it wasn't just that. The feeling I was getting became stronger until it made me sick. I almost passed out, and I doubled over dry heaving. It turns out it was still trapped there until that night. Somehow, it got loose. I don't know how or why, but now I have to get rid of it for good, and I don't know how. In 1989, 
I moved into a government apartment in a small town containing seven units. The last apartment was occupied by a single mom with a small child and her boyfriend. The previous year, they, men and women, were murdered and shot to death in their bed, in their first bedroom by the woman's estranged ex. No one wanted to move into the apartment because of the history surrounding the apartment. I was a young mother and had two children and needed a place to live and thought nothing of this. In time, I was told of the strange happenings of the place and chalked it up to superstition or small-minded people with too much time on their hands. Things were pretty quiet for me and my little ones for the first few months. Then small things started to occur. Light over the sink area in my kitchen will mysteriously come on in the middle of the night. Being the only adult in the house, and the only person who would actually reach the switch, this had me worried that I had electrical short or something and promptly had it checked out. Nothing. Perfectly normal. Kitchen cabinet doors would be halfway open in the mornings when I awoke. I scolded my oldest daughter, seven years at the time for climbing the counters and getting snacks out, and she told me that she was asleep and she didn't do it. My youngest daughter, two years old at the time, was starting to make a habit of getting up in the middle of the night and getting into bed with me. Very unusual for her, she's a hard sleeper. At one point, I was having trouble sleeping, so much so, to the point I went to a doctor and got sleeping medication, all to no avail. I always woke up at 3 a.m. and had a difficult time getting back to sleep. Nothing worked until I rearranged my bedroom furniture and moved my bed from one end of the room to the other. Once while my oldest daughter was visiting her grandmother overnight, Myself and my youngest daughter decided to take a bubble bath together in the late evening. While we were in the tub, I heard jingle bells rattling around in the cup on a shelf not five feet from me. All of my windows were closed and no one else was in the house. Couldn't explain it at the time. After three years, I chose to move in with a man to a better neighborhood. My landlord chose that time to tell me the complete history of my apartment. He showed me the newspaper articles on what happened, and after reading all of them, I understood all. The ex climbed through the bathroom window and shot them both dead at 3 a.m. and took the child, which was sleeping between the two. Her bed was in the exact position as I had my bed when I couldn't sleep. The mom was a stay-at-home mom and was always in the kitchen fixing stuff for her little child, making homemade cookies, snacks, and such. She always left the kitchen sink light on for her boyfriend when he came in late at night. My daughter always getting into my bed late at night was quickly understood by me. The other bedroom was never used by the child. She always slept with her mother and the boyfriend. No other tenants have reported any activity in this unit. Of course, they didn't have a smaller female children either. Time will tell if this ghost will ever find peace or her final rest. Before moving out, the last night there, I made my peace with her and told her I understood why she did the things she did. I understand she wasn't trying to scare me or my little girls, and I wished her peace. One afternoon of 1995 or 96, I was dusting our bedroom, the master bedroom, in our apartment. Right beside our bedroom was a small hallway leading up to the bathroom into the other bedroom. I remember being in a very good mood. I'd been doing a few changes in the decoration of the bedroom and was now dusting. I was happy with the results and as I was dusting, I was talking about the changes with my husband, or what I thought was my husband, standing in the hallway. All smiling and happy, I started to tell him, or what I thought was him, Hey Frankie, look at what I've just done, isn't that nice? I advanced in the hallway to bring him in the bedroom, and as I neared him, 
he disappeared. I nearly jumped. Now, as I was dusting, I happened to turn my head towards the hallway, which was on my right, and there stood a man who very much looked like my husband and who was dressed in modern clothes, a short and a t-shirt. When I saw him, I was sure he was my husband. That is when I started talking to him, and as I was cheerily and happily explaining the changes to him, he had this most beautiful smile of encouragement. He seemed to be happy for me. What a surprise when I realized that I had been speaking to someone or something else than my husband, and when I saw it, it disappeared. It is when this being disappeared that I realized that my husband was lying on the couch and watching TV. He was very surprised when I told him what happened. I live in Australia, and I've been seeing spirits ever since I was about two years old. My first experience was just after my grandmother's death. I was visiting her grave for the first time, and then all of a sudden, I started hearing voices. They were telling me to leave, that it was too dangerous for them and me if I stayed, that I had to run and never turn around. It is weird that I remember it, although my memory is not as clear as my mother's, but I remember most of the details. I know that this is pretty hard to believe, but I give you my word it is true. Although I think about it now, and realize that I wasn't scared, at the time I knew that I had to leave, so I told my mom and dad, and we left. My dad didn't believe me, but my mom did. Since then, I've had many experiences with spirits, all of which have been good, except for one. This happened when I was 15. I had been roped into a swimming carnival, and I can't swim too good, so I was practicing in my pool. The pool is down the very back, and he can't see the house from the pool, as it is behind a shed. I've often seen spirits down the back, but it has never worried me. It was getting late, and I've been swimming for a while, so stop for a break. Whilst I was standing in the middle of the pool. I seen a baby sitting on the fence that surrounds the pool. I tried to look away, but I was in a trance. I finally stopped looking at it, but it was good as I was suddenly dragged under the water. I struggled for about two minutes before it would let go. When it finally did, I ran inside. I told my mom, and she never believed me but I've never been down there on my own ever since. My name is Evan and my friend's name is Scott. We're making a trip to North Carolina for a concert in August of 1996. After the concert, we drove for a long while, finally making it to South Carolina and we're in need of a place to camp as it was getting pretty late. We found the King's Mountain State Park entrance, but being almost 2 a.m., the gates was locked. We both got out of the VW camper to see if we could get the gate open. The road was completely deserted, and being at the entrance, we were not even close to any campsites. With the headlights of the camper as our only source of light, a woman appeared out of nowhere. She had dark hair, thin white dress, and was barefoot. She asked us if we were with the wedding party, and we replied that we were not. As quickly as she appeared, she was gone. Scott and I thought it was kind of weird. No evidence of another car on the road, and the fact that she was barefoot in the middle of nowhere at 2 a.m. in the morning. Entertaining the thought that we may have had an encounter with a ghost, we forgot about it. Recently, I was reminded of the incident and thought I'd surf the web to see if there was documentation of some similar experience when I found her site. I was blown away when I found an entry for Kings Mountain State Park and the woman in the white dress. The entry said that she was murdered by the clan for marrying a black man. I wonder if they were married right before the murder and that's why she asked us if we were the wedding party. 
When I was nine years old, we moved to a house in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. My mom had just gotten remarried, so I now had a stepfather, whom I absolutely despised. About a year or so later, my dad started renovations on the house. We added almost half a house on. There was a three-season porch, a mudroom, a bathroom, and two basement bedrooms. My sister moved out of her bedroom to the new one in the basement. A few days later, I was in my bed. My bed faced the wall by the door, but I couldn't look out down the hall. I had only been in bed for a few minutes. I looked up because it felt as someone was in the room with me. That's when I thought there was my stepfather standing at the foot of my bed. He was wearing what appeared to be a hooded trench coat and appeared as a dark silhouette. Looking back, it didn't really initially terrify me because I just thought it was my stepfather playing tricks on me as I said. Boy, was I terrified. I yelled, Ken, get out of here. Suddenly, my mom, who was in her bed at the end of the hall, yelled back at me that he was asleep in the bed next to her. Suddenly, the figure disappeared. I ran as fast as possible into her bedroom. There was my stepdad, sound asleep and snoring right next to her. I told her what I saw, and she just told me to go back to bed. The next morning, at the breakfast table, I started telling everyone. My oldest brother described the man in the hood. He also said he'd seen the man in his bedroom at the foot of his bed. His bedroom was in the basement, located right under my parents' room. He also thought it was our stepdad, until it vanished. He just thought he was hallucinating or something, and didn't tell anyone. Honestly, now, I really wish it was my dad. Hi, I'm a 21-year-old student in Chicago, Illinois. I'd like to tell you my story, and if possible, ask for your professional opinion about a few things. I've experienced spiritual and ghostly activity for about 11 years now. I used to be frightened by these experiences, but now I'm quite intrigued. However, one incident stands out in my mind and still bothers me to this day. This is the story that I would like to tell you about. About five years ago, I lived in an apartment on the second floor. It was an unusually warm summer's night, so I decided to sleep on the couch, with the sliding door open to let in the breeze. I woke at about 2.30 a.m. to a horrid stench and a strange coolness. Confused. I looked around the living room. I looked then, and directly in front of myself, and I was lying on my right side with my right arm tucked under my head as a pillow, and I saw a figure. I was frozen with fright as my eyes began to adjust to the darkness, and I saw the figure's face. At this point, I was thinking that someone broke into the apartment. However. This was no person. This ghost had a human-shaped face, but it was a grayish-white color. Its eyes were darkened, and what I remember the most was the huge prominent cheekbones. Furthermore, this thing only had a torso and a head, nothing else. Suddenly, with great quickness, its head descended, positioned its face directly in front of mine stared at me for a moment, and as quickly as it descended, it pulled its head back to the original position. I began crying at this moment, and that's when I felt a sort of punch on my chest. It then seemed to kind of run off into the kitchen, and then I heard the door slam. I jumped from off the couch, turned the lights on, and checked the door out. The door was locked from the inside, so there was no possible way that someone had broken into the apartment and left through the kitchen door. To say the least, I was badly shaken. 
I took a moment to collect myself. When I realized my chest hurt, I went to the bathroom and pulled down my pajama top slightly, which revealed a large red mark, as if someone had punched me. This mark eventually developed into slight bruising as the morning came. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. Since this event, several other experiences have occurred, none as frightening as this, thank goodness. However, a cluster of events did occur directly after this experience. For what reason? I'm not sure. I did go to the library and search for possible causes for such an occurrence. The closest I got to a logical answer was something called a night terror, which I'm sure you are familiar with. I've excluded this as a possible explanation for many reasons. The only thing I can think of is that I had seen a ghostly entity as to why there was a stench or a cold chill associated with the experience. I can only guess. Also, I've always been under the impression that spirits cannot harm the living, but I simply cannot believe this to be true anymore. This is an experience that I had when I was younger. It's a little short, but it remains my creepiest ghost story I've ever had. I had to have been eight or nine years old when it happened. And yes, it sounds a little corny, but it was truly an unforgettable and authentic experience. It happened to be dark and dreary on this night. It had been raining really hard, and I had no choice but to walk through the rain. The rain just kept pouring down, and all I could think about was how miserable I was from the rain, and just wanted to get to my friend's house faster. I think it was around 10pm, and I was walking through the neighborhood park to my friend's house on the other side, when all of a sudden, I saw my dead grandmother appear from out of nowhere. Oddly enough, it was a year to the day of her death from cancer. She just looked as she did before she got sick though. She looked wonderful. Of course, I wasn't sure if it was really her, so I walked up to her and called out her name. The wind became harsher and the rain fell harder, and as she reached out to me, I could see she was in pain. It was at that very moment that her face changed, and she became scared and looked as though she needed my help and it was then that she disappeared. I had to have been three to five feet away. Needless to say, I ran as fast as I could to my friend's house and didn't say another word that very night. I was sent to live with my grandparents when I was three years old. I loved my grandpa with all my heart, and he and I became very close because he could not work due to a serious heart condition. We took wonderful care of each other. Even at the age of five, I've always been very responsible due to my grandfather's ill health. One day, when I was nine, my grandma kept me home from school to look after grandpa because he was not feeling well. About 9.30 that morning, he went to lay down because he said he did not feel well. I went in about 10.30 to take his temperature and discover his fever to be 103.4. I rushed and called my grandma and mother immediately. In turn, my mother said she was going to call an ambulance, so I was to get grandpa ready and wait for them. As I did this, my grandpa called me into his room and told me, Pumpkin, I love you very much and you know this. Even though you are young and in time will forget different things about me, just always remember my love and the way you feel. I promise you this. I'll always be there with you, and you'll always be in my heart. I will always remember him saying this, because that was the last conversation he ever had. I never got to say goodbye, because he fell into a deep coma, and they wouldn't allow me into ICU to say goodbye. He then died on May 26, 1983, at 5.36 a.m. I know this for a fact, because he had given me his watch to hold on to while he was in the hospital, and it stopped at that very second that they pronounced his death. Now, while that is odd enough, 
The best part is yet to come. Three weeks after my grandpa had passed away, my grandmother became very ill and was put into the hospital. So my sister, brother-in-law and myself stayed out at my grandma's house. My sister had a cat that whenever someone came down the stairs, it would run to the basement door and cling to the screen to be let out. Well, one night, at about 11.30 p.m., the cat was sleeping with me on the couch in the basement when it jumped down and ran to the door to cling onto the screen, when all of a sudden, we heard footsteps. Now, the house is locked, my grandmother is in the hospital, and we are all in bed, downstairs. My brother-in-law grabs his baseball bat and tells us to call 911. At first I was very scared and was crying. And then they went upstairs. The footsteps stopped. And all of a sudden, my grandpa was standing in front of me, holding the note I had put in his pocket the day of the funeral. He had a tear in his eye and told me not audibly, but I could see his lips move, that he loved me and would always be there with me. Ever since then, any major life event, graduation, marriage, the birth of my two children, anything, I felt this love at one time or another and have felt a huge sense of calmness. I guess this would be a second account of a previously encountered ghost story. I had the same thing happen to me as in the story below on Denton Road, Ypsilanti, Denton Road Bridge. The story goes that a group of kids were playing chicken near Denton Road Bridge and one of them proved to be chicken. His car swerved off the road when they reached the bridge and they crashed into the river below. Many people claimed to see a light come out of the river and chase their vehicle to the end of the road if they stop at the center of the bridge at night. I'm a racer and have a very fast, very built up 1969 Dodge. One stopped on this bridge simply because we were lost and a pair of headlights came up the embankment and behind me and started coming up on me very fast. I thought some drunken redneck was out four-wheeling and was going to rear-end me. The car was in gear and running, so I simply stepped on the gas and the headlights behind me pulled up within a few feet of my rear bumper. I floored it and the light stayed right on my bumper. Couldn't see a thing behind me because the brights were on the car following me and they were far brighter than any car I'd ever seen. I had the speedometer buried past 120 miles per hour, and they were two feet off my bumper. I remember the red glare of the brake lights lighting up the road behind me some, and the moon was very bright that night, so I could see the way to the bridge practically, and there was not a car on the road. I was a little stunned, and almost lost the car at the turn. We went back to make sure that no one behind us had gone into the ditch, there was nothing. Then I got freaked. Made it back to Windsor in record time. I don't know how to start this, other than saying several years ago, when my children were small, we moved down to the country on the Washington side and lived in a home that I feel has some strange paranormal or ghostly things going on in it. I would have to say that during that time, there was something in there causing all havoc in our home. To make it short, I used to on a regular basis have something come to me, and I'm not sure what, but let me explain what it looked like. I would wake up from asleep most of the time, but sometimes I was fully awake in bed when it would happen, but for the most part, I would wake up from a sound sleep and notice this lavender colored smoke, or whatever you want to call it, coming from the corner where my closet was, and it would do different things at different times. It would wrap around my perimeter of my room, and then go to the end of my bed, and separate into five different lines, and then dart at me, and then would go away. Sometimes it would wrap around the room, and then come down from above, into five different lines. The first few times that this happened to me, I was very frightened, and would wake my husband up, and of course by the time I could wake him up, there was nothing there. 
He slept very hard. This went on for a whole seven years that we lived in this home. During that time, my husband also became very mean and violent. Also, in the room adjoining where my closet and my son's closet connect, my son was having these horrific nightmares that we could not wake him up from. We would sit there for sometimes 20 to 30 minutes, trying to wake him up, and he would be begging for his mother or his father, and crying out, asking them to go away and leave him alone. He would describe them as ugly and short, very ugly and mean looking in the face, and they would torment him and scare him and try to hurt him. This was heart wrenching for me to see him go through this and not be able to wake him up. I would cry right alongside of him when I was holding him, rocking him, trying to wake him up from these nightmares. All of my children used to tell me that in the house, they would see a ball of light sometimes that would move quickly through the home. I saw that occasionally as well. Our television was something quite interesting as well. It would turn off by itself while we were watching it, and then it would turn back on with the remote and then it would turn back off again. We could play this game for a few minutes, and then it would stop. This only happened a couple of times through the TV. I do feel that there was something evil in that home, because many things went on in that home. What the lavender colored smoke was, or the ball of light, or even my son's terrifying dreams were, I have no clue. I don't have a great deal about that kind of stuff. I do feel that I have many experiences though and had some in other homes as well. Who knows, maybe they follow me, but the home in Washington was not a good ghost, if that is what it was. Her family went through some of our hardest times in that home. Can you tell me what the lavender smoke was, or what the ball of light was? I would be very interested in knowing. You could respond to me. Thanks so much. I'm from the Southern California area, so here's how it goes. I was born in the Los Angeles area, but my parents bought a brand new home in the Orange County area. The city of La Palma, to be exact. The house was located on some ranch of some sort, because our backyard faced a very large open but fence field, with some cattle roaming around in it. Mind you, these are track homes as we know it today, and at the time, it seemed like we were living in the boondocks. I mean, looking back at it now, it was a rather very lonely area, but it all had these new track homes. You know, one supermarket, one library, one hospital, fire station, and police station. You get the idea. What well, the funny thing was, we were only four blocks west of Knott's Berry Farm. That is, if you stand at the main entrance, as you get closer to the park, Anyway, the house was well built, new carpet, plumbing, the whole works with upgrades, but on some occasions, I was very scared downstairs in the family room. I was even scared in my own bedroom. I mean, my room looked like a toy room display, so there was no reason for me to get scared just out of the blue. I mean, I was playing in my room, and it seemed as if evil walked in the room. I got this incredible feeling of hate towards me, as if I shouldn't have been there. It was happened to me several times in the house, and at 7 years of age, I didn't know anything about the supernatural or paranormal activity. Another occasion was during a Saturday afternoon. My mother and I were upstairs, and suddenly, we heard this slamming and crashing noise, and as we came down the stairs, we saw in the living room my mom's favorite painting smashed on the floor. It looked as if someone broke it in anger. I mean the frame was just trashed, and the small pictures around the one that got smashed were perfectly hanging straight. The ghost made itself seen again in the late afternoon. This time, my mom was doing some house cleaning, and as she turned to one side, she looked up towards the stairs, and she saw a man wearing a white cream colored suit in pristine condition except he didn't have a head. No Hollywood genre or anything like that. I saw the same thing myself. This time, I saw him at night. 
at the end of the hallway. This was very real and very scary. Another time, as I would sleep at night, the beds were occasionally kicked very hard. Also in the master bedroom, the sliding glass mirror doors were slamming back and forth, and the dresser drawers were also slamming in and out as well. All these things would happen separately from each other on different occasions. The main boulevard is La Palma Avenue, and the street of the house is Comstock Circle. We lived there from 1970 to 1975, my parents and I. And that is the most scary and terrifying ghost story I have. Thanks for listening. I had recently sent a story about my grandfather visiting me about a week after his death. Well, that was one of the more comforting things that has happened to me. The next story I'm about to submit actually happened as a dream, but to this day, I feel a very strong connection with it. It all happened about six years ago. A 10-year-old girl mysteriously vanished from a sleepover at her friend's house. I never met this girl, and although we only shared the same first name, I had several odd dreams about her after her disappearance. One day, about one week after the child turned up missing, I woke up early one morning to go to work. It wasn't like any day though. I woke up feeling very sad and upset. I didn't have any idea why I was feeling like this, but something just wasn't right. So, I continued to get ready for work. When I got there, I still had this bizarre feeling that something big was about to unfold. About an hour into my long work day, I forgot about the feeling and went on with my day. A woman I work with came into work about an hour later and then asked me, did you hear they found the missing girl? All of a sudden this feeling came back. I said yes, they found her in a dumpster wearing her blue nightgown. She replied, then did you hear? I then started to cry uncontrollably and said no, she, the young girl, came to me in my dreams and showed me where she was and told me that I no longer had to play with her because it was time to move on and now she could rest in peace. The woman just looked at me in disbelief and really didn't know what to say and neither did I. I then realized this poor young soul felt compelled to have someone to be with her. Why she chose me, I will never know. Again, we did share the same first name, but other than that, I cannot explain what happened. Most people I tell this story to have a tendency of just looking at me with an odd expression on their face, but I too believe that it was all just more than a dream. I've never seen any ghosts or had any sort of experiences with the supernatural, but my friend Amber has. She was friends with this guy named Seth, whose mother was my high school coach. She was telling me about this house Seth's parents bought in Monticello, Florida, about 45 minutes away from where we live. It was a real old house with lots of land around it. This house is a weekend house for Seth's family. One day, Amber was invited to spend the weekend with them. She told me that on the way up there, they tried to warn her not to get scared because there were ghosts there. She thought they were pulling her leg and was laughing and playing along. When they got there, Amber was impressed with a two-story wooden house. It was built in some old style from the 1800s, apparently. She walked upstairs to her room for the weekend and was given a tour of the house. Upon entering one room, she smelled something sour and bitter. It was right beneath the attic. She couldn't describe it to me, but let me know it wasn't pleasant. Then, she was led to the attic, supposedly the most haunted room. There were old rusted chains and shackles attached to the walls. A long time ago, a slave owner owned this home. The slaves would be punished by whipping and being shackled in the attic with no food and water for several days. 
Amber said she had no eerie feeling and didn't see anything out of ordinary. Later on that night, Seth and Amber were staying up late and playing games. They dared each other to go up to the attic, knowing the stories behind the deaths of slaves in the attics. When they went up the stairs and turned on the lights, they smelled that sour and metallic smell and saw dark stains on the floor that wasn't there previously. Amber said she had never been so scared in her entire life. She thought her heart was going to stop beating because it was beating so fast and hard. She and Seth went downstairs, wasting no time at all. Amber couldn't sleep at night because she was certain she could hear the groans and cracking. The next day, Amber came straight home and refused to come back to the house again. I talked later on with Seth's mother my high school coach, and she said it was true. She gave more stories about how she'd find things moving or missing, how she smelled cigar smoke when no one smoked. She told me how she would come home at night and all the lights would be on in the house. She told me she had not seen any ghosts or even felt threatened. She actually thought of them as her friends because they would turn on the lights for her at night when she came home. I wouldn't be able to stand it. Weird, huh? It makes me leery of my own house, even though my parents originally built it. I have a few experiences. In 1976, I was living in an old building, and every night, I would hear footsteps, heavy ones, walking on the floor above me. I then asked the apartment manager, who lived upstairs and learned that no one did and there was a crawl space. He checked it and no one was there. So on a weekend when I knew no one was in the building except myself, I decided that if I heard the footsteps again, I would not be scared. Then the footsteps began pacing all night. I kept my wits and made plans to leave. I left the building. Second experience, about 1985. I was at work early one day, 9th and Market, and was going into the bathroom. A woman went in before me, not less than one foot in front of me, and so when I walked into the bathroom, no one was there, and I looked under all the stalls, and still, no one. Yet there was one way into the bathroom, and the same way out. The woman just looked like a solid body. The same thing happened once again late one evening. When I was going into the bathroom, and I just rushed in just behind her, to see her, and when I got in two seconds later, no one, not even in any of the stalls. Later I learned that the cleaning staff in the building saw the same thing. They saw the woman enter the bathroom, and they waited for the woman to leave the bathroom, but no one left, and when they went in to find her, she was not there. In 1977. A friend committed suicide. All that weekend that she had died, I was depressed and could not shake the feeling. Then on Monday, I went to my university library and as I sat there trying to read late in the morning, I hear that someone yelled in my ear, except it penetrated my body, that Holly committed suicide. I jumped and looked around, but people were quiet and no one was saying anything and I thought, where did I hear that? And I must be thinking negatively. I became uncomfortable and left the library to shop. When I returned at about 6 p.m. to read, a woman came up to me and said, We're looking for you this morning. We're talking about you and wanted to tell you that Holly committed suicide. I said, So this is true what I heard. I was told to call Holly's husband and he verified it. Instead, he searched for me the whole entire weekend. The next day, a strange thing happened. In my grief, I meandered my way to work in a different direction, passing a funeral home where I noticed a coffin in a hearse, and my heart and love went out to it. Then, after I got to work, I checked the obituaries for the funeral home where Holly was. It was the same place I passed that very morning. And so I invited a friend to come with me to pay my last respects to Holly at noon. 
I met my friend at the funeral hall, and we were told that Holly had been sent out that morning for cremation. She had been the only one sent out, and she was in that coffin in the morning in the hearse that I passed on my way to work earlier. In 1982, when my father died, I woke earlier in the morning and was calm. Then my mother called to tell me he died. Everyone in my family woke up, and my mother got out of bed, sat by the phone, then it rang, and she got the word. At this time, I could hear people cry. Only the sound came from their body and not their mouth. My brother was in a deep grief and not crying out loud, but I could hear his spirit cry and he just had a sad look. In 1992, my mother was very ill and in a rehab center. I did not like staying in her house because I thought it was haunted. On this particular morning, it was 5 a.m and I was typing and printing a letter on the computer. I typed most of the letter, got up and stuck a mug of water in the microwave, and set it for one minute. Also, I prepared a plastic cone with filter and coffee in it, then I rushed back to the computer to print the letter. I added a few lines to the letter, and then began to hear the microwave beep and beep. I ignored it, then the beeping stopped. I got this creepy feeling, but I ignored it, and then I thought the microwave had a timer, and so the beeping stopped because of the timing, not because anyone opened the microwave door. I printed the letter, ran to the kitchen to get the mug of water out of the microwave, and poured in the cone. I found instead that the mug had been taken out of the microwave, and the coffee was made, waiting for me on the ledge of the kitchen counter. Yet I know I did not get up from the computer to make it, because I made a conscious decision to ignore the microwave and finish my letter. My mind worked over time to figure it out. I grabbed the letter and left the house that morning and told whatever did that it was taking the coffee. I didn't really appreciate it. Other things happened, like the rustling of papers when I was trying to sleep, etc. And I had to leave the house. Sometimes, I've heard other people think that they were not directing their thoughts to me, as what happens with schizophrenics. Enough for now. This isn't my story, or even the story of the person who told me, but I thought I'd share it anyway. This was told to me by the music teacher at my high school. The college he attended which I won't mention the name, is up north. I'm not sure when it was built, but the main building of the college was a Catholic monastery. There have always been stories around the college that a monk went crazy and killed himself in the monastery. People in the college have reported strange happenings and sightings of what appeared to be a monk. The story that I know comes from a janitor who works at the college. On the weekends, one of the custodian's jobs is to break down the classrooms. This means that they have to stack up all the desks and chairs up against one wall. The janitor had just finished doing this and walked out the door and locked it from the outside. There is only one door into the classroom and it is the one he had just locked. The windows in the room can only be opened from the inside and the janitor was the only one in the room. As he turned to walk away from the door, he hears loud crashing and banging, coming from inside the room. He immediately unlocks the door and steps inside. What he finds is that all the desks and chairs have been thrown all around the room. Drawers from the teacher's desk are ripped out and papers strewn across the room. There is no way any possible human could have been in that room and done that damage in a matter of seconds and run out without the janitor noticing. As I was reading your website, I was recalling my own happenings. None were ever harmful to me, but I do sleep with the light on most of the time. I believe I have a following, whether it be the same ghost or if I have some attraction for them. It started when I was about four years old. I have this imaginary friend. 
I named him Jingles. From what I am told, I do not recall any part of Jingles other than what I was told by my family. I made my friend Jingles so believable that everyone in my family actually started to believe there really was someone named Jingles. I would talk to him, play with him, and of course, if anything was broken or stolen, Jingles did it. If I was good and got a treat, Jingles had to get one too. Jingles remained my friend until I reached first grade and moved to a new home. While in the kitchen with my sisters and mother, a man's voice from the woods called my name. I was about eight years old then. We all froze with our mouths dropped to the floor and our hearts racing. All four of us could not have imagined that someone called our name. I was young, so my mother made a joke about it and it was forgotten. Throughout my childhood, strange things happened in this house. Images were seen out of the corner of my eye and my family's eyes, but we would just chalk it up to our imaginations. Certain toys would flip in the air, stuff like that. I was scared for the moment, but never afraid to be in the house. Over the years, we have found what I believe to be cow skulls in the backyard. Two were found, but no one in the street has any cows. We don't know where they came from. This house that I lived in as a child eventually became my home. My sister lived in the in-law apartment below me. She would always ask me what I was doing up there because she would always, even when I wasn't home, hear jumping and walking around. What makes this so strange is that once I moved out of the house, the noises stopped. After moving out of my parents' house and into my own home about nine months ago, there seems to be extra guests. I hear voices, but can't make out what they are saying. I often hear a muzzled radio sound. I hear running water. The house is always making house noises, but around 4 to 5 a.m., the noises stop and the house is dead silent. Often a cool breeze would find me, even when there is no wind. I can't explain the feeling that I'm not alone. My children, nine years old and eight years old, keep saying that they want to move because they think the house is haunted. I don't think moving is going to solve that problem. A little background on the house I own. It is 30 years old in a waterfront property. I found out that the owner of the home died of cancer, not in the house, but has died. There have been 11 deaths around the lake and they've all died of the same cancer. When I was nine, my grandfather died in the dining room of his house. It was not unexpected. He had been very ill and was bedridden. Shortly after his death, we moved in with my grandmother due to the fact that she was also ill. She was a very unhappy and hateful person. She blamed all life's injustices on my late grandfather and hated him for dying. After we had moved in with her, we realized how serious her illness was and took her to the doctor. She had Alzheimer's. As her illness progressed, my parents could no longer take care of her, so they placed her in a nursing home. Big mistake. She transferred all of her anger from my late grandfather onto my father. During the last stages of her illness, she would repeatedly tell us that she did not want to be buried near my grandfather, that she had spent all of her living years with him, and she did not want to spend eternity next to him. Well, as fate would have it, my grandmother passed away. Funds were tight, and we not only had to bury with my grandfather, but her casket was placed on top of his. We had no other choice because all of the extra money we had for a funeral was used to care for her in the home. Anyway, on with the story. After my grandmother's death, strange things began to happen. During dinner, the back door would just fly open, or at night, the sheet would be tucked around my body while I slept. We always made jokes that say that grandfather was home, or he was looking in on us. Then. 
things took a turn for the worse. One night, my father awoke to the sensation of his legs being pressed into the waterbed mattress. Once he was fully awake, he realized he could not move, and whatever was pressing him into the mattress was continuing up his body. He glanced over to get my mother's attention, but could not speak. This entity was now cutting off his breathing. Finally, he thought, Mom, I am sorry. I had nowhere else to put you. And then it all stopped, as fast as it started. The next morning at breakfast was when Dad told us about his experience. The next night I had a similar experience, but chalked it up to dreaming. I figured that I heard my dad telling us about his experience, and that I was just dreaming based on that. Now, let's jump ahead nine years. I'm married, and have just given birth to my first son. It was morning time, and my husband already left for work. I thought I would just take a short nap and rest, while that baby was not fussing. So I doze off to that place between sleep and wakefulness, where you're not fully totally asleep. Arresting. The next thing that happens is something that I'll never forget. I begin to feel my body being pressed down into my waterbed mattress. I could not open my eyes, but I knew I was awake. I could hear the television and my son cooing. I could not move, and then I began to hear this voice, a horrible evil voice that not even a word can describe, saying, you know I love you. This went on for what seemed like an eternity, but was only probably about two minutes. Then, in my mind, I thought, dear God, what is my baby seeing? And just as quickly as it started, it stopped. I've not had many experiences since then, and that was just two years ago. My question is, was it my anger grandmother or something else? If anyone has any suggestions, Please email me. I'm on your website because my boyfriend runs a theater in downtown New York City and has otherworldly occupants. The building has been around since 1897 and was a school until 1978 where a fire killed a little girl. Now, it's an arts community with theaters and artists that occupy the studios and occupy the whole of the building. My boyfriend and a couple other people who run the theater have seen and heard things. I myself have felt the cold associated with presence in a particular room. All my hair stood up on end, and in my gut, I felt we needed to leave the room. These are two particular events which solidify my suspicions. I got a call from my boyfriend one night to tell me it was coming home early. In the background, I heard male laughter, like someone was playing a joke on him and really enjoying it. I thought nothing of it. He works with a couple guys down at the theater. When he came home, he told me he had been dumping the evening's garbage. The dumpster is at the bottom of the stairs on the north side of the school. As he was going down the stairs, he saw a figure cut across the room at the bottom of the stairs. He called out, thinking it was the building's handyman. No answer. He reached the bottom of the stairs and deposited the garbage bag and headed back up the stairs to get the other bag of garbage. At that moment is when he heard what sounded like someone dragging the bag he had just deposited. He stopped, turned and called out. The noise stopped. He dismissed it and brought the other bag down. He headed back up and the same thing happened. This time he did not go back down, but instead called to tell me he was on his way uptown. Later that night, in bed, he told me what had happened. I asked him who was with him when he called me and he said he was alone. All my hair stood on end who was that laughing then? I asked. He said he was alone when he called. I think he thought it was my imagination or a bad connection, but now I know what I heard. Now last night, 
I was at the theater, some fashion show going on there. My boyfriend tells me what happened the night before. He had spent the night at the theater on a pull-out mattress. The guys kept there for late night work. It was around midnight, and he was not asleep. He was staring up at the ceiling, rethinking his day. He heard his name called out. Then the door to the office slowly closed, as if someone was closing it from behind. He responded and peeked out to his desk, see if somehow a cat had found its way into the building, which is ludicrous. One doesn't see cats around there. And of course, he found nothing. All the windows were closed, so no breeze blew in. He said he then heard what sounded like whispering outside the office door. Lots of whispering, stage whisper, of gibberish with some strong hissing sounds, almost like a snake. He called out again and banged on the door. He went back into the adjoining office and went towards the door. He then felt a cold coming in from under the door. He placed his hand in the crack at the bottom of the door and felt no breeze. Then, a scratching sound, fast repetitions, like a dog scratching to get in, started. This was too much for him. He packed up and calmly walked out. He said he was a little afraid to walk back once he left the theater office, afraid of what he might see. I think being a theater and many actors who love the space left parts of them when they died. The founder died of leukemia and loved and lived for this theater company. The little girl who died in the fire also stands my hair on end. Last night, I also found out the other guy who hears and sees things, that he hears that same playful laughter in the theater, just like I heard on the phone that night. Also seen, figures sitting at the bar, footsteps heard. And that's my story. Thank you. Hello. I'm writing about a few experiences I had at my home. The home is called Edgefield Manor. First, I want you to know that this may sound like the classic haunting in a big old mansion. Well, believe me, what lives in this house is no Casper. I moved in the fall of 86. The estate is huge, gardens and rooms upon rooms. It was originally going to be condemned. Well, anyway, here's a couple of my experiences. One day, I was in one of the parlors. I got up to turn the light on, and as soon as I did that and turned around, I saw a whitish figure glide across the other hallway. Another thing there is, is poltergeist activity. Explain this to me. The home has a ballroom. I went inside like usual. The grand piano was in the same place as it has been when I moved in. I walked out for five minutes and then came back inside. The grand piano was moved across the floor, pushed to the other side of the room. No indication of any noise. It was just moved. There are many others, and I have pictures. If you want more stories or pictures, just email me. I know this is kind of short, but it's always terrifying. Hi. My story begins in Maine. Our family owns a cottage in Castine. We go there every year. We're going next week, actually. The house belongs to my great-grandfather. The house dates back to the Revolutionary War times. People have died on the front lawn. The house is a three-floor tower. This is a story about a crazy lady who used to live in that house. She used to scream out of the tower at people. Well, I think I saw her in the tower one night. When my great-grandfather lived in the house, he claimed that he saw it a few times when he would read on his rocking chair in the living room. 
He said it would walk in front of him. Three other people in my family saw the same thing. I never heard the story about the crazy lady until I brought up my experience to my parents after we got back from vacation. The funny thing was, this ghost, it was wearing a maiden's outfit. When my dad told my grandfather, he said that I experienced it exactly as he saw it. I've never heard the story until I saw it. I am no liar. I was really never told to believe in ghosts, if they were real or not. This started when I moved to Missouri with my family in 1995. The first home we rented when we arrived, something was very uneasy about it. I not only felt it, but my eldest son did also. One evening, when the three sons were in bed and my husband was working late, I was up watching TV late. When I decided to go to bed, I left a low light on in my bedroom. As I was walking down the hallway, past my son's room, there was a blur. I thought it was because my eyes were tired and there was a mirror on the back wall of the hallway. But as I continued walking, my left eye got real blurry, and I felt a cold chill go through me. There is a basement to this house. I had my washer and dryer down there. I also had my kid's Sega game there. I felt very uneasy every time I went down there. My eldest son heard something pounding on the Sega controllers. He said at one time, he saw some kind of figure down there. The figure was bent over, blurry blackish gray, and it had no real face or features. He said it stood there, and it was shaking its head. It would be downstairs playing, and hear someone coming down the stairs, and no one would be there. My son was very uncomfortable when he first walked in. He said he felt sick to his stomach. When he saw the figure, he felt sick also. We have since moved, same town. We have moved into another house that has been lived in by many people, but not for long periods of time. Someone told me that the reason nobody stays in this house very long is because it is haunted. Again, me and my eldest son have been the ones noticing everything that has been happening here. I hear feet scooting across the floor at night, but no one is there. My son has seen a bright light flashing in the corner of his room. It is in the upper corner of his room, where no lights shine on the wall. I've also seen this myself. He has also seen three lights, spinning lights, beside his bed. There was also a time that he felt his bed shake. My son has cancer, and he had been going through a time that he could not sleep. It was right around the time that he felt his bed shake. We do not have an uneasy feeling about these experiences. They are quite comforting. I had an uncle. He was killed on a head-on accident when he was riding a motorcycle and he was hit by a drunk driver. This was around maybe 20 years ago. I think of him very often. I was just wondering if it was him that was there with my eldest son and me during this time that he, my son, is going through this cancer. We aren't scared of his cancer, even though it's rare. My uncle was a very spiritual man. I feel that this is his way of letting us know that my son is going to be alright. We will get through this year, and his cancer will be done. I have two other sons, and they've not experienced anything. Neither has my husband. I told him, and felt foolish. I felt he thought I was crazy. To start my story, I've had these experiences for a good part of my life. It started long before I was born, in a house that has been in my family for almost a century. My oldest brother Mike, he was around three when he saw the presence of my great-grandmother in a corner in the attic during a visit to see our grandmother. 
This house is an old two-family home with a basement and an old apartment attic that had been dismantled in the 50s. My family moved into the house in the late 80s. Since the house has been in my family for almost a hundred years, the house has seen many losses and a lot has occurred inside the home. The attic had a very high spooky factor to it, I guess you would say. The house had a very spooky feeling to it all over. A lot of two family houses built in the 1900s in the New England area. I've been told that a door that led into the living room. The door was for coffins to be wheeled into the living room so the wakes could be done in the home. Knowing this always freaked me out. The doorway had been covered decades before my family moved in, but the eerie outline was still there on the living room wall. Now that I give you a feel of my old home, I'll explain my happenings. I lived in the house for 10 years. I have three older brothers. My oldest brother, Mike, heard and saw a lot happen in the house. He didn't always tell the rest of us for, I guess, reasons of his own. I started having things happen seven years after we moved in. When I was younger, I thought they were just nightmares. June of 96 for my birthday, I received a dog. August of that summer, my parents were staying in our summer home and my brothers and I were home. My oldest brother Mike and I were lying on my mother's bed when all of a sudden my dog went wild. She went from a dog that never barked or growled into an attack dog. She started barking and growling at the wall and when we pushed her towards the wall, she cried and whimpered and shifted herself back towards us. I being brave stood in front of the wall and tried to beckon her towards me. She just barked and kept at her growling. My brother Mike and I were convinced we weren't the only two watching TV and left the room. My brother and I kept what happened to ourselves and later that night my brother Joe came home and slept in my mother's room. I slept in the living room and my brother Tom was watching TV in the room with me. At 4 a.m., Joe and I heard my mother sliding bedroom door open and shut three or four times. The dog started going nuts again, and Tom jumped up and ran to see what was going on. Joe sat straight up in bed, terrified by what he had seen. That night, the three of us slept in the living room. Mike and Joe and I have heard voices of two men talking to one another. I've heard the doors open and shut, and when I went to see who it was, no one was there. Mike, he once saw what he thought was Joe. Joe looks just like my uncle, who had died in the house. Mike said hello to the figure and went to his room. When he came out of the room to talk to what he thought was Joe, the figure was gone. And when he finally saw Joe again, Joe told him, that he was just getting home from work and hadn't been home since that morning. Mike had slept on the bottom bunk of a bunk bed he had in his room. Joe used to sleep on top, but long since then, slept on the couch in the living room. Mike swears he could hear someone shifting on the top bunk, even when none of us were sleeping on top. Mike would hear two men conversating on the top bunk, but he could never understand what they were saying. These are just a few of the experiences we've had. My mother, father, Tom and I, we all moved out of the house in 97. Joe and Mike still live there. They still experience things happening at the house. I lived with them from November 98 till July 99 and I had no experiences. I visited them two weeks ago and stayed overnight. I slept by my grandmother's on her pullout, and something almost jumped at me. I can't even explain what happened. It was pitch black in the room, and my mother was next to me. I turned my body and opened my eyes, and it almost a flash of light, but with a dark figure behind it, leaped at my face and disappeared. I got so startled, 
I started crying. I think that whatever was in that house has followed me. There's something as new in my home. When I leave my room sometimes, or even when I'm sitting in my room, my stereo would turn on, and my jewel CD will come on. Last time I came in the room, the song Adrian was on. If you know Jewel, it's a song about a young girl who has a child who becomes disabled. I have no pictures or sound bits to share, just what me and my brothers have experienced. I know it's long, and some of my things may seem a little wild, but what I'm typing is nothing but the truth. I don't really know where to begin with my story. I told very few people about it, for the fear they might think I'm crazy. I'm glad to have found a place where I can talk about it freely. I'm 26 now, and have not experienced anything like this since I was a small child, but it changed my life forever. When I was around the age of three, I was still sleeping with my mom and dad. There were several things that happened around this time. I will start with the worst first. One morning, I'd just woken up, and I turned over like I always did. But this morning, I saw the most horrifying sight that no three-year-old should have seen. Laying next to me was this terrifying demon. I know it was a demon because of its eyes. It had a human form of a woman, and was nude. It was about ten feet tall had thin bony fingers and the darkest eyes. It was like you could almost see through them. You could just feel the pure evil. It had the most wicked smile on its face, like it was taunting me. I stared at it for a few seconds and then turned back, hoping I was dreaming. Then, I felt the bony finger poking me in the back, as if to say, Hey, you. I turned back over, and it was still there, grinning that sickening grin. I watched it get up to go to the window, which was closed and about 20 feet off the ground. It turned and gave me one last grin and went out the window. It was also around this time that I awoke one night to see three demons. They seemed to be like children. They were standing in the doorway laughing the kind of laughter like I've never heard before. This was the same room where I'd seen the other one. At the age of about seven, I awoke one night to see a grim reaper standing by my bed. Needless to say, these things have disturbed me all my life. I also saw my grandfather and his past child after he had died, but that was a peaceful sight. I have not had any other experiences since I was a child. Oh, they've always been noises that I could not explain, but nothing like before. It was like the experience did something to me. I've never had normal dreams, not as a child or as an adult. Always strange dreams and nightmares. Like I have some way of knowing when a spirit is near or a house is haunted. Some people call it a gift but I just wish I could understand it and what happened to me as a child. Thank you for letting me share my story. And this is a true story. This happened to me when I was eight years old. I'm now 28 with three kids of my own. It happened in my hometown of Soak Village, Illinois, which is known to be a place that Indians pass through using South Trail to get to other destinations. At least, that's what the official story is. There are others, like myself, who believe more. We believe that Indians actually settled there, if only for brief periods of time. There's always been talk of bones being found when a pool was dug up or a garden was put in, but most say it's just that. Talk, not me. I believe it. I also not only believe, but know that the ground the Soak Village is residing on is sour, cursed, 
beyond anybody's wildest dreams. And I have many stories to support that belief. But for now, I will start with my first story of proof. It was a cold normal night in the season of autumn, cold enough to keep you inside your house and snuggled under a blanket. I was doing exactly that. An eight year old can only do so much during these times and I chose to do my homework so I could read later. I'd been listening to a Rick Springfield album on 8-track. I was playing it on my 2XL robot toy. This was a toy that you could put 8-track cartridges in that was made by the company to be a sort of trivia game. You'd play the cartridge and it would ask you questions and tell you jokes. It had two big red robot eyes that flashed red when you were correct. It had three buttons you could push to answer your questions. 2XL could also play normal, 8-track music. And of course, its red robot eyes flashed in time with the music. So it was doing exactly just that on that cold autumn night, flashing its eyes to Rick Springfield, and I was quite contented. My bedroom was on the second floor of my house and faced north, along with my bed. I had a window north of me and east of me. Of course, it was dark outside, but it was so warm inside and so very comforting. Every now and again, I'd look up for my homework and just look out into the darkness. No reason. It was just something I did. Well, this was the last time I ever did that again in that house. As I was sitting there, all of a sudden, I felt instantly cold and every single hair in my body was raised. My blood felt like it had ran cold and decided to just stop pumping through my body. My heart was racing. I was perfectly terrified and I didn't even know why. Yet, my 2XL was suddenly stuck and it kept playing the same verse from Rick over and over, hole in my heart and its eyes weren't flashing anymore. No, they were just burning bright red, blood red. Then I felt this magnetic pull, like something was pulling me to my right. I turned my right head and looked out the east window and saw something that haunted me for the rest of my life. Sitting just barely outside my window, levitating, was the most horrifying image I'll ever see in my life. A creature, about two feet tall, but sitting Indian style. His skin was snowy white, and you could see the outlines of his bones because he was that skinny. He wore some sort of white cloth draped sideways on his body. This is why I later named him Gandhi Monster. My young mind thought his skinny body and his white cloth looked like the real Gandhis did. This creature's head was too big for his body. His two horrible, big dark eyes were piercing my soul as he stared at me. He opened his mouth and grinned a grin at me that haunted my dreams for years. His mouth was full of long, snarly, razor sharp looking teeth dripping with blood. I don't know how a mouth could fit so many nasty teeth into it, but it did. I watched as the blood dripped from his teeth and slid down his chin and onto his white cloth diaper shorts. He raised his hands and reached for me. The fingernails were at least four inches long, gnarled looking and sharpened to points, also dripping with blood. I wanted to scream. I wanted to run, but I was locked into place by his piercing eyes. I couldn't breathe. I felt as if my brain was being scrambled and my soul was being raped. His grin became larger and he opened his mouth wider. He kept looking at me as if he knew me, as if he had been waiting for me. He started to lift his arms and it looked as if in seconds he would actually be inside my room and not just outside my window. All traces of reason disappeared 
and my mind snapped. I still don't know how I did it, but I managed to tear my gaze away and leap off the bed and out my bedroom door, screaming with every inch of my soul, all in like two seconds. I could feel him pulling me. I could feel that horrible stare penetrating my back as I screamed down the hallway to my mother. Of course, when her and my father and younger brother came back, it was gone. But they knew I saw something, and they did not try to tell me it was my imagination. They comforted me and taped up all the windows in my room. They actually had to pull down all the shades and seal all sides with duct tape. I couldn't even sleep in that room for almost a year. My brother even remembers coming into the room with my parents afterwards. The Gandhi monster was a story we didn't often tell, but it always brought fear to speak of it to us and to others. My parents never spoke of it again either. As I grew up, I tried to face my fear and sleep in that room, but never did I sleep with my back to a window. Never. 18 years later, I moved to Florida with my own little family and have found peace within myself, but I'll never manage to forget that creature, and I'll never sleep or sit with my back to a window. And I will never forget the one thing I heard it say to me in my mind as I was running out of my bedroom door. Someday, I'm coming back. Hey, I'm in my mid-teens, and I've experienced ghostly encounters. The one that really freaked me out was when me and my family moved to Scotland. For a few months, we lived in chalets. Me and my older sister shared one on our own. A few weeks after we moved in, we began to feel uncomfortable and felt as if we were being watched there. And there was also a threatening atmosphere. We told our parents, and they said it was just because we were next to the graveyard. A few weeks later, I was lying in my bed with the door open when a tall dark figure stood leaning over me. I didn't think at that particular moment, but it wasn't until my sister asked me if I felt somebody was in my room the previous night. We started the talk, and she too felt as if somebody tall was leaning over her. I then started to sleep in my sister's room, and the figure didn't return, so I moved back into my own room. But then again, the figure returned this time, it was kneeling beside me. The next morning I told my sister, and again, she felt the presence of a tall man. Our dad told us that the large house next to us was where the Vikers used to stay until the house was sold. One night, my mom came in, and she was holding two necklaces with crosses on it. Me and my sister aren't religious, so her mom thought it had something to do with that. So we went to bed, holding the crosses. That night, it was very uncomfortable in both rooms. After that, we haven't felt the presence of the tall man. The figure that visited did so on a few occasions. Each time, it felt as though it was getting closer and more angry. When the crosses were given to us that night, the figure seemed very angry. Its face was literally pressed into mine and it felt as if he was gritting his teeth at me. My sister also had this very uncomfortable, menacing figure who was pressed into her face. All you could do was hide under the guilt, closing your eyes really tight, and hope you'd fall asleep quick. Since that last visit, nothing has returned, and we've since moved then, and nothing. We don't even use the crosses anymore. Other things that we didn't think of as being connected at the time now do seem connected, such as the chalet that mom and dad were in, although the same, was different in feeling. Because mom and dad's chalets always had a comfy feeling, yet ours didn't, whether it was because there was just me and my sister alone in there, and it was our imaginations or not, 
We don't know. Although in Mom's and Dad's chalet, there was only one more person over there. From the moment we stepped into the chalet, it was always cold, even with the heaters on. Plus, there was often a bad smell wafting around, a lot like fish, rotten. This was only in my bedroom, possibly me, my sister says. Also in my room, there was a strange noise of scratching, as if someone was sketching or writing. This noise accompanied the presence of another figure, smaller in stature and of the female sex. My sister also felt the smaller presence, but not the noise. She only came once, very different, not menacing, quiet in nature, and much older. She was almost a comfort, but it's still not nice to be watched over at night by ghostly figures. It's strange, because we didn't actually see anything, yet you get so much from these feelings, the sex, age, angry, happy, etc. Plus, we get almost exactly the same feelings. But is it just our imagination? Are we certifiably insane? Are we demented? No, we definitely feel we had a visitor. Previous to this experience, my sister had not really believed in it, ghostly visits and such. But now, I think she has had a change of mind. Me, myself, I've always believed. My mom's granddad often visits, a kind presence, bringing good luck, such as when she was having problems. He visits to let us know everything will be okay. He often visited when we were babies, watching over our cots. Our dad also saw what appeared to be him. Whenever he visits, we know him by the distinct smell of putty. He used to repair windows. So really, we are used to the visits, although my sister had never experienced any until now. Unfortunately, it wasn't a happy experience, one not to forget. Happened to surf onto your website, and I just wanted to let you know that I saw Resurrection Mary in Justice, Illinois, back in October of 92. After getting off of work at 3 a.m. from a chemical plant, Witco Corporation, near 51st and Central in Chicago, I was driving by that particular cemetery at about 3.30 a.m. on my way home from work. Driving by, but initially not thinking much of this site, as there was a nightclub with women of ill repute nearby. I saw a woman in a light blue or white palm dress, standing by the trunk of what looked like a black park limousine at the front SW Cemetery driveway off Archer Avenue to the cemetery. I slowed down quite a bit to get a better look at the odd sight, but then drove off. I thought it was probably a prostitute with her john. However, looking back at my mirror, maybe a second later, the woman in the limo were gone. Let me reassure you that there was no way that I would have missed the limo driving off in that second that it took me to look back in the mirror. They weren't on the road or in the cemetery because I looked for taillights. The cemetery gates are pretty large, and it would have taken a great effort and time to open both of the cemetery gates for the car to get through. I did not think much of the incident until a few days later. I was talking with some of my employees that lived in the area near the cemetery. Two of my employees mentioned that I'd probably seen the ghost called Resurrection Mary. I didn't much believe in ghosts until that incident, and I'm still somewhat skeptical but I cannot fully explain what I saw that night. That incident is still vivid in my memory and kind of creepy to think about it to this day. Ever since I can remember, I've always had an interest in ghost stories. That is why I'm writing you this letter. No, I don't have a ghost in my house. A friend of mine told me about this place at least 10 months ago. I was so amazed at this story, I asked if he would take me to this place. No one really ever goes there. 
I guess because it's so creepy and dark looking at night. But during the day, it is okay. Nothing strange happens. Well first, before I tell you more about this place, let me tell you the story of why it is so unusual. The city is called Lake Forest, California. They call it Cannon Creek, I guess, because it is nothing but cannon and wide open spaces of nothing but rocks and wildlife. The story goes back 30 years ago of a lady who was in her 40s. Nobody knew what her name was. She lived alone with her two great Dayton dogs. She was very rich and owned all of the canyon, which is like miles and miles of land. This lady never married and had no children. It was just her dogs and herself. She lived in this trailer park home and it was not a pretty house by any stretch of the imagination. Well, about six years later, the story goes that a police officer got a call about the lady and her dogs. The officer went to the lady's home and knocked at the door and no one answered. The officer ended up breaking down the door and what he found next was horrifying. It is said that the officer found the lady dead. Nothing was left but her decaying body and her bones were visible. Worst of all, laying right next to her were her dogs. They had both died as well. Now, on to the paranormal part. People who have never been to this place don't know what to expect if they come into this place. It's unpredictable. Sometimes, when you go back to the area where she passed, you'll notice paranormal phenomena. Other times, you won't. A man was driving alone on the cannon by himself one night. And the story goes that he saw the presence of the lady standing at the side of the road with her two dogs. The man did not stop at all to give the lady a ride. He just kept going. And this other story was told by my friend. My friend told me that his ex-girlfriend and her boyfriend went up there one night to check it out. They stopped where the lady's house was. They were only there about 15 minutes away when they were just talking and listening to music. Then, all of a sudden, they heard a knock on the side door of the driver's seat. They both turned to look and they saw the lady standing there, knocking on the window. She was dressed in all white and covered in blood. They also saw the dogs nearby as well, far off into the distance, appearing as silhouettes. They sat there in shock for three minutes, horrified by what they just saw. For some reason, the lady was still knocking at the driver's side of the window, but in reality, it was really not that long. They both said that she must have been there about 40 seconds. After that, my friend said they never returned back there. That was not the only story that happened to anyone. There are far more. What I would like to know is who is this lady and why is she doing this? There's something more to why she has to haunt people who have done nothing to her. Maybe it is because she does not want anyone on her land that she loves so much. What could it be? Here's my email address. If you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. I would like at least some kind of feedback on this story. Please, I beg you. I'm so confused, and I'm scared. Please let me know what is going on. I find this intriguing. One night, about 13 years ago, my brother and I were Christmas caroling with friends around our block. We were about 10 or 11 at the time. After ending the night, my brother and I said goodbye to the last of our friends, who had turned in for the night. We were riding doubles on a bike that night. My brother pedaling, we approached the edge of the driveway when he suddenly stopped. We both looked across the street. I said, do you see what I see? He replied, yeah. Happening very quickly across the street was a dark shadowy figure, void of prominent features, approximately seven feet tall. When it began to approach us, 
we threw the bikes down, and we were able to slide under the electric garage door, still in process of closing. We were able to summon our friend's dad to investigate, but nothing. That night, we rode our fanny's home, about eight houses down. Amazingly, we never mentioned it to our parents, who were waiting in the driveway to take us to the town's candy cane lane. We have since told them about everything, and to this day, when I visit home and happen to walk that corner of the block at night, I am constantly looking over my shoulder and feel as though I'm being watched. Aiken SC East Pine Lock Road now houses Riley's Whitby Bowl Restaurant. This house was in my wife's family from the late 1960s until it was sold to the present owners, operators of the named restaurant. My family and I moved there in 1993 and lived in the house for two years after we moved back here from Atlanta. This house was in my wife's family from the late 1960s until it was sold to the present owners, operators of the named restaurant. My family and I moved there in 1993 and lived in the house for two years after we moved back here from Atlanta. This house was built in the late 1800s, estimated from the style and was remodeled in 1914 when indoor plumbing was installed and this date appears on the tax records, which would be correct. They use the latest remodeling date for effective date. Archaeologists from SC State Highway Department visited the site in the winter of 1994 when the road in front was being surveyed for widening. I took them under the house and they showed me where the curve marks and the big supporting beams evidenced that the original part of the house was either built before the war between the states or wood from that era which was recycled into the house. In any event, the home is an old large rambling affair of an old southern home that, like I said, is now a restaurant. It's unusual in that it is the second empire style with a mansard roof and a large wraparound porch with Doric columns. On to the story. We frequently heard footsteps when no one was there and had strange feelings that we were not alone. I could be in the front room, which I used as an office, and hear someone come down the stairs and stand at the large open pocket doors. When I turned from my computer, no one would be there. I got used to it. One day, I was relaxing in the upstairs bathroom in the old six long iron bathtub. It was in the middle of the day. I had some time to relax. My wife was away. The kids were in school. I had no pressing work. So I took a midday soaking bath. I was lying quietly in the hot sudsy water with water up to my neck, stretched out with a washcloth across my face. I heard someone coming down the hall. I slid the washcloth away, opened my eyes, and listened carefully because I knew I was alone. The footsteps came slowly down the hall, towards the bathroom door, which was at the end of the hall. The footfall stopped at the door, and the old porcelain doorknob moved slightly like someone had it in their grip, then started to turn slowly in its big square lock housing. It was right near me, because the head of the tub was by the door. I watched over my left shoulder, and then spoke, Mary Ann? The turning stopped. I jumped up in a torrent of steamy water and snatched the door open. And there was no one there. No one down the hall. No sounds of anyone running or jumping down the stairs. Just the sounds of dripping bath water. I grabbed a towel and ran down the hall, down the big hallway stairs, and jumped to the landing. The front door was closed and locked. I could see down the hall to the old Victorian carved door leading out to the back porch. Nothing. I sprinted to the kitchen. Nothing. I looked out into the side drive in the circular drive out front. No car. Nothing. Doors were locked. There was no sign of anything out of the ordinary. I searched from room to room and found nothing. 
I never said anything that might spook the family, but nobody likes to be in the house alone anyway. Funny thing is, now that we live in a modern house, built in 1973, across the cotton field from 801 East Pine Lock, we still hear noises and footfalls when no one else is in the house. I've sensed the presence more than once, and a teenage friend of a family told us that he saw a kind-looking old man one night, dressed in white, standing in our foyer. It was late at night, and Tyler was in the library, and from where he was sitting, he could see out into the foyer. The man in white looked at him, smiled and nodded, and turning, went down the hall. He said it was really interesting, but not too scary. My grandparents died when I was four, and we moved into their house. They were the only people who ever lived in it. I ended up getting their room. When I was in fifth grade, I started experiencing things in my room. My TV would go on and off whenever I would think that I need to turn it on or off. I had to sleep with the hall light on. One night, I thought I saw my mom in my room standing by my closet. When I turned my light on, she wasn't there. Then I thought I saw my dad standing in the same spot, but that time I kept looking at him as I went into the hallway to see if he was still sleeping on the couch, and he was. I was looking at him in the living room, in my room, and when I turned my light on, he wasn't there, but still on the couch. It always felt like someone was watching me. Then. My last experience of seeing something was in the same spot, but just ahead looking at me. He looked like he was from the 1700s. When I tried to tell my mom, she wouldn't believe me. I'd wake up at night not being able to breathe, and my sister would run in. Then my mom started to believe me when she'd hear heavy breathing in her room when it was just her in there. I'd be walking, and it would feel like someone was trying to trip me. So I told my mom's mom, and she gave me a cross to hang in my room. When I put it up, I didn't see anything after that, but it always felt like I wasn't alone in my room. Now, years later, I found out that the guy staring at me from the 1700s looked just like a picture in our living room. He was an old relative. When I still go by the house, it still feels like something evil there, but at our new house, it feels like a household. Now that I'm 21, I think that it was my parents' dad still in the room that I had. That's the only reason. A long time ago, about 20 years or so, there was a car crash in front of my driveway. At the time, I did not live there. At that matter, nobody did. In the car, there were six young boys ranging from 6 to 20. They crashed because there were a couple of drunk drivers who hit them head on. All the young men died in the car. About 10 years later, me and my family moved in a double wide on the lot in front of where the men died. About one year later, there was an awful car crash at the exact same spot of where the young men died. The woman was not killed, but she was seriously injured. After a couple of years, I went down to get the mail, when I heard a strange noise, like a young boy crying. I was the only one at home at the time. I looked around and seen nobody. The crying became fainter and fainter until I could hear no more. The next day, I went back down to check the mail, and I heard talking, two men, about 18 years of age. I looked around and saw nobody once again. I listened to the conversation, and I couldn't make out anything they were saying, but I could hear the voices as clear as day. Soon after, the voices began to fade away. I talked to my grandmother, who lives just up the road. She told me that the accident happened about 20 years ago, and everyone in the car were killed. I asked her what time it was that they wrecked, she said it was about 5 to 10 p.m. Around 7 p.m. is when the young woman wrecked her car. A few years after the woman wrecked her car, another woman broke down on the bridge 
several feet away from where the young man crashed. Another time, a couple were driving with a full tank of gas when all of a sudden, their gas tank just went empty right where everything was happening. There were several more breakdowns and accidents that happened over the years where the young man crashed, and more of my family members have heard strange talking and crying below our driveway. After time, we have moved, and still, there have been breakdowns and accidents at the same location. We think that the bridge in the area around it is haunted by the ghost of the six young men. I want to post something that happened to my mother, Marie, my uncle, her brother David, and my aunt, her sister Gail. A little background first, please. Marie was living in Arkansas, David was living in Florida, and Gail was living in South Carolina. Many miles apart, these three siblings shared the same dream on the same night and called their mother within 24 hours of the dream the teller of it. This dream occurred in 1989. The dream starts with the three siblings visiting an old farmhouse they lived in as children 30 years ago with their other siblings and parents. The house was empty. Marie, David, and Gail all got out of the car and walked completely around the house, recalling climbing an old oak tree that held a tire swing recalling the farm area and what used to stand there, etc. When the three returned to the front of the house, there on their steps sat their dear old dad. Dad passed away in April of 1974. Shocked to see their father on the steps, they called out to him. Dad stood and stood at the three with a malevolent grin. He motioned for his kids to follow him into the house. They followed through the living room, past the kitchen, down the hall, until they reached their parents' old room. He turned and looked each one in the eye and put his fingers to his lips, as if to say, shh. He then motioned with his hands for them to follow. He opened the bedroom door, and they followed him inside. He walked to the closet and walked through the closet door. Now in each person's dream, they were the ones about to open the door. As each reached for the doorknob and slowly started turning the knob, their mother appeared from nowhere, screaming at them to not open that door. They instantly woke up from the dream. I was a teenager at the time this occurred, and I did not see the big deal about following their dad into the closet until we visited my grandmother. My grandmother was telling my mother of how David and Gail both called her after Marie did, saying they had the same exact dream as she had. My mother looked scared, and my grandmother told her they all needed to get into church because Satan himself was using their father's image to lure them into something evil. I asked dear old granny how she got that from a dream and grandpa going into a closet. She told me because her husband, their father, my granddad, was scared of closets. I thought she meant he was claustrophobic. She assured me he was terrified of closets. The whole time they were man and wife, she would have to get his clothing out of the closets and lay them out for him. She would have to put things into closets. She refused to open them or go into them. My grandmother believes that Satan used granddad's image to lure the three siblings down a path of evil. I know this isn't much, but I love to hear the story. Within my years, I've had many, many ghostly experiences, but the most recent experience seemed to scare me the most. Almost every night sitting in the downstairs of my home, I feel a strong presence each time at a different location within the dining room and the living room. First, you may want to know how my dining room and living room are set in my house. When you first walk into my home, you enter a little narrow hallway 
Or you then have to go through another door to get into my living room. Then, to get to my dining room, we have a huge opening. And there's my dining room. And my steps to go to the second story in my home. The other night, I was sitting on my couch closest to the two living room windows. But something just kept telling me to look over at the window in the dining room. Sure enough, I saw black mist that looked as if a face was watching me, but then it disappeared. I passed it off if it were nothing, and that I was seeing things, because it was around 11.30pm, and I was quite tired. For some odd reason, my shades were semi-open for five blades, and then the rest were closed, so no one could see. I then moved my brother to the other couch, and we sat together, and I just could not keep my eyes off the window in the hallway entrance. Within an hour, I was getting finally comfortable. My brother was sleeping. My mother and stepfather were sleeping. And my older brother was home upstairs, with his car parked outside. I gazed at the window, and the black mist was back. But this time, it was more clear and bigger. It seemed more like a body and a face, but turned to gaze out of my window. Then it sounded like someone was trying to open my front door. It's a big steel door, and when it's locked and somebody tries to open it, it sounds as if someone is pushing against it. It happened at least six times before it stopped. I held my little brother close to me. Within the next 15 minutes, it sounded like someone was walking in the hallway and jiggling keys. Well, that was enough for me. I woke my brother up and sent him into my room because I had my air conditioner on in my room. But the jingling sound seemed to follow us to right outside my bedroom door, then stop for the night. My mother recently saw the mist and told it to go back to wherever it came from. It then seemed to glide to my basement door and disappear. My home is about 150 years old, and back then, people couldn't afford to have a proper funeral. So they buried people in the walls in the basement or in the floor. We recently had a dirt basement floor and a cobblestone wall, but we had the floor cemented over. My grandfather, whom I can safely say is a ghost expert, senses something in the walls in my basement. Around my house, but mainly in my room, I know for a fact there is a ghost in my room, but she's a sweet woman and she just seems to watch me until I fall asleep. There are several ghosts in my home, but recently, I feel as if more are residing here. Just the other night I was drifting to sleep in my room, and I heard the sound as if someone was breathing. I held my breath, and the sound was still there, so I turned the TV on. It seemed to just go away. I was scared, and looked towards the mirror, and saw a flash and then nothing happened, but I saw the woman and felt comfort. I feel as if she scared the other spirit away. In my grandmother's house, there is an attic, but it's hidden in the ceiling, and you have to pull the straps down. During the war at her home, soldiers were hid in the attic, and rumor has it, one night, the other people found them and killed everyone in the room. But the one young nurse was beaten and then murdered. I had a dream once about a place where there's a dangling light, and you have to walk on beams and then open a door, and there's a little room with blood stains. I told my grandmother, and she said I described her attic exactly, even though I'd never been in the attic. The woman who was murdered was a beautiful woman, and she is often spotted around my grandmother's house, scrubbing floors and walking. My grandmother's house was remodeled after the war, and the woman comes down the steps and walks, straight turns, and goes out a door, which is now a window. But before there was a wall separating the rooms and a separate door. Recently, my grandma has seen a little boy petting her dogs, saying, come on doggy, come with me. She thought it was my little brother 
because he had spent the night. But he was downstairs sleeping, and no one else in the house was awake. She knows he's a ghost, and she is comfortable with him. Although I am severely frightened of her basement, which in 1947, a man was found hanging with a grin on his face, and a woman shot in the head underneath him. There were people found suffocated in their beds, random strangers. My grandma says the boy was one of the children found, and the man is evil. She feels that he may harm me. She doesn't like anyone, except for her in her basement. I have many more stories to tell you, but I'm sorry, I'm out of time. I'll contact you later with many more stories. Thank you. Feel free to email me. Or if you just want to exchange experiences, thank you. Although this is a true tale, it's not one of your spine tinglers. Just something odd that cannot be explained. It was told to me several years ago by a colleague and happened to her mom, Jean, and some friends. Although Jean lived in Romford, Essex, she regularly went to a keep fit class in a small school hall in Upminster. The class had finished and her and her friends had piled into her car and drove around the corner, parking near the chip shop and they all ordered fish and chips, like you do when you've just had a good workout. They were all sitting in the car quietly eating when one person noticed something odd and nudged the person next to them. Eventually, they were all mesmerized, mouths agape, chips forgotten as their attention was focused on the activities in the churchyard over the road. Quite clearly, they could see a silent nighttime funeral procession of a coffin being carried on the shoulders by six pallbearers, all decked out in long black-tailed coats. They silently watched the procession walk from one side of the church and disappear around the other side. St. Mary's Lane, for anyone who lives nearby. Of course, they all asked the other, did you see what I saw? Knowing full well they did. The next day, Jean decided to visit the church as she just had to know what happened. Maybe someone was buried late last night. However, she got to the church and found the vicar. She worded the question carefully so as not to look like a complete idiot, and was obviously stunned when the vicar told her that no funeral took place last night. She said that from the look on his face, it was fairly obvious that he knew why she was asking. But being a vicar, he simply smiled and walked away. Spooky. I've been past the churchyard as my grandparents used to live just down the road, and it is quite a creepy looking place. All the stones are really old and crumbly and covered in moss. None of the names or dates are readable. It's one of those graveyards where you can look at it for a little while, and then you kind of shudder and have to look away. I used to think it was my childish imagination. But even these days, the place still gives me the creeps, even in the middle of summer. My story has to do with things that happened to me as a child. When I was six years old, my parents bought a very old house, probably around 100 years old, and that was back in 1976. It was a very large house and some of the original wallpaper was still in it. I have always been kind of in tune with the supernatural, and I also have a psychic sense. I'm not saying I am psychic, but I just know things and I can't explain it. Well anyway, I know that my sister was very afraid of this house. She is three years younger than me. She would either sleep with my parents or with me and she would never cross the long hall that ran through the center of the house by herself. I know that one day I was sitting in the living room and I got this really weird feeling, like I wasn't the only one in the room. I felt like someone was staring at me. Now keep in mind that my mother and sister had gone to the store, so I was in the house alone. At this time, I was about nine years old. I was sitting on the floor and I just happened to look up. If you are familiar with old houses, you know that some have these glass windows at the top of each door that I guess people used for ventilation before air conditioning was invented. Well, the upstairs of this house had been added years after the original one story had been built, and the steps that led upstairs went even with the glass window above the door in the room I was in. There was also a small triangle of wood that was missing from the step, 
and that is where my eyes shifted to. There was something looking at me through that space. I was so scared that I grabbed my dog and ran to the front porch, just hoping my mother would drive up. I don't know what it was, but there was something there. People in the neighborhood were always asking if the house was haunted, and one time an old woman I had never seen before asked me if I knew of the girl that had been locked in her room, in my house, and she had died there. There is also another story that happened in this same house. My uncle was living with us. He was 70 years old, and I was about 10 at the time. One night I heard him calling my father. He was shouting, and that is what woke me up. My father went running into his room, and this was my uncle's reply. I know you're not going to believe this, and I know I shouldn't be seeing this, but I do. There's a black woman standing in front of the fireplace holding a little girl's hand, and she's wearing a red coat and hat. Then my father said that my uncle's eyes followed something around the room, and then my uncle began to scream again, No! Go away! Don't come near me! Then they disappeared. My father said that he had never been so scared in his life, because his uncle was being rational about it. Like he knew he shouldn't be seeing something like that, but he did. I knew there was something in that house. Although we moved out when I was 14, I still drive by it to look, and I still get a creepy feeling about it, just from driving by. I feel it in my bones. What do you think? I would really appreciate your opinion. Thank you so much. In the summer of 1999, I bought a house in a small town in Washington State. I'm a California native, so as you can imagine, I had a difficult time adjusting to the calmer settings. It was almost too quiet for my liking. About three weeks after I moved into my new home, an old colonial-styled house, I decided and began looking for a roommate. Soon after I placed the ad, I got a phone call from a very willing young lady who said it sounded like the perfect location for her. I took her name down, and she said she would call me the next day to set up a time and place to meet. I waited all day for her phone call, but it never came. I figured she must have found some other place to stay, but I kept the spot vacant in case she called back. A few weeks later she did call again, and as before she told me she would call back the next day to set up a time and place to meet. I faithfully awaited her return call, but same as the first time, it never came. I began to get suspicious as to whether it was a prank caller or a real person of interest. I thought it was odd how she'd given me a name without a number. My attempts to find her in the phone book failed, so without any other place to turn, I gave up on the search. About three months later, I was up in the attic storing some Christmas decorations I wouldn't be needing for some time when my eyes fell upon an old stack of newspapers in the corner. I was somehow intrigued by a particular paper lying on the top of the stack. As I thumbed through it, I was quite shocked to read an article printed about a young woman who died in her house, the house I was currently living in, at the age of 22. Even more shocking was the name of the woman. It was an identical match to the woman who called about sharing my home. I couldn't catch my breath. I went down to the local historical library and discovered that this woman did indeed live in the very house I now owned in the late 1800s. My visit to the library occurred close to six months ago. Since then, late at night, I've heard crying downstairs in my living room. My aunt and uncle used to live in an old log cabin. We think it was by an Indian burial ground, but it was definitely haunted, and the spirit there was not good at all. One night, my aunt and uncle woke up to find they couldn't move. They were being held down by something, but that's not my story. My three cousins all shared the same room. It was the only room on the second level. I hated going up there by myself. I never had to before, but this time I did. I was about six or seven. My sisters and I had been playing board games with our cousins up in their room. When we went downstairs to watch movies, I left my shoes up there. When the time came to go, I couldn't find my shoes. I looked everywhere. Then my sister reminded me I left them in my cousin's bedroom. I went upstairs and planned to run into the room, get my shoes, then run out and down the stairs as fast as I could. I ran into the room and picked up the shoes. But as I was turning around, I felt something behind me. 
I was so afraid to turn around, but at the same time, I wanted to run down the stairs, right out of the house and into the car. So I slowly turned around. There I saw a small little Indian girl, maybe about my age. She was surrounded by a blue and white light. I just stood there until she vanished. I ran out to the car where my parents were waiting, and until now I have never told anyone my story except for my aunt, who also sees things. Later I found out that my aunt and uncle would pray to the Indians to watch over them, to protect them from whatever was in that house. Maybe the little Indian girl was just watching over my cousins. My wife and I had moved to the naval station at Mare Island of Vallejo, California. I was attached to the personal support office. About four months after reporting, I was sent to the Combat Systems Tech School's command to process new students. I hadn't heard about the school's past until my encounter. One day in the fall of 1993, I was typing up a report about 0730 before the other three civilians and one other sailor got there. The typewriter was next to the door to my office, so I didn't miss anyone coming or going. There also was just that one main entryway into the office cluster. No other exits except for a fire door with the alarm connected. Anyway, someone walked by my door and I thought it was my shipmate, so I asked how he was doing. I got no reply, so I thought he hadn't heard me and I decided to go bug him after I finished my report. I went to his office and found it locked. Then I noticed the light on down the hall. The light was moving ever so slowly and getting closer to me. It was then that I realized that it was actually a translucent figure of a sailor. It terrified me so much that I ended up passing out from a panic attack. One of the civilian computer programmers walked into the hallway at work, noticed I passed out and shook me awake. I told her I saw something in this hallway and she said that I probably was just overworking myself from stress. I also told her that I thought Brian had walked by. She looked at me and said that nobody had moved from their computers since she got there at about 15 minutes to 0700. She did tell me something fascinating though. She said that at times she could have sworn she heard a whistling and a crying sound coming from the hallway. It sounded a lot like a little girl. It was then that I learned that the school was a fleet hospital for the San Francisco Bay Area built back approximately 100 years ago. The night watch detail would find locked doors open and hear footsteps at night. There were stories told about people hearing sounds of a little ghost girl playing ball near the main staircase. I never had the chance to witness her, and the base is now closed, but it was very interesting. As for the sailor, I have absolutely no clue as to what the story behind this guy was. To spare myself the anxiety, I just revert to thinking it was only my imagination although it felt as real as anything I could ever see. One other experience was shared by my wife, myself, and my mother-in-law at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii in 1995. My wife had been flown to Tripler Army Hospital due to complications with her first child. My mother-in-law arrived a day before I got there from my ship. Anyway, we were put up in the guest house at Hickam for a couple of nights before being moved temporarily to an officer's quarter in the corner of the base. It was a well-furnished room and had a pleasant air about it. That was until the night arrived. My wife was awoken that first night where she heard multiple whispers. She then went to get herself a cup of milk in the kitchen of the house when she saw the presence of two figures crouched down as if they were praying. They both wore brown robes like they were monks. This whole ordeal must have lasted 30 seconds and they faded away quickly. In the morning we both got up and discussed what we had felt that night. That's when she told me about what she witnessed. The crazy thing was, while she was experiencing that, I told her that I could have sworn I saw the face of an elderly man just staring back at me in the mirror when I used the bathroom. He had scars on his face and was balding. I'll never forget the sight of it. It was an extremely uncomfortable feeling. This is a story that will always live with me for the rest of my life. My mother and father used to always take lengthy trips over the weekends to visit my grandparents in Ohio when we had lived in Michigan. We would drive about four hours and we usually would get there by the evenings. My grandparents lived in a huge Victorian estate on top of a hill surrounded by woods all around. 
The house had six bedrooms and was extremely spacious, so whenever we slept over, I got a room to myself on the second floor. At the time, my dad suffered from terrible sleepwalking episodes, and they only seemed to trigger at this house. I can remember one night, I was sleeping in the room and had my window open. That was when I was awoken by soft sounds coming from outside of the window. It sounded like hymns and chanting, as if it was a lullaby. At first, I checked to see if the television from downstairs was accidentally left on, but it wasn't. I was starting to get really freaked out when I went back in my room, because I noticed my dad was walking towards the trail path into the woods. The house lights were shining bright enough so that I could see the woods well enough from the window. In a panic, I ran downstairs and outside as fast as I could and grabbed a flashlight, then chased after my dad into the woods. He had managed to walk so far into the path of the woods that we got to be a mile away, and the further I went into the woods, the darker it got. We just kept getting further and further away from the house, and it was really starting to get cold and scary. I started to call out for my dad, shining the flashlight straight ahead in the now pitch black woods when I had lost him. For a split moment, I felt someone whisper my name in my ear and the rustling sounds of leaves behind me as if someone was walking right behind me. For some reason, I thought maybe my dad was behind me instead. So I turned and pointed my flashlight and there was nothing there. I kept going and continued to look for my dad. That was when I once again heard a voice, but this time in a low and guttural voice. I could have sworn I heard the voice say, let's play. At this point, I actually thought my dad was playing a practical joke. So then I yelled out to my dad and told him this isn't funny and to show himself. Even though the voice sounded nothing like him, I just kind of assumed maybe to ease my mind in my panic state. Literally a split second later, I see a cloudy mist and what looked like an orb hovering from the distance of the woods and slowing going in my direction from afar. It then disappeared. I heard my dad's far off distant scream and I started running faster into the woods to try to locate him. When I finally found him, he had fallen into this well that none of the family had any idea had existed. I quickly helped my dad out of the well, and he had asked me what happened. I brought him back into the house and told him that he was sleepwalking and managed to wander into the woods. The creepiest part of this whole experience was this. He said that while he was sleepwalking, he had dreamt that a woman in pioneer clothing urged him to find her missing son in the woods. She told him to run to the well and he will find him. When my dad told me this, I told him about hearing some soft singing before I rushed into the woods to get him and that I heard voices and whispering into the woods. A couple days later, fascinated by the well that existed in the woods, we went to go see it in daylight. To my utter shock, we had made a gruesome discovery. We found what looked like human bones at the bottom of the well. We immediately called the police. They examined these bones, and we were able to confirm weeks later that they weren't animal remains, but human remains. We had the bones examined by a professional, and they believed that the bones belonged to a young boy who may have perished hundreds of years ago. My guess is in the early 1800s. I would like to stay wholeheartedly that these events are in fact true. From my father's sleepwalking to the dream he had and the bones uncovered. It may sound a bit far-fetched, but I guess you'll have to take my word for it. This event happened in the 1970s and I'm 70 years old now. This all happened when I was 17. I have a rather bizarre ghost story 
Or maybe it just appears that way to me, since I've never experienced ghosts before. It was many years ago, when I was 14 years old, and spending a few weeks at our lake home. One night my friend and I decided to spend the night in the den, rather than our bedroom. The den has a lonely view of the lake, and has a wall of windows. It is a very large room. As we were in our sleeping bags, I noticed what looked like a man sitting in the armchair. The apparition was black. You could not distinguish any features, but you could see a bowler hat or a similar hat on his head. He just sat there and didn't move, his arms resting on the chair. I was paralyzed with fear. I eventually mentioned this to my friend, or maybe she mentioned it to me first. I just remember that after a long time, we started talking about our late night visitor. We compared notes on what we were seeing, and it became apparent that we were both seeing the same thing. A shadow? I think not, and if you read on, you will know why I'm so sure. My friend and I became so scared that we buried ourselves in our sleeping bags and held on to each other for dear life. We knew we had to get out of there, but we were too scared to move. Eventually we got up our nerve and made a mad dash to the bathroom. Keep in mind, our lake house is quite large and the bathroom was not nearby. We huddled in the bathroom for some time and got up our nerve to make it to our bedroom. This time, for some reason, we didn't run. As we were making our way to the bedroom, we saw another apparition on the living room sofa. This was definitely no shadow. There were no windows in this room, therefore no light except the bathroom light. This apparition was easier to see. It was a woman from the turn of the century. She was dressed in a white dress, possibly a Victorian wedding gown and lying in the pose of a deceased person. As you could imagine, we hightailed it to our bedroom. When in the bedroom, we sat up with the light on. I'm not sure how much time passed, but eventually, we heard what appeared to be a marching band playing. We looked at the clock and saw that it was after 3 a.m., and therefore, highly unlikely that a marching band would be performing in this rather sleepy-like community. Had it not been for this, we would have considered it as teenage imaginations going wild. You can see things, but hearing them is an entirely different story. In the morning we checked out the house, to see if there was any way music could be played by itself in the house. We found an old radio down in the basement, but it wasn't plugged in. We then plugged in the radio, and it did not even work. We asked my grandparents if they had heard anything, and they said they had it. When we told them our stories, they just laughed, and almost everybody else we had told this to laughs also. If they don't laugh, they listen and nod their heads, but we can tell they are just being considerate and patronizing us. We are now both 30 years old, born a day apart, and live over a thousand miles apart. When we are together, we still talk about this and stand by our story and memory. We still agree about what we saw and heard. I have no explanation about this, but I will not sleep alone in this house. I don't even visit often, but when I do, I'm still scared to death. Seabrook, Toddville Road the former Toddville mansion, which has recently been torn down. The property turned into apartments or condos. Reports of a strange creature roaming the grounds, noises, feelings of being watched, shadowy figures. Actually, this mansion was the List Mansion. The story of this place was well known to the people of Seabrook, who lived there at the time. I lived near the List Mansion for many years. Several acres of land were bought by a Houston business owner in the late 70s to early 80s, right on Galveston Bay, 
near the intersection of Toddsville Road and East Meyer Road. Bill List was his name, and for the most part at first, no one knew who he was, only that there was a major construction project going up near the bay. Bill List owned a trailer manufacturing business, and with the success of his business came great wealth. The mansion was a massive undertaking, built up on several feet of soil. The three-story brick structure dwarfed the modest home surrounding the property. The brick foundry, where Bill was buying the bricks for his mansion, was unable to keep up production of bricks for the mansion and bricks for other products. So Bill just bought the brick foundry so all the bricks made could go into his construction for project. Month by month, the mansion began to take shape. The stark brick structure was three stories tall, four if you count the massive garage on the ground level. All the windows on every floor featured wrought iron bars. It was divided into two separate sections, with a large glassed in garden and pool. Catwalks on the second floor crossed from the front of the house to the back part. The rooms were arranged into two separate apartments, with kitchens, bathrooms, and living areas. The entire property was surrounded by a brick wall from Toddville Road. The List Mansion, as it was called, resembled a prison, which was not far from true. When construction was completed, me and some friends were in the Kroger parking lot in Seabrook when two guys a little older than us invited us to a big party to celebrate the opening of the List Mansion. We talked to them for a few minutes, and then they left. We did not go to the party. For years after that, you rarely saw anyone coming or going from the mansion, even though several families could live there at the same time and never see each other. The guys we saw at Kroger that day never showed up anywhere in town. Then one day, Bill List was dead, murdered, and the whole story came out in the Daily Citizen, the Bay Area newspaper. The List mansion was built like a prison, not to keep people out, but to keep people in. As it turns out, Bill List had a preference for younger men and would cruise the alleyways in parts of Houston where runaways would frequent. He would offer them a place to stay in drugs in return for his indulgence for the young men. Bill would keep them drugged and locked in the mansion, providing everything for them but freedom. Some would stay and others would eventually be let go, but it was the final group of guys who figured it all out. They decided that Bill List must die. So one day, they got a hold of a shotgun and waited for Bill to come home from work. Bill never made it up the stairs from the garage before he was shot and killed. The guys who killed him ransacked the mansion, stole Bill's credit cards, and left. Some were picked up on their way to Canada. Others were caught in the Houston area. For years after the death of Bill List, the mansion was up for sale, and yet no one would buy it. Caretakers were brought in to maintain the property, and eventually, a bunch of people at a rock and roll band rented it for a while. I moved from Seabrook in the early 90s. Eventually, the List mansion was bought by a real estate land developer, and he tore down the List mansion. In its place was built Suco condos with clay tile roofs. There is nothing left of the List Mansion, except the sordid stories of the long residents of Seabrook. These are my memories of the List Mansion. I grew up in a small town, and for about a year, we lived in a haunted house when I was just two years old. In other words, I don't remember specific things, just feelings. It all started when my mother and father moved from South Carolina to Kentucky. They rented an old house with a huge basement. This was told to me by my mother. I don't remember much about the house, so this is all secondhand information. They had lived there only about a month when my mother and older sister started to notice things. They told me that I was the focus of the spirit as it would do things to me or around me. Here's a few of the things that happened to me when I was little. One time, 
My mother and sister was sitting in the living room watching TV. I had a little wooden rocking chair that I loved to sit in. My father was at work working a night shift in the coal mines. Mom said, all of a sudden, things got very cold and my little rocking chair started rocking very fast and the rocking tossed me out onto the floor. Then, the chair fell backwards against the wall with no one in it by the way, and my mother and sister both heard a very dull laughing. My mother said that the thing in the house would push me, and a few times when she was watching me play on the front porch, would pick me up and drop me down hard on the ground. My mother says that she was terrified to leave me alone. Then another time, my big sister and her best friend were playing with me in the front yard, and my mother said she heard them screaming for her. When she went out in the yard, my sister and her friend was holding on to me and crying. I was trying to go down the little hill, into a little field below our house, begging to go play with it. My sister to this day swears that she and her friend saw a big black figure hiding behind a tree and motioning for me to come to it. And what was scary was was that I was going. My sister's friend refused to come visit her at her house after that episode. My mother told me that I told her its name. I won't repeat it here, for it makes me have anxiety attacks, and that I lived in a deep dark hole in the ground, down in the field below our house. My mother went looking for a hole in the ground, and she found an old well that had been boarded up, and the weeds grown over it pretty bad so it was very difficult to see. She didn't tell me if she experienced anything there or not, but she wouldn't talk about it with me. She kept begging my father to move. My mother said it would laugh at her, and she was constantly scared. Finally, one night when my dad was home, something happened that made my dad rethink and take my mother seriously. My parents were in bed, and it was pretty late. My father looked up, and noticed the shadow of someone staring at him in the darkness. My dad at first thought it was my sister, so he raised up and asked her what was wrong. The thing laughed, and my mother screamed that it wasn't my sister, because the shadow was too big to be my sister. When she screamed, my dad jumped up to turn on the lights, and it laughed again and disappeared. From then on, my dad took what my mother said seriously. After a while, my dad was able to buy a piece of land, and we moved, and according to my mother, not a minute too soon. To this day, my mother refuses to talk about it. I didn't find out about this until years later, when I was watching TV about 15 years old or so. I saw a commercial for cat food with the same name of the thing that had haunted us for years before. I had no idea about this because my mother didn't tell me about it until afterwards. As soon as I heard the commercial and some of the cat food, I had an anxiety attack. When I told my mother what happened, she turned very pale and told me some of the story. Some history of the house after we moved out. There was a man and his daughter who moved into the house. He was a single father, so he had his mother move into the house with him to help him take care of his daughter while he worked. Within two years of them living there, the man went crazy and one night killed himself with a gun. The daughter and her grandmother moved out at the night of his suicide and moved away to another state. No one ever lived in the house again. It stood empty for years and the house started falling apart. The owner had since died a long time ago, and everyone just sort of ignored the old house. My mother never told anyone of our experiences. Finally, about six or seven years ago, they tore down the house in the basement, and they built a community fire department on the property. That building isn't exactly where the house was. It stands about 30 or so feet from where the original house stood, Anyway, that is my story. I've had other experiences as an adult, but I will save those for another day. 
Thanks for listening. I live in a two-story town. It was the middle of July, and it was very hot in Kansas City. I was sleeping on the couch downstairs, as the upstairs is hot in the summer months. I was sleeping, and I remember a low, heavy, dark voice saying I must help Laura, my cousin, understand. I woke up startled by the deepness of the voice. You could even say a little bit scared. My dog, which hardly ever barks, was looking into the kitchen and growling, and then slowly he started to bark. He was watching something, and when I looked in the direction he was looking, of course I couldn't see anything. The light from the outside street lamp was beaming through the window, so it was somewhat light. He started to back away and follow the presence into the den and then to the wall that was straight across from me. He was watching something, but of course, I still couldn't see anything, but from the way I woke up, in a startled state, I was somewhat scared to move. Like an idiot, I just stayed still and watched my dog follow this presence that only he could sense. He then started to go to the door, located on the wall across from me, and which opens to my garage, growling at the door. He would back up, and then move closer, and then he started to smell under the door. Still, I was too afraid to move. I just stayed there, and watched. Within five to ten minutes of this, the presence seemed to have left. My dog stopped growling. I was going from the kitchen to the wall, into the door again, and again, as if to look for something. Finally, he gave up, and just curled up at my feet, which have not moved an inch this whole time, and fell asleep. Feeling now that the presence had left the room, I went to the door, which led to my garage, and pushed on it to make sure the door was closed. Once again stating what an idiot I am, I did not dare to open the door. However, I didn't really have a choice because that was when the door cracked open just enough that I could see the face and a body of a bloodied lady in a black robe. It appeared for 40 seconds and I saw her long enough to make out that she had to be a nun. I just remember her face looking so badly bruised and beaten, as if she was hit with a bat or something damaging enough to give her a black eye. I turned away in fright, then opened the door completely to see that nobody was there anymore. It was like it appeared in a flash of lightning, then was gone. Just to give you some background on my house, the door that goes to my garage does not have a lock in it. Yes, this is dangerous, for if my garage door is open, anybody could just walk in, right into my house. Maybe this nun I saw was really a homeless person. Maybe it was someone who was trying to rob the house, but since they saw me, they fled. Nothing was stolen, everything was in one piece. Feeling somewhat safe that the presence had left, I joined my dog and soon fell asleep. In the morning I awoke, went upstairs to take a shower, and dressed for work. When I came downstairs, I gathered up all my things and opened the door which leads to my garage, and stood there in total amazement. My garage door was wide open. I left the door open all night and morning. I truly feel my spirit guy was trying to warn me, and I was too stupid and too afraid to listen to him. As I drove to work, I thanked him for trying to warn me, and I promised to try and listen more carefully next time. The reality sank in that I could have been robbed or beaten. Yes, today I'm buying a chain lock for that door and installing it right away. In hindsight, I wish I would have been more accepting of the events that were happening in me. If this has taught me anything, it's to stop, slow down, and listen to the ones who are trying to help me.
As a youngster, I was playing with my toys in the lounge, and suddenly, I had this great feeling of feeling a fright around me. So I went running into my mother, who was washing the dishes. She told me not to be frightened, as there was nothing to be frightened of. So she assured me, and took me back into the lounge, to carry on playing. But as she walked back to carry on washing, she saw a figure standing still in the hallway. It looked as though it appeared to be a monk in a brown habit, with his face covered by his hood. All you could see was his feet, which had sandals on. My mother walked towards it, and it disappeared into my mother's bedroom. But my mother always said how I must have sensed the presence of this ghost. Another time in the same house, it was nighttime, and I couldn't sleep. So I was just looking into space, when three squares appeared on the wall. I thought that it must have been some kind of light shining in from the window, knowing full well that no light normally shines through, as we had blinds and curtains up at the window. I kept on staring at the squares on the wall. They didn't move or anything but I felt really frightened like in the other story. I must have fell asleep, thinking about the lights on the wall. In the morning, when I awoke, the first thing I did was get out of my bed and go straight to the wall, hoping in the back of my mind that there wouldn't be any kind of marks on the wall where the square was. But I was wrong. Where the squares were, there were deep lined marks, like holes that were pressed into the wall, around where the shapes were. They looked almost like claw marks, and definitely weren't there before. There is no logical explanation for this story, not that I can explain anyway. It was not possible for any light to come through the curtains, and there were no other kind of lights, or anything on in the room or in the house. I've tried to come up with some sort of explanation, and I don't have one, and that happened about 23 years ago. I've had some strange and incredible experiences over the years, just posted one in the last batch. Some of them, I haven't sorted out how to share yet, but the following experiences are pretty strange. My roommate and I were living in a Seattle neighborhood called Capitol Hill. Our apartment building, the Ben Lamont, was built in 1910, and my apartment overlooked a little park area with a long retaining wall in the back. One night, I must have fallen into a deep sleep as soon as I went to bed. When I woke up the next day, I immediately told my roommate about a disturbing dream that a menacing, sinister black figure had climbed out of a hole in the ground, right against the retaining wall. He seemed full of rage and anger, and was coming closer and closer to our window, and meant real harm. It was a very real, fearful thing. After hearing my dream, my roommate said she tried to wake me up soon after I went to sleep, but I was out cold. She said she heard something like a gunshot outside in the park and walked through a darkened apartment to the living room's bay window to see if she could see anything. She said she saw a man who was built like a tank, but fitting the physical description of the man in my room to a T. He appeared to be staring up at her. For whatever reason, I don't understand why she did this, considering she thought she heard a gunshot, but she shined a flashlight on him. When she did, she could no longer see him. Although she saw everything else, the trees, the ground, bushes, everything where she was standing was illuminated, but he had vanished. When she covered the light, there he was again. I guess she did this a few times until he really vanished. Very very strange. Another time I was staying in an artist's loft in San Francisco that was in a really creepy area on Market Street and 6th. 
I was in bed, just starting to get the semi-lucid feeling, when I woke with a frightened gasp. The only way to describe it is a flash vision. I thought for sure my throat had been slashed with a deep long knife from left to right, and all this blood was pouring. I remember sitting up gasping, knowing it was fatal. Then on the news the next day, chills went up my spine when the anchor person said that someone's throat had been slashed at a hotel on 6th Street, right around the corner from where I was staying. Somehow, I must have picked up on the victim's fear, anxiety, and shock. Not really a ghost story, but still weird. Another time, a friend and I had an interconnecting dream. I dreamt one part, and she dreamt the other. They matched perfectly, and since we both dreamt this right before we were waking up, we assumed we had these dreams at the same time. I think I was about seven when I first started seeing things in my house and around my neighborhood. The first time I saw something was when my sister and I were sharing a room. I knew that I always felt something in the room, but I never saw anything, so I really paid no mind. Then one day, while I was sitting in my room, I looked up and saw an image by my door. I don't know exactly what it was. But I know that I was scared. Over the next couple of days, I would hear things in my room, like people walking, the doorknob would jiggle, and things would just tip over. When I talked to my mom about these things, she told me not to be scared of them, just tell them to go away. The next night, I was sitting on my bed, and I heard somebody walking around. I did what my mom told me and told it to go away. It didn't work. The sound became closer, and an image began to appear. At first I was kind of scared, but when I saw what the image was, I wasn't so scared anymore. It was a little girl, about five years old, who was lost. She was just staring at me for a while, and then she just sat down on the bed next to me. She was sitting next to me for about two minutes, and then she was just gone. For a few years, I wouldn't see anything, just hear things. When my older sister moved out, my sister and I finally had our own rooms. I stayed in our original room, and my sister moved to my other sister's old room. For a couple of months, things were cool, and then my sister woke up in the middle of the night and asked if she could sleep with me. The next morning, when I asked her why she slept with me, she told me it was because she was hearing people talking from the closet. Me and her had to switch rooms because she wouldn't sleep in her room. The first night, nothing happened, but the second night was completely different. I was hearing whispering and footsteps. At first, I thought I was scaring myself, but when I heard someone ask why my sister and I switched rooms, I knew I wasn't imagining it. At first, everyone thought I was making it up, but when I told my grandma about it, she looked at me as if she were surprised. She told me that I wasn't the only one in the family to be able to hear and see things. It was something that actually ran in my family. After that, Things started happening more. People would talk to me. I would feel them touch my arm, face, or even feet when I was sleeping. And sometimes, I could feel someone sitting at the end of my bed. I think when I really got scared was when I decided to sleep with my light on so nothing would bother me. But when someone said turn the light off, that was it. I ran to my mom's room and fell asleep on the edge of her bed. That was the last time anything happened to me for about a year. I thought it was just something I went through, but when I turned 14, it got bad. Not only was I seeing things at home, but I was seeing them outside occasionally. I learned not to say anything, 
Because when I would, people would just laugh at me. My family and I became aware of a particular area of a supposed haunting in the Jamestown, North Carolina area. We were intrigued by the article and wanted to investigate, even though we are people of faith. The article, which made us aware of the haunting, was in a local magazine and caught my two sons' attention after my wife read the article in a restaurant. The article described the following. In the 1920s, there was an accident in Jamestown near a certain bridge underpass involving two high school students returning from the local prom. From time to time, locals have reported driving by the area where the accident occurred and spotting a young woman dressed nicely standing by the roadside, needing a lift. The stories tell of a young woman named Linda entering the car and describing where she needed to be dropped. Upon nearing the destination, she vanishes. Of course, my wife and I are skeptical, to say the least. So, unaware of any peril, or should I say for a lack of knowledge or fear, we thought we would investigate with our two young sons of five and eight years. We arrived at the location, which is off the main road into the woods, about a hundred yards. There is an old stone blocked railroad underpass located next to the now regularly used underpass. Both of the underpasses have been covered with graffiti in tribute to the stories of Lydia. The old underpass, however, has been overgrown with ivy and weeds and is relatively secluded to say the least. Nevertheless, we were determined to investigate despite the spooky nature of the claims. As we entered the underpass, the air became distinctly colder, which we all noticed. We all felt frightened and left after only a few moments. We got in our car and drove home. We thought nothing of the event until that evening. Strange things began to occur at about 2 a.m. Of all things, an old woody doll with a pull string began to speak in a toy box and would not stop. The electric van door opened and closed several times without any provocation. My boys thought someone was in their room. We thought we were frightened from our prior experiences and let our logical minds control. The house still seemed strange to me and I had difficulty sleeping even though my male ego would not let me admit my fear. Time went by, and although the supposed haunting events were less traumatic, they nevertheless continued for about a month. It came time for the van to have a regular tune-up, and we took it to the dealership. When my wife returned with the van, the trouble ceased. I don't know what we experienced exactly over that period in 2001, but it seemed real. My wife and I still questioned the validity of her haunting, but our youngest son still maintains that Megan, as he refers to her, often talked to him and was very nice. Anyway, it's a nice little story we often tell family members who don't think we're lost on cozy evenings. Hope you will enjoy. I used to work at this daycare center that only stayed in business for two years. The building that we worked in had many owners and many businesses, but never stayed in business for longer than two years. Usually, bankruptcy would follow. Anyway, I had worked there for about a year and had always been scared of the back of the building. There was a long dark corridor that always gave me the chills and I always felt like I was being watched. I had the early morning shift, so I had to be there at 6.30 and get ready for the kids to arrive. One morning, I had an infant who was only four months old and was asleep at the time of the incident. We were in our room, and I was write out papers for the rest of the day when I saw a toy out of the corner of my eye being thrown across the room. 
I didn't think anything of it and played it off as my imagination until a week later when another coworker told me what happened to her. She was in the sleep room changing a child's diaper when she looked right and saw a little girl standing there staring at her. She looked back at the child she was changing and back and the little girl had vanished. There were no children besides the one she was changing in the room with her. It freaked her out. And when she told me, freaked me out. Because then I realized that the toy that I saw thrown across the room wasn't my imagination. It was just after 11ish at night in the Christmas holidays. Everyone had gone to bed. Some were still up reading though. I was feeling a bit tired so I thought I would try to sleep. I turned off my light and laid down, but try as I might, I could not get to sleep. It got to about half past and I was still awake. It was like my body was asleep, but my mind was racing. I could hear footsteps down the hall. I thought it was my sister coming home from work. My bedroom door opened slightly. Maybe she was checking in on me, although she didn't usually do this. I then felt something on the bottom of my bed, next to my foot. My original thought was it's only the cat, but then I felt pressure on the other side of my feet. By this time, I was done convincing myself it was my sister or my cat, and was at the point of freak out. I clenched my jaw and didn't dare to move. I felt the original pressure be taken off, but quickly put back down, only this time it was around my knees. The same happened with the second place and continued alternating faster and faster until finally I felt a weight on my chest, but I didn't want to open my eyes. It felt so heavy that I couldn't breathe or move, and I had to do something. I opened my eyes and looked. Green eyes looked back at me. I couldn't help myself. I screamed as loud as I could and my grandmother came running. My door flung open on its own, and my grandmother stopped in the cross section of the hall in front of my room. She waited a moment and came in. I was sitting up in bed, and I felt so hot, and I asked my grandmother if I had a fever. She put her hand on my head and said, No, your skin is ice cold. I don't think I'll ever forget those eyes. Or how hot I was. When I was younger, my parents and I tended to move a lot, mainly because my mom despised staying in one place for too long. As she often said, there are simply too many things to do and see, so why settle? I was seven when we got a job offer in Springfield, Missouri at the primary school. Of course, she jumped on the opportunity, and we said goodbye to Lebanon, packed up our few belongings, and were off. She had found a nice apartment for us. It was a two-story, three-bedroom, two-bath, and cozy yet spacious, with lots of children for me to play with, and only five minutes from the school she would be teaching at. Within a week, we were settled, and Mom was pushing me outside to socialize. I was always a socially awkward child, mainly because I was shy, making it really hard for me to relate with other kids, nonetheless communicate. I hopped on my bike and started riding the sidewalks, watching for someone close to my age to play with. Oddly enough, for a sunny Saturday, there wasn't a lot of people out and about, so I headed towards a small playground that was between the two apartment buildings. It had a large tire swing and a slide attached to what looked like a clubhouse. So I parked my bike and started swinging. I decided to get lost in my thoughts when I heard a female voice from behind me. Hey, mind if I swing with you? I turned startled, toppling over the tire swing into the sand. A tall, thin girl with long, wavy brown hair, wearing a buttoned-down yellow sleeveless shirt and white caprice was staring at me, trying not to laugh. You all right there, Jumpy? <laughs> she chuckled, extending a hand towards me. Yeah, you just startled me, I said, brushing the sand off my back. What's your name? Rebecca, but you can call me Becca, and you? Elena, you still want to swing? 
She smiled and climbed on the tire swing, waiting for me to join her. So are you new here? I don't think I've seen you around. Yeah, we just settled in not long ago. How long have you lived here? A pretty long time, I guess. I looked at her puzzled. How could she not know? I shrugged it off and changed the subject. We talked for the longest time about anything and everything that came to mind. For the first time in a long while, I had finally found someone that I had something in common with. Maybe I've actually made a friend. I thought to myself, smiling, as I watched the little boy and his mom heading towards the playground. You want to come to my apartment and get a drink? It's kind of hot and you can meet my mom, I said, stopping the swing. No sooner I had finished my sentence, the little boy's mom walked up and placed a hand on my shoulder. Sweetie, who are you talking to? I turned around and Becca was gone. I looked around to see what direction she had ran, but she was nowhere in sight. I was talking to Becca. She's the girl that was swinging with me. Did you see the way she went? The woman studied me and shook her head. She's loco, mama, laughed the little boy. I thanked her, blushing with embarrassment, and got on my bike to look for Becca, but I never saw her again, nor did I ever mention her until now. I'm not sure why she approached me or why she was lingering around the apartment complex, but I will never forget my disappearing friend. My story took place in Colmar, France. It's a town near Germany. My grandparents were quite young during World War II and told me many stories about that town. When I was four, my parents and my mother's parents bought a two-story house in Colmar with a beautiful garden. My grandparents lived on the first floor and my parents and me on the second floor. There was a basement which was separated in three rooms, a storage room, a room for my father, and a laundry room, an attic, and next to the attic, a small storage room at the time. I loved the basement. I always played there or in the garden. I never was afraid of the basement, but the attic terrified me. I remember I was four and my mother put some boxes in the attic. I followed her and felt very uneasy. It was dark, and I felt eyes on me. I looked in every direction, but I never saw anything. I was little, and I thought that there was a beast up there. Not a monster. A beast. I don't know why. Fast forward. I'm eight years old. In the summer of 1991, I played every Saturday with a friend. Melanie. I had this genius idea of searching the house to find a secret passage. I had read a book about a girl finding a secret passage in her house, and I was sure there was one, because my house was quite old. We searched the basement, but found nothing, so we eventually went to the attic. It was such a strange place. It was L-shaped, but the left part of that place was totally dark, so we had to bring a flashlight. What I could never explain was a hole in the wall at the right corner of the attic. It was three feet tall and quite narrow, but by looking into it with the flashlight, one could see a room, but there was no entry, just this hole. Nobody could enter in. This room was actually behind a small storage room next to the attic. Maybe there was a passageway, but we never found any. So we were looking through this hole. When I felt uneasy again, I felt something in the attic with us. I kept looking at the far end, where there was no light, and was sure that something would come at us. I saw nothing, and we went out playing in the garden. We went back to the attic. We were fearless young girls. My friend never felt anything, so I thought that I had an overactive imagination. So this time, I was looking through the hole, and my friend had the flashlight. She was standing at the far end of the attic, and suddenly, she asked me, What's that? 
I looked in the beam of the flashlight and froze. There was a young man sitting on the floor, his knees against his chest. His arms were crossed on his knees, like he was hugging himself. He turned his head towards us and smiled. We bolted out of the room and went to the storage room. My heart was pounding. I was out of breath. I first thought that it was a real live person, but he had no color. It was like a 3D dark shadow, and we never heard any footsteps. My friend refused to admit that we saw a ghost, and we never talked about it. I never saw him again, but the storage room became my room when I was a teen, and sometimes I heard strange noises, bangings on the wall, the wall which was connected to the secret room, and scratching noises. My grandmother learned later that our house was a clandestine printing office for World War II. The owners printed slogans against the Germans, but I think there was something else in that house. I believe that the secret room was used to hide people. But forever and ever, I'm terrified of the addict. We moved out three years ago, but I still have nightmares. Man in a trench coat staring at me. After being considerably bored at work one day, I decided to Google ghost stories, as I've personally seen and dealt with them before, and came across this site. I love reading the stories, and it got me all jazzed up to tell mine. It probably all started when I was 14. I'm now 24. My family and I were on a week-long camping trip when my dog passed away. This dog that we had, Max was his name, was the family dog, but being at a young age when we got him, I became the closest to him. After I had learned that he died, I was so upset that my family had to cut the vacation short just to get me home. I had just moved into a room in my parents' basement, and it had no door to it. Now, where my bed was located, when looking out the door, you could see the furnace to the house. One night, I woke up and grabbed a sip of water from a water bottle I always keep beside my bed and happened to look towards the entrance of my room. Sitting in the doorway was my dog, Max. Now, since this happened so long ago, I've constantly said to myself that this was a dream only because when I started calling Max to me, I remember specifically his eyes glowing red and him then jumping on my bed and trying to attack me. That ended up scaring the bejesus out of me. After the whole dog dream, I've not seen Max since. Later when I would wake up and roll over, I would steal a look to the door and I would see a giant man, like a silhouette, standing in my doorframe staring at me. To me, it looked like he was wearing a huge trench coat with some sort of hat with a huge brim. The first time this happened, I was so frightened that I dared not to stare at him too long as he would attack me like my dog. It became constant. Like every night, I would see him and for the first while, it scared me to no ends, but I became used to it, and later, when I would see him, I would just roll over, smile, and go back to sleep. One morning, after seeing the dude in my doorway the night before, I was speaking with my parents about a bad dream I had the night before. My mom chuckled as my dad also had a nightmare the same night and told me to go ask him about it. When I asked Pops about his dream, he told me that he was dreaming about a guy who broke into the house, made his way into my sister's room, and ended up killing her. This woke him out of his sleep, and when he looked out the hallway into the kitchen, he said he actually saw someone leave my sister's room. The two rooms are right beside each other that lead into the hall that leads into the kitchen and walk into the kitchen. He said he got up and ran to the kitchen 
and when he flipped the light on, no one was there. It was then that I told him that I always see someone standing in the doorway every night, and he just told me it was the furnace. What the hell? After I turned 18, I was still seeing this guy. My friends would spend the night, and in the morning, they would explain to me how they saw a guy standing in the middle of the room thinking it was me, and then explain what he looked like. That was when activity in the house started to pick up. My family and I would constantly see things out of the corner of our eyes. My mother one night told me about a floating person with a tiny smile on their face, waving to her. Loud, unexplained noises followed up by things. One night, it was all of our empty bottles lined up on our freezer, which I thought was hella cool. Moving unexplained. I feel like I might be dragging this on, and I have a bit more to talk about, so I think I will make a part two about my experiences in the future. Looking back to them, I think things only get worse for me. Nightmares with ghosts and demons. And we ended up getting the house blessed. But like I said, that will be another story. Thanks for listening and reading my story. Indonesian Black Magic I was reading another story here about black magic, which reminds me of an incident that occurred almost 20 years ago. It's probably not as scary as other stories on here, but it's definitely odd. My family immigrated to Canada when I was nine. Years later, I was living with my mom, brother, grandma, cousin, and an Indonesian houseworker. My maternal relatives are all Chinese Indonesians. At that time, my mom was too busy to take care of us, so our aunt found a houseworker, cleaner, caretaker from Indonesia to help around. I can't remember her name. We always change houseworkers, but let's call her Mia. She's quite an easygoing person. I was probably the only one who casually talked and joked with her the most, regardless of our status. One day, when I returned home from school, I didn't see Mia. She was usually in the kitchen or somewhere on the first floor at this hour. So I asked my grandma about it. She told me Mia was in the basement, resting in her room. Then she said, in the early afternoon, Mia suddenly came up from the basement, crying uncontrollably and trying to hug my grandma for comfort. Her hair was cut short, like really short to the point some parts of her scalp were almost exposed. It was not nicely cut either, as if someone had randomly snipped her hair strand by strand. She looked like a mess. I remember my grandma saying that Mia got snipped hair all over my grandma's clothes when Mia was hugging her. A while later, Mia calmed down and went back down to the basement for a sleep. I should note that my grandma doesn't speak Indonesian or English, so she couldn't communicate or ask what was going on. One thing for sure is, no one else was in the house except Mia and my grandma. For the next few days, Mia still cleaned around the house, but she looked really down and emotionless. I was a bit scared to talk to her. My cousin bought her a wig, and that was what she wore every day. No one else told me what really happened that day. Slowly, things went back to normal, and Mia was also returning to her usual self. I forgot how the conversation started, but she opened up the details to me about that weird incident. She was just resting in her room, and then the next thing she remembered was her hair was cut short, and her hair was everywhere. To her surprise, she was the one holding the scissors. By the time she realized it, she broke down and rushed upstairs. The rest was what my grandma told me. Then she was telling me about her life back in Indonesia. She had a boyfriend back home and had often dreamed about him, always telling her to come back to Indonesia. 
Her parents hate him, though, and instead wanted her to marry another rich man. She doesn't like him at all, which was why she left home to work in Canada, so she could avoid him. She suspected that man probably hired someone to cast a spell on her and made her cut her own hair as a punishment for running away from him. At that time, I didn't know much about black magic or voodoo. Actually, even now I still don't know much about it. I just had an idea that it's something similar to cursing someone and causing them to have bad luck. Weeks after the incident, my mom said Mia had returned to Indonesia. I asked her why. All she said was because her contact terms had ended with us. Although I really didn't believe that. My mom was probably afraid more unusual events might somehow get us all involved. Thanks for reading. Now to start with a little background. I was five years old at the time this occurred, living with my mom in an apartment my parents had recently separated. The layout of the apartment was, you walk in, and to the right is the kitchen. Beside the kitchen, to the further right, is the dining area. Go forward from the door, and there is a hallway on the left, where the bathroom and my mom's room were. Go straight, and take a step down into a sunken living room. To the left of the living room looks like closet-type horizontal wooden slat doors, but those were actually the doors to my room. Moving along. That day, I was at home sick, I had a terribly sore throat, and could barely speak. I had cream of tomato soup and a toasted bologna sandwich for lunch, and could not finish the sandwich, as the toast was too hard and hurt my throat. The point of me telling you this is so that you know that I remember the details of the day leading up to my experience. I digress. I spent the day with my mom and cuddled with her while we watched Young and the Restless. A movie, of course. In the middle of the night, I was woken up by the sound of the chain coming off the door and the deadbolt unlocking. I thought that it was my mom letting her boyfriend into the apartment as he worked until late at night. I heard footsteps coming through the hall and down into the living room, stopping right outside my door. At that point, I was terrified. I didn't hear my mom talking to her boyfriend or him say anything at all, and it was completely silent. The wooden slats in my door shifted and opened, and I saw a six-foot cartoon clown standing outside the door, looking in at me. I know it might sound funny that it was a cartoon, but I guarantee you that it was terrifying. It opened the door and came into my room. It walked over to me, standing above me in my bed. I was trying to scream, but because my throat was so sore, I couldn't make any noise. It had a teapot or something in its hand and was holding it over me and was starting to pour something onto me. I started thrashing around in my bed, trying to make it go away. It worked. It was like I hit rewind on a video. A slow rewind, but a rewind nonetheless. The clown backed out of my room, closed the door, the slats closed again. I heard the footsteps retreating through the apartment, the door open and close, and the deadbolt and chain go back on the door. I tried calling my mom, but my voice still wasn't working. I finally got up the courage to go and get my mom, and she came and slept with me. She didn't believe me and her, along with the rest of my family, laughs hysterically and brings up my little story. I know more than anyone how ridiculous it sounds to have a cartoon clown torment you. I also know that most of you will not believe me and say that because I was a child that I was just imagining things. But I wasn't. I know what I saw. And I know it was terrifying. The Joker. I was eight years old when my Aunt Wendy, who lived in Tennessee, 
gave me a porcelain Joker doll that had what looked like a red teardrop. We were getting ready for bed, and since we were staying with them, we didn't have anywhere to put it. My mom set it on the shelf in the front room. While my mom and I were lying there talking, we got the feeling that something was watching us. When we looked around, no one was in there and everyone was asleep. My mom looked over to the Joker doll and noticed it was pointed towards us. Knowing she had faced it towards the door, my mom got up and, and turned it to face the wall. We laid there talking for a few minutes when we heard a scratching noise on the shelf, like something heavy was being turned around. When we looked over to the shelf, the Joker doll was pointed towards us again. Thinking it was my cousin, we went in her room to see. She was asleep. I knew this as I hit her leg, and she was never a good faker. After realizing she was asleep, we went back into the front room and laid the Joker flat on its face. Later that night, with everyone still asleep, my mom got up to use the bathroom and realized that the Joker was lying on its back. So my mom got it and put it in the back with our clothes, and the feeling as if something was watching us left. The next morning, we got a call about a house. In the process, my mom told my dad that she wanted to get rid of the doll. My dad said no, because my aunt gave it to me. We were unloading some stuff, and my mom put the Joker doll in her hallway closet, hoping my dad wouldn't find it. Much to our dislike, my dad watched my mom put it there. My dad brought it in my bedroom and put it on my dresser. He said, this is where I want it to stay. The feeling of being watched returned. I was lying there and glanced at my dresser to the Joker doll and noticed it had an evil smile on its face. I hollered for my mom, and when she came in, she noticed it too, so she put it in my drawer. The next morning, we were telling my dad about what happened. He was not believing in that stuff, told us to shut up, and that we were making it up. My mom decided to call my aunt, Wendy, and asked her if they ever noticed anything out of the ordinary, and my aunt said yes. That was the reason they put it in the shed out back. Later that night, my dad came home from work, and we told him what my aunt had told us. Unfortunately, my aunt denied it all, making my mom and I look like idiots. So again that night, my mom put it back in the dresser drawer. She went to turn the coffee pot on so dad would have coffee the next morning and went to bed. The next day, my mom and I were sitting in the kitchen. My dad came into the kitchen holding the Joker doll and told us that he said he wanted it to stay on my dresser. Being eight years old, I knew I had better listen to him. So I went and put it on my dresser. He then started cussing, saying that he didn't see any problem with the Joker doll and we better keep it on my dresser. He didn't believe in stuff like that. I asked my mom if she would lie down with me, and she said yes. Still feeling an evil presence in the room, my mom said a prayer with me, and we fell asleep. The next morning, when my dad got up, he came into the room where we were and told my mom he wanted the doll out of there. My mom says that she thought he didn't believe in things like we had been telling him. Yet he just now decides that he wants the doll out of the house? He began telling her that the night before, he got up to use the bathroom, stepped into my room, and the Joker doll had an evil smile on its face, and he heard an evil laugh. Now believing us, he went in my room, got the Joker doll, and took it outside and tried to burn it. Only the clothes burnt, and the face turned black from the smoke. Then, he got it out of the trash barrel and hit it with a hammer, but only part of its face chipped. Getting freaked out, he took it to the neighborhood dumpster and threw it in there. We never saw it again, and everything in my room went back to normal. A week later, I became friends with a boy in my class, and we were all over at his parents for supper. When I looked in the front room, on a shelf... 
There was a Joker doll, just like the one I used to have. Later, my mom asked if she could look at it, and she noticed a mark where it was made that mine didn't have, and it didn't have the red teardrop. After seeing that, my mom asked where they got it from. They told her what store, and my mom called my aunt Wendy to ask her about my doll. She told my mom the same store. My mom asked my aunt about the teardrop, and my mom called my aunt Wendy to ask her about my doll. She told my mom the same store. Mom asked my aunt about the teardrop, and my aunt said she asked the store clerk about it, as it was the only one. The teardrop didn't look like any kind of paint, that it looked more like blood. When my dad got on the phone, he asked my aunt about it again. My aunt told him what they had experienced. They thought that it didn't have anything to do with the Joker doll. Even though she said they felt an evil feeling, like someone watching them, which went away when the Joker doll was in the shed. You can choose to believe this or not, but if you don't, please don't post any rude comments. I was wondering if the reason the Joker doll was like that could have been made by someone who was really into witchcraft. Thanks for reading. Another clown? During the early 70s, when my family lived for a time in Fresno, my mom decided to divorce my dad and moved herself, me, and my little sister, Ruth, into government housing, which was not bad. I thought the little semi-detached two-story houses were cute with their wooden floors. When my dad was around, my parents would argue loudly, so I thought it was just as well they were getting a divorce, whatever that was. To my six-year-old mind, Divorce was what happened to your family when you got to a certain age, like your teeth coming in. At least that's what it seemed like. Once I fell down the stairs, maybe pushed, but I was very adventurous and was probably practicing my flying. Luckily, I didn't break my neck and was only a little bruised. Another time, I rolled off my bed and fell into my metal dollhouse. There were no lawsuits back in those days, so the manufacturers of metal dollhouses were at liberty to produce razor-sharp objects for small children to disassemble and play with. But nothing supernatural ever happened that I knew of. Then, just a few years ago, my mother mentioned the ghost your sister used to see in our house in Fresno, and I soon got the story out of my sister. This is what she says happened to her to the best of my recollection. One moonlit night, she awoke on her little bed next to my big bed. She got up, wearing her itchy, footy pajamas, and toddled down the hall to use the toilet. When she returned, there on the floor was something she had never seen before, nor has she seen since. Something that looked like a clown's head was moving back and forth around the floor. It was slightly larger than a volleyball and had a painted look, white skin, wide, grimacing reddish lips, and huge yellow, googly eyes that were rolling around in their sockets. She remembers nothing definite after that, which I have read indicates a possible nightmare in children. She says she may have run into our mom's room and jumped into her bed with her, but she's not sure. You left me in there with that thing? I asked her. You were asleep, she answered. I asked her how she felt this experience affected her life. You become very open-minded about certain things, she said. One thing I know, Ruth was an extremely intelligent child who well knew the difference between make-believe, dreaming, and reality. Thanks for reading. Hope it wasn't too long and boring. This happened a couple of years ago. We had just moved into a new house. I was getting used to living in a different neighborhood, and it wasn't really easy. One night, my parents weren't home, so I invited my friend over. We were sitting in my room, talking about boys, when my friend said she had to go to the washroom. While she was in the washroom, I went downstairs to go get a snack for us to eat without telling her. As I went downstairs, she came out of the washroom 
and was stunned I was coming back upstairs. She asked, How did you leave so quickly when I was just talking to you? I was shocked. I told her that I had been downstairs and I didn't even talk to her while she was in the bathroom. We both were freaked out and she told me the voice sounded exactly like mine. That night, when my parents returned home, me and my friend were getting ready to go to bed. We fell asleep at around, oh gosh, I would say 1.30 a.m. The next morning, I awoke and my friend left to go home. I was walking up the stairs. I had this feeling as if someone was following me. I looked back and I saw this dark thing walking behind me and as it walked after me, its hood came out of nowhere and just became more visible. I ran to my bedroom and locked the door. I told my parents about what had happened. They didn't really believe me. So I asked my mom who had lived in this house before us and she told me that this lady and her kids had lived here. She had this worried look on her face. I asked her what had happened and in a light voice she said the woman who lived here before had committed suicide in our laundry room. I was terrified. Sometime after that, I went to do my laundry when the door had slammed shut. I was scared to death. I quickly opened the door and ran out of the laundry room. After that day, I never saw anything again until I had to take care of my baby cousin with my friend. We were playing with her in the spare room when she pointed up at the ceiling and started to cry uncontrollably. I ran and got my camera. When I took a picture of where she was pointing, I could see this white weird shaped thing. We were terrified. After that, I showed my parents the picture and they invited the priest to bless our house. Ever since that day, I haven't seen a ghost. Thank God, peace and love. Monster in the Laundry Room In September 2005, my husband, myself, our three children, and of course, the lovable dog, moved into our house. It is a renovated lakefront cottage built in the 1930s in a rural town of upstate New York. We were drawn to the house for its charm and the peaceful lake. But I must say that I did feel a bit uneasy when we first moved in. Within the first few weeks of living there, I experienced some strange happenings. The house is a ranch style with a partially finished basement an unfinished laundry room, and workshop. There is also a dirt floor, crawl space, that you can only access from an outside door. I still can't bring myself to go in there. One night, while carrying a basket of laundry up the basement stairs, the stairwell light flickered out. I tried the light switch at the top of the stairs a few times, but could not get it to work. I told my husband that we needed a new bulb, and when he flicked the switch, the light went on. It happened again the next night, and I made him change the bulb. Well, this flickering continued for a couple of weeks, even after the bulb changed. While this was happening, my dog was also acting bizarre. After I would get up to the top of the stairway, he wouldn't follow me up like he normally would, but instead would sit at the bottom of the stairs and bark at me as if he didn't know me, almost as if he was staring right through me. He did this every day. A short time later, I woke early one morning before my husband left for work 
and found the front door wide open. Now, I know that I shut and locked the door before going to bed, and when I questioned my husband about it, he denied leaving it open. Hmm. I decided to mention what was going on to a co-worker of mine who had some knowledge of spiritual activity, and she suggested talking to the spirits and asking them to leave. I did, and other strange noises every now and then started to appear. Everything seemed to stop after that, though, until last night. We recently finished renovating part of the basement, which is actually ground level because of the grading of the land, and closed off two doors that used to give access to the basement from the outside. We made a master bedroom, a bathroom, and my four-year-old son's bedroom. There's a door from the master that goes into the laundry room, which is in the unfinished part of the basement. Well, my son woke up in the middle of the night last night and climbed in between my husband and I. He had a hard time falling back asleep. After my husband left for work in the morning, my son and I were laying in bed and he was staring at the open laundry room door. He said, Mom, when I move close to you, the monster has a sad face, and a very angry one too, but when I move to daddy's side, the monster smiles. I said, where is the monster? And he replied, right there in the laundry room. He has a white face and red feet, and his head is up to the ceiling. When I move next to you, he gets a mad face. I asked him if the monster talks to him, and he said, No, but he puts his hand next to his mouth and whispers only at night. He also told me that the monster thinks this is his house. We got out of bed, and I walked towards the laundry room to take a closer look. But my son said, No, don't go in there. He gets mad. I didn't see anything, so I asked my son to show me where the monster was, but he couldn't look. He seemed terrified. He just said, tell him to leave mom, he freaks me out. We went upstairs, and my son was telling his 10 year old sister about the monster. She asked if she could show her where he was, so he brought her down to the basement. He came running upstairs a minute later, saying, Yep, he's still there. His sister couldn't see it. After thinking about this, and what happened when we first moved in, I then remembered that when our next door neighbor came to introduce herself, she mentioned a couple who used to live in our house, several owners ago, that would always argue and fight. Well, apparently the husband went missing, but that was all she had said. It all seems too coincidental now. I have a feeling it will be a long night. Laundry Visitor I'm sharing this story on behalf of my dad. This experience occurred to him almost 20 years ago, but I was at home asleep at this time, in my bedroom upstairs. My dad is originally from Europe, and most of his family still reside over there. The way they lived many years ago is certainly a lot different to how we live now. The toilet was outside. They had to wash all their clothes by hand, in the river, etc. Of course, since then, many things have changed, which is great for them. It was a Saturday morning, and my dad was downstairs in the laundry, sorting out the washing. All of a sudden, from the corner of the room, he saw a white mist appear. It then turned into the apparition of his sister, who had died many years before. He told me by this point 
she appeared like a real human. In a soft voice, she said to him, Dear, look how lucky you are now to have a machine to do your washing. When I had to use my hands in the river. After that moment, she faded into a swirling mist, into a corner of the ceiling, and disappeared. Dad did not even have a chance to say anything to her. He just stood there completely shocked, but certainly not scared. After that moment, he tells me to this day, he could not believe what he had seen, and he felt very at peace with their presence there in front of him. Needless to say, he says he made himself a very strong cup of coffee after that experience. Has anyone had any experience where a loved one who has passed has gone to greet another loved one before they could get a chance to speak in such a manner and respond, before evaporating into the cold air. This all started about two years ago. Just like the rest of the house, the laundry room and garage has always given me the creeps. The laundry room is located in a small room in what we call the far garage. We have two, two car garages, and it is located in the furthest one. This far garage has always been the epicenter for creepiness. One day, I was going out to switch the laundry from washer to dryer, and as I got there, I saw that both the washing machine and dryer lids were open mid-cycle. I just thought, okay, Someone came out here looking for something and forgot to close them. I asked my mom and boyfriend if they had been out there. Both said no. Seemed kind of strange. Then, it happened again. Both lids open, mid-cycle, nothing missing. Only this time, I had been home alone the entire time the clothes had been going. This has happened to me maybe four or five times. It's not that I left them open. The washing machine's lid is located on the top, so it didn't fall open. Plus, they won't start unless the lids are shut, so I didn't forget to shut them. Nothing blatantly scary, just unsettling. I have yet one more story about the experiences I've had in my home. And it really takes the cake on full-out scariness. In another post, I will detail this event. Thanks for reading. The Washing Machine Just a short story here. And it is true. I'm not a believer in ghosts, and not an easy guy to scare. But this, this did the trick. I'll tell you in advance that I don't have an answer to what happened, but would like to hear your thoughts. It's all true, and a major puzzle to me. Our top loading washing machine is in the basement. It's a nice basement. Not a dark, spooky place. The room has bright lights. And because it's in the basement, there is no way to enter this room from the outside of this house. Okay, here we go. At least half a dozen times in the past year, I've gone done to put the wash into the dryer after the washing time should have long elapsed. Imagine my surprise to find the wash not finished and the top cover of the lid of the washing machine up. The fact that the lid is up means that the washing cycle has not been completed. Each time, I just scratched my head and wondered how this could happen. 
Just the other day it happened. This time, as I went back into the washroom, I switched on the light and looked to see the top up once again. But this time, I heard something move in the room. It was the sound like a dog would make if he woke him up from sleeping and he just bounced up. And we don't have any pets. The hair on my arms went straight up as I looked around the room, but I never found anything. We saw John F. Kennedy in the early 1990s. I know that you probably won't believe my story, but it is true. My honor and dignity as a Christian is important to me. Even today, I am still frightened by what I saw that day back in the early 1990s. I live in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and was working in a retail store as a sales manager back then. The day was as usual as a summer day is, June or July, and the sun was shining bright. Inside the store, I began walking to the back of the store to go on break or to get my paperwork. I can't remember which. This store was large, and when I had walked a certain distance, it seemed like time had stood still, and nobody was around me. It was really strange. Only a good friend and fellow sales manager was near me, and then we both saw him. A man came walking forward towards us, and we just stood in awe at what we were seeing. We both knew instantly who the man was. You see, the man was President John F. Kennedy. At an age, he would have been in the early 1990s, in his early 70s, with gray hair. Well, you might ask, could it have been a person who resembled the late President Kennedy? No, because something about him made us know who we were seeing. The man wore ordinary clothes, but he had a massive scar down the entire left side of his skull. The very area the fatal headshot was fired and killed the president in Dallas, Texas on November 1963. It looked as if that side of his entire skull had been blown away and reattached somehow. The scar marks were plainly visible to see. He looked right at me and continued walking until he got out of sight. My friend and I just stood there staring at each other. I said, did you just see what I saw? And my friend replied, yes, but I'm sure not going to tell anybody about it. We agreed to keep quiet. I ran to find the Kennedy ghost man again, but he was gone. He simply vanished. This story is absolutely true, and I never even told my fiancé about it. I keep asking myself today why the deceased president, John F. Kennedy, would contact me, of all people. He had always been my favorite U.S. president, but this was truly a crazy experience. I indeed saw John F. Kennedy in some sort of purgatory spirit world, or his spirit contacting me in one form or another. John Lennon's Ghost On December 8, 1980, former Beatle John Lennon and his wife Yoko Ono were just returning home to the Dakota, a luxury apartment building in Manhattan, when a deranged fan shot Lennon five times in the back near the entrance to the Dakota. En route to Roosevelt Hospital, John Lennon died. John Lennon was 40 years old. Lennon had an open mind when it came to the paranormal. While traveling and living at the Dakota, he reported seeing a spectral figure walking down the corridors, which he referred to as the crying lady ghost. He told his first wife, Cynthia Lennon, that if he passed away, he would contact her. In 1986, Cynthia reported that John had indeed sent her a sign. She found a dead jackdaw Wrapped in old newspapers, dated 1956, behind the fireplace in her home in Cumbria, John had told her if there was life after death, he would prove it by sending her and Julian, their son, a feather as a sign. 
John's ghost has been seen at the Dakota on several occasions. In 1983, three years after Lennon's death, Joey Harrell, a musician accompanied by a writer friend, Amanda Moores, spotted Lennon near the entrance where he was shot. Moores stated she was tempted to approach Lennon and talk, but his expression dissuaded her. Harrell reported that when Lennon appeared, an eerie light surrounded him. Yoko Ono also encountered John Lennon's ghost at the Dakota. She stated that she saw him sitting at his white piano. He turned to her and said, Don't be afraid. I am still with you. Paul McCartney described these encounters he had with Lennon's ghost. In 1995, when he, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr were singing Lennon's song, Free as a Bird, during a recording session, McCartney stated he felt Lennon was in the studio with him. As it turned out, this was more than just a feeling. McCartney went on to state, There were a lot of strange going-ons in the studio, noises that should have been, and equipment doing all manner of weird things. In another encounter, McCartney said that during a photo shoot for the single, a white peacock wandered over from the neighboring farm. At the last minute, the beautiful bird made its presence known. McCartney felt it was the spirit of John Lennon hanging around as they wrapped the recording. McCartney stated to Harrison and Starr, That's John. Spooky, eh? After the recording, while McCartney, Harrison, and Starr listened to the single's B-side, he stated that John again was making his presence known. McCartney explained they had just put a spoof backwards recording on the end of the single for a laugh and to amuse fans. As they listened to the finished single, One Night in the Studio, McCartney swears, as it got to the end, they heard John Lennon in the recording itself. Paul McCartney stated that he and George and Ringo, after this, knew it was John and that he was sending his approval. This story begins when I was a child, probably about seven years old. My mom and aunts threw a huge Halloween party for all the kids in the family. I think there were 16 of us at the time, ranging in age from probably 5 to 13. It was awesome, but the coolest part came about the time it just got really dark. We took a hayride to a cemetery a few miles down the road from my aunt and uncle's where the party was being held. My mom told us about some of the people buried there and how some of them were not resting in peace. Typical urban legend stuff. When we got there, the adults said they wanted us to show us the grave of an old man whose ghost was seeking revenge for his wrongful death. We were all scared and excited, creeping through the cemetery in the dark towards the largest tombstone. When we were about halfway there, my dad and uncles popped up from behind the graves wearing scary masks. The kids all screamed and ran for the wagon while the ghosts and moms all laughed. For years, the adults retold this story, laughing over the details of our panicked faces and terrified attempts to get away. When I was a teenager, my sister and two of my cousins decided to get our moms back for this prank. Our parents got together once a month to play cards, so that October we made sure we were around for card night. We waited until our fathers went for a beer run, which inevitably meant an hour or two at the bar. We told our moms about a legend we had heard about a sad ghost that could be seen weeping at her husband's grave when the moonlight hit. We made this story up and convinced them to take us to see it. My cousin secretly called his best friend, who had agreed to go there in a mask and hide to scare them. The prank worked perfectly, and our mothers nearly peed themselves. We all laughed hardly as we went back to our car. When we got to it, the car would not start. We laughed some more about the ghost sabotaging it and decided to walk where my cousin's friend had hidden his car. We would send our dads to get the car later. 
But of course, his car would not start either. We started to feel a little weird about this since neither car had problems recently. But what could we do? This was before everyone had cell phones, so we started walking towards the closest house, which was about a mile or two away. Though none of us knew them well, we knew the name of the people who lived there. As we walked up their long driveway, we started to worry because there were no cars parked by the house and it looked pretty dark inside. We knocked anyway, but got no answer. We were about to leave, not having nearly as much fun thinking we would have to walk the long distance to the next house when we heard voices coming from the back of the house. We went to the backyard looking for the people we heard, but it was pretty dark and nobody was around. We yelled hello a few times and identified ourselves, but got no answer. The backyard had a fair amount of trees and suddenly large branches started falling. This scared us since there was no apparent cause. In just a few seconds, at least a dozen branches bigger than your arm fell from the five or six trees closest to us. It was utterly crazy. We all ran for it. We were around the end of the driveway. My cousin screamed and pointed towards the house. It looked like several pairs of red eyes were peering around the house at us. We ran straight back to our car and tried it again. It started no problem. We did not stop at my cousin's friend's car. We went right back to the house. Later that night, my uncle and dad and cousin took his friend back and got his car, which also started on the first try. When they drove past the house, it looked completely normal, and there was a car in the driveway. We have never been sure if the people there saw us mucking about in the graveyard and decided to prank the pranksters, or if it was something else. If it was a prank... They put it together awfully fast and never laughingly confessed. We felt too foolish to ask. It was in 1971. I was in my late 20s. I was then staying in Rose Hill in a different country not married yet and staying at my folks. One day, my dad came home with a South African couple. He met them while coming back home, and they were tourists visiting Meredith with their back bags, tents, and sleeping bags. Meredith was still safe in that period, but independence was given by Great Britain in 1968, and a civil war had just come to an end a few months before. Two communities had fought for some political reasons. Anyway, my dad invited them home to sleep over for a few days. I remember the guy had a big blonde beard. He was very kind. His wife was as well, but I forgot her face. We decided to organize camping during a weekend on the west coast of Meredith. This place, which is now pretty developed, was at the time very wild with just a few houses. We went on a Saturday morning, found a nice place to put a tent, and organized the day. The South African man and his wife were very good swimmers and divers. We spent a lot of time in the sea, catching fish, crabs, some lobsters, which were getting scarce then, we don't find them anywhere by the coast, and cooked all these goodies on a small homemade barbecue set. All of us, mom, dad, the couple and I, really enjoyed the day. The sunset was beautiful. It was warm. We were in summer, and everything was perfect. When night came, we prepared a nice barbecue with chicken, beef, and pork, and a few shrimps we had caught earlier. 
The night was starry. My dad was happy and drunk, and the couple was obviously having a great time. Since we were not fluent in English, I was improving then. Communication was a bit difficult, but we could make ourselves understand with gestures and sometimes drawing on the sand. It was a great fun seeing my dad, trying to converse with them with a very limited knowledge of English. Anyway, it must have been around 9 p.m. We were all seated on the beach, watching the ocean as well as the starry sky by the campfire. It was so beautiful. Then we started to hear like a complaint. We couldn't determine the origin of the sound, but it was like a woman wailing. It was faint, but clear, since the place was wild and remote. The wailing was not constant, but would be heard from time to time. We put it on the sound of some sorts of animal. Since we were not people living on the coast, thus being ignorant of animals, which could be active at night. We were seated on the beach, facing the ocean, when suddenly, we noticed someone coming out from the sea. On our left, at about 30 to 40 meters away, it looked like a woman with a long white dress just walking from the sea to the beach. We could not see her face, but could guess she had long hair. The only lights were the stars and our bonfire. She silently walked straight and disappeared from our view in the vegetation. We found this very odd. I knew it was not normal, but did not know what the others were thinking. My dad was drunk and watched the scene with a little smile on his face. I think he was lost in his thoughts. We all looked at each other and did not know what to think. I tried to check if there was a house where the woman walked to. I just stood up and walked towards the sea and looked on my left to see where she went. There was only green, bush, and trees. There were no lights or any constructions around. I was now scared because I was realizing that we must have seen a ghost. I walked back to the bonfire and sat and told everyone that I did not find any house there. We stopped talking and everyone kept alert. We could now hear all the little noises of the night. We heard faint crackling like someone or an animal quietly walking on dry leaves. Then, suddenly, we heard loud flapping noises on a tree nearby. It looked like large birds, pigeons or bats, flying away. It scared us. Then my mom told me quietly she felt that something was not right, and I and she were feeling watched. The couple was looking around with their glass in their hands. Then, suddenly, something heavy fell in front of us on the beach at about five or six meters. I stood up to see what it was, but could not find anything. Everybody stood up and looked around. Nothing was found. Despite the fact that the night was clear and sweet, the atmosphere had changed. Apart from my father, who was in a trip because he was too drunk, we were all scared by then. The couple talked between them, and I could not understand. They seemed quite concerned about the situation. I did not know what to do. Could we stay there, or maybe go to sleep, or maybe we had to leave? That was a pity. We were enjoying such a nice time before seeing that woman. Then, in the middle of the night, we heard this bone-chilling scream like a woman being attacked. It seemed close to our camp. We were on our feet with eyes about to pop out from our sockets. My heart was pounding so loud that I thought others could hear it. 
the couple started to pick up their stuff, and my dad followed them. Mom and I packed away everything quickly. As we were doing so, some coconuts fell and rolled on our camp as if someone had thrown them away. We were now scared to death, and no one would talk. We heard running on the beach, then in the woods, but could not see anything. We quickly put stuff in the car, and it was not easy because we did not have a big car, and we had taken time to pack things so that they could fit in when we came down. Now we had to pile up things. The worst was the barbecue. It was hot and dirty, and we did not want to leave it. I burnt myself twice while trying to put it away. While we were packing away, things were happening around us. The screams seemed to originate from different places, and there was a lot of noises going on. We all got into the car practically, one upon the other with stuff on us. I decided to take the wheel because my dad was too drunk. As we moved away, we got a shock. We saw a woman dressed in white standing by the little lane looking at us. It was bone chilling. I stopped the car. She was standing about four to five meters away. I didn't know what to do. I was too scared to move closer to her, but it was the only way out. We waited a few minutes as she was standing there, staring at us. I heard my mom praying and the South African couple mumbling something between them. Suddenly, we heard a bang, like something hit the car behind. We all turned to see what had happened. The atmosphere was very tense, and I think my dad was becoming sober very quickly. He was now swearing. We did not see anything behind, but when I looked forward, the woman was not there anymore. But the scariest thing happened. She was now standing by my door, looking at me. I can't describe the utter fear which took hold of me then. I released a scream. My throat was sore several days after and pushed the gas pedal. I think everybody screamed then, but with panic, the car choked and the woman was still there looking at us. I remember not seeing her eyes or features because it was dark. I switched on the car again and drove off as fast as I could. The poor car got shaken on the dirt road. We reached the main road, relieved and shouting. What the hell had we seen and experienced? Fortunately, Rose Hill is not far from that area we were just at. But when we reached the town, the car broke down. The fan belt of the car had broken and the engine stopped from overheating. We were in the 70s, no cell or anything like towing services available a Saturday evening. The couple and my mom walked home, which was not far. My dad and I stayed by the car. At home, mom phoned a friend of my dad, who was not staying far, to tow away our car. We finally reached home at around 11.30 p.m., completely exhausted. My dad's friend who had helped us was invited to have coffee, and we told him what had happened. He said that we were lucky because there had been accounts of people walking to the sea, like being in a trance and never coming back, getting drowned by possession, really scary and unbelievable. Some would be hurt by objects being thrown at them. A woman apparently lost her baby while being pregnant. She was a few weeks away from delivery, 
But after coming to that place and seeing the ghost, she had pain in her tummy and started to bleed a few hours later. She had to go through surgery where they noted that the baby had died. These events would not always happen, but would take place randomly. The South African couple stayed two more days at home and left. We never heard or saw from them afterwards. I later discovered that there was a cemetery on the other side of the road. Not too close to the road, though. I never knew who that woman, ghost, was. But it seemed that regularly she would come out of the ocean and walk to the cemetery. However, in the late 80s, there was no accounts of seeing her up to today. My brothers and I have been living in our townhouse for eight years now. Ever since I entered college and my brothers entered high school in an exclusive school in Quaizon City, Philippines. Our townhouse is only a 10 minute walk away from the school, which is very convenient for us. However, because our family business is in the province, my parents have to live there while my brothers and I live in our townhouse alone. Several incidents happened in our house, which we chose to ignore. In one instance, when my dad paid us a visit, he and my brother were in the kitchen. My brother was washing dishes while my dad was chopping vegetables for lunch. They were both facing the wall. Their heads turned away from the door leading to the washroom at the end of the kitchen. From behind them, they heard my voice say, May I use the restroom? My brother answered back, What's wrong with you? Because he was surprised I was asking permission in our own house. They both turned around and saw no one. They checked the bathroom. It was empty. They went around the house. I wasn't there. I received a call in myself from my brother that day asking where I was. I was at work the entire time. But my brother and father were both certain it was my voice they heard. Now the second incident was more creepy because I myself experienced it. I was leaving for work. My youngest brother was already in school while my younger brother was in his room. I stepped out the door and stood by the front steps, locking the door with my keys. Suddenly, I heard my voice in the living room calling my brother's name. Rap, come down here. I fumbled my keys and tried to open the door, except this time, the locks won't open. I heard my brother running down the stairs, so I went to the window to see what will happen. The living room was empty. My brother opened the door for me and asked why I was calling him. I told him it wasn't me calling him and he couldn't believe it. After telling the story again, I left him to go to work. The third incident happened in my room. More than a year after the second incident. I woke up in the middle of the night, which always happens to me. The first thing I did is check my bedside clock, which I always check when I wake up in the middle of the night for comparison. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. At the corner of my bed is a full-length mirror which normally faces and reflects the image of my bedroom door. After checking my clock, I checked my mirror and saw myself standing and staring at myself in a dead pan away. At first I thought I was looking at my reflection and I even asked myself in my mind, why the hell am I sleeping standing up? But then I felt the bed and I knew I was lying down. After a few seconds of staring at my standing reflection, 
I turned to the other side of the bed and decided just to ignore it. The last incident did not happen to me, but to my youngest brother, who has always been in touch with the supernatural. It happened just last year, in 2007. According to him, he woke up at 5 a.m. and took a bath for school. While getting dressed, he noticed that his reflection in the mirror was grinning at him, though he wasn't smiling at all. He got terrified and decided to go to school, though it was too early. When he was locking the door, he practically screamed when he saw his own head grinning at him from his right shoulder. He walked to school the whole time with the grinning face that looks like him on his shoulder which he could see through his peripheral vision. On the way to school, he passed by some shops and saw his reflection still grinning at him. He noted that although his reflection looks like him exactly, the eyes were somewhat different. My brother chose to ignore the doppelganger who stayed with him at school the whole day. A doppelganger of my classmate. It was Saturday morning. Some of our classmates, including me, were tasked to go to the school to finish our beautification project. We were done exactly at 11 a.m. All of our classmates, excluding Trisha, Karen, Ariana, and me, went home. Ariana told us to wait here at school while she will go and buy something to eat she didn't eat any breakfast so we agreed and we waited for her since there is nothing much to do we decided to go on ghost hunting we went up to the second floor and began filming all around us with trisha's phone while walking as we passed by the library we all felt a very cold wind around us. Trisha screamed, run. Then we ran outside the gate and we saw the guard. The guard is very angry with us and so he tells us to go home. We text Ariana to go to my place after she is done eating. At my place, we replayed the video. As the film passes by the library's glass window, we saw Karen's reflection wearing a blue t-shirt in front of Trisha. Trisha was so shocked and said, Wait, you're at my back, right? And are you wearing a white t-shirt back there? Karen said, Yes, why will I be in front? Clearly you're the one who is in front, right? And I'm still wearing the exact same white t-shirt. We tried to replay it again and again, and still the same. I really want to know what you think, because I'm still baffled by this whole situation. If anybody has any idea as to what this could be, please put it in the comments below. D is for doppelganger. As would be expected, a lot has happened since I was last on here. In due time, I'll explain my absence. But for now, I'll start with what is troubling me the most. I have been with my partner, whom we'll call Michael for privacy reasons, for nearly a year now, and this started happening in November of 2012. Now, before I delve into it, at all times when these sightings have occurred, he has not been on any medication, drugs, of any kind, nor had he been consuming alcohol. To better understand the story, I better give you a layout of the house. Walk through the front door, you are greeted by the dining room, with an open plan kitchen at the end of it. Take four steps forward, and to your left you have the lounge, which is connected to the dining room, 
by two doors which are kept open at all times. Next to the lounge is a small extension of the house, which is Michael's little sister's playroom. The playroom is separated from the dining room by a glass wall and a glass door. Keep walking straight from the front door and to your right is a door leading to the garage and laundry room. Next to the laundry door is the hallway. The hallway is L-shaped and the first room to your right is his mother's and sister's room. Go to the corner of the L and you'll find the main bedroom which his grandmother resides in. At the corner of the L and slightly off to the right is Michael's room and at the very end of the L is the bathroom. Michael has been seeing my doppelganger. The appearances have been happening generally once or twice a month and it was usually just out of the corner of his eye. My doppelganger has usually been seen in and around his room and up and down the hallway. After grilling him for details, I found out that before these sightings, he would always get a whiff of my perfume that I tend to always wear. Now, the sightings have only ever been at his house, and no one in his family has my perfume, and none of my clothing is actually at his house. Doppelganger seems to have my sense of style down to a fine art, as it has always been seen wearing my usual attire. Michael has always picked up a feeling of sadness every time he's seen my doppelganger. Now, here's where it picks up a notch. A few months back in June, I was on the phone with Michael when he suddenly stopped mid-sentence and everything went dead quiet thinking something happened i immediately got worried and asked what was wrong all i got in reply was very frightened whispers getting slightly frustrated i asked yet again what was wrong michael finally told me he was seeing my doppelganger i then got very worried as he was very frightened I asked Michael what happened and he said he had been walking around the dining room table talking to me when out of the corner of his eyes he saw someone sitting on the couch in the lounge. All his family had retired to bed for the day so he was very surprised. As he turned to face it he saw that it was my doppelganger clear as day casually sitting on the couch. Scaring the bejesus out of him, he ran into the playroom. My doppelganger then proceeded to get up from the couch, walk towards the kitchen, and, from what Michael heard, as he couldn't see at this point, get a glass of water. No glass was ever found as proof of this, by the way. As I calmed him down over the phone, I asked him if he got any vibe from the doppelganger. He said he picked up an obvious negative vibe, not in a menacing way, just down and unhappy. He also said it looked like my doppelganger was in pain. Can doppelgangers even feel pain? Now, I definitely know Michael wasn't bluffing to me, as this happened over the phone, and no one can fake the kind of fear that was in his voice. Another thing to note is the doppelganger had brown hair, whereas I have dyed my naturally brown hair blonde. That seems to be the last sighting of it he's had for a while. What happened? Help would be greatly appreciated here, as I am going out of my mind with questions. What is this thing? What does it want? Why imitate me? No one else in his family has seen it other than Michael. Thank you for reading. Doppelgangers, oh my. I can't say I've ever seen a doppelganger. However, some of my family members have. 2010. At this time, the family members residing in our home were our oldest daughter 
and her husband, our youngest son, and our youngest daughter. My husband saw the first one sometime in 2010. He came home from work at midnight. I was asleep on the couch in the living room. He was on his way through our room to the bathroom to take a shower when he saw our youngest daughter sitting at my computer. He called out to her. She didn't answer or even move. He assumed she had earphones in and didn't hear him. He realized he had forgotten to grab a towel from the laundry room, so he turned around and headed that way. Our bedroom is on one end of the house. The laundry is on the opposite end. He walked down the hall, though the dining room and the kitchen were in between. Just as he was about to open the laundry room door, M, our youngest daughter, stepped out. My husband asked if she had just been on my computer. She said no. She had been in the laundry room this entire time. We all picked at him about getting old and seeing things. That's before I did some research on doppelgangers. Shortly after my husband saw our youngest daughter's doppelganger, our youngest son saw mine. This happened about 6 o'clock on a Saturday evening. I had just finished cooking dinner and was waiting for my family to come home. Except our youngest son, Z, who had gone into work about an hour before. I decided to do some laundry while I waited. I always had to keep myself busy when I was home alone. I still had the notion that if I was doing something there, was less of a chance for me to encounter anything ghostly. Plus, staying busy made the time go by faster. I was in the laundry room when the door shut, when I felt or maybe heard someone come into the house. And as a side note, there is absolutely no way anyone could ever come into my house without me knowing it, whether I'm awake or asleep. When our kids were younger, they used to try to fool me. Never happened. I can feel the least change in air pressure drove them crazy. I asked, who is here? Z answered me and said his new manager sent him home to shave because he had a five o'clock shadow. He was fussing about as he went down the hall into the bathroom. I stayed in the laundry room folding clothes. We have never kept our clothes in our bedrooms. I have a huge laundry room, so everything clothing-wise, is kept there. Oddly enough, I was folding Z's clothes when I heard, Mom, why are you putting those in my room? I opened the laundry room door, walked out into the kitchen just as Z walked into the dining room from the hall. The look on his face frightened me. It looked as if he had just seen a ghost. I watched as all color drained from his face. I asked him if he was okay. He just stared at me. After about a minute, he snapped out of his trance. The following is what he told me. He was standing in front of the bathroom mirror shaving when he heard a shuffle. He looked up and out the door. He saw me dressed in a red robe walking really fast, holding a stack of clothes. I entered his bedroom, so he stepped out of the bathroom to ask me what I was doing. I didn't come from the direction of the laundry room. I came from the opposite end of the house, from the other bedrooms. His is the first bedroom in the hall before you get to the bathroom. I did own a red robe at that time. However, I was fully dressed in jeans and a t-shirt nothing red. Before that day, Z was a non-believer of the paranormal. For years, he swore he still was. He refused to talk about that day. About a year ago, he and his wife bought a house built in 1940. He's now coming around to the fact that there are some things that have no other explanation. Last week, April 22nd, 2016. 
My oldest daughter was visiting. She and I were laying on my bed talking. I fell asleep. She got up to get a drink from the kitchen. As she was leaving my room, she saw Ems, the youngest daughter, boyfriend coming from her bedroom, which is directly across from mine. She said he had a faraway look in his eyes. He was laughing as if something he and M had shared moments before was extremely funny. He walked down the hall into the bathroom and shut the door. S continued on to the kitchen. She got her drink and started back down the hall. As she was right outside of the closed bathroom door, she noticed Jay was stepping out of M's bedroom. He looked as if he was half asleep. He asked her if someone was in the bathroom, to which she replied, You. She reached over and opened the bathroom door. It was empty. It was the vacation of a lifetime. Just my best friend Nicole and I going away to Ireland. I was very excited as we were going to stay in a famous castle, which of course had some history of its own. I believe it was Capra Castle, of something to that effect. I recalled as it was yesterday. We were in rooms number 71. We left our room to go through the courtyard to the main castle for dinner. We then proceeded to go look for this haunted bridge or something. We made a few jokes about how we were going to hang each other from the bridge. We had a bit of fun with that, hit the bar, and then went back towards our room. After returning, our luggage was messed up on the floor. We thought nothing of it. Could it have been the maid for all we know? I'm not sure. But we noticed that the dog that went around the hotel courtyard was outside of our room. It was an Irish wolfhound. So we got to bed about an hour or so after we had got back. And we locked the door and the dog got up and went away. So it was now about 1 a.m. I was sleeping through the night, and around 3 a.m., I had a rude awakening. I started freaking out because I felt like someone was on top of me, and that I was being scratched at. I was freaking out, and I started screaming and moving around, and I was hitting Nicole, trying to wake her up. I felt that my face was bleeding and could taste the blood. I was in a state of panic. I managed to get Nicole up, and she was trying to calm me down. I was telling her I was bleeding and to get help right away. As she felt my face, she felt the blood. She was in shock. So she said she would turn on the light and call the desk for help. She reached for the phone and light, which were right by one another, and she got, as she described, brutally pushed aside, brutally pushed aside, hitting her head on the floor. She reached for her pocket keychain light to search for the light. She crawled over to the light switch and came running back to the bed, where I was still feeling as if I was pinned down. She got on the bed to check on me, and I felt as if I could freely move up. So I sit up. I was feeling pinned down this whole time, hence my freaking out. She checked me for blood, and there was no sign of blood. We went to open the door and check to see if there was any sign of forced entry into our hotel room in case it was something else. There we saw the dog walk back to the front of our door, and he laid down there. We couldn't get back to sleep after all of that. The whole thing freaked me out, and I'm not sure why exactly that did happen. Why was the dog back after the attack? Why could I taste blood and then be fine? I couldn't move and I did not shove Nicole off the bed. It was one of the most freaky experiences ever. Did I anger a spirit and they were being spiteful? This isn't my first encounter with strange beings, just the more physical. Woodsford Castle I've had a few weird experiences, but this is by far the scariest. Me, 
my sister, my parents, and my grandparents all went and stayed in a natural trust place called Woodsford Castle. It was really old-fashioned with the decapitated stags and stuff mounted on the wall along with chandeliers. In the visitor's book, there was loads of questions about whether the castle was haunted or not. The room me and my sister stayed in was the oldest room in the castle. It was always quite dark and cold in the room, even if we had the lights on, and you always got a chilled prickly feeling when you were in there alone. Whenever I went into the room, I felt a huge urge to leave and felt like someone was trying to make me get out. One night, I went to the toilet, and as I was coming back up the stairs, I heard footsteps clicking up the steps, which sounded like high-heeled boots. This confused me a bit, but I passed it off as my imagination and walked back to the room me and my sister were staying in. When I opened the door, I saw someone standing over my sister. It wasn't any of my family because they all denied being awake at that time. I couldn't see what she looked like because she was mainly a shadow, but all I could really see was what looked like a long dress suggesting she was a woman. As I walked into the room, there was a sudden chill, and the woman vanished. I told my mom, who was a real believer of spirits, and she said that the woman may have wanted me out of the room so she could be with my sister alone. But we don't know why she wanted my sister. We were all really scared and left a day early because we didn't feel safe. If anyone has any idea why this woman wanted my sister alone, it would be really helpful to know. Castle Leslie Haunting So I just got home from a two-night stay at Castle Leslie in Co. Monaghan. I was aware that there was reported hauntings prior to going out, but did not want to read any stories before I went, and my wife was totally unaware of any stories relating to the castle. We stayed in Norman's room, and a series of events happened between 1 a.m. and first light, which would have been around 5 or 6 a.m.-ish. The night is in question was Monday night, Tuesday morning, the 4th and 5th of April, 2016. Firstly, we returned to the room around 12 a.m., and we both were very tired after the drive up from Co. Wexford. I was awoken, and I could feel a presence in the room and I could make out the figure of a man sitting in the chair next to the bed. The hair was standing on the back of my neck, and I couldn't move. I then saw what I can only describe as a mist cloud over the right-hand side of the bed. I had a restless night of dreams. One of those was a dream of being in the bed, and others which I can't recall. It was very warm in the room, and I was too scared to move, or even hang my leg outside the covers. In the morning, my wife confirmed she too had a night of vivid dreams and awoke to see a cloud of mist at the foot of my bed. No windows in the room were open. I was glad to see the morning and went to the bathroom. Our room overlooked the vast gardens and lake, and whilst looking out over the lake, it looked like a wave or wall of water around 10 feet was moving across very slowly. My wife confirmed the same, but by the time I got my camera to take the picture, it had disappeared. The following night, we told the night porter our experience, and he mentioned that there were reports of the bed being haunted, and offered to move us into another room. Nothing like this has happened before, and I would say I was open-minded, yet very skeptical. We had a sound sleep on Tuesday night with the help of a different set of spirits. I can't explain what we saw, and we will return there one day, but won't be staying in Norman's room. An Audible Manifestation My only ghostly experience came in the fall of 1986. I had lost most of my vision from diabetes and had entered a residential rehabilitation facility in the capital city of a southern state. Rumors had been shared among clients about odd things that occurred on the campus that encompassed an entire city block. 
because many clients came to the rehabilitation facility with secondary medical complications. There had been cases of clients passing on in their dormitory rooms. Odd things have been reported, such as the elevator engaging and moving from one floor to the other, when only one person, the business officer manager, sat in his office in the administration building. More than once, he had charged out of his office into the elevator doors to see who was coming from the second floor, but the elevator was always empty when the doors slid open. That to me could be easily explained as an electrical glitch versus something paranormal. But that same office manager was in the small first floor reception area of the training hall with two men who were hired as security guards during the week-long Christmas closure. One of the guards was a regular member of maintenance and the other a part-time staff member and both fully knowledgeable about the entire campus. The clients and all staff had departed except for these three men. They stood quietly chatting when they all heard a sound. It sounded like someone had dragged a heavy pile of furniture across the floor, directly over their heads. They rushed to the second floor, but nothing was moved or out of place. This they could not explain. My experience took place in the hall, where my room, along with three other rooms, were located. There was a fire stairway at one end of the short hall that led either upstairs to the woman's second floor dorm rooms or outdoors and into the courtyard. Double swinging doors on the other end of that hall opened into the first floor women's lounge and then either led out the courtyard or through a second set of swinging doors that led to the counseling hall. It was a Friday night and I had just finished supper. Using my white crane, I made my way out of the cafeteria, into the training hall's reception area, and down through the hall, up the short set of stairs, and through the counseling hall. I passed through the first set of swinging doors and walked across the first floor of women's lounge and through the second set of doors and into my hall. My room was the first door on the left. The hall was very short and you needed to take only one step to cross the hall to the door directly across from mine. I removed my door key and using my left hand located the keyhole and just begun to insert the key with my right hand when I heard five taps on the door across the hall from my own. It sounded like someone tapped with just one finger. I straightened my position and spun on my heels, feeling somewhat foolish for not having realized that there was someone in the hall with me. I said a pleasant hello, but received no answer. I could only imagine the look on my face when no response came. Finally, in shrugging my shoulders, I turned my back to my own door. As I was again about to insert my key into the slot, a thought struck me. Knowing that it was a habit for all diabetics to be housed on the first floor in the event of needing assistance quickly for low blood sugar, I again turned to the door across from mine. My thought was that perhaps one of the two ladies sharing the room had knocked from the inside and was in need of help. I took the one step necessary to reach their door. In a loose fist, I raised my hand to knock on their door, but before I could, I again heard the five taps on the door, but this time there was no question that those taps came from my side of their door and that I was the only person standing in the hall. Then I heard one of the ladies in that room say, Yes, someone is at the door. See who it is. Well, when they opened the door, there I was standing transfixed with my right hand still in the air as if to knock. When they asked what I might need, it took me a moment until I found my voice. I knew what just had happened and was trying to process what I knew had just happened but was finding it difficult to admit that I knew in my heart what I knew, that someone or something had tapped on the door right beside me. I finally was able to explain what I had heard from inside the hall, the two sets of five taps on the door. They both said they heard the taps too. We stood there puzzled when I burst out laughing. I was still not ready to face the reality of what I had known I had heard. I said, oh, I know. Your guard dog was leaning against the door and scratch, which caused the tapping sounds. But 
one lady said. Neither of us have a guide dog. She replicated the tapping sound exactly as we all heard it. I know those tappings came from the hall side of their door. The sound was not a foot to my right and at eye level as I stood there. Had it been a real person, we would have been all but touching shoulders. Together, we three ladies attempted to replicate the sound by going through the swinging doors, opening and closing the stairwell door, and even the doors leading out into the courtyard from the woman's lounge. We could not replicate those tappings, no matter what we tried. And despite not having vision, I slept that night with all my room's lights on. The following Monday, as I walked to the administration building, I caught up with the director of vocational training. I asked her if, to her knowledge, anyone had ever passed on that floor. She said that yes, years before, an older woman who once occupied one of the rooms on the far right side of the woman's lounge had gone to lay down after a double period of orientation and mobility, instruction for using a white cane, and had expired in her sleep. When I explained what we three ladies had experienced that Friday night, she made me vow that I would never share the story with other clients so as not to frighten them. I know what I heard. I know what we three ladies heard. I have no rational explanation except to speculate that the former, and now departed, client was visiting one of her fellow dormies in my hall. My life has very been much like a horror film or a creepy horror novel, and recently I began contemplating on a strange and creepy story I grew up with. One that really isn't talked about in my family anymore, and when we do speak about it, usually we joke around about it as an attempt to lighten the mood, when in reality, it is nothing to joke about. My sister is about five years older than me, and on a side note, I hope she doesn't get mad at me for telling this story, and for a time before I was born, she and my mother and father experienced strange occurrences in our former apartment complex. My sister saw the film E.T., and it didn't affect her in a negative way. She wasn't afraid of E.T. She enjoyed the movie, and it didn't really impact her in any way other than the fact that she found it to be a good movie. Now, I'm not sure at what point my sister saw the movie, but I think it was at least a few years before the strange events began to occur. Sometime later, my sister began to act strangely. She would do very violent things for a child her age, throwing objects at people's heads, and just all around really strange and violent stuff. Most of it is personal, and I'm not going to get into it here. So at some point in time, my sister begins to talk about the being in her closet. She said the being talked to her and told her its name was E.T., that it was the same E.T. from the movie. This E.T., was the one who was telling my sister to do all those strange and violent things. My sister was bewildered. She was unsure what to think. At first, like most parents, she thought it was all in my sister's imagination. But then she began wondering about my sister's strange behavior over the past few months. One night, my mom decided to sleep with my sister in her bed. E.T. didn't come out and talk to everyone, but he did begin to shake my sister's bed while my mother was on it. It started slowly, then violently. My mom always told me it was like something straight out of The Exorcist. It really shook like one of those old hotel room beds. You know the ones? My mom jumped out of the bed, took my sister with her, and went to my dad's bedroom. Frightened, she explained the situation to my half-asleep father. Up to this point, my dad was very stern in his opinion on the matter. It was all part of my sister's childhood. She was just a kid, and this was all a part of her overactive imagination. But this time, my mom told my dad that if he didn't believe them, that he should sleep in that room by himself, while my mother and sister slept in my dad and mom's bed. My dad accepted it, as she just wanted to get some sleep. Sure enough, the bed shook on him too, and needless to say, my father slept on the living room couch that night. A few weeks later, everything returned to normal, and my sister was once again sleeping in her bedroom by herself. 
So this part of the story I've decided to remove. Basically, sometime after things seemed to return to normal, my mom experienced something truly horrifying in my sister's room, and at some point, my parents complained about the apartment to their landlord, and the landlord allowed them to move into the vacant complex directly above and across from their current one. After that, the events ended. My sister apparently still acted out from time to time, but it was really just normal kid stuff. Nothing as violent as those times in the old apartment. The old apartment sat vacant for a while. Eventually, a small family moved in, and to my mother's horror, they had two young sons. My mom waited a few weeks for them to settle in. Then one day, while at the washing machines downstairs, I think that's where it was, my mom asked the new woman who had moved in how she was liking the apartment. She had no complaints, but she found it strange that her younger son suddenly had an imaginary friend, and he claimed that this friend's name was E.T. And the funny thing about this was that the boy had never seen the film and had no idea E.T. the extraterrestrial even existed. This part of the story is where it gets fuzzy. As I said earlier, it's been a long time since my family and I have spoken of this story. Eventually, the boy stopped talking to E.T., but I'm not sure how long it was before he did. The family moved out of that apartment, but I don't recall how long it was. It may have been a few years. I think the family may have had a priest bless the place, but I'm not 100% certain. And eventually, my sister got a new bed, and that was when my parents found out where the bed had really come from. They had known that the bed came from my dad's parents' attic, but what they didn't know was that someone that my dad's parents had known had passed away on it. The person had died of old age, aka natural causes, but still one can't help but wonder if it had anything to do with the events. Maybe the bed was some sort of catalyst for what took place. The apartments we lived in weren't exactly old, and my family wasn't into the occult or anything like that. One theory my mom has is that maybe whomever lived in that apartment before us was into the occult and had invited some entity into the location. My sister was but a child, and we all know the theories around children and the paranormal, not to mention the bed someone died on, whether related or coincidence. Another theory is that something from my grandparents on my mom's side home had attached to her, but that's another story for another time. Thank you for reading. I have had one experience where a type of demonic entity descended on a lady battling alcoholism. This lady told me point blank that this demonic came up out of her deceased uncle at the funeral she was attending. The uncle was also an alcoholic and had battled the disease most of his life. Her family backed her story, relating that the uncle had often spoke of this demonic being. The lady was terrorized for nearly two years and eventually gave up the addiction. The family gave a long list of family members who had battled this creature and the disease. The belief was that when one family member died, it simply found another victim to adhere to. It took the form of a bat-like creature with an old man's very small head and face. I spent a great deal of time with this lady and did believe what she told me. This woman was about as tough as they come, but she would break down and cry every time she related the story. Right, let's start this off with the traditional I'm not crazy bit. On the 7th of April 2014, I decided to take my routine shower of the day. However, while I was in the shower, I kept feeling like I was being watched. We have three mirrors in the bathroom, and I swear I saw a dark figure. No facial features or any clothing, just a solid human-like figure pass through each mirror. It was not tall or anything, and it looked about average height. And I kept telling myself, you are not here for me. You are not here for me. And the figure just vanished. Since the 7th, I have not seen it again. On the 9th of April 2014, my wife's father, who seemed in very good health, had a massive heart attack and suddenly passed away. His passing was so shocking that no one believed that he passed away. I personally feel that that figure was somehow involved. 
Fast forward to today, the 21st of April, 2014. I was sitting in the lounge, and a picture we framed of my wife's father suddenly fell over. The reason why I am so freaked out about the picture falling over is due to the fact that we positioned it in such a way that it would not even move if the wind picked up. To add to the freakiness of the picture falling over, this evening, my wife asked me to make her and my daughter a cup of tea. I already had the kettle boiling and the tea bags in the cup. However, I reached for the sugar and placed it on my right-hand side. I then opened the cupboard to grab an extra cup for myself, and the lid on the sugar suddenly popped off the container and landed next to the kettle, which is also impossible as they are generally slipped on lids. My wife said it could have just been compressed air but it gets open and closed multiple times throughout the day. If there's anyone that knows what the hell is happening, some insight would be amazing. I'm not a nut job or anything. I'm just very freaked out. I told my wife about this and she said that I may be open to things like this. In the past, I used to have really bad nightmares, but they stopped once we placed a bit of holy water in the room. I've not had any nightmares in around five years, However, over the past few months, they have started again. Anyway, I will end things off here. Any help would be much appreciated. Thanks for reading. When I was 16 or 17, I woke up to a symbol written on my mirror. I'm 37 years old now, but the question of what it was or where it came from still haunts me. The memory pops into my mind occasionally from time to time. Today, I thought of it for the first time in several years, and for the first time, it occurred to me that I might be able to find answers on the internet that weren't available when it happened. The symbol wasn't something that the steam in the shower made visible. I woke up one morning, after thoroughly cleaning my room the day before. Both parents are ex-military. When I say thorough, what I mean is completely spotless, and looked up from my pillow to see it. Strangely, my eyes went right to it. It was like my subconscious knew it was there, but consciously, I had no idea how it got there. I was not scared. I was at a point in my life where I had felt most secure in my own spirituality. To explain, I identified with Native American spirituality because it was the closest thing to natural to me, but I hate labels. At the time, and even now, I felt an odd familiarity with rocks, trees, and the wind. Not animals so much, but I do like birds. Rocks especially. I know this sounds freaking insane, hence why I never bothered to explain it to people. It's just how I polarized. I wasn't scared, but I wasn't sure what it was. I told my sister about it. She saw it, but I smudged it away. I assumed there would be no defining it, and I tried to rationalize it by telling myself I probably put it up in my sleep, but it looked like it was drawn with clear wax or chapstick, and there wasn't any in my room. But has anyone ever seen anything like this before? I would love to hear them if so. I've been dealing with addiction, and it seems to directly correlate with the strange phenomenon I've experienced over and over. Every time I engaged in this particular addiction, I would begin to experience strange, scary, and even threatening phenomenon. I could go on forever about all the experiences I've had if someone were interested, but I'm fairly certain that I would be deemed insane. For now, let's just say that I hear voices that sometimes give me information that I have never heard of, but I google it and there it is. I began to use a recorder. Will an iPad app to record some of this? I have heard whistling so clear and realistic that I have searched my house inside and out, as well as set up cameras. To my surprise, I captured the whistling on my recorder. My wife heard it, but just denies anything out of the ordinary due to the fear of actually conceiving the possibilities. Also, I have two small dogs. On occasions, I could strongly feel a presence, my dogs jumped up from their beds and start sniffing and acting anxious. Once I sat down and used an app that measured EMF, 
and it suddenly showed giant calculations, and my dogs actually got up and run in front of me wagging their tails and sniffing the floor like I had thrown treats out to them. There is plenty more information that has no explanation, but is backed up by actual findings. If anyone wants to hear more, let me know. Meanwhile, I have made it clear that I stand my ground, and I am no longer afraid, but I do have a real situation on my hands. This event happened when I was maybe three years old. My mom was cleaning around the house when I came out of my room and asked her to come to the bathroom with me because I had the potty and there's a man in there. So she went with me and she couldn't see anyone, but she asked me to describe the man. I told her the man was a policeman she asked me what color his uniform was because she knew the colors worn by the different law enforcement agencies. There's sheriff department, local police, and highway patrol, of course. Before I was born, I should note that my mother had been a dispatcher and deputy for the sheriff's department where we lived in Northern California. I said the man's uniform was tan, which meant highway patrol. As we left the bathroom, I pointed into my bedroom and said, There's another one in there. I described how the men had been shooted with a shoot gun, one in the elbow and stomach, one in the knee, as well as other places. I don't remember exactly where, unfortunately. From the fact that two murdered CHP officers appeared to be hanging around in her house, my mom knew who they had to have been. After all, she didn't know very many people who had been murdered. I'm not writing their names because I don't know if there could be an illegal fallout from doing so. I can't think why there would be, but just to be on the safe side. Some time passed and my mom told the story to a friend of hers who still worked for the sheriff's department. The fact that one officer had been shot in the elbow was one of the details that was withheld from the public as the cops investigated the crime. Even my mother hadn't known about that. But because of that, she was able to confirm her guess about the identities of the dead officers. On December 22, 1978, the two officers, one of them, a friend of my mother's, had made a vehicle stop on a stolen car. The driver somehow managed to get control of their weapons, shot one in the knee and one in the elbow, disabling them, and killed both of them with their own service revolvers. The officers were not expecting a fight and were caught off guard, and theirs was the only CHP car in the county that night, due to state-mandated cutbacks and nightmare patrols. At the time I saw the ghosts, the case would have been just going to trial. The Murdered Family I lived in an old two-story house. I did not like it there. I just felt like there was a presence watching me in my bathroom and room. By the way, the house is made of wood. I see just for a second a shadow running across the room and, the, and into the bathroom. All my stuff is misplaced all the time. It's frightening. So I did some research and found out a horrible murder took place here. A family of three was murdered here in the room and bathroom. It seems that the father of a poor family made an enemy of a mean neighbor. One day, the father humiliated the neighbor in front of a town not far from the house. The neighbor was, of course, very mad. At night, the neighbor snuck into her house. He grabbed a knife and slit the father's throat in the same bed I sleep in. His son came in there wondering what the noise was all about. When he saw his father dead, he screamed. The scream woke the mother. The neighbor cut the boy in the chest and killed him. The mother fled to the bathroom and locked the door. When the killer got in, he stabbed the mother repeatedly. There was blood all over the place. The neighbor was scared, so he committed suicide. When I told my parents, they were shocked. So one week later, we moved to Texas. I'm glad I am out of that house. But it was pretty interesting. I was 15 then, and now I'm 31.
murdered friend is still about. I find it strange that I'm sharing a story that is so personal to me, but I would just like to get some understanding from it. I come from Manhattan, and I'm still currently living there. It starts from 2002 when my father, brought up in the Bronx, but moved to the Upper East Side, decided to give back to his community, since it has, he says, made him who he is today. He set up a graffiti club, as I should put it, where kids in rougher neighborhoods could come off and get off the streets and express their emotions through their art. It was pretty successful, some trouble here and there, but overall it went pretty great. I decided to go, of course, and I befriended some people who, if it wasn't for the club, I would never have thought they'd be friends with me. Cut the long story short, I really got on with Jay. Jay not his real name, but for privacy's sake, with whom I could have so many laughs with. Tragically, in early 2003, he was shot down in Harlem, where he came from. It was a tragic blow to the club and me personally. It affected me more than I could ever explain. It hurts and still does now just to think about him. I visited the spot a few weeks later, I bent down and cried with my head in my hands. As I did, I felt a hand on my shoulder, and I heard a laugh, then a mumble I will never even make out myself. But I think it sounded like, don't cry about me or something. I thought I was a respectful person, yet seconds later when I stood and turned, nobody was there. I wasn't frightened, I just assumed it was someone who walked off fast. Driving back home, still crying, I stopped at a light. I wiped my eyes and looked out the driver's window at some girls playing double dutch. On the steps of the building beside them, I could have sworn I saw Jay. I was so convinced that I shouted his name. The kids were bewildered at who I was shouting at, and the man I saw didn't even look towards me. His eyes just stayed fixated somewhere over the top of the car. I drove off fast, sure that I was going crazy. It wasn't until the club stopped in 2005 that strange things happened once again. As I prepared food in the kitchen, my music player blasted a Tupac song. I think it's called Hold Your Head. It was an album from the Don Kilimnati, the Seven Day Theory, which Jay persuaded me to buy, but I'd never listened to it since the day I'd buy it. This overwhelming feeling of happiness came over me, even though I knew I should be scared as for how a CD had got out of my bedroom closet into the stereo in my living room and then played by itself. I walked into the living room, smiling and silently laughing, and then I heard a laugh, very loud, coming from by the hallway. I then became scared, even though I was so familiar with that laugh. I just stood there, burst into tears, and that feeling, that gutted feeling I felt all those years ago. That night, as I got into my bed, my bedroom door opened. Thinking it was my cat, I got up and closed it, of course. Now this is the part that I find so unbelievable and disturbing to think about. Halfway down the hallway, a figure stood, just dark with no features at all. It stood directly in front of a picture Jay and another kid had created. For about a minute I stood there bewildered, too scared to move staring at the figure that barely moved. Then I just slammed my door, ran to my bed like a child. Since then I've never seen anything like that, but sometimes I don't feel alone in my home and channels on TV have the tendency to switch to certain music channels. I've never told anybody except my best friend and my father. On here, I'm hoping people are more open-minded and help me understand what happened. Even though I never believed in the paranormal, I really do think Jay is around me at times, which makes me feel so happy to know. It really does scare me the idea of a ghost, but if it is of Jay, I know he's only there to joke around and just see if I'm okay. But I can't help thinking that people become ghosts on Earth because they are stopped from going into the afterlife. Because they have some unfinished business to attend to? Thank you for allowing me to share the story, which has been bothering me for so long. 
The Ghost Girl in the Mirror This is a true story that happened when I was around 11 years old. It is so far the only ghost experience I have ever had, but it is one of the scariest moments ever. I was in middle school when this whole experience occurred. We have two bathrooms for girls and boys, the downstairs bathrooms and the upstairs ones. Everyone knows about the upstairs girls bathroom. The reason is, whenever you go in there, you always feel really weird, feels cold, and basically just gives you a feeling of distortion. Because I was with the older students, all our classes were upstairs. So if we needed the toilet, we had to use the upstairs ones. Anyway, one lesson, I needed to go really bad. I had no choice but to use the bathroom upstairs. I walk into the girls' bathroom and immediately get that familiar sense of disorientation. I rush into the cubicle, all the while feeling this freezing cold energy, despite it being a lovely warm day. My heart was pounding. The feeling of panic was rising. I just wanted to get out of there quickly. I opened the cubicle door and headed for the sinks. Even though I was terrified, I was still a freak about germs. I quickly washed my hands and glanced at the mirror in front of me. My heart literally stopped. My eyes went wide. In the mirror's reflection, I kid you not, was a young girl right beside me. She was turned to the left, making a clapping gesture with her hands and eyes closed. I only saw her for about two seconds before I shot out of there, screaming. I assure you, I was the only one in there the entire time. The bathroom door is a very large one. You can certainly hear it if someone comes in or leaves. When I first entered, the room was empty and all the cubicle doors were swinged open. So I am positive nobody was in there but me. Besides, when I left the cubicle, it was still empty. I only saw this girl in the reflection. I never went to that bathroom again and now I moved up to high school. My friend has a familiar experience in the same bathroom, but that's for another day. In January 2000, we lost my dad because of a doctor's error during surgery. As we were all very close to him, this all hit us particularly hard. I decided to move back with my mom. I was 24 at the time, and I took care of her. I've been with her ever since. It has now been nearly seven years since his death. Before my dad died, I didn't believe in anything paranormal. I believed in what I learned at church, but I did not believe in ghosts or hauntings, even though I had experienced a few unexplicable things myself. I brushed them all off as weird phenomena, but nothing to concern myself with, and certainly nothing to change my views about, until spring 2005. When my dad passed away, we began having trouble with people messing around the house. There were a few things stolen from my dad's work building, and there were three batteries stolen right from the vehicles while mom and I watched out a window after placing a frantic phone call to the police. The police didn't show up until some time later, and by then, the burglars were gone. Occurrences of this nature would happen time and time again. Spring 2005, I was up late one night, 1 a.m. or later studying for finals in my bedroom. Everything was quiet and dark. The only light on in my house was in my bedroom. We lived in a very rural area, so when it gets dark and quiet, it really gets dark and quiet. I was engrossed in my studying when my dogs began barking. I sighed, realizing that someone was probably out there, but there was really nothing I could actually do about it since we lived so far away from a police station. They had already stolen most of everything of any value, and they never had tried to get in the house before, so I went back to studying. I'd become engrossed in my studying to the point that I didn't even really notice the dogs barking anymore, when suddenly, my bedroom filled with the overwhelming scent of my dad's cologne. But it wasn't just the smell of the cologne. You know how different perfumes and clothes smell different on different people because of differentiating body chemistries? Well, this was my dad wearing the cologne. I looked up, fully expecting to see him, but nothing was there. The scent was getting stronger and stronger. 
It was then that I noticed the urgent pitch of the dogs barking and growling and the rustling coming from outside underneath my bedroom window. There was someone out there. Suddenly, Daddy sent centered at the window beside the bed where I was working and seemed to become malevolent. Don't ask me how I know this. I just do. It's like the air seemed to crackle. It was then that I heard someone running away breakneck from the house without even bothering to try to be quiet. The atmosphere in the room suddenly went from malevolent to peaceful and Daddy sent lingered for a moment and then was gone. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but I can't deny it. I would like to think that he's still here, watching over those he loves. It made me feel very safe and taken care of. Not once did I feel one bit of fear over the scent in my room. Thanks for reading. I have yet another story to tell. I guess I am susceptible to spirits and apparitions, as I've had other encounters with loved ones who have passed. This one was my very first encounter. I was going through a very bitter divorce, being only 28 and afraid to be alone with two very little boys. I didn't know which end was up, so to speak. It was in the summer. I had my two babies bathed and in bed. I decided to lay on the sofa and watch some television. I fell asleep. A pretty deep sleep at that. I was awoken by the static of the television. The station had gone off the air for the night. My baby of 10 months old had the bedroom right off of the living room. The sofa was facing his room, and he was sleeping soundly. I had a habit of keeping all of the bedroom doors open at night, so that if one of my sons cried, I would hear them. All of a sudden, the living room got so cold, like a very damp chill. A glowing light appeared at the doorway of my baby's room. Then a figure appeared, a woman, in a long white dress and dark hair. Her hair was up in an upsweep, but I couldn't make out her face. Her face was blurry, and I just couldn't see it at all. I was shocked, couldn't move, mind racing and heart pounding like crazy. I sat up on the sofa and just stared at this figure in the doorway of my baby's room. Then she spoke, only a few words. But she spoke. She said it will be all right. Then she vanished into thin air. That damp chill vanished along with the apparition. I was so shaken by this not knowing who it was or what it was about. I eventually calmed down and put it out of my mind. A few days later, my mom and dad came up for a visit. They loved their grandbaby so much, they came to visit several times a week. We were sitting at the table in the kitchen just chatting about anything and everything. That's when I thought of the strange happening I experienced a few nights before. I told my folks about what had happened and described the figure that I saw that night to my parents. I mentioned too how cold and damp it got in that room that night and how the chill went away when the figure went away. My dad sat there looking at me with the eyes of dinner plates and had a stunned look on his face. I asked him if he was okay. He said that he was, but he knew who that figure was. I asked him who that could have been, and he said it was his mother. He was only seven when his mother died. She was only 34 years old. She died a week after her ninth child was born. She had all of her children in the farmhouse where her and my grandfather lived. Dad used to sit at his desk in a one-room schoolhouse and look out at her grave. The cemetery was right next door to the schoolhouse. I asked him how he knew it was his mother. He said the way I described her, wearing a long white dress and the color and style of her hair. Her hair was dark and always in an upsweep, but this part is what really convinced me that he was right. He told me that she would always use that expression, it will be all right, to him and his brothers and sisters when things didn't go quite right. He said he just knew it was her. He said she was comforting me and telling me that everything would get better. I was quite amazed, not only by the fact that I never saw my grandmother, but how she came to visit me in my times of need. I never had any other encounters with her after that visit, though I felt a calmness inside of me and felt somehow closer to her after that hot summer night. Thank you for reading my story. I hope you enjoyed reading it.
I had visited my mother on Monday afternoon, after she and I had a disagreement on the Saturday before. She had called me on the Saturday afternoon and told me she needed to come to her house. I lived in the country at the time, and she lived about 10 miles from me. I'd just been in town with my youngest two sons for baseball practice. I also had just taken my only transportation to the shop to have new tires put on, so I had no vehicle to take me anywhere for the day. Our conversation escalated into an argument quickly, and I ended up hanging up the phone after she had not stopped her insistence that I'd come to her house immediately. She was never this insistent over me coming to pick up some fresh veggies she had gotten from her early garden. On Sunday, I was stubborn, and though I could have gone in to visit all day, I stayed at home. On Monday, I'd taken off work a little early to go to school to watch my sons in a spring sports day. I had about 45 minutes after the sports events before they would be out of school and I went to see my mother. We talked and our argument from Saturday was completely forgotten. She and I talked about all three of my sons. My oldest is 8 years older than my younger and 10 years older than my youngest, so he was in college and doing well. She told me that she had some problems with asthma lately, but she wasn't going to let it get the best of her. I told her she should really go to the doctor because asthma might not be something to ignore. She said she would be fine. On Tuesday morning, around 2 o'clock, I got a phone call that they were on their way to the hospital with her. I got up, dressed quickly, and drove into the hospital. About 20 blocks from the hospital, I was at a spotlight and thinking that I could run the light because I was the only car around. When I had a warm and comforting feeling fill me, Something told me to take it easy. She was okay and in heaven. Really, it was such a grateful feeling of peace. I got to the hospital, and I knew for sure the way the receptionist at the ER desk met me, that she was gone. In the next week after the adjustments, I'd driven my sons to school and was on my way to work. There are some industrial sites at a cross street right before a spotlight, and it can get busy and bottled up. Also, there's a hill going down in the direction of where I was headed. I again felt a warm presence and felt her hand on my arm. Her voice said, Vicky, look up. Far enough ahead of me was a tractor trailer truck crossing over my lane into the side street. I had been in deep thought about so much, but had plenty of time to slow down very preventively, not to have any problems with the truck. She has been with me many times since then, and it is always such a warm, loving feeling. In her life, she dismissed ghosts and paranormal things as if she didn't think it was real. I have no idea if she has ever been with any of my four sisters or my brother, but she has definitely been with me. Thanks for reading. When I was about four years old, I entered the front door. We had one of those bells that was a knob you would turn on the outside. There, in bright daylight, stood a woman dressed in all pale yellow, in a long dress and matching, colored big brim hat. This occurred in the 1950s, around 1959. I let her in. She asked for my mother. I told her I didn't know where she was. She was illuminated. I thought by the sunlight coming through the glass of the front windows and doorway, I was only about four years old. Not frightened by her, but... Rather, I was fascinated and mesmerized. I followed her into our living room. She proceeded to sit on the antique empire couch and kept asking where my mother was, and she seemed very concerned that I was left all by myself at a very young age. After what may have been an hour or so, she got up from the couch and said to me, Tell your mother that Ada said it was very beautiful and don't be afraid. She then got up, walked to the front door with me following her, and left. When my mother came home, I told her about the lady in yellow named Ada and related her message. My mom almost fainted and fell down on the same spot where Ada sat. She asked me in a very unnerving voice, are you sure she said she was Ada? To which I said yes. Then she said, my cousin Ada just died a few days ago. At my age then, thankfully, I feared nothing. Ghosts were not in my brain tank, so to speak, until about seven years later. I was up in our attic. It was a very old house, 
looking for stuff to wear for Halloween and came across the same dress Ada had worn when she showed up as a ghost many years before. It was a dress that had actually belonged to her from when she was young in the early 1900s. Also had a run in when I was 19 years old, old same house, with a sea captain. I was lying in my bed, daylight, and I was not asleep, just relaxing. Suddenly, I felt someone was there, next to me, and no one but me and my mom were home. My mom was downstairs watching TV. So, very reluctantly, I slowly looked to my left, and there, standing, was a tall man dressed in a blue uniform with brass buttons with anchors on them. He had no face, just like TV static for a face, but the rest of him was visible. He reached out a huge hand to me and said, don't be afraid, I only want to touch your blonde hair. It took me a while to not have a heart attack until I found my voice. I screamed to my mom. She came running upstairs. I told her what happened and she said, you just had a bad dream. I explained to her I wasn't asleep. I knew what I saw and I was very frightened. She then told me that my most male ancestors on her side of the family were sea captains and some were lost at sea. She assured me that he didn't want to hurt me, but he almost killed me from fright. I've also had animal ghost visits, and those were of course sad, but that's a whole nother story. Didn't want to bore you. You may now go to sleep. Thanks for reading. I've decided after about a month or two of wandering around your site that I'll add my own story. I noticed your last update was in 2003 or so, therefore I'm not expecting immediate posting of my tale. Keep in mind, this is the first time I've ever written the story out, so excuse me if I digress or repeat myself. In other stories that I've read, I've noticed people apologizing for extensive background information, so here's my apology slash disclaimer. There's a serious pity me, I've had a hard life story involved that needs to be told before the actual ghost story can be understood. Feel free to skip over it, but don't expect to get the whole situation if you do. Oh, and may I add that I'm not completely looking for sympathy or anything. So that being said, here goes. When I was 14, I was living in a predominantly African American suburb in Illinois. My best friend and I seemed to be the only white teenagers around. Something started one night when someone called my friends, let's call her Jen's cell phone. The number showed up on Jen's caller ID as private number, and Jen answered, thinking it might be her parents calling from the restaurant they had gone to, but the other person on the other end started ranting about how Jen was a slutty person and a nasty whore. The caller proceeded to tell Jen that she should just kill herself and get it over with. Adding that if Jen didn't commit suicide, the call on her friends would hunt her down and slaughter her. Jen told the girl to grow up and hung up the phone. She was obviously and understandably shaken up, but she had the sense to star 69 to call. She wrote down the number and informed her parents of the incident when they returned. The next day, Jen's father, being the military man he is, called the number. No one picked up, so he and Jen headed to the police station. The police force in that town was also predominantly black, and when Jen stated that she thought the caller was black because of the way she spoke, the officer behind the desk gave her a dirty look and said he'd look into it and call her in the morning. She never heard from him. Then again, she never got another threatening phone call either. About a month later, Jen and I were walking back to her place from a convenience store about 9 o'clock at night when we heard something walking behind us. We turned around and there was this black girl following us. We didn't recognize her from anywhere and yet she started screaming the most obscene things I've ever heard directed at Jen. To this day, and I'm 20 now, I've never heard such awful things come out of a human being's mouth before. This girl, who looked to be about our age, told Jen, I told you to just kill yourself. I warned you that I'd get you if you didn't. She then stabbed my best friend in the stomach and chest. I was frozen with fear and shock, but I finally jumped on the girl and started punching her with such fury and animal rage that she backed off and ran, 
but in the scuffle, she slipped my arm pretty badly and took off. I started to chase her, intending to tackle her to the ground, not knowing if I wanted to hold her down until someone came to help or if I wanted to just kill her for hurting my best friend. But I quickly decided that Jen needed me, so I went to Jen, ripped my t-shirt off, wrapped it tightly over her wounds, and told her to hang on. I ran back to the store we had just left, in my bra, which made the most horrifying moment of my life also the most embarrassing, and begged to use the phone. I called the police and explained what had happened and where we were. Then I darted back to Jen, ignoring the blood dripping onto my jeans and the pain in my forearm. I sat there, with Jen's head in my lap, pressing the shirt against her injuries, telling her I loved her and everything would be okay, and that the police said they'd be there with the ambulance as soon as possible. It wasn't soon enough. Jen died in the ambulance. The stab wound to her chest punctured her left lung. She suffocated before even reaching the hospital. I didn't find out until the next morning. It was two summers later that I saw her. My family moved to New Jersey soon after the incident, thinking a change of scenery would help me forget. Wrong. Our new home was down the street from a conservation area, where I liked to go and relax on nice days. There was one specific spot that I liked. There was a neat little clearing where just enough sunlight came through the thick trees and there was a fallen tree that I'd sit on to read or write or whatever. On the other side of the clearing though, there was a spot I wasn't too fond of. There were six saplings, taller than I, forming a triangle. I never had a positive vibe from that area. It just felt wrong, not like the rest of the clearing, where I felt peaceful and relaxed. If I walked through those trees, I'd have this overwhelming urge to burst out in tears and hurt something. I never knew why until one day. I was sitting on my tree, smoking a cigarette, and reading Shakespeare when that angry, depressing feeling came over me. The feeling I only got from that triangle of young trees. I ignored it and kept reading, but it grew and grew until I felt like I'd choke on it. So I looked up at the triangle and waited. For what? I had no idea. There was a little smoke coming up from the leaves on the ground, but I wrote that off as lit cigarettes someone had thrown. Then again, since I'd been there for quite a while and hadn't seen anyone around, how could someone have thrown a cigarette in there? So I shrugged it off and kept reading. Then I heard leaves rustling and the feeling of deep depression intensified. There was no wind, the trees were not swaying, my hair wasn't blowing, the leaves were moving. I raised my head and saw only leaves being pressed into the ground, as if an invisible person were walking across them, and they were coming towards me. Needless to say, I booked it out of there and sprinted home. That night, I woke up unable to breathe, with a searing pain in my stomach. I turned the light on, and just as I did, I caught a glimpse of those familiar blue icy eyes I knew and loved. My best friend. After a few minutes, the stomach pain went away, and I caught my breath and turned the light only to see those eyes again and feel presence on my bed like someone sitting down. I felt like she was sitting there watching me. The corners turned up a little, and something cold touched my cheek. I realized then that the angry slash depressed feeling I often got was flashing back to the emotions I had the night she was killed, angry at the killer and myself, and so very depressed that the best friend I'd ever had was taken away from me, and the pains I had moments before were the same feeling she had when she was taking her last gasp of air. I suddenly felt overpoweringly tranquil. She was here, and she was not angry with me. I miss you, I said, and went back to sleep. Nothing has happened since, and it's been three years. I think she's watching over me every day now, except I know it's her, not by a feeling of extreme sadness but by the overwhelming urge to smile and make the most of my day. Thank you for reading. I know this was heavy hearted, but I appreciate you sticking through to the end. Thank you so much. It happened when I was a kid, maybe seven or eight years old, but I remember what I saw vividly. My little sister and I were ready to go to bed. At that time period, we always slept on the couch together in the living room. Living in an old farmhouse that was heated by a wood stove, the upstairs got a bit cold to sleep in, and 
We didn't have the luxury of electric blankets back then, so therefore we slept downstairs in the living room. I remember my dad saying goodnight and turning off the light, and I closed my eyes. I opened them again a few seconds later because I hadn't heard my dad leave to go to bed yet. I was wondering why. I assumed that he would still be standing there, but when I opened my eyes, he wasn't there, and neither was my sister, who previously was awake. She was sound asleep. Maybe I had somehow fallen asleep without noticing, but I don't think so. In our living room, there was a door with glass that led to the closed-in porch, and the door was what I could see if I looked up while I was lying on the couch. That night, I looked up and saw a glowing form of a man sitting at the table on the porch. You couldn't really see anything other than his outline, and he didn't glow brightly, just sort of dimly, as if he was made out of shapeless glowing fog. As I saw him, he turned and looked straight at me. He had no face, just the same glowing fog. I was terrified and hid my face under the blankets. I kicked my sister awake. She wasn't very happy with me. Still not looking back up, I asked her if she saw it. She said she didn't and that I should go back to sleep. I convinced her to get up and investigate and she got up, looked around and found nothing. Years later, I told the story to my sister asking if she remembered it. She said yes, and then asked me if she had ever told me about the time when she had seen a ghost. I hadn't. She then told me that one night she woke up in the middle of the night and heard the TV flashing on and off. Thinking her parents were still awake, she walked into the living room. What she saw was the TV turning on and off by itself. There was no one in the room. She looked over to the couch to find the remote, to turn it off, and that's when she saw it. A ghost sitting and floating over the couch. She said it felt like she had spent hours looking at it. As soon as it turned and looked at her, she felt panicked and quickly ran and went back to bed. When she looked at the time, a minute had not yet passed since she had got out of bed. She didn't tell anyone about what had happened until years later. When she told me this, I asked her what her ghost had looked like. She then described the exact same glowing ghost that I had seen. The creepy thing is that I had never told her what the ghost I had seen looked like, just that I had seen one. Our continued conversation revealed that many details of our stories matched up. Another glowing encounter. I haven't been around for a while. I've been so busy it's hard to get free time. But finally, I can share another experience that I had just a few nights ago. It's winter here and it's really getting cold out, especially at night so I bundle up and sit in my car to stay warm whenever I go out for a smoke. This night was odd. I was the only one outside that I could see. It was late and dark out, and nothing but the streetlights to illuminate the parking lot. Everything was fine during my smoke. I finished it, turned off my car, and started walking back towards the dorm. I'd take a glance up at the smoke pit, up the small hill, and see no one out there, so I looked back ahead for only a second, but in that second I suddenly felt a presence and I immediately looked up back at the smoke pit and I see this hazy figure on top of one of the tables. It looked like someone wearing a hoodie and sitting cross-legged on the table, but he was completely see-through. I could see the road behind him and the grassy hills that led to the base housing area and the lights from the streets were glowing right through him. Yet they seemed dim in the haze of this figure. What freaked me out the most was that his eyes were very distinct, and they were glowing a very bright white. The figure just stared at me, and I stopped dead in my tracks staring at him. 
I don't know why, but I could not move at all. Finally, after what felt like hours, but it was only a few minutes, the figure began to slowly fade away until it was completely gone. I felt like I was released from some invisible chain, and I could move again, and I ran back to my dorm room and made sure everything was locked. I've been seeing strange things all my life, and I understand that this weird ability can cause spirits to be attached to me. Most of the time, I just ignore it, but sometimes there are those moments that I am petrified, and I can't even explain why. I will say this though, this is the first time I have ever seen a figure with glowing white eyes. I've seen red, blue, and a strange haze of purple, but never bright white. Has anyone else seen something like this before? Thank you for reading. Creepy story number three. When I was seven years old, my mother, my brother, and I lived in a small three-bedroom house in a nondescript little town in West Central Illinois. I'd been aware of the paranormal for quite some time, as we live in a house that in the 1800s has been something like an abortion center. A summer after my birthday, my grandmother bought me and my younger half-sister a glow-in-the-dark Muppet shirt that were too big for us, so instead we used them as nightshirts. I loved the shirt and wore it all the time. That fall though, after the leaves had fallen off the trees, I remember because I looked out the window, I became scared from that shirt for life. I had fallen asleep lying in my usual spot. I had a small bedroom with a bunk bed, and I slept on the bottom bunk, my head in line with the window, but on the far side of the bed, a twin-sized mattress that is. I remember waking up mentally, realizing that Bluey, my stuffed rabbit, had fallen off the bed. I had an attachment issue to him, so it was really a big deal. Still, I didn't open my eyes because I felt as though somebody was watching me. I remember through my eyelids, a bright green light and the same color as my shirt. I figured it was just my shirt, but I still wanted to make sure, of course. I pulled the covers over my head and opened my eyes. I hadn't looked at my shirt yet, but I remember the light was definitely coming from the other side of my blankets. I looked down and was shocked, only to realize my shirt was plain white. No Muppets, no glow in the dark, just a plain white t-shirt. Without removing the covers, I took the shirt off and checked all sides of it. There was still nothing there. I pulled the shirt back on, sat up, and yanked the covers down over my head so I could see. There, sitting at the end of my bed, was a young boy, maybe seven or eight years old. He had pale hair and dark eyes and honestly looked a lot like myself. We stared at each other for a few minutes. There was a smug look about him as he stared at me in a rather cool way. And I looked at him with what I'm sure horror mixed with curiosity. Horror because I knew he wasn't human. And curiosity because on his impish little body was my Muppet's shirt pattern. My Muppets were glowing at me from his spectral body and they seemed scary at that point. I tried screaming for my mom, but my throat was tight, almost like I was paralyzed or mute. I can only describe it by saying it was like I was going to cry, but never did. After what seemed like an eternity, the spirit boy crawled over to me, his hands making little indentations on the bed as his weight shifted forward and he sat on his knees in front of me between me and the window. He sat there for a minute, our noses maybe three inches apart, and then he smiled or bared his teeth. His teeth, I remember, were normal, except that where he should have had canines, he had fangs, fangs as in the kind big dogs have pointy, sharp, kind of curved, but not so much. 
I was still registering what his teeth were when he disappeared, just vanished. No faded away, no transition at all. One moment he was there, the next he was gone. I felt like screaming, but still couldn't speak. About five minutes after he left, the Muppets materialized. Yes, just slowly appeared, were... They belonged on my shirt, on my body. I was too afraid to move, too afraid of what else might be in my room and under my bed, to go to my mom and even grab Bluey. A few weeks later, my great-grandfather, Alan, died. I've seen him four times since then, each time preceding a major life-altering loss. I'd also like to point out that I've moved multiple times since then. I feel him a lot, but still haven't seen him, which I'm glad for, honestly. He never grew up, at least in appearance. The time he appeared to me before my boyfriend's car accident, though, he looked sad. I saw him in the mirror in my bedroom for a few seconds, looking as though he wanted to say something. But he disappeared before either of us could. Has anybody else ever experienced anything like this little boy? I don't think he's evil or good, but just there. I don't know. Had to share this though. First and foremost, let me say that I have never been a believer in the supernatural. It's not that I don't think that there's more to life than what we can physically see. It's just that I've never really had a ghostly encounter, and I'm just like most ordinary people, going about my business, paying bills, trying to make ends meet, and so forth. That was until Hurricane Katrina. I'm a military policeman in the Air Force Reserves in Texas. We were activated in August of 2005 at the behest of our governor to help the battered state of Louisiana. Part of our job was to patrol the streets in New Orleans with food, water, and what little medication we had left to offer the citizens in New Orleans. We were also there to offer transportation to those who wished to leave, but were stuck without a means to travel. Contrary to what the then Mayor Nagin stated on TV and radio, we were not there to harass black people. We were volunteers who were trying to help fellow Americans. That being said, I remember one evening we were patrolling near the Ninth Ward. Not a very nice place, even before the hurricane hit. My squad and I were walking in the middle of the street, yelling out that we were military police. We had food, water, and a way out if anyone needed assistance. I could see every house had been boarded up to keep the looters out, and many people spray painted slogans on front and sides of their homes. You loot, I shoot, and you loot, you die were the ones that stuck out the most in my mind. Slowly, some people did emerge from their homes and ask for water, food, and medicine. We gave them whatever we had and asked them if they needed to be evacuated. Many refused to leave their homes for fear of losing what little they had left. Anyway, I noticed that all the houses on this particular block had been boarded up. It was a typical southern plantation-style home, which looked like it had been built around the time of the Civil War. A small figure of a little girl caught my eye as I looked up at the second floor. I smiled and waved at her, mainly to let her know that I was there to help and that she had nothing to fear. She seemed to smile and wave back from what I could tell. I called out to her to get her mommy or daddy, but she just stood there staring at me. It was then that a kind of cold shiver ran up my spine. I really couldn't understand why. It was my cop sense kicking in. Two tours in Iraq and over 20 years as a sheriff deputy had developed this. So when it went off, I paid attention. Just then, an elderly man on a bike rode up on us asking if we could help evacuate his family of seven out of New Orleans. I told him we'd be happy to help him out and asked him if he knew anything about the little girl and her family living in the old plantation home. He looked at me kind of puzzled and asked, What girl? 
I turned around and pointed to the second floor window, but she was gone. I told him that I had just seen a little girl at the window and she waved to me. His eyes widened a little and he just smiled and said, So, you've seen her too? He put his hand on my shoulder and said, Son, there ain't nobody living in that house for over a hundred of years. I started to protest, but he just shook his head, laughed and walked away. As he was leaving, I could have sworn I heard him say, Some things about New Orleans are better left unsaid. I spent the first 18 years of my life living in a small Kansas town. Although there was little reason to stay, it was a great place to grow up, and I have many fond memories of exploring the nearby woods and rivers. A lot of strange things happened in and around that town, but I will only tell of one for now. This short story is about the Burns Ranch. The Burns Ranch was located about five miles west of town, situated at the base of a gently sloping hill, literally out in the middle of nowhere. A curving gravel road was the only way to get there, and beyond the house, this same road soon petered out into dirty ruts that faded into miles and miles of unused pasture land. The house itself was a two-story Victorian that had to have been built in the early 1900s. It was old, but wonderfully remodeled and a beauty to behold. A smaller, more modern guest house stood behind it, and an ancient barn nearby completed things. All of this had been in the Burns family for generations, handed down from one son to the other until finally Richard Burns inherited it. At the time of this story, Mr. and Mrs. Burns had a newborn baby girl and a son who was about four years younger than me. I was a family friend, and while in my high school years, would house it while they were all away on business trips or vacations. This was a great gig for any teenager, and I always jumped at the chance to get away from it all and spend some time alone out there. One summer, they asked me to stay at their place for a few weeks. The first week, I was to be alone as usual, but the second week, their son Robert was going to be there. Although not much younger than me, they for some reason wanted me to keep an eye on him. We got along well enough, so this was all fine with me. I left for the ranch one late afternoon, just as the shadows of the day were starting to bend longer towards the east. Weaving through the curves of the road and over old, low, water bridges, I finally crested a hill, made my way down to the last of the bridges, passed through a small forest, and then came out into the wide, open spaces of prairie land. About a hundred yards further down the road was the house. No matter how many times I went out to the ranch, I could never fully get over the creepy feeling that would wash over me the minute the house came into view. It always seemed foreboding and spooky. The place looked haunted. One corner of the house formed a rotunda in which Robert's room was located on the second floor. As I neared the house, I could see someone standing in the shadows of his room, holding the curtain back and watching me arrive. Pulling into the driveway, I saw the curtain fall back into place, swinging slightly. It seemed that someone was home, and I wouldn't be alone that first week after all. The driveway led around the house to the back door, which everyone used when entering or exiting the house. The only time I ever saw the front door used was after dinner, when we would go out to sit on the porch and watch the sunset. I locked up the car, went through the gate of the fenced-in yard, and knocked on the door, waiting for whoever was inside to answer. When no one did, I went across the yard, past the three-foot statue of the Virgin Mary, and toward what amounted to a cement room that had been built into the side of the hill. It was some sort of storm shelter, and near the door, I found the keys to the house, which were always hidden there behind an old painting. As I let myself into the foyer and sat my bags on a bench, I kept calling out to let my presence be known. Dead silence was my only welcome. On the right side of the entranceway were the stairs that led up to the bedrooms. 
Under the stairs and next to the bench upon which my bag sat was the door that led to the basement. Beyond the door and in front of me was the dining room, the kitchen being to its left. To the right of the dining room were the rest of the downstairs, a few sitting rooms, the library, and an entertainment room. Sure, I saw someone at the window. I began a search of the house, starting with the first floor before working my way upstairs. The stairs ascended to an L-shaped hall. Just to the left were the master bedroom and bath. To the right and down the hall, past another bathroom, were the baby room and a spiral staircase that led to one of the sitting rooms below. The guest room I used as well as Robert's bedroom was around the corner at the end of the L. I searched these rooms, then went down to the basement, which had been renovated into a modern living room with a complete bar. I found nothing. Perplexed, but kind of used to how weird the house could be, I went back upstairs to unpack and start to enjoy my stay. I set up my guitar and amp in the entertainment room, where I planned on creating rock songs I was sure millions would jam to in years to come. The fridge was stacked, so that was no problem, and I had brought along a ton of movies to watch on the VCR in the basement. It seemed the only thing I had to worry about was the occasional phone call and feeding the dog, which was in a pen out near the old cement shelter. No problem, as far as I was concerned. I had been house-sitting here many times before, so knew how eerie things would feel when evening came. Like I said, it just had that look of a haunted house. Not much happened that first night, and the next day I got up, fed and watered the dog, then watched a few movies before taking a short walk around the property. That evening the phone rang, and it was Mr. Burns. He wanted to know how much it rained the night before. I knew he was out of state, so told him it didn't rain at all, but he insisted I check his rain counter, a measuring device that he had attached to a post near his mailbox. I went out and sure enough, although it had been completely dry the last few days, there was about one-fourth inches of water at the bottom of the thing. I went back to the phone, where he was waiting on the other line, and told him. He didn't seem surprised and said it would probably rain that night. He told me to take care, make sure to keep the doors locked, and to not let anyone in when evening came. I liked Mr. Burns, and he was a decent guy, but sometimes he talked like that, making little sense at all. So I agreed to do as he said and hung up the phone. About three hours later, evening crept up on the ranch, and with it came the first storm of the summer. This wasn't just a small shower. This was a torrent. It came down heavy for about 30 minutes, then calmed to a steady downpour. Suddenly, the phone started ringing. I would answer, but no one would be on the other end of the line. It rang like that all night, about three times an hour, and each time I picked up the receiver, I would be greeted with silence. No voice, no signals, nothing. Just silence. As the rain came down, I looked out the window, down toward the road that led back to town. I saw a flicker of light through the nearby forest and went to stand on the front porch to get a better look. Sure enough, there was someone down there. It seemed a vehicle had just stopped inside the forest at the low water bridge. Whoever it was had most likely been coming out to the ranch, so to make sure there was no trouble. I reluctantly slid on my bad weather clothes, went out to the shelter where I hung up the key, then made my way through the rain and mud down the road toward the light. The wind was howling and the rain pouring down in sheets, but I could still see the light shining whenever I raised my head to see where I was going. I finally got to the curve that led into the woods and towards the low water bridge, but when I made the turn, there was nothing there. By now, I was really freaked out. The bridge was flooded over, and there were no tire marks on either side of it. I could clearly see the other side of the bridge, and no one had been down it since well before the rain started. Probably not since I came down the day before. I checked around a few more minutes just to make sure no one happened to be there needing help, and then made my way back to the ranch. 
The phone was ringing again as I entered, but I didn't bother picking it up this time. Let it ring. I had wet clothes to get out of and weird lights to think about. I was warming up in the kitchen a few hours later when I heard a car horn go off. A steady drizzle was coming down now and looking out the window again, I noticed the lights near the bridge were back, this time dancing around through the trees before turning up the road and coming towards the house. It was a car and every few seconds the driver would toot the horn a few times. I got on my clothes, wrapped the still damp coat around me, and went out the back door, this time armed with a rifle. I could see nothing past the light of the porch, so went out into the storm, carrying the rifle and a small flashlight. I went towards the barn and down the soggy driveway. The horn was still honking, but I could no longer see the road due to tall brush in the fields, so the car was invisible to me, but getting louder and louder by the moment. Everything suddenly seemed to build up. The car horn got louder. I could now see the glare of the lights growing through the brush. I found myself getting tense, pointing the now cocked rifle in the general direction of whoever was coming down that road. The horn rang out one more time. The light shined just a little brighter. I finally got to the end of the drive and went out onto the road. There was nothing there to greet me. Just a dark, wet, stormy night and a muddy road that led to a very flooded bridge. Even the rain seemed to have eased up a bit. After a few minutes of trying to figure this all out, I gave up covering the rifle so as to keep the water off of it. I trudged back toward the house for the last time that night, deciding it was safer inside than out there in the open. Nothing much happened for the rest of the evening until about 4 a.m. when I was awakened by someone pounding on the front door. This was odd. Everyone always used the back door. Nonetheless, I got out of bed, put my clothes on, and went downstairs to find out what was going on. My body ached from being out in the storm the night before. I tried to hurry down the stairs and through the house as fast as possible, listening as the banging became more and more persistent. I had no idea that no one was going to be waiting for me on the porch when I opened the door and I was right. Unable to sleep, I looked around a bit, then brewed a large, strong pot of coffee and sat reading until the sun poked over the horizon. The day was bright, hot, and humid, and after a short nap, I decided to take a walk around the property. I hung the keys back inside the shelter so as not to lose them, and as I did, I got a strong urge to go into the little room and explore a bit. I have no idea why I would suddenly want to do this since there was really nothing in there and to be honest, it was not a place I wished to be in. Still, it took a little more effort to walk away from the shelter. Something told me not to enter all the way, so I just stuck my hand in, quickly placed the keys beside the painting, and then I shut the heavy door. I took a long walk before going back to the low water bridge. I shut the barn door, which had come open during the previous evening storm, then made my way to the top of the hill behind the house. From here, I got a great view of everything for miles and miles. I sat up there for some time, then went to the river. The bridge was still flooded out, but not as bad as before. There were no tire marks and no evidence whatsoever of anyone being there before except for what tracks I made. I still had no idea as to what had happened the night before. I would have thought it was all a prank, but the storm was a bad one and beside, the bridge had been out. I went back to the ranch and the first thing I noticed was that the barn door was open again, already on edge. I peered inside then closed the door, placed a large rock in front of it. Later that afternoon, while working out a few songs on my guitar, I kept getting a very strong feeling of someone standing right behind me. No matter where I would sit, the feeling was always there. Growing tired of it, I stopped what I was doing and said out loud, STOP IT! I'M TRYING TO DO SOMETHING HERE! 
No sooner had I said this than the feeling stopped. It came back whenever I would start to practice my music, but went away when I told it to. The next day, I was upstairs going through some things when I heard, very loudly, someone downstairs yell out, Hey! It startled me at first, but then I thought it might be the family coming home early, so I put up what I was doing and went down to find an empty house. The rest of my time there alone was uneventful, with the exception of a lot of weird feelings. The library for some reason spooked me as did the shelter, and I refused to use the spiral staircase located next to the baby room. I was somewhat nervous the whole time and took many long walks. Once while sitting at the top of the hill, I saw a car coming towards the ranch. It passed through the forest and made it over the bridge. I was actually a little relieved. Robert had finally showed up. Robert's grandmother had brought him back from a summer camp he had attended, and after we finally said our goodbyes, I sat on the porch with him listening to the various stories he had to tell and looking through the photos he'd brought back. I was reluctant to mention my own tales, but it didn't matter. Robert had grown up in that house. He knew something weird had happened to me while I was home alone there. We spent the next few days enjoying the good weather. We hiked, explored the valleys and forests along the road, and went on drives that took us to places we'd never been to before. One night, just as the sun was setting, Robert finally asked me how my stay had been. I didn't hesitate in telling him some of the odd things that had happened, and he reaffirmed some of them with his own stories. It seems he too was drawn toward the cement shelter where the keys were hidden. The only difference was that he had gone inside, the heavy door slamming shut, locking him in. It was some time before he was able to push the thing open and get out. He said that the Virgin Mary statue had been removed, so it was facing the doorway, as if watching his struggle. He was as confused as I concerning the lights at the bridge and the mystery car, but he did mention seeing a lady come down the spiral staircase I was so afraid of. She came down, glared at him for a moment, and then walked back up. Robert never found out who she was, but felt she was not nice. He also told me of dreams he had about the library. They were vivid and scary and involved a closet. He had just recently discovered that a relative had been born in that room years ago and had died there as well. Above each bedroom door was a small window, and Robert said one early morning he woke up seeing the shadow of someone come down the hall and stand in front of his slightly open door. The person stood there for some time before Robert called out, thinking it was his father. When he got no reply, Robert screamed for his parents, and as they turned the corner in the hall, the shadow disappeared. That explained why I always felt watched whenever I tried to sleep in the guest room across the hall. As for Robert's room, I only went in there to get a CD now and then. I never felt comfortable in there ever since I saw someone looking out the window at me as I came up to the house that first day. Towards the end of my stay, Robert and I settled down one evening in the basement. We had movies to watch and were set for the night. There was a small bathroom between the foyer and the kitchen, and in it was an old-fashioned toilet that had a string you pulled when you wanted to flush it. The thing was loud, and as we sat downstairs watching our second movie, we could hear it flushing. We inspected it before finally turning off the water and returning to our movies. Around 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, we were in that zombie state just before our sleep actually comes. Suddenly, we heard the back door slam shut. Wide awake now, we grabbed a few rifles that we had brought down to the basement with us and listened. From right above us, we heard the unmistakable sound of boots shuffling across the foyer floor. They slowly came towards the basement door and stopped. Then we heard the door creak open. I admit, I finally came to understand the term shaking like a leaf, but Robert wasn't much braver. We were too scared to even try and pretend to be cool. For a moment there was nothing, 
And then whoever was above us came walking down the stairs. We could hear someone brush against the coats that hung on pegs along the wall. We could hear the firm, deliberate sound of boots making contact with the warped boards that were the steps. The stairway going down into the basement was hidden behind a wall, so that anyone who came down could not be seen until they reached the bottom. The third stair from the bottom always made a horrible squeaking noise, and when we heard that, we raised our rifles and waited and waited. Finally, when no one came into view, I told whoever was there we were armed and to leave. There was no sound at all. Eventually we gained a little courage and slowly peeked around the wall and up the stairway. No one was there. The door was shut. I was beyond scared at this point, and after going throughout the house and checking the doors and windows, we spent the rest of the night in the dining room talking about what had just happened. To this day, I am unsure what to think. We heard, without a doubt, the back door open and slam shut, but when we checked it, the key was still in the lock and the door was still bolted from the inside. Robert left the next day to go spend a few days at a friend's home. He wasn't surprised when I told him I was asking another friend of mine to come out and stay with me on my final night there. That night was quiet except for the usual strange feelings. Even my friend mentioned it and left early the next morning. Rather than spend another day there alone waiting for Mr. and Mrs. Burns to return, I wrote a note telling them I had to leave early to run a few errands placing it on the kitchen table. I packed up all my things, made sure the house was cleaned up, and then locked the door. A sudden sense of urgency overcame me as I walked to the shelter to put up the extra key. I came close to just tossing it into the room in my struggle to hurry, but managed somehow to put it back in its proper place on the hook. As I walked to the car, I noticed the barn door was open again, and although I tried to ignore it, I ended up going over and shutting it. The big rock I had put in front of it earlier was gone. No one ever said anything about me leaving earlier or asked how my stay was. Miss Burns would often laugh at the idea that her house could ever be haunted, but sometimes I think that laughter was a little forced. As for Mr. Burns, when I asked him how he knew it would rain in the evening, I checked the level of water in his gauge. He looked at me puzzled and swore he never even called me during that trip. I still don't know what to make of that place. Like I said, lots of strange things happened in and around the small town I grew up in, and that was just one of them. My name is Dino. I'm 32 years old, married, and work as a scaffolder for a small company in Kearns for North Queensland, Australia. I moved here from a small country town at the top of Victoria called Melindra roughly eight years ago with then my girlfriend of three years. I have always been very skeptical about ghosts and thought it was just a market to make money until that day. It was the middle of summer, very hot and humid. Me and Angela, my girlfriend, jumped into my work vehicle and was going to get home and get some lunch, and she wanted to go to Job Hi-Fi to grab some CDs. With me driving and her in the front passenger seat, we were driving down the main road. It is called Captain Cook Highway. When to the left of us, on the side of the road, was a woman with dark hair and a beautiful white wedding dress. She had a very scared and troubled look on her face, and she was lifting up the bottom of her dress so it would not touch the dirty road. It looked like she had no shoes on, and it looked also as if she had her feet burnt to a crisp. Once I had driven past her, my girlfriend said, Did you even see the woman in the wedding dress? I replied, Yes, let's go back and see if she is okay, as she looked really upset. So I turned around and headed back. It must have been no more than 40 seconds before. We were back to where we spotted her, and she was completely gone. Now this is a highway, and there were no houses or people around, and there was only horse paddocks and a slight steep cliff, so there is nowhere to go or even hide. Me and my girlfriend were in complete shock and could not believe what we just saw. 
I had never told anybody this until recently, when my mate Ryan came over. We were watching Netflix, some paranormal show was on, and I felt comfortable enough to tell him. I told him, hey, I think me and my ex-girlfriend may have seen a ghost. He said, oh yeah? Where about? And I explained that between the Carnivica roundabout and the Yorkies roundabout on the Captain Cook Highway, he looked straight at me and said it wasn't a woman in a wedding dress, was it? My skin started crawling. I stammered yes. He said he saw the same thing near Lake Placid that is roughly a couple of kilometers from where I saw her. He said he was getting dropped home late one night from a party and he saw her walking on the side of the road. Thank you for reading my story. Back in the early 1980s, my now ex-husband, we'll call him Ed, my then three-year-old son, and I moved into our first house. Ed started out as one-room schoolhouse. I discovered proof with the removal of layers of wallpaper, revealed old state chalkboards, and had grown into a monstrously large farmhouse-type structure due to folks adding on over the years. The place had a lot of quirks. For instance, the main floor had two full bathrooms, a very large country-type kitchen, and a smaller galley-type kitchen in what one time served as a mother-in-law apartment. This is also where the second bathroom was. Inside that apartment was also a Murphy ironing board that folded up into the wall. What I found very odd was at some point, someone had removed the interior doors that would have shut the two units off from each other. As a result, you could literally do laps around the ground floor. The front door led into a nice sized living room. From there, you could see the staircase that led up to the two bedrooms upstairs. Another quirk, the upstairs rooms were not separated by a hallway of any sort. The top stairs split into two triangle stairs, one on the left, one on the right, and these faced the bedroom doors. I won't make you suffer through a lengthy description of the place. However, I thought these were points of interest that may aid with understanding the events that would take place here. Our first night in the place, I distinctly heard someone rummaging through the moving boxes downstairs. I sat up in bed and listened, deciphering normal house sounds from those that seemed like someone was moving around. I looked over at my sleeping husband and slid out from under the covers and cautiously crossed over into my son's room. I lifted his sleeping form and returned with him to my room, depositing him on my bed. Someone downstairs coughed. I shook at awake. Someone's downstairs, I hissed. Go check it out. After a few groggy swears, he informed me that I could check it out for myself. Something downstairs toppled over. I about wet myself. If we had an upstairs phone, we would in later years, and this was pre-cell phone days. I would have stayed put and called the cops. As it was, I gripped my ball bat and made my way down the stairs, flipping on the lights as I went. I didn't want to surprise whomever had broken in and I really hoped they'd just run away. I could see into the living room. Boxes were strewn about, giving voice that someone had been going through them. I made my way through the entire lower floor, leaving lights burning in my wake as I checked every nook and cranny while straining my ears. While I didn't wish to confront whomever it was, I didn't want them surprising me either. On my way, I double-checked the doors and windows to be sure they were shut and locked tight. Finally, there was only one room left, the bathroom in the apartment. I pushed the door open hard, and in the dimness, saw someone staring back at me. As I reached for the light switch, I saw them move towards me. I bellowed loudly, swinging the bat with all my might. There was a tremendous crash of breaking glass as shards went flying in all directions. I fumbled for the switch again, and as it came on, realized that I had slain a mirror that Ed had perched on the toilet tank. I wish he had told me. I fetched the broom and dustpan, feeling very foolish, and had just swept the bulk into a pile when there was a very loud banging at the front door. Neighbors hearing my scream had called the cops. Just try explaining that your own reflection had scared you that badly. At least they didn't laugh in front of me, 
but they grew very somber, learning that Ed, at 6'4", had stayed upstairs during the entire time and had only come down when their knock summoned us. I still recall them looking down at me, over at him and back again with something that seemed to be a mixture of disbelief and disgust. So you, one pointed at me, came down to investigate, and you, he looked at Ed, stayed upstairs? Then things got weird. Cop A decided to see where this mirror was and check out the house to be sure it was secure, taking me in tow. Cop B stayed with Ed. I learned later that they had their own little chat, which left Ed feeling somewhat badly. As we approached the bathroom, I said, be careful, that glass went everywhere. But there was no glass to be seen, not a shard. The mirror sat on the toilet tank, seeing it. In the light, I realized I had never seen this mirror before, but I knew I had broken it. I had heard the glass smash. The broom and dustpan still sat in the door where I had left them. Weird. Very, very weird. After the cops left, I asked Ed where the mirror had come from. He said he'd found it in the basement. He went back to bed, and I went back to check the mirror out better. It was a rectangular in shape, the glass itself a bit wavy looking, with a few light spots and tiny clear areas. Its framing was very ornate, tiny, interwoven vines interspersed with leaves and flowers. It was obviously an antique, exactly how old, I wasn't sure, but guessed early to mid 1800s. I wanted to examine it, look for a manufacturer's mark, or possibly a date, but something about it made me feel strange. I reasoned that given the whole weirdness that had happened, the hour, and the move, perhaps it would have been wiser to wait for the light of day. I closed the door and went back up to bed, but not before saying a prayer of protection and adding that anything unkind was not welcomed in my home. The next day was very anticlimactic, at least in the weird department. Ed's family had swooped in on us to help. If you ask me, it was more of a way for his mother to dictate the way she thought we should decorate, complete with paint chips she thought would be just the colors we should use. And wouldn't that chair look better over there, I advise. She expressed an interest in the mirror when she saw it. The woman absolutely gushed over it, and before I could say one word more, Ed gifted it to her. I never saw it again, and oddly, whenever I'd bring it up, the subject would be changed. This morning, I woke up at about 3 a.m. I couldn't sleep for whatever reason. I turned and tossed until it started to look like it was starting to get daylight outside. Still dark, but not black outside. I was just laying in bed with my eyes closed, but I was awake. I opened my eyes to see my boyfriend sitting on the floor next to our bed, or so I thought. It didn't scare me at first because I thought it was actually him. I looked at him very inquisitively, but couldn't speak. He looked at me back like a confused dog or something with his head all sideways. For some reason, the way he moved frightened me. I found myself leaping backwards to the other side of my bed, where I felt my boyfriend lay asleep. I thought to myself, is this real? I covered my eyes with my blanket because I was so scared. I thought it was because my eyes were adjusting. When I pulled the blanket back down and looked again, he hadn't moved, only reached towards me. I just lay there stiff as a board. I was too afraid to move or even speak. He sat there in the same position for what seemed like a very long time to me. The only thing that wasn't his were his eyes. They were black and white. He then laid down on the floor and was gone. When I felt like it wasn't coming back, I reached over to the light by our bed and flipped it on and just sat at the edge of our bed and wondered what just had happened to me. I'm afraid that it will keep happening. This has never happened to me before, until last night. Someone please help me understand. What could this have been? What did it want? Someone was telling me that it was a bad thing, that other spirits like demonic things can form to look like loved ones. Is this true? It's been a few years since I've added any new experiences. The last thing I recall writing about were whispers heard around my home. Since then, my father passed away from cancer, 
and his spirit may be responsible for some strange happenings. My father passed away in early May 2003, and that summer, I had a very vivid dream. It was Sunday, July 20th, and I'd worked very early that morning. I worked at the Gap, and we had to rearrange the clothing stock and add new items to the shelves. It took about four hours and arrived back at home around 10.30 a.m. I was exhausted due to waking up so early, so I drew the blinds and took a nap. Immediately after falling asleep, I dreamt that I was sitting in my father's bed in his home in London, Ontario. There was a knock on the door, and I got up to open it, and standing in front of me was my father wearing his dark blue pajamas that he died in. He looked so luminous and healthy, and he was smiling. I hugged him and could feel his warmth, never wanting to let go. I looked up at him and asked, where are you going? And he replied, I don't know yet. I have some things to take care of. I asked him if there was a God and he replied, I don't know that yet, but we'll find out soon. Just then, my mother woke me up because she heard me crying. When I awoke, my eyes shot open and I had no idea where I was. I shot up upright, crying hysterically, asking, where did he go? Where is he? My mom was so confused and tried to console me. But I was just so upset because it seemed like such a real encounter. I stayed in my room for the rest of the day because I felt he was there with me still. I felt that if I left him, I would abandon him. It sounds strange. And it may well have just been a dream, because his death just occurred two months before, and I was grieving heavily. I like to believe that it was him just trying to say goodbye. I haven't had any other dreams like this. Although I've dreamt of my father, mainly he'll appear randomly in dreams that have nothing to do with anything. The second thing that happened was very frightening to me. This occurred last April, around Easter time. I had a terrible cold and was home from school for Easter weekend. We were set to leave for my grandparents' house that morning. Around 6 a.m., I awoke, coughing repeatedly. I took some Buckley's to calm my throat and rolled over onto my stomach, sprawled across the right side of my bed with my feet apart. Not a minute later, I heard a repeated tapping above my bed on my headboard. It lasted about a full minute, and I did not think much of it, but suddenly, it felt as if someone placed their hand between my feet and compressed the covers, or as if a cat was sitting beneath my feet. It just appeared, this strange sensation. I lay frozen, not knowing what to think. I was frightened. I finally gathered the courage to rip out of bed and turn on my light. Of course, there was nothing there and my door was closed and locked so our cat was not in my room. I remember seeing a faint thread of light whisk by and disappear, but it could have been my eyes adjusting to the light as it was still very dark at a.m. I told my mom about what had happened and she mentioned that she had a similar experience in my room two weeks prior. She said it felt as if a cat jumped on the bed, but there was nothing there of course. I'm not sure what to think. I like to think that it was my father, making sure I was alright. Maybe it was the ghost of a past cat, Oscar, or maybe it was nothing. One thing that convinces me that this was a paranormal incident is the fact that I've read about paranormal tapping before a paranormal event occurs. I read this book called The Ghost That Haunted Himself, the story of the Mackenzie Poltergeist by Jane Andrew Henderson. It's a book of well-documented hauntings surrounding the Black Mausoleum, a tomb in Greyfair Cemetery in Edinburgh, Ireland. Ben Scott leads tours of this tomb, and one of his encounters was very similar to my own. On page 21 it reads, Ben lay in his bed, staring up at the ceiling. It was almost Easter. He had drank too much and had gone to bed alone. As he lay unsuccessfully, trying to sleep. He heard a repeated tapping noise just above his head. Ben didn't know what it was, and he no longer cared. A few minutes later, he 
he heard the heavy swish of the bed curtains parting. I almost couldn't breathe when I read this. I couldn't believe how related the incidents were, but it all could be a coincidence. One other thing that frightened me occurred this past May. It was May 5th actually, the second anniversary of my father's passing, and I'd just returned home from a friend's house. It was around 3 a.m., and I went to sleep in the guest computer room because my room was occupied by my mother because her basement room had been flooded due to a leak in the foundation when our pool thawed. I was dozing off when suddenly I heard something fall off the shelf of the computer desk onto the desk itself and it made a very loud noise and startled me awake. I was frozen and felt very threatened like something was looming in the darkness approaching me. I yelled out, go away, not really thinking how ridiculous I sounded. I scrambled to open the door, proceeding to run out of the room and into my room to my mom. I jumped under the covers, absolutely quivering and crying. I get scared very easily. So she got up to check out the room. I went with her and we turned on the light. A heavy compass that sat on the top shelf had fallen and that's what the noise was. But how on earth did the compass itch off the shelf and fall into the desk as a complete and eerie mystery? Not too much else has happened since. Before we renovated the house over the summer, we would sometimes hear random knocks and a picture of my father once gently fell to the floor when a plant was placed a little bit in front of it. My mother's diamond ring engagement ring from my father has disappeared and never is found to this day. But again, I guess these things happen. I just thought I'd share my ghost story. In the summer of 2001, I was living in Paris in a building that I believe was built in 1863. The elevator was deemed historic. It was creaky and slow and broke often, but couldn't be replaced because it was antique and they had rules about that. The elevator was wooden on three sides and made of grating and stained glass in the front and each landing was grated so you could see right into the elevator when it stopped and anyone standing there when you were in the elevator could see you. The elevator was very small, just big enough for three average weight people to stand inside. A friend visited me in August and we decided to go out shopping in the afternoon. We went to the landing and pressed the button for the elevator. I might mention that I believe that we were probably just about the only people in this building at the time. The Parisians had all left for the seashore and I hadn't seen anyone but the building's porter and one other person the whole summer. This day, when the elevator came, there was a man in it. My friend and I both gasped at the same time because it was very unexpected. The man was handsome, with thick black short hair, maybe in his thirties, tallish, wearing a dark suit with a white shirt that was open at the collar. He looked very crisp and rich, but a little tussled, like he had just come from a party. Within a blink of an eye, the man was gone, in a flash. The elevator hadn't opened, you pushed the door to open it, he just vanished. My friend and I said did you see that to each other and we confirmed the description. He looked like just a regular person, not clear or ghost like at all. Then she just got into the elevator, brave. I got in with her but I made her stand where he had been standing. In June of 1988, my husband and I moved to a small town in Gloucestershire County, New Jersey, called Polesboro. Polesboro is situated along the Delaware River in Matena Creek. To get into town, you have to cross a small bridge over Matena Creek. We had a dog, and after a long day at the office, banging away at a keyboard, I enjoyed taking our little darling for a walk. Many times the dog and I would walk down our street, turn onto Broad Street, cross the bridge, and walk down Crown Point Road for a bit, then turn home. For some reason, I was reluctant to walk on the east side of the bridge, 
or the east side of Crown Point Road near the bridge. I can remember looking off into a woodsy area on the east side of Crown Point Road by the bridge and thinking, I don't know what happened there, but it must have been really bad to make me feel this spooked. About five years ago, after we came to Polesboro, I was driving home on a dark and stormy night, as Snoopy would say. The rain was so heavy, I could barely see the road ahead. As I approached the bridge from Crown Point Road, I caught a glimpse through the murky weather of a house on the east side of the bridge where I knew no house was. It was that little woodsy area that always spooked me so much. The house was a ball of fire. Flames were shooting straight up into the air like the 4th of July, and the smell of wood burning filled the car. As quickly as I saw the house, it was gone, vanished, and the scent of charred wood disappeared with it. Yes, I was scared, even though the doors of the car were locked. Periodically, I'd be coming home from that direction, but only when it was stormy and late at night. I'd catch a two or three second glimpse of a house engulfed in fire, and the smell of the house burning, which is entirely different from the scent of something like leaves burning or a fireplace. This happened about six times over ten years, and the experience really spooked me. A few years later, I learned that back in the 1930s or 1940s, can't remember the decade, but during that time period, there was a house located on that piece of ground. A family living there had either five or six children. I can't remember now how many, but it was more than four. One night, when the father was working night shift, the house caught fire and all the children died in the blaze. Witnesses said the oldest girl, who was about 13, ran back into the house and up the stairs to save her littlest brother, who was a baby. Needless to say, now I understand why that spot always made me feel uncomfortable and where the scent of charred wood came from. What I think is interesting is that the ghost of this story isn't a person or an animal, but an inanimate object, a house, a house that no longer exists and hasn't existed for over a half a century, but still blazes away like a Halloween pumpkin when conditions are just right. So, the next time there is an unusually dark and stormy night, come on down to Gloucestershire County, New Jersey, and Hadford Pulls Barrel on Crown Point Road. You may just be haunted by a house. My first name is Holly, and I don't know if this will help your page, or if you'd just be interested in hearing my story, but telling someone who will not laugh in my face will help me get this weight off my chest. I'm 21, so for me to tell my story to anyone, they aren't going to believe me, thinking that I'm young and I made it up. But let me tell you, after I tell you my life's experiences, you'll know it just isn't a figment of my imagination. Because if it is, then my whole family's crazy, along with me. The first haunting occurred in my grandmother's house. I have two sisters and three brothers. One of my brothers wasn't born until I was 14. One of those sisters is my identical twin, so pretty much whatever happened, happened to the both of us for some reason. We never really had a twin connection until she moved away, and now it's like we're in the same room together even though we're 300 miles away. Anyways, I lived in the house from the time I was four until I was about 16. I don't really remember when I first noticed strange things going on. The first thing I can actually remember is when I was five. My sister and I shared a room and a bed, so I slept in the side closet to the door. I was always afraid to look into the hallway. I always felt like I wasn't alone, like someone was watching me. I woke up one night to see a huge ball of white light, I mean big and bright enough to illuminate the entire hallway in my room. I watched it slowly flow out of the bathroom, past my room, all the way down the hall and down the stairs where it disappeared into the way. I wasn't afraid, but afterwards, when I realized that what I saw wasn't alive, I was terrified. Things always seemed to happen to one of us at a time, except once. We were all sitting watching TV one night when we first heard a crash in the dining room next to our living room. My mom went in to investigate. 
The picture was off the wall and sitting up against the wall on the floor. No broken glass, no nail missing from the wall. It was as if someone just took it off the wall and placed it on the floor. But that doesn't explain the loud crash that we all heard. We also had a wooden spoon, fork, and knife set that hung on the wall in the same room that liked to fall or go flying across the room. The older my sisters and brothers got, the more we realized this house wasn't your normal house. In normal houses, things don't go bump in the night. Strange voices don't call your name when you are home alone. Items don't disappear to be found years later on top of a shelf at eye level. Gusts of cold wind don't blow so hard that it makes your hair fly off your shoulders and it smells of an odor of your grandfather that passed away before moving into the house. Or footsteps that come up the stairs and right before it gets to where you can see the person, they stop. I remember I was always afraid of my grandmother's room because I had so many sisters and brothers we had to share rooms. So when my brother came from college and got my room, I had to sleep on the floor of my grandma's room. I couldn't fall asleep because of the presence of a tall, thin man standing over my bed but looking at me. I couldn't actually see him, but I saw a shadow of him. I got the feeling he didn't like children because when I got to the age of about 11, I never saw him again. But I think there were also ghosts of children because once, when my twin and I were 13 and my older sister 15, we were out at a family party. My older brother was getting ready for a date when he looked into the mirror, which reflected off a mirror behind him so you could see into our grandma's room. And he saw what looked like a little girl, about 10 or 12, sitting on the bed. He said he thought it was me because I look younger than what I am and came into the room to ask why I hadn't left yet and nobody was there. He said she looked just like me. I really don't know if it's in our DNA or what, but almost every house and I that my sisters and brothers live in is haunted. I get the feeling that our original ghosts have followed us. When we moved into the next home, but one after my grandma's, but the next one, I never actually saw anything, but my little brother who wasn't born until I was 15 says he saw something. I was about 19 and he about 5. He would refuse to go to the bathroom alone, said he wouldn't go into the hallway because the little girl sitting on the floor, crying, scared him. I thought he was making it up, but I could hear him talking to someone in the hallway sometimes, and I asked him who he was talking to, and he would say, the little girl who cries all the time, but nobody in the house could see her or hear her. When I was 18, my grandma, same grandma whose house is haunted, came to stay with us for a couple of months because her health wasn't too good. Anyway, I started hearing what sounded like footsteps, more like stomping, coming from upstairs. I thought I was imagining it until Grandma looks up at me and says, who's up there stomping around? Mind you, I was the only one upstairs usually. The upstairs was one bedroom. After this house, my twin sister moved away and got married and I went off to college. My older sister is living with her boyfriend. My older brother is living with his girlfriend and their baby girl. My oldest brother is living in an apartment and my youngest brother is living with my mom and my stepfather in Indiana now. We are scattered across the United States from Indiana to Texas to Pennsylvania and to New York. All of our houses are haunted and I know because I've been to each one. First I will start with my occurrence. When I went to college, I went to a cheap college and lived on campus so I wouldn't be home with it. That didn't work because when I had a friend over to watch a movie with me, we were sitting on a bunk bed they provide for us and the window behind us decided it wanted to be open all the way up and slam back down. The window was closed and locked. Then sometime later, I was sleeping on the top bunk and my roomie was on the bottom. I had my hand hanging over the side like I usually do, and I felt someone tug on my hand, hard enough to jar me from my sleep and almost slide me off the edge. I said, hey, stop it, thinking it was my roomie under me being childish, until I heard a giggle that could only come from a little girl. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and the next day, I moved out to a townhouse all the way across campus. 
but I guess the ghost wasn't alone. She or even he liked to go room to room, waking up girls and keeping them up all night, pulling their hair, turning the TVs on. I heard about it the next morning in the cafeteria at breakfast. Now I'm getting married to my college sweetheart, and once again, I get the feeling that I'm not alone. Door handles turn on their own. I keep seeing a shadow of a person in the hallway. My twin sister had her ghost tug on her earring while in her car. Toilet's flush. It sounds funny, but it's true. Smells of perfume. Her two-year-old who is looking up at something that isn't there and smiling. Or her waking up and trying to say someone jumbled up about a lady. My mom's house in Indiana is most uncomfortable. My little brother, who is now almost seven, new room, has his own computer in it. I was lying on the bed with him one night, trying to get him to go to sleep. He kept saying he didn't like the new computer and to take it out of the room, when all of a sudden, the keyboard started typing away on its own. He and I bolted from the room. The computer is now in the basement. It still likes to do that tapping crap, but at least it isn't in his room with them. As far as seeing anything, none of us in our new house has seen anything, but the odors, footsteps, things disappearing, and voices haven't left any of us. The only thing that I can think of was our uncle had been sick, and Mike, my older brother, was sitting in the living room of his house sleeping. Woke up to three balls of light coming from the ceiling forward downward until it came next to him and disappeared. His girlfriend, who is psychic, I know this all sounds strange, said that it was the spirit of our uncle coming to tell him he was safe and had passed on to the other side safe. The next morning, we got a call from the hospital saying my uncle passed on. That isn't it. I don't know if this has to do with my mom's haunting, but a blackbird got into her sunroom. No doors or windows even open. It just sat there staring at her. Didn't fly or anything. Just was there. Didn't know how it even got there, but it was there all day long. That night, a close friend of the family died. Wasn't sick, just had a heartache at a young age and died. My mom thought the blackbird was an omen and went to go see if it was still there and it was gone. Same sort of thing happened to my aunt and uncle. A bird came into the house. They didn't know how. It wouldn't leave. And then just disappeared when something bad happened to their son. I don't know what the connection is. I've just moved into my new home on October 30th, 2005. And I am renting it. The night before, I was here painting one of the upstairs bedrooms. Around 10 p.m. I distinctly heard my patio door open in the dining room at the bottom of the steps and footsteps creaking the steps up to where I was painting. No one entered the room I was painting. I thought it was my boyfriend, but he didn't answer when I called his name. A minute later, my boyfriend called my cell phone from his house and I thought it was nuts for even thinking so dumb. Now a month later, we have several other occurrences that have been taking place. My daughter felt and heard a whisper in her ear as she bent down to the empty dryer in the laundry room. Her bedroom lights go on and off often. Our wiener dog will not enter the room. If she puts her head in there, she scratches to get out after a few seconds. We hear two men's voices having a conversation in the living room and there are no other radios or TVs on in the whole house. I like it quiet when I am home. The kids hear banging in the night in their rooms with the huge closets that they have. We hear what sounds like heavy items hitting the basement floor all the time, and there's nothing there when we run to look. There are many cold spots in the house. Just last night, December 7th, at 3.20 a.m., I got up to go to the bathroom at my usual 3 a.m. waking, for no reason at all, each night, and the bathroom door was not closed all the way. Since it was 3.20 a.m., I did not fear anyone would be coming in on me. Just then, the door started to pull open, and I yelled, I'm in here, and the door closed and shut all the way. I looked at my bedroom door, just adjacent to my bathroom door, and my boyfriend was snoring away peacefully, and I awoke him and asked him if he was at the door, and he was angry at me for waking him with such a stupid question. I then went upstairs to my children's room, 
and found them both sleeping peacefully soundly. This afternoon, my landlord called me about a cable installation problem and I asked her if my house was haunted. She hesitated what felt like an eternity and then she finally answered. It's the man across the street. He watched over my girls. He hung out in my youngest daughter's room. That's why they slept together in my oldest girl's room. Her baby is two and her oldest is four. She said they weren't scared of him. He was friendly. She couldn't remember his name, but that he killed himself in the house across the street years ago. And I should go ask her grandfather-in-law that works next door what his name was. I asked him and found it to be Russell Lutz and he shot himself in his basement as he was dying from cancer 25 years ago. She said to talk to him by name and that they did. She was surprised I hadn't called her earlier about it, so she figured we weren't bothered by him. She has not awoke at 3 a.m. since she moved out of here, and the girls have not been visited by Russell Lutz yet. We are not afraid of him at all, and talk to him out loud all the time. The kids ask him to turn on things, and he doesn't. Ha! Huh. My kids are 14 and 16, and think it's awesome we have a haunted house. Last night, my son and I went next door to work on an Xmas tree and wreaths they sell, and a path was shoveled from their door to my door with a shovel. It wasn't there when we just drove in the driveway from religious class and stepped in the house to get gloves and stepped back out to walk 160 feet to their door. Weird. Throughout my life, I've encountered many ghosts. Good thing the ghosts never bother me. They walk away as if I was not there, but I clearly see them as clear and as clean as a window. Anyways, 1995 in Glendale, Arizona, we just moved into a house located near the downtown Glendale area. This area was a mess at the time, and in the middle of the housing area is a small cemetery. In my opinion, it should not be there and should be moved for crying out loud it's a residence area, but all around Glendale, especially West Glendale, lies many scattered cemeteries. Anyways, back to my experience. One night I was home alone. Family went to California for a vacation and left during the afternoon. Everything was fine till night came. When night came, all hell broke loose. As usual, I would take a bath before I head to bed, and while I was bathing, I swore something walked through the door and started screaming. I got so scared, I popped out of the tub. My heart was racing. I felt so cold. I felt like time had frozen. My head was spinning, and the only thing I could think of was what the heck was that? When I was having my panic attack, the ghost, the thing, the whatever it was, backed up and passed the door. It was not screaming, but it said sorry. Anyways. I hurried and washed the remaining soap and shampoo off me and headed out looking around the house for the thing. At this time, I was not as scared because I got my iron rod. I don't know why this rod always made me feel safe. This rod is sacred to me. I call it my demon rod. Anyways, I searched the house. Nothing was found. I headed for bed and hope morning came fast. I made it through the night and did not experience anything else. The thing at the time I saw, it didn't look like human. It didn't look like no animal, nor did it come close to looking anything like from this planet. I did, however, suspect it was a ghost. Of what, I don't know exactly. But this was not the last of it, for I seen it many more times after this, and it always was around when my rod was not with me. I submitted a story to you prior to this one, a couple of years ago. I've had some recent occurrences that I would like to share with you, if that's okay. Here is my story. In the fall of 2001, my best friend Harley was killed in a tragic car accident, and I took his death very hard. When he first died, I felt that he was always around. When I was living in England, my dorm room would smell like his aftershave, and I continued to sense he was around, and occasionally, he would come to me in a dream, but lately, things have been quiet until recently. A couple of months ago, I had a dream with Harley in it. We were sitting around a picnic table 
and he just looked as healthy and happy as if he were alive. He told me to quit worrying about everything, and I would be alright. He would never stop taking care of me. And then this past Thanksgiving, I was driving to my boyfriend's house, and as I'm going along on the highway, I got this strange feeling like the car in the next lane was going to cut me off. So I backed off the car in front of me, and wouldn't you know it, that car cut in front of me with no warning at all. Now how did I know that the car was going to do that before he even did it? Some people tell me it was my friend looking out for me since his accident occurred on Thanksgiving. I know they are not big, spooky stories, but they make me believe that we do not die after death and that we can still communicate with our loved ones here on Earth. Thanks for listening. This is a true story. No one believes me, but I know what I saw and the following is an accurate accounting of that one summer night. In the summer of 1973, my baby was around 18 months old. We lived in an older wood-framed house in the South Texas coastal area. We had lived there since early 1972. We didn't have central air conditioning, and the only room that had an air conditioner was the den. At night, we, my husband, Two daughters and myself slept in the den. My husband and I slept on a full-size mattress on the floor. My daughters each had a foam cushion for a bed, which also was on the floor. There were two doors to the den. One door led to the outside, the other led to the hallway, and the front part of our house. Both doors were solid. There were two sliding windows with line curtains. At night, with the lights out, doors closed, and drapes pulled, the den was as dark as a cave. So dark, in fact, that you could not see your hand in front of your face. On this particularly hot, humid South Texas night, I woke up to the sound of my youngest daughter crying. I rolled off my mattress and crawled on hands and knees towards her foam pad to comfort her. Before I reached her pad, I saw her in the middle of the room. As I crawled towards her, she rolled away from me. It wasn't until I reached her sleeping pad that she stopped rolling away and sat up. At the same moment that she sat up, I touched her. She was asleep on her pad. What I had thought was her rolling away from me had disappeared. This is my story and I'm 100% sticking to it. Remember when I said the room at night was as dark as a cave? I decided what I saw was energy. I mean, it had to be. Why else could I see it? As far as I could find out, there were no deaths of a very young child. I really thought I'd seen a ghost. When I laid back down, my heart was pounding. There is no way I could have dreamed it. I've explained what happened to myself in the following manner. My baby was only around 18 months old. She wasn't old enough to know how to control her mind, and therefore, part of her mind, the part that older humans shut off, was able to send energy out in what could be called an out-of-body experience. I know this sounds crazy. If you have a better explanation, I would love to hear it. I know I saw something that I thought was my baby. I know when I touched my baby and disturbed her sleep, what I saw disappeared. I know I did not dream this. Last March, my husband, myself, our two daughters, 13 and 17, and toddler son, moved into a beautiful three-bedroom condo. We were so excited to have gotten such a huge place for such a good price. Looking back, I am so glad we rented and opted out of buying it. Event 1. My three-year-old son was afraid to enter the kitchen. He told us there was a man or thing under the kitchen table. Never saw him look so frightened. Event number 2. I was in my walk-in closet, kneeling on the ground, arranging shoes, when I felt something hit my back. I thought my toddler had run into me. I turned to see what was wrong 
and no one was there. Very creepy feeling. Event number three. My oldest daughter tells me that she has been seeing a black shape moving in the darkness of her room in the middle of the night and sounds in the closet. She says she just ignores it and it goes away. I'm scared for her. My husband either doesn't sense anything creepy or won't admit to it. But in event number four, my oldest hears something scathing at her window. She opens the curtains and sees a huge crow hovering at her window, scratching on the window. Two nights later, my 14-year-old daughter runs into her room because the bird is at her window. A few nights later, I hear scratching at my bedroom window. I feel watched. I don't get up to check. Notice a presence near the long, dark hallway. I find myself anxious to get past that area of the house. I feel a sickly evil presence, like something that enjoys seeing us suffer. During the three months we lived there, we had the worst of luck. I lost my job. Our car got towed away, then broke down for good. Our PG skyrocketed from a normal bill of $75 a month to $600. We never used more electricity. We became sickly and irritable. We couldn't afford to stay. We couldn't afford to move. So we packed up and moved into my mother's house. As the days passed, our luck changed for the better and the black cloud of despair lifted. We look back now and feel that whatever is in the house drains everything good and is evil. I researched the history of the tenants and found no one lasts long living there, and bad luck has happened to all live there. That's as far as I will go. I'm afraid to look any further. I don't want to know. While I've never actually seen a ghost, something very strange occurred a few years ago that I cannot even explain. My then four-year-old daughter, Savannah, was on the third floor playing on the computer and printing pictures. I had gone upstairs to call her down for lunch, and she started calling her father to show him her artwork. Daddy, Daddy, she called. I had to remind her that Daddy was working and not at home, as was the norm, but she insisted he was here. After a few rounds of, honey, listen, he's at work. She asked me, then who is that man? My daughter was not prone to imaginary friends, and I asked her, what man? Savannah replied, who was that man at the bottom of the stairs? Again, I protested that there was not a man, but she insisted. I asked her, what was the man doing? She replied, I was watching him, and he was watching the bathroom. When I asked her what happened to the man, because I certainly didn't see him, she replied, he disappeared. At that point, I was thoroughly spooked, but I let the issue drop. She had no idea of ghosts and wasn't afraid of the dark. The last thing I certainly didn't want to do is put any ideas into her head. Nothing more was said, but a few days later, out of the blue, my daughter asked, Mommy, what happens if the man comes back? I told her she should come call me if she saw him again because he doesn't belong here. Fortunately, she never saw him after that. About six months later, my five-year-old niece slept over and told me the next day about a nightmare she had. She had a dream that she saw a young man in my daughter's doorway. When I asked her what happened to the man, her reply was the same. He disappeared. She had a dream that she saw a young man in my daughter's doorway. When I asked her what happened to the man, her reply was the same. He disappeared. If this is a ghost, he's a very quiet ghost because nothing out of the ordinary had happened, but I believe the children. If they say they saw something, then they saw something, something I can't explain. few years back, 
My stepmother was dating a man, other than my father. This man had a friend that needed them to house it while they went on vacation for a couple of days. The family that lived in the house consisted of two parents and a six-year-old daughter. All the bedrooms and bathrooms were upstairs, and the kitchen, living room, and the den were downstairs. When my mother walked into the house, she immediately had an overwhelming urge to leave the house. She felt uneasy and uncomfortable. She was sick at the time, so she thought that her feelings might have been off. Her boyfriend decided to run her a bath. When he came back down, his face was flushed. She asked him what was wrong, and he replied, Nothing at all, darling. You go get in your bath. So she went up and took her bath. The whole time she was upstairs, she couldn't help but feel like something was with her. When she was done, she walked downstairs and sat with her boyfriend. She told him how she was feeling and said that she wasn't sure if she was able to spend the night. When he heard this, he replied to her, Honey, when I went upstairs to run your bath, as I closed the bathroom door, which if you open the door, it blocked the bathroom doorway. After getting you a towel, there was a deep black shadow lingering in your daughter's bedroom doorway, which was across the bathroom doorway. It didn't have a specific shape, but it had specific red eyes that glowed ever so bright. All I could say was, you don't scare me. The power of the Lord protects me. Over and over I said this. After about the sixth time of saying this, it turned into the girl's bedroom and lurched across the floor into the closet. The door was shut. My mom was so scared that she left the house immediately. Later she got upset because he let her go upstairs after what he had seen. This is a pretty long one. I was around nine years old when this happened. When my brother was born, we turned our garage into a toy room for him. It has a pull-out pouch in it, so when I had friends over, we would sleep there. I had a friend over one day, and we were watching TV in the garage while laying in the pull-out couch. We were getting so tired, so I turned off the TV. I closed my eyes again but felt a weird chill pass over my body. I opened my eyes and looked back at the TV. I saw a lady sitting on top of it. She had brown hair pulled back into a really fancy bun and a really nice pink dress on. She just sat there looking at me for a while. Then she disappeared. At the moment, I was extremely tired, so I didn't think much of it. But then in the morning I woke up and remembered what happened. My friend thought it was a dream, but I know it wasn't. I have another experience with the same lady. I had a different friend over this time, and this was when we were older, so we didn't sleep in the garage anymore. I still have a fridge in there though. So my friend and I went in there to get a soda from the fridge at about nine at night. We opened the door, and there was the same lady sitting on the same TV. My friend and I both saw her, so I know it wasn't a dream. We flipped the light on and looked back at the TV. She was gone. After this, I got kind of scared. My friend and I got soda and got the hell out of there. After that, I didn't see the lady for a while. But then about a year later, I was sick with a fever and a sore throat, and I was in my parents' bed, just laying there. They have a TV hanging from the wall. My parents were out at a dinner for my aunt's birthday, so I was home alone with my brother, who my parents had put to bed before they left. It must have been around 9.30 this time. I was just drifting off to sleep when I, for some strange reason, looked at the TV. I saw the same lady sitting on the corner of it. I was pretty delirious from the fever, so I ignored her and went to sleep. I woke up the next morning and was in my own bed. My parents had put me there when they got home. I remembered what happened and told my parents. Of course, they didn't believe me. 
They said I was sick, and that it was my imagination. After this, I realized that it all happened at night, when I was in a dark room, and by a TV. The only witness I have is my friend, who is still scared of my garage at night. My house is haunted. The only thing that might relate to it is that my grandma died in my house, but she doesn't look like her, and it doesn't explain why I always see her at night and buy a TV. I'm just glad that the ghost isn't violent. When I was about four or five, my mom's husband moved us to Pueblo, Colorado. We moved into what I guess was an apartment building, but to me, it looked like a giant house. I think it was really old. My memory of what the outside of the house looked like is kind of blurry. It seemed like it was two or three stories with a Victorian kind of build. At the same time, it looked Adobe style too, like the walls were made out of clay. Her apartment was in the lower right corner if you were facing the house. We had a one level apartment in part of the basement down below. You could tell whoever owned the place tried making the basement into a room. It was completely concrete, but they had carpeted part of it and painted the concrete walls white. The other half of the room was the laundry area. On the side of the room that was carpeted, there was a giant hole in the wall. It was perfectly square and purposely put there. It ran the entire length of the wall, except for one side. That ended at the stairway. It was about three feet off the ground, and I'm guessing maybe a foot from the ceiling. To this day, I have no idea what the purpose of that hole could have been. The moment I saw that hole, which was when the realtor lady was showing us the apartment, I was scared to death of that hole. I didn't know why. I just hated it. It was so dark inside that you couldn't tell where it ended. As it turned out, this basement room ended up being my room because it had the most space for all my toys and belongings. I hated it there. Every night I was frightened stiff. I would just lay there and try not to make the slightest move until I fell asleep. It was like I didn't want to get anyone's attention even though I was the only one in the room. I'm not sure how long we lived in the house, but I would guess about a year. Nothing happened for the first few months, and I was starting to relax more in my room, though I still never stepped foot anywhere near that hole. I remember watching my mom hang clothes up to dry in front of that hole, and thinking how brave she must be. And then one night, when I was sleeping, I felt someone pull my hair. It wasn't just a little couple hairs getting caught under my head either. It was like someone grabbed a good lock and yanked it on very fast and very hard. It hurt quite a bit and it jerked me awake. I automatically looked up towards the hole in the wall and I saw from the back what appeared to be a very tall, very wide man. He was wearing a big black coat that looked old fashioned. I'm not a fashion or history expert, but I would guess it was 40 style. This is kind of silly. But when I look back at the image of him I still have in my head, his coat kind of reminded me of Dick Tracy's style. That's the only example I can think of. He walked very slow and swayed from side to side, and as he did so, he walked straight into that hole. I immediately ran upstairs for my mom, but she worked graveyards at Dunkin' Donuts and wasn't home. It was just her jerk husband, and I didn't like him. So I went to lay on the couch in the living room, but before I got there, I got this feeling that I should stay away from the couch in the living room in general. So instead, I went and laid on the floor in front of my mom's bedroom door. I think I might have dozed off, I'm not sure, but eventually, I got really cold. I decided to be brave and sit on the very edge of the couch closest to the kitchen, which is where I was. My mom's bedroom was on the opposite side of the kitchen, across from the living room. The couch had a blanket on it that I wanted to cover up with. As soon as I sat on the edge of the couch, the man appeared again. He walked through the door, literally right through it, 
and was moving slowly towards me. He wore the big black coat and had a long, bushy, dark brown beard that covered almost all of his face. The hair on his head was shaggy and dark brown as well, and he may have been wearing some kind of cap. He had his arms stretched down and was pointing at me. He was either moaning or I just couldn't understand what he was saying, but it seemed more like he was trying to make words, but simply couldn't. I slowly tried to grab the blanket off the couch, but it seemed like he started moving quicker when I did this. So I left the blanket there and ran to my mom's room. I laid down again on the floor in front of my mom's bedroom door and eventually I fell asleep because the next thing I knew, my mom had come home. I told my mom everything that had happened. Unfortunately, when I described the man, I compared the way he looked like to Chewbacca from the Star Wars movies. It was because he was so hairy. As a child, that was the only way I knew how to best describe him. Of course, my mom dismissed me immediately and told me I just had bad dreams because of that movie. It seems like more happened in the house, but I don't remember anything else. I kind of think I might have blocked some things out because it scared me so much. As I said, we didn't live there long anyway, so my mother and I never spoke about the house until I was 12. I started telling my mom all kinds of memories I had from when I was very young and I ended up telling her what happened that night with greater detail. She said that she remembered that night too and that she had believed me but didn't want to scare me anymore than I already was so she said it was nightmares. She said that quite a few strange things happened to her also and that she had tried to tell her husband but he didn't believe her. While none of my experiences were all that intense, there are several things that I have seen and heard that are more than real. I was born in a tiny town not far outside of the New York border. The town grew up as a railroad mining town. Our house was built at the edge of town, the owner liking his privacy. While everyone in town took him to be a bachelor that spent most of his time at the rail yards, it became apparent when the old man died that he did have a son. The son moved in and raised a family there, also working in the rail yard. The family produced two sons. Thin types of the family were found in my bedroom closet wall when we remodeled. After this lineage, a daughter and son were born to one son, and the other died. It was this son's daughter that greeted me not long after we moved into the house. It didn't help that she had died almost 30 years before I was born. Through the back door, across the old linoleum floor to the staircase in the room at the top, I lay snug in my little bed. I'd been playing earlier that day, and had left an old music box, found in the room when we moved in, open on my dresser. My parents were downstairs enjoying their television when they heard me scream. I had rolled over, disturbed by something in my sleep that I couldn't quite explain, and sat up. My music box, completely unwound when I'd gone to bed, was playing cheerily. But it wasn't that that had woken me up. It was the figure of a girl standing next to my bed, gazing at my bedroom window into the backyard. My first thoughts were that she was lovely, long blonde hair and a pale blue dress, hands clasped behind her with a slightly sad air about her. It changed quickly, though, when she turned to look at me and instead of disappearing, advanced on me, hands outstretched, her face changing from benevolent to cruel in a heartbeat. My mother sprinted up the stairs with more energy than I've seen in her since, driving her away. But it would not be the last time I would see her, though after that, each visit was absolutely benevolent. A few years later, we, the family and I, began remodeling the house, tearing out walls and finding pieces of the house we had not counted on. Anyone who's ever remodeled a house knows the strange things that can be found in the walls. Between the gross of finding a mouse corpse in one of my walls to finding the remains of a burnt-out old chimney on another, we also found a death certificate. One for Elizabeth Grimney 
born July 17th, 1940, died March 22nd, 1952. The cause of death was so blurred with time and so undeterminable, but we finally had our ghost, Elizabeth. We've realized, too, that my music box was hers, too, tied to it, somehow. Since the remodeling, though, I've not seen her. And I have the sinking feeling that I won't again. Strange. I feel as though I've lost a friend. My haunted place was in Phoenix, Arizona. My mother, sister, and I, and our family dog Snoopy, and the parakeet Albert lived in a condominium. We lived there from 1971 to 1974. I mention the pets as some of the most horrifying things happened to these animals. Here were some of the events which occurred. My dog Snoopy would always be locked in the closet in the master bedroom. I would leave for somewhere, my mother and sister would be gone. I would know instinctively as the house was quiet, too quiet. I would go upstairs and open the closet door, and out he would fly like a bat out of hell. I awoke one morning to find my parakeet, Albert, hanging by one foot on his perch. His head was in a grotesque position, like he had been strangled. I had to put him down. Weeks later, I heard voices outside the window. The voice of a doll, Chatty Cathy. I believe a doll like that was made by Mattel. The voices sounded like the doll, Chatty Cathy. Why, Mary, why did you leave me? I remember that night as I almost put my head through the window, straining to hear what the doll-like voice was saying to me. I visited a psychiatrist the next day. She said voices heard like that were a sign of schizophrenia. I didn't believe it. After moving out here to California, I have never heard voices. I heard them that night. Another night, I remember hearing the lolling sound of wind chimes. I yelled out to my mother, and told her how relaxing the sound of the chimes was. She said, Mary, we don't have wind chimes. Another night, the wrought iron stairwell lunged out and caught my mother's arm, left a permanent X on it, scratched her arm. The stairwell, other incidents happened. Black bubbling tar-like substances in the toilet, a smell like a dead animal in the walls. My sister at the time was in high school. I have heard that poltergeists sometimes occur with teenage girls. Anyway, I believe the site was haunted. The building contractor went bankrupt and those of us in condos were in limbo for a while. One by one, the few families left. I once went back there to investigate the new residents. I went across the street and a 1989 black firebird came out of nowhere and almost ran me down. I decided the site itself was haunted and the ghostly inhabitants didn't want me around, asking questions of the current residents. I was just reading A Sea of Voices in the Night by Ant 1111. You know, that story brings back a memory of something that happened when I was around 16 years old. We were house-sitting for a friend of my dad's. They had been family friends all my life and seemed like family. His friend's mom had passed away not long prior to this, and I don't know where he was, but anywho, I spent the night there several times before. I just finished watching The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and had laid down. I'd only shut my eyes for a minute or two. The window was open beside the bed I was in, and the back door was around the corner from the head of the bed. I heard voices, like maybe four or five people were coming from the barn to the house. Then I heard footsteps, and the back door open. Now, I know no one else but us should have been around there. And these voices sounded like it was the most natural thing in the world to be coming in the house at that time of night. I was scared shitless. All I could think was, you moron, why did you leave the back door open? I found I could not move or open my eyes. I knew I was scared, but even at the time I thought surely I wasn't scared to the point of paralysis. The word aliens came to mind, but aliens who spoke perfect English, it didn't make sense. I heard the group walk up to the side of my bed and stand over me talking in hushed tones, like they didn't want to wake up anyone else. I could tell they were right over me, looking down at me. I went through the I have 
to be dreaming reasoning, because I thought for sure I was on the verge of panic if something sensible didn't come to mind. But I knew I couldn't have fallen asleep in the approximately sixty seconds or less I had laid down when I started hearing them coming from the direction of the barn. I understood everything that they were saying, and it had something to do with things that would happen to me in the future. I found this even more disturbing. Were they angels, demons, ghosts, aliens? How did they know me so intently, and what was the purpose of this? The next thing I knew, I woke up, and it was about 1 a.m. or so, and I was laying in the living room. No pillow or blanket, just sprawled out on the living room floor with the lights and TV off, though I knew I didn't fall asleep watching TV. I asked the next morning if someone got up and turned everything off. No one had. I've never sleepwalked, and I wasn't overly tired or distraught about anything, nor could I recall what they had talked about when I awoke. I just knew it had concerned me and my future. I found it very disturbing for a while, and I can't believe I forgot about it until reading that story. I've read a lot of the stories here, and noticed that a lot of folks say this, I'm not sure if I saw a ghost, but here's my story. As a child of about five or six, maybe, I was the only boy and had my own room. My two sisters had the room straight across the hallway from me. Now, this was about 1976 or 1977. We had gas heat through the entire house, so at night my dad would turn off all the heat. As a child in Georgia, we used to have cold winters, so the house would be very cold at night. I felt a cool breeze blow over my face, and I woke up. I saw a teenage girl standing in my doorway, blonde hair and wearing a long white gown. I thought it was my older sister, so I called out to her and said, Ain't you cold? Well, you can guess she didn't answer me. I called out again, and she just stood there watching me. Well, I quickly covered my head, and when I peeked out again, she was gone. And of course, when I ran across the hall, she was in bed, sound asleep. There were several things that happened in that old house. See someone run across the porch, and no one was ever there. Our bathroom had a hook to lock the door. One day, my middle sister and I were home alone, and the door was shut and locked. Okay, someone shut it, and the hook fell and locked. Not a chance. Ten minutes later, the door was unlocked and opened right up. I really don't know if I believe in ghosts or not, but I know what happened in that house. Feel free to write me, anytime. Around 1986, my family and I moved into a home in a city called Venita. It used to house two residences. The upstairs had its own kitchen, bath, and bedrooms, and the downstairs could house a bigger family. The side door that led out into the driveway was where I first saw a little old lady. We had such crazy paranormal episodes there that it never made any sense. My brother had made a remark about a cat that she used to own there, Two hours later, a similar cat appeared with the exact same markings as a cat she had owned 13 years earlier, which of course fascinated me. Banging could also be heard from under the house that raised furniture off the floor. I never even entered the garage due to the bad vibes I would get there. After a few months of noises and mischief, we decided to move. About two weeks later, we drove back past the old house, and as I looked up into what used to be my room... There she was. It was the little old lady looking and staring right down at me. There was never an indication of an old lady who lived there. Not one that was alive at the time. Later, the side of the house burnt in both places where I had seen her. If we had stayed, me and my sister would have been trapped in the upstairs and more than likely would have perished. My husband and I lived in White Eagle, Oklahoma, about a year and a half ago with our four children. One morning, about 4.30, I was feeding my four-month-old son in my front room when I saw a shadow cross the window. It stood about seven or eight feet tall and had the shape of a man. I couldn't see what it was exactly because my blinds were closed, but it walked in front of the window and stopped as if to look in the front room 
and then continued to walk around the east side of the house where my bedroom was. Our bedroom was right off of the front room. It stopped in the middle of my bedroom window, and turned its whole body to face my bedroom and then turned around and walked off. The next morning, I walked around my house and saw no footprints. I've been told by my community members that Bigfoot is known to walk around by White Eagle, and that was what I saw. A couple weeks after that happened, my husband and I had just gotten into bed, and we heard a banging on our side of the wall from the outside. My husband thought it was the children playing a joke on us, and he went outside to chase them off, but found nothing. He came back in and got in bed again when we heard something hit our front door. I told him to just leave whatever was outside alone. I lived in Ponca City my whole life, and was raised knowing about Bigfoot. I do believe he walks around White Eagle, and that was what I saw that night. At night you can be outside and all of a sudden smell something really stink. I was always told when you smell that it was Bigfoot. White Eagle as a community is haunted. I've heard so many stories about what people have seen or heard. Thanks for taking the time to listen to one of my stories. Many years ago, I lived in an old farmhouse. It was pretty big, and I was newly married. We would have friends stay periodically as they needed to. We had many things happen. The one bedroom always had flies in the window. I would spray vacuum and scrub the windows. The next day, the room was always full of flies. My best friend and her husband needed a place to stay for a while, and I let them choose the room they wanted. They chose the room of flies. This one night she was sleeping and felt someone pushing her to roll over. She thought her husband had gotten up in the middle of the night and was coming back to bed. When she rolled over, she fell against her husband. She looked to see who pushed her, and although no one was there, she felt the pressure of someone lying against her. She tried to wake her husband. But he would not wake up. She was so scared. She stayed awake the rest of the night until morning and was too afraid to look and see what was next to her. Finally, when daylight hit, she felt the pressure leave and noticed the indentation of a body left behind on the bed. They never slept in that room again. We also had dogs that would not go upstairs or downstairs. I was doing dishes in the kitchen and the upstairs stairwell was behind me. All of a sudden, my dog perked up and his hair stood on its back. He started to growl as if he was looking towards the doorway and suddenly bolted for the living room. He would not come into the kitchen after that unless I was with him. My dogs would also stand at the doorway to the basement and would have their hair raised on their backs. I was always scared to go down there. I would get a really bad feeling where I would run down and back up. I would try and get one of my dogs to go with me, even in daylight, and they would not go further than the doorway. We would also hear someone walking through the home, but nobody would be there. The one spirit would be talking, and we would look for the voice, and couldn't even find it. Sometimes it would call out our names, and we would think it was each other and answer, and find out it wasn't anyone calling. We slept in a downstairs bedroom, and I would have a sense of a man standing at the foot of our bed, watching us as we go to sleep. Our dogs even went to sleep with us, and wouldn't even sleep at the foot of the bed. After many strange activities, our neighbor told us that an elderly man had lived alone in the house for a long time. His mail had been piling up in his mailbox, so the mailman contacted the police to have them check on the old guy. He was found dead on the kitchen floor, and had been for quite a while. The funny thing is, the kitchen was never spooky feeling. My name is Amy, 
and I want to share something that happened to my family about nine years ago. I have some free time on my hands, so I thought I might as well. As I said, about nine years ago, my husband and I and our four children, ages 12, 11, 9, and 5, moved into the small four-bedroom home. From the day we moved in, we knew that there was something about this home. It wasn't really a bad feeling, but something different. The feeling was almost welcome, like we were meant to be there. We were happy to be there. It was a comfortable house for people who were used to living in apartments. We had bedrooms, a living room, bathroom, and a kitchen on the first floor, and a bedroom with a bathroom and a small porch, plus a larger room with a smaller room off to the left on the second floor. At one time, the house had two apartments. The upstairs had one bedroom with a bathroom, a living room, and a small kitchen off to the left. The first floor had two bedrooms and a bathroom, living room, and kitchen with the access to a basement. At the time we found this house, it seemed like almost a godsend since we were being evicted because we had acquired a dog. And this house had a nice sized yard, and the landlord didn't mind pets. Well, soon after we moved in, strange things started to happen. Well, since I was a stay-at-home mom most of the time due to being the parent of an ADHD child, I was the one to experience most of the phenomena. You see, while my husband was at work and the kids at school, I would hear light footsteps downstairs. But for anyone who has lived in apartments, your first thought is it's the neighbors, until you come to the realization that you are now living in a home, and there is no way you're going to hear the neighbor. It's a single family home for crying out loud. But I put it out of my mind, telling myself that I was so used to hearing the patter of small feet that I could still hear it when no one is at home. We had minor things happen like the footsteps when there was only one person home, things disappearing and turning up, somewhere you knew it shouldn't be, sightings by a friend who had never been to our house, and finally, the sound of a small die-cast toy car falling down the stairs and hitting the back door. For anyone who has small boys, you know what a hot wheel sounds like when it is hit by a surface because you've heard it before. Anyway, this is what my husband and I heard on a nightly basis. One day, about eight months of living there, a friend of my husband brought over a new girlfriend for us to meet. As far as we were concerned, nothing out of the ordinary happened that day until Jimmy, my husband's friend, brought by his girlfriend, China. At this point, I should explain a few things. The bedroom with the bathroom belonged to my husband and I. The large room that used to be a living room, because our computer room, and the little room off to the left, became our daughter's room. Secondly, we did not allow our kids to have friends over, due to things disappearing whenever certain friends come over. Well, the next time the girlfriend came over, she asked us how many kids we had. And I told her three boys and one girl. Then she asked us who the little boy downstairs had been. And I asked her what little boy. She said the last time she had visited us, there had been a little boy in diapers playing Nintendo 64 with my kids. And I told her politely, there was no other child but mine in the home. She insisted that I saw another little boy in diapers today. And the last time I came playing Nintendo 64 with your kids, I told her she was mistaken, as my kids were not allowed to have friends over. Well, of course, she dropped it after that. But to this day, she still swears she sees little boy in diapers in her house. At other times when I was alone at home, I would hear someone knocking on my bedroom door, and I would automatically ask what and realized there was no one home but me when I received no answer. This happened to me a lot. 
At times, I would hear someone playing in the boys' rooms downstairs. When the kids were at school, about one year after we moved in, my oldest and I took newspaper routes. About four months after we started our paper routes, I was rolling newspapers before delivering them. When the front page caught my eye, the picture on the front page looked like my house. But there were no toddler toys on the lawn, and I had no toddlers at the time. So I read it and found out that exactly one year before we moved in, a little boy of about one years of age had died in the home. It seems that Miles had been living there with his foster mother, her father, and her children. One day the foster mother went out and left her father to watch little Miles. While she was out, her father, in a fit of rage, hit Miles while the little boy was at the top step on the second floor, which by the way happened to be near my bedroom door. The little boy lost his balance upon being struck and fell down the stairs and broke his neck. As I read this, little things began to fall into place, and I realized that maybe Miles was still there. The last thing to happen there was about three months before we moved out. It was late, and my husband and I were still talking and watching TV, when again, we heard the little car falling down the steps and hit the back door. I knew my kids were sleeping because that was the only sound in an otherwise silent home. So I jokingly said, all right, Miles, it is late and it's bedtime for little kids and even little ghosts. What I heard next chilled me to the bone and freaked me out so bad, I was almost in tears. As soon as I said that, I heard a little tiny giggle, which my husband also heard, and I probably said, do whatever you want. As I said before, up to this point, we thought we were imagining everything that was happening there and never wanted to believe that we had a ghostly tenant. The strange thing is, we were never scared while we lived there. The feeling there was we were home, and this is where we were meant to live. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our control, we had to move. Otherwise, we would still be living there. It was the most comfortable place I'd ever lived in, and I loved it there. I have other stories that happen to family members, and also myself. Maybe I will share more of this. For now, I hope you enjoy this story, and maybe you can tell me if it was really a haunting. My name is Randy, and I've been reading many of the true ghost stories on your website. And I must say, a lot of this stuff is genuine and it sends chills down my spine. I know from experience. Let's go way back to the 1970s, the city of Toronto. My mom and my dad were in a band. My mom left my stepdad for a woman in the band, and we, meaning me and my younger brother, my mom and her lover, moved into a rooming house. Two rooms on the second floor, with a kitchen and a bathroom on a street called Bartmount, near Pepe and Queen. The first day we moved there, maggots came crawling out from underneath the baseboard of one of the walls of my room. My mom and her girlfriend, shrieking and squishing bugs. Anyway, my mom would leave me and my brother there alone at night, so she could play music with the band. Besides, the lady who lived on the first floor had three boys my age, and she would come up periodically during the night, or right away, if we called out. Well, it started that night out. When everyone was gone and my brother was asleep, I would hear the voice of a child quietly muttering or praying, and I wasn't the least bit frightened at first. Now, please keep in mind, this was a long time ago and I don't remember anything in particular it said to me, but it was like an imaginary friend I assumed. Then one night, I was in a mood or something, and for some reason, 
I was being cruel to my younger brother, as children sometimes are, and he went to sleep crying. Now, this spirit or entity took on a much more terrifying persona. It hated me, and nighttime was now a horrifying experience. There were a few things that it did almost nightly, like yanking the covers off, or making it seem as though there was a huge rat underneath the covers, scream profanities constantly, Rattle the dishes that were left to try on the counter. I would beg my mom to stay home and scream for that poor woman who lived down the stairs. Or I would try to keep my brother awake. But he could sleep through anything. The most terrifying thing that ever happened was this ball of light red. But then it changed. As it traveled up and down the wall, spitting electricity. It got so bad that I couldn't even sleep and kids at school were accusing me of wearing makeup. Eyeshadow. I became accident prone and finally got poked in the eye by some girl at school. And my mother sent me to stay at my grandmother's for a month. By the time I recovered, we moved away a few days after I returned. For years, I had never had that happen to me since. It seemed like for a while, and even I forget it happened, but not anymore. There are a couple things I learned from this experience. First thing was that spirit was a child. And secondly, that spirits do exist. And lastly, I'm no psychic or detective or anything, but I bet there's a body buried behind the wall in that room. I've experienced hauntings since I was about five or six years old. The very first time was when my family moved into the house my uncle owned. We lived downstairs, and they lived upstairs. It was a pretty old house. Well, after a few weeks of living there one summer, my dad went to the grocery store. Though it's strange, my parents would leave me alone at the home because I hated leaving the home. The grocery store was on the corner anyway. That day I was alone, and I heard someone walking up the stairs, thinking it was my cousin or aunt's. I went upstairs, where they always left the door open for us. I walked in, and no one was in the house. I checked the living and bathroom, the kitchen. No one was there, but I kept hearing someone behind me. Then out of nowhere, this doll appeared by the door. It wasn't there when I walked in. I wasn't very scared, but just a little shook up. I went downstairs and stayed in my living room, looking out my window for my dad to come home. Well, we ended up moving three years later, when I was eight. This time we moved into a Victorian-style home. Cherry wood and old heaters. Very romantic with a small chandelier. I fell in love with the home. I've always loved old homes. Months after moving in, I would hear someone in the bathroom rummaging or washing their hands. I would walk in there, and no one would be there. Everything would stop. Later, I would be sometimes sitting in the kitchen, eating cereal, and I saw a tall man with another oddly tall woman not dressed in Victorian wear, but still old-fashioned, maybe 1930s or 40s. I saw them standing down the hall in there, looking straight at me. I looked at them for a little bit, and then they were gone. They were misty, and I remember seeing the sun shining through them. It was very calm. Other times that I stayed home alone in this new home, I would hear someone walking up the stairs, and then it would stop if I would call out. One day they didn't stop. I was watching TV. It then turned off, and I couldn't even figure out why. And then I sat on the couch playing with a little music recorder I talked into. I heard my name being called from the stairs. It didn't sound like my dad, but in my head, I was forcing myself to think it was, and I called out Daddy. No one answered. I just kept hearing my name. 
and slow walking closer up the stairs. I heard the footsteps in my name. I became really frightened, and I heard a soft chuckle of a man. Well, after that, I had many more experiences now that I'm 18, and they have just stopped. I kind of miss them, and sometimes want to contact them again. That is the earliest of my experience. Just for the record, I'm not alone. I'm normal. I have a normal job. And I'm not crazy at all. I was staying in my friend's house. We all planned to sleep in the living room. Laura, Dave, and myself. I knew Dave was leaving early in the morning for work at 6 a.m. I woke to go to the loo in the night and found Laura had gone to bed in her own room upstairs. So it was just me and Dave sleeping in the living room. It was getting light when I found myself awake, even though I felt tired. I awoke suddenly but peacefully, and I was very much awake. I didn't dream this. I was wondering why I was awake, in my head, not out loud. When I heard breathing, two sets of deep in and out heavy breaths, I instantly thought, oh, it's okay, it's Dave breathing. The next thing I thought was, hang on, Dave's not even here. He had left for work, and straight after that thought came, Laura said her house was haunted. Before I could even ponder that I heard a voice, an older man's voice right in my ear, so close. I could feel him near me whispering. He said, I'll wrap you in my grave. He sounded full of malice and just really hateful. I was terrified and was stuck in that position. I was so afraid. After about 15 minutes, I held my hands over my ears and screamed and screamed till Laura came down, but where I had my eyes closed, when she tried to get me to realize she was there, I thought I was the ghost, and then I screamed even more. She says I was hysterical for a while, until she calmed me down. It was not a dream. Laura then told me her sister used to wake in the middle of the night because she couldn't breathe and felt like someone was sitting on her chest. Laura's mom told me that Laura when she was little, used to ask who the people in her house was when there was no one there but herself and her mom. I had trouble sleeping for months after and still can't sleep on that sign or with the lights off alone. When he said the word rap, I had a visual image of cherries, which I thought was strange. It was like saying something in a German word you recognize when you only speak English. What he said doesn't make much sense. When I told my mom, she thought he might have said the R-A-P-E word and not rap. It sounded like rap though. Well, that's it. I really hope you didn't mind the story. And you get to the end of the video, and you get to the end of the video, and you get to the end of the video, and everybody gets to the end of the video. Sorry, I had a little bit of Oprah in me. Anyway, guys, if you got to the end of the video, please leave a like, share, and comment right below, because I love your comments, as usual. And I mentioned Oprah, and everybody loves Oprah, right? So we're going to use Oprah as the keyword this time to let me know that you got to the end of the video, that you guys are watching the video, and that you enjoy the video. Otherwise, I'll be sad, and I'll cry like a Oprah when she has an interview that's very emotional. Um, I really don't know what I'm talking about, guys, but I appreciate your support. Again, any comments would be appreciative. Any Anytime you could share and like the video all across social media and i'll appreciate everything you guys have done for me and you know we're really close to thirty-four thousand. so if you could do all that you know it helps a really small channel like mine grow and i appreciate you um sorry for sounding like a broken record but i love you guys i'll see you in the next video